John. He dreamt he was back in Winterfell, limping past the stone kings on their thrones. Their grey granite eyes turned to follow him as he passed, and their grey granite fingers tightened on the hilts of the rusted swords upon their laps. "'You are no stock," he could hear them mutter in heavy granite voices. "'There is no place for you here. Go away.' He walked deeper into the darkness. "'Father!' he called. "'Bran! Rickon!' No one answered. A chill wind was blowing on his neck. Uncle, he called. Uncle Benjen. Father, please, Father, help me. Up above he heard drums. They are feasting in the great hall, but I am not welcome there. I am no Stark, and this is not my place. His crutch slipped, and he fell to his knees. The crypts were growing darker. A light has gone out somewhere. Ingrid, he whispered. Forgive me, please. But it was only a dire wolf, gray and ghastly, spotted with blood, his golden eyes shining sadly through the dark. The cell was dark, the bed hard beneath him, his own bed, he remembered, his own bed in his steward's cell beneath the old bear's chambers. By rights it should have brought him sweeter dreams. Even beneath the firs he was cold. Ghost had shared his cell before the ranging, warming it against the chill of night. And in the wild, Ygritte had slept beside him. Both gone now. He had burned Ygritte himself, as he knew she would have wanted, and Ghost, where are you? Was he dead as well? Was that what his dream had meant, the bloody wolf in the crypts? But the wolf in the dream had been grey, not white. Grey like Bran's wolf. Had the Thens hunted him down and killed him after Queen's crown? If so, Bran was lost to him for good and all. John was trying to make sense of that when the horn blew. The horn of winter, he thought, still confused from sleep. But Mance never found Joraman's horn, so that couldn't be. A second blast followed, as long and deep as the first. John had to get up and go to the wall, he knew, but it was so hard. He shoved aside his furs and sat. The pain in his leg seemed duller, nothing he could not stand. He had slept in his breeches and tunic and small clothes for the added warmth so he had only to pull on his boots and don leather and mail and cloak. The horn blew again, two long blasts, so he slung long claw over one shoulder, found his crutch, and hobbled down the steps. It was the black of night outside, bitter cold and overcast. His brothers were spilling out of towers and keeps, buckling their sword belts and walking toward the wall. John looked for Pip and Gran, but could not find them. Perhaps one of them was the sentry blowing the horn. It is Mance, he thought. He has come at last. That was good. We will fight a battle, and then we'll rest. Alive or dead, we'll rest. Where the stair had been, only an immense tangle of charred wood and broken ice remained below the wall. The winch raised them up now, but the cage was only big enough for ten men at a time, and it was already on its way up by the time John arrived. He would need to wait for its return. Others waited with him, Satin, Molly, Spareboot, Kegs, big blonde Harith with his buck teeth. Everyone called him Horse. He had been a stable hand in Molestown, one of the few moles who had stayed at Castle Black. The rest had run back to their fields and hovels, or their beds in the underground brothel. Horse wanted to take the black, though, the great buck-toothed fool. Zai remained as well, the whore who'd proved so handy with a crossbow, and Noy had kept three orphan boys whose father had died on the steps. They were young. Nine and eight and five. But no one else seemed to want them. As they waited for the cage to come back, Clytus brought them cups of hot mulled wine, while Three Finger Hob passed out chunks of black bread. John took a heel from him and gnawed on it. Is it Mance Raider? Satin asked anxiously. We can hope so. There were worse things than wildlings in the dark. John remembered the words the wildling king had spoken on the fist of the first men, as they stood amidst that pink snow. When the dead walk, walls and stakes and swords mean nothing. You cannot fight the dead, John Snow. No man knows that half so well as me. Just thinking of it made the wind seem a little colder. Finally the cage came clanking back down, swaying at the end of the long chain, and they crowded in silently and shut the door. Molly yanked the bell-rope three times. 
A moment later they began to rise, by fits and starts at first, then more smoothly. No one spoke. At the top the cage swung sideways, and they clambered out one by one. Horse gave John a hand down onto the ice. The cold hit him in the teeth like a fist. A line of fires burned along the top of the wall, contained in iron baskets on poles taller than a man. The cold knife of the wind stirred and swirled the flames, so the lurid orange light was always shifting. Bundles of quarrels, arrows, spears, and scorpion bolts stood ready on every hand. Rocks were piled ten feet high, big wooden barrels of pitch and lamp oil lined up beside them. Bowen Marsh had left Castle Black well supplied in everything save men. The wind was whipping at the black cloaks of the scarecrow sentinels who stood along the ramparts, spears in hand. "'I hope it wasn't one of them who blew the horn,' John said to Donald Noy when he limped up beside him. "'Did you hear that?' Noy asked. "'There was the wind, and horses, and something else.' "'A mammoth,' John said. "'That was a mammoth.' The armorer's breath was frosting as it blew from his broad, flat nose. North of the wall was a sea of darkness that seemed to stretch forever. John could make out the faint red glimmer of distant fires moving through the wood. It was manse, certain as sunrise. The others did not light torches. "'How do we fight them if we can't see them?' Horse asked. Donald Noy turned toward the two great trebuchets that Bowen Marsh had restored to working order. "'Give me light!' he roared. Barrels of pitch were loaded hastily into the slings, and set afire with a torch. The wind fanned the flames to a brisk red fury. "'Now!' Noy bellowed. The counterweights plunged downward. The throwing arms rose to thud against the padded crossbars. The burning pitch went tumbling through the darkness, casting an eerie, flickering light upon the ground below. John caught a glimpse of mammoths moving ponderously through the half-light, and just as quickly lost them again. A dozen, maybe more. The barrel struck the earth and burst. They heard a deep bass trumpeting, and a giant roared something in the old tongue, his voice an ancient thunder that sent shivers up John's spine. Again! Noy shouted, and the trebuchets were loaded once more. Two more barrels of burning pitch went crackling through the gloom to come crashing down amongst the foe. This time one of them struck a dead tree, enveloping it in flame. Not a dozen mammoths, John saw. A hundred. He stepped to the edge of the precipice. Careful, he reminded himself. It is a long way down. Red Allen sounded his sentry's horn once more. Ow! Ow! And now the wildlings answered, not with one horn, but with a dozen, and with drums and pipes as well. We are come, they seemed to say, we are come to break your wall, to take your lands and steal your daughters. The wind howled, the trebuchets creaked and thumped, the barrels flew. Behind the giants and the mammoths, John saw men advancing on the wall with bows and axes. Were there twenty or twenty thousand? In the dark there was no way to tell. This is a battle of blind men, but Mance has a few thousand more of them than we do. The gate! Pip cried out. They're at the gate! The wall was too big to be stormed by any conventional means, too high for ladders or siege towers, too thick for battering rams. No catapult could throw a stone large enough to breach it, and if you tried to set it on fire the ice smelt would quench the flames. You could climb over, as the raiders did near Greyguard but only if you were strong and fit and sure-handed, and even then you might end up like Jarl impaled on a tree. They must take the gate, or they cannot pass. But the gate was a crooked tunnel through the ice, smaller than any castle gate in the Seven Kingdoms, so narrow that rangers must lead their garons through single file. Three iron grates closed the inner passage, each locked and chained and protected by a murder hole. The outer door was old oak, nine inches thick and studded with iron, not easy to break through. But Mance has mammoths, he reminded himself, and giants as well. Must be cold down there, said Noy. What say we warm them up, lads? A dozen jars of lamp oil had been lined up on the precipice. Pip ran down the line with a torch, setting them alight. Owen the oath followed, 
shoving them over the edge one by one. Tongues of pale yellow fire swirled around the jars as they plunged downward. When the last was gone, Gren kicked loose the chocks on a barrel of pitch and sent it rumbling and rolling over the edge as well. The sounds below changed to shouts and screams, sweet music to their ears. Yet still the drums beat on. The trebuchets shuddered and thumped, and the sound of skin pipes came wafting through the night like the songs of strange, fierce birds. Septon Celador began to sing as well, his voice tremulous and thick with wine. Gentle mother, font of mercy, save our sons from war, we pray. Stay the swords and stay the arrows. Let them know. Donald Noy rounded on him. Any man here stays his sword, I'll chuck his puckered arse right off this wall. Starting with you, Septon. Archers! Do we have any bloody archers? Here, said Satin. And here, said Molly. But how can I find the target? It's black as the inside of a pig's belly. Where are they? No, I pointed north. Loose enough arrows, it might be you'll find a few. At least you'll make them fretful. He looked around the ring of firelit faces. I need two bows and two spears to help me hold the tunnel if they break the gate. More than ten stepped forward, and the smith picked his four. John, you have the wall till I return. For a moment, John thought he had misheard. It had sounded as if Noy were leaving him in command. My lord? Lord, I'm a blacksmith. I said the wall is yours. There are older men, John wanted to say. Better men. I am still as green as summer grass. I'm wounded, and I stand accused of desertion. His mouth had gone bone dry. I, he managed. Afterward, it would seem to John Snow as if he'd dreamt that night. Side by side with the straw soldiers, with long bows or crossbows clutched in half-frozen hands, his archers launched a hundred flights of arrows against men they never saw. From time to time a wildling arrow came flying back in answer. He sent men to the smaller catapults and filled the air with jagged rocks the size of a giant's fist, but the darkness swallowed them as a man might swallow a handful of nuts. Mammoths trumpeted in the gloom, strange voices called out in stranger tongues, and Septon Celador prayed so loudly and drunkenly for the dawn to come that John was tempted to chuck him over the edge himself. They heard a mammoth dying at their feet, and saw another lurch burning through the woods, trampling down men and trees alike. The wind blew cold and colder. Hob rode up the chain with cups of onion broth, and Owen and Clytus served them to the archers where they stood so they could gulp them down between arrows. Zai took a place among them with her crossbow. Hours of repeated jars and shocks knocked something loose on the right-hand trebuchet, and its counterweight came crashing free, suddenly and catastrophically, wrenching the throwing arm sideways with a splintering crash. The left-hand trebuchet kept throwing, but the wildlings had quickly learned to shun the place where its loads were landing. We should have twenty trebuchets, not two, and they should be mounted on sledges and turntables so we could move them. It was a futile thought. He might as well wish for another thousand men, and maybe a dragon or three. Donald Noy did not return, nor any of them who'd gone down with him to hold that black, cold tunnel. The wall is mine, John reminded himself whenever he felt his strength flagging. He had taken up a longbow himself, and his fingers felt crabbed and stiff, half-frozen. His fever was back as well, and his leg would tremble uncontrollably, sending a white-hot knife of pain right through him. One more arrow, and I'll rest, he told himself, half a hundred times. Just one more. Whenever his quiver was empty, one of the orphaned moles would bring him another. One more quiver, and I'm done. It couldn't be long until the dawn. When morning came, none of them quite realized it at first. The world was still dark, but the black had turned to gray, and shapes were beginning to emerge half seen from the gloom. John lowered his bow to stare at the mass of heavy clouds that covered the eastern sky. He could see a glow behind them, but perhaps he was only dreaming. He notched another arrow. Then the rising sun broke through to send pale lances of light across the battleground. John found himself holding his breath as he looked out over the half-mile swath of cleared land that lay between the wall and the edge of the forest. In half a night they had turned it into a wasteland of blackened grass, bubbling pitch, shattered stone, and corpses. The carcass of the burned mammoth was already drawing crows. 
There were giants dead on the ground as well, but behind them. Someone moaned to his left, and he heard Septon Celador say, Mother, have mercy, oh, oh, mother, have mercy. Beneath the trees were all the wildlings in the world, raiders and giants, wargs and skin changers, mountain men, salt sea sailors, ice river cannibals, cave dwellers with dyed faces, dog chariots from the frozen shore, hornfoot men with their soles like boiled leather, all the queer wild folk mans had gathered to break the wall. This is not your land, John wanted to shout at them. There is no place for you here. Go away. He could hear Tormund Giantsbane laughing at that. You know nothing, John Snow, Ygritte would have said. He flexed his sword hand, opening and closing the fingers, though he knew full well that swords would not come into it up here. He was chilled and feverish, and suddenly the weight of the longbow was too much. The battle with a Magnar had been nothing, he realized, and the night fight less than nothing, only a probe, a dagger in the dark to try and catch them unprepared. The real battle was only now beginning— "'I never knew there would be so many,' Satin said. John had. He had seen them before, but not like this, not drawn up in battle array. On the march, the wildling column had sprawled over long leagues like some enormous worm, but you never saw all of it at once. But now— "'Here they come,' someone said in a hoarse voice. Mammoths centered the wildling line, he saw, a hundred or more, with giants on their backs, clutching mauls and huge stone axes. More giants loped beside them, pushing along a tree trunk on great wooden wheels, its end sharpened to a point. A ram, he thought bleakly. If the gate still stood below, a few kisses from that thing would soon turn it into splinters. On either side of the giants came a wave of horsemen in boiled leather harness, with fire-hardened lances, a mass of running archers— hundreds of foot with spears, slings, clubs, and leathern shields. The bone chariots from the frozen shore clattered forward on the flanks, bouncing over rocks and roots behind teams of huge white dogs. The fury of the wild, John thought, as he listened to the skirl of skins, to the dogs barking and baying, the mammoths trumpeting, the free folk whistling and screaming, the giants roaring in the old tongue. Their drums echoed off the ice like rolling thunder. He could feel the despair all around him. "'There must be a hundred thousand, Satin wailed. "'How can we stop so many?' "'The wall will stop them,' John heard himself say. He turned and said it again, louder. "'The wall will stop them. The wall defends itself!' Hollow words, but he needed to say them, almost as much as his brothers needed to hear them. "'Mance wants to unman us with his numbers. Does he think we're stupid?' He was shouting now, his leg forgotten, and every man was listening. The chariots, the horsemen, all those fools on foot! What are they going to do to us up here? Any of you ever see a mammoth climb a wall? He laughed, and Pip and Owen and half a dozen more laughed with him. They're nothing. They're less use than our straw brothers here. They can't reach us, they can't hurt us, and they don't frighten us, do they? No, Grin shouted. They're down there, and we're up here, John said. And so long as we hold the gate, they cannot pass. They cannot pass. They were all shouting then, roaring his own words back at him, waving swords and longbows in the air as their cheeks flushed red. John saw Keggs standing there with a war horn slung beneath his arm. Brother, he told him, sound for battle. Grinning, Keggs lifted the horn to his lips and blew the two long blasts that meant wildlings. Other horns took up the call until the wall itself seemed to shudder, and the echo of those great deep-throated moans drowned all other sound. "'Archers!' John said, when the horns had died away. "'You'll aim for the giants with that ram, every bloody one of you. Loose at my command, not before. The giants and the ram. I want arrows raining on them with every step, but we'll wait till they're in range.' Any man who wastes an arrow will need to climb down and fetch it back, do you hear me? I do, shouted Owen the Oaf. I hear you, Lord Snow. John laughed, laughed like a drunk or a madman, and his men laughed with him. The chariots and the racing horsemen on the flanks were well ahead of the center now, he saw. The wildlings had not crossed a third of the half-mile, yet their battle line was dissolving. 
Load the trebuchet with caltrops, John said. Owen, kegs, angle the catapults toward the center. Scorpions, load with fire spears and loose at my command. He pointed at the Molestown boys. You, you, and you, stand by with torches. The wildling archers shot as they advanced. They would dash forward, stop, loose, then run another ten yards. There were so many that the air was constantly full of arrows, all falling woefully short. A waste, John thought. Their want of discipline is showing. The smaller horn and wood bows of the free folk were outranged by the great yew long bows of the night's watch, and the wildlings were trying to shoot at men seven hundred feet above them. Let them shoot, John said. Wait, hold. Their cloaks were flapping behind them. The wind is in our faces. It will cost us range. Wait. Closer. Closer. The skins wailed, the drums thundered, the wildling arrows fluttered and fell. Draw! John lifted his own bow and pulled the arrow to his ear. Satin did the same, and Grin, Owen the Oaf, Spareboot, Black Jack Bulwer, Aaron, and Emric. Zai hoisted her crossbow to her shoulder. John was watching the ram come on and on, the mammoths and giants lumbering forward on either side. They were so small he could have crushed them all in one hand, it seemed. If only my hand was big enough. Through the killing ground they came. A hundred crows rose from the carcass of the dead mammoth as the wildlings thundered past to either side of them. Closer and closer until... Loose! The black arrows hissed downward like snakes on feathered wings. John did not wait to see where they struck. He reached for a second arrow as soon as the first left his bow. Notch! Draw! Loose! As soon as the arrow flew, he found another. Notch! Draw! Loose! Again and then again, John shouted for the trebuchet and heard the creak and heavy thud as a hundred spiked steel caltrops went spinning through the air. Catapults, he called. Scorpions! Bowmen loose at will! Wildling arrows were striking the wall now, a hundred feet below them. A second giant spun and staggered. Notch, draw, loose. A mammoth veered into another beside it, spilling giants on the ground. Notch, draw, loose. The ram was down and done, he saw. The giants who'd pushed it, dead or dying. Fire arrows, he shouted. I want that ram burning. The screams of wounded mammoths and the booming cries of giants mingled with the drums and pipes to make an awful music. Yet still his archers drew and loosed, as if they'd all gone as deaf as dead Dick Follard. They might be the dregs of the order, but they were men of the Night's Watch, or near enough as made no matter. That's why they shall not pass. One of the mammoths was running berserk, smashing wildlings with his trunk and crushing archers underfoot. John pulled back his bow once more and launched another arrow at the beast's shaggy back to urge him on. To east and west the flanks of the wildling host had reached the wall unopposed. The chariots drew in or turned while the horsemen milled aimlessly beneath the looming cliff of ice. At the gate! a shout came. Spare boot, maybe. Mammoth at the gate! Fire! John barked. Grin, pip! Grin thrust his bow aside, wrestled a barrel of oil onto its side, and rolled it to the edge of the wall, where Pip hammered out the plug that sealed it, stuffed in a twist of cloth, and set it alight with a torch. They shoved it over together. A hundred feet below it struck the wall and burst, filling the air with shattered staves and burning oil. Grin was rolling a second barrel to the precipice by then, and Keggs had one as well. Pip lit them both. "'Got him!' Satin shouted, his head sticking out so far that John was certain he was about to fall. "'Got him! Got him! Got him!' He could hear the roar of fire. A flaming giant lurched into view, stumbling and rolling on the ground. Then suddenly the mammoths were fleeing, running from the smoke and flames and smashing into those behind them in their terror. Those went backward too, the giants and wildlings behind them scrambling to get out of their way. In half a heartbeat the whole center was collapsing. The horsemen on the flanks saw themselves being abandoned and decided to fall back as well, not one so much as blooded. Even the chariots rumbled off, having done nothing but look fearsome and make a lot of noise. When they break, they break hard, John Snow thought as he watched them reel away. The drums had all gone silent. How do you like that music, Mance? How do you like the taste of the Dornishman's wife? Do we have anyone hurt? he asked. The bloody buggers got my leg. Spareboot plucked the arrow out and waved it above his head. The wooden one! A ragged cheer went up. Zai grabbed Owen by the hand, spun him around in a circle, and gave him a long, wet kiss right there for all to see. She tried to kiss John, too, but he held her by the shoulder and pushed her gently but firmly away. No, he said. I am done with kissing. 
Suddenly he was too weary to stand, and his leg was agony from knee to groin. He fumbled for his crutch. Pep, help me to the cage. Gren, you have the wall. Me? said Gren. Him? said Pip. It was hard to tell which of them was more horrified. But, Gren stammered, but, but, but what do I do if the wildlings attack again? Stop them, John told him. As they rode down in the cage, Pip took off his helm and wiped his brow. Frozen sweat. Is there anything as disgusting as frozen sweat? He laughed. Gods, I don't think I have ever been so hungry. I could eat an aurochs hole, I swear it. Do you think Hob will cook up Gren for us? When he saw John's face, his smile died. What's wrong? Is it your leg? My leg, John agreed. Even the words were an effort. Not the battle, though. We won the battle. Ask me when I've seen the gate, John said grimly. I want a fire, a hot meal, a warm bed, and something to make my leg stop hurting, he told himself. But first he had to check the tunnel and find what had become of Donald Noy. After the battle with the Thens, it had taken them almost a day to clear the ice and broken beams away from the inner gate. Spotted Pate and Keggs and some of the other builders had argued heatedly that they ought just leave the debris there. Another obstacle for Mance. That would have meant abandoning the defense of the tunnel, though, and Noy was having none of it. With men in the murder holes and archers and spears behind each inner grate, a few determined brothers could hold off a hundred times as many wildlings and clog the way with corpses. He did not mean to give Mance Raider free passage through the ice. So, with pick and spade and ropes, they had moved the broken steps aside and dug back down to the gate. John waited by the cold iron bars while Pip went to Maester Amon for the spare key. Surprisingly, the Maester himself returned with him, and Clytus with a lantern. "'Come see me when we are done,' the old man told John while Pip was fumbling with the chains. I need to change your dressing and apply a fresh poultice, and you will want some more dream wine for the pain. John nodded weakly. The door swung open. Pip led them in, followed by Clytus and the lantern. It was all John could do to keep up with Maester Amon. The ice pressed close around them, and he could feel the cold seeping into his bones, the weight of the wall above his head. It felt like walking down the gullet of an ice dragon. The tunnel took a twist, and then another. Pip unlocked a second iron gate. They walked farther, turned again, and saw light ahead, faint and pale through the ice. That's bad, John knew at once. That's very bad. Then Pip said, There's blood on the floor. The last twenty feet of the tunnel was where they'd fought and died. The outer door of studded oak had been hacked and broken and finally torn off its hinges, and one of the giants had crawled in through the splinters. The lantern bathed the grisly scene in a sullen reddish light. Pip turned aside to wretch, and John found himself envying Maester Amon his blindness. Noy and his men had been waiting within, behind a gate of heavy iron bars, like the two Pip had just unlocked. The two crossbows had gotten off a dozen quarrels as the giant struggled toward them. Then the spearmen must have come to the fore, stabbing through the bars. Still the giant found the strength to reach through, twist the head off spotted pate, seize the iron gate, and wrench the bars apart. Links of broken chain lay strewn across the floor. One giant. All this was the work of one giant. Are they all dead? Maester Amon asked softly. Yes, Donal was the last. Noy's sword was sunk deep in the giant's throat, halfway to the hilt. The armorer had always seemed such a big man to John, but locked in the giant's massive arms, he looked almost like a child. The giant crushed his spine. I don't know who died first. He took the lantern and moved forward for a better look. Mag. I am the last of the giants. He could feel the sadness there, but he had no time for sadness. It was Mag the Mighty, the king of the giants. He needed sun, then. It was too cold and dark inside the tunnel, and the stench of blood and death was suffocating. John gave the lantern back to Clytus, squeezed around the bodies and through the twisted bars, and walked toward the daylight to see what lay beyond the splintered door. The huge carcass of a dead mammoth partially blocked the way. One of the beast's tusks snagged his cloak and tore it as he edged past. Three more giants lay outside, half buried beneath stone and slush and hardened pitch. 
He could see where the fire had melted the wall, where great sheets of ice had come sloughing off in the heat to shatter on the blackened ground. He looked up at where they'd come from. When you stand here, it seems immense, as if it were about to crush you. John went back inside to where the others waited. We need to repair the outer gate as best we can, and then block up this section of the tunnel. Rubble, chunks of ice, anything. All the way to the second gate, if we can. Sir Winton will need to take command. He's the last knight left, but he needs to move now. The giants will be back before we know it. We have to tell him. Tell him what you will, said Maester Amon gently. He will smile, nod, and forget. Thirty years ago, Sir Winton Stout came within a dozen votes of being Lord Commander. He would have made a fine one. Ten years ago, he would still have been capable. No longer. You know that as well as Donald did, John. It was true. You give the order, then, John told the maester. You have been on the wall your whole life. The men will follow you. We have to close the gate. I am a maester, chained and sworn. My order serves, John. We give counsel, not commands. Someone must— You. You must lead. No. Yes, John. It need not be for long, only until such time as the garrison returns. Donald chose you, and Coran Halfhand before him. Lord Commander Mormont made you his steward. You are a son of Winterfell, a nephew of Benjen Stark. It must be you, or no one. The wall is yours, John Snow. Arya. She could feel the hole inside her every morning when she woke. It wasn't hunger, though sometimes there was that, too. It was a hollow place, an emptiness where her heart had been, where her brothers had lived and her parents. Her head hurt, too, not as bad as it had at first, but still pretty bad. Arya was used to that, though, and at least the lump was going down. But the hole inside her stayed the same. The hole will never feel any better she told herself when she went to sleep. Some mornings Arya did not want to wake at all. She would huddle beneath her cloak with her eyes squeezed shut and try to will herself back to sleep. If the hound would only have left her alone, she would have slept all day and all night. And dreamed. That was the best part, the dreaming. She dreamed of wolves almost every night. A great pack of wolves with her at the head, she was bigger than any of them, stronger, swifter, faster. She could outrun horses and outfight lions. When she bared her teeth, even men would run from her. Her belly was never empty long, and her fur kept her warm even when the wind was blowing cold. And her brothers and sisters were with her, many and more of them, fierce and terrible and hers. They would never leave her. But if her nights were full of wolves, her days belonged to the dog. Sandor Clagane made her get up every morning, whether she wanted to or not. He would curse at her in his raspy voice, or yank her to her feet and shake her. Once he dumped a helm full of cold water all over her head. She bounced up, sputtering and shivering, and tried to kick him, but he only laughed. "'Try off and feed the bloody horses,' he told her, and she did. They had two now. Stranger and a sorrel palfrey mare Arya had named Craven, because Sandor said she'd likely run off from the twins the same as them. They'd found her wandering riderless through a field the morning after the slaughter. She was a good enough horse, but Arya could not love a coward. Stranger would have fought. Still, she tended the mare as best she knew. It was better than riding double with a hound. And Craven might have been a coward, but she was young and strong as well. Arya thought that she might be able to outrun Stranger if it came to it. The hound no longer watched her as closely as he had. Sometimes he did not seem to care whether she stayed or went, and he no longer bound her up in a cloak at night. One night I'll kill him in his sleep, she told herself, but she never did. One day I'll ride away on Craven, and he won't be able to catch me, she thought, but she never did that either. Where would she go? Winterfell was gone. Her grandfather's brother was at River Run, but he didn't know her no more than she knew him. Maybe Lady Smallwood would take her in at Acorn Hall— but maybe she wouldn't. Besides, Arya wasn't even sure she could find Acorn Hall again. Sometimes she thought she might go back to Sharna's Inn if the floods hadn't washed it away. She could stay with Hot Pie, or maybe Lord Berwick would find her there. 
Angie would teach her to use a bow, and she could ride with Gendry and be an outlaw like Wenda the White Fawn in the songs. But that was just stupid, like something Sansa might dream. Hot Pie and Gendry had left her just as soon as they could, and Lord Berwick and the outlaws only wanted to ransom her, just like the Hound. None of them wanted her around. They were never my pack, not even Hot Pie and Gendry. I was stupid to think so, just a stupid little girl and no wolf at all. So she stayed with the Hound. They rode every day, never sleeping twice in the same place, avoiding towns and villages and castles as best they could. Once she asked Sandor Clegane where they were going. Away, he said. That's all you need to know. You're not worth spit to me now, and I don't want to hear your whining. I should have let you run into that bloody castle. You should have, she agreed, thinking of her mother. You'd be dead if I had. You ought to thank me. You ought to sing me a pretty little song, the way your sister did. Did you hit her with an axe, too? I hit you with a flat on the axe, you stupid little bitch. If I'd hit you with a blade, there'd still be chunks of your head floating down the green fork. Now shut your bloody mouth! If I had any sense, I'd give you to the silent sisters. They cut the tongues out of girls who talk too much. That wasn't fair of him to say. Aside from that one time, Arya hardly talked at all. Whole days passed when neither of them said anything. She was too empty to talk, and the hound was too angry. She could feel the fury in him. She could see it on his face, the way his mouth would tighten and twist, the looks he gave her. Whenever he took his axe to chop some wood for a fire, he would slide into a cold rage, hacking savagely at the tree or the deadfall or the broken limb, until they had twenty times as much kindling and firewood as they needed. Sometimes he would be so sore and tired afterward that he would lie down and go right to sleep without even lighting a fire. Arya hated it when that happened, and hated him too. Those were the nights when she stared the longest at the axe. It looks awfully heavy, but I bet I could swing it. She wouldn't hit him with a flat, either. Sometimes in their wanderings they glimpsed other people, farmers in their fields, swineherds with their pigs, a milkmaid leading a cow, a squire carrying a message down a rutted road. She never wanted to speak to them, either. It was as if they lived in some distant land and spoke a queer alien tongue. They had nothing to do with her, or her with them. Besides, it wasn't safe to be seen. From time to time columns of horsemen passed down the winding farm roads, the twin towers of Frey flying before them. "'Hunting for stray northmen,' the hound said when they had passed. "'Any time you hear hooves, get your head down fast. It's not like to be a friend.' One day, in an earthen hollow made by the roots of a fallen oak, they came face to face with another survivor of the twins. The badge on his breast showed a pink maiden dancing in a swirl of silk, and he told them he was Sir Mark Piper's man, a bowman, though he'd lost his bow. His left shoulder was all twisted and swollen where it met his arm. A blow from a mace, he said. It had broken his shoulder and smashed his chain mail deep into his flesh. A Northman it was, he wept. His badge was a bloody man. And he saw mine and made a jape, red man and pink maiden. Maybe they should get together. I drank to his Lord Bolton. He drank to Sir Mark, and we drank together to Lord Edmure and Lady Rosalind and the King of the North. And then he killed me. His eyes were fever bright when he said that, and Arya could tell that it was true. His shoulder was swollen grotesquely, and pus and blood had stained his whole left side. There was a stink to him, too. He smells like a corpse. The man begged them for a drink of wine. "'If I'd had any wine, I'd have drunk it myself,' the hound told him. "'I can give you water and the gift of mercy.' The archer looked at him a long while before he said, "'You're Joffrey's dog.' "'My own dog now. Do you want the water?' "'Aye,' the man swallowed. "'And the mercy, please.' They had passed a small pond a short ways back. Sandor gave Arya his helm and told her to fill it, so she trudged back to the water's edge. Mud squished over the toe of her boots. She used the dog's head as a pail. Water ran out through the eye holes, but the bottom of the helm still held a lot. When she came back, the archer turned his face up, and she poured the water into his mouth. He gulped it down as fast as she could pour, and what he couldn't gulp ran down his cheeks into the brown blood that crusted his whiskers, until pale pink tears dangled from his beard. When the water was gone, he clutched the helm and licked the steel. Good, he said. I wish it was wine, though. I wanted wine. Me too. 
The hound eased his dagger into the man's chest almost tenderly, the weight of his body driving the point through his surcoat, ringmail, and the quilting beneath. As he slid the blade back out and wiped it on the dead man, he looked at Arya. That's where the heart is, girl. That's how you kill a man. That's one way. Will we bury him? Why? Sandor said. He don't care, and we've got no spade. I leave him for the wolves and wild dogs. Your brothers and mine. He gave her a hard look. First we rob him, though. There were two silver stags in the archer's purse, and almost thirty coppers. His dagger had a pretty pink stone in the hilt. The hound hefted the knife in his hand, then flipped it toward Arya. She caught it by the hilt, slid it through her belt, and felt a little better. It wasn't needle, but it was steel. The dead man had a quiver of arrows, too, but arrows weren't much good without a bow. His boots were too big for Arya and too small for the hound, so those they left. She took his kettle helm as well, even though it came down almost past her nose, so she had to tilt it back to see. "'He must have had a horse as well, or he wouldn't have got away.' Clegane said, peering about. But it's bloody well gone, I'd say. No telling how long he's been here. By the time they found themselves in the foothills of the Mountains of the Moon, the rains had mostly stopped. Arya could see the sun and moon and stars, and it seemed to her that they were heading eastward. Where are we going? she asked again. This time the hound answered her. You have an aunt in the airy. Might be she'll want to ransom your scrawny arse, Though the gods know why. Once we find the high road, we can follow it all the way to the bloody gate. At least, sir. The thought left Arya feeling empty. It was her mother she wanted, not her mother's sister. She didn't know her mother's sister any more than she knew her great-uncle Blackfish. We should have gone into the castle. They didn't really know that her mother was dead or Rob either. It wasn't like they'd seen them die or anything. Maybe Lord Frey had just taken them captive. Maybe they were chained up in his dungeon, or maybe the Freys were taking them to King's Landing so Joffrey could chop their heads off. They didn't know. We should go back, she suddenly decided. We should go back to the twins and get my mother. She can't be dead. We have to help her. I thought your sister was the one with a head full of songs, the hound growled. Frey might have kept your mother alive to ransom. That's true. "'But there's no way in seven hells I'm going to pluck her out of his castle all by my bloody self.' "'Not by yourself. I'd come too.' He made a sound that was almost a laugh. "'That will scare the piss out of the old man.' "'You're just afraid to die,' she said scornfully. Now Clegane did laugh. "'Death don't scare me, only fire. Now be quiet or I'll cut your tongue out myself and save the son and sisters the bother. It's the veil for us.' Arya didn't think he'd really cut her tongue out. He was just saying that, the way Pink Eye used to say he'd beat her bloody. All the same, she wasn't going to try him. Sandor Clagane was no Pink Eye. Pink Eye didn't cut people in half or hit them with axes, not even with a flat of axes. That night she went to sleep thinking of her mother and wondering if she should kill the hound in his sleep and rescue Lady Caitlin herself. When she closed her eyes, she saw her mother's face against the back of her eyelids. She's so close, I could almost smell her. And then she could smell her. The scent was faint beneath the other smells, beneath moss and mud and water, and the stench of rotting reeds and rotting men. She padded slowly through the soft ground to the river's edge, lapped up a drink, then lifted her head to sniff. The sky was gray and thick with cloud, the river green and full of floating things. Dead men clogged the shallows, some still moving as the water pushed them, others washed up on the banks. Her brothers and sisters swarmed around them, tearing at the rich, ripe flesh. The crows were there, too, screaming at the wolves and filling the air with feathers. Their blood was hotter, and one of her sisters had snapped at one as it took flight and caught it by the wing. It made her want a crow herself. She wanted to taste the blood, to hear the bones crunch between her teeth, to fill her belly with warm flesh instead of cold. She was hungry, and the meat was all around, but she knew she could not eat. The scent was stronger now. She pricked her ears up and listened to the grumbles of her pack, the shriek of angry crows, the whirr of wings and sound of running water. Somewhere far off she could hear horses and the calls of living men, but they were not what mattered. Only the scent mattered. She sniffed the air again. There it was. 
and now she saw it, too, something pale and white drifting down the river, turning where it brushed against a snag. The reeds bowed down before it. She splashed noisily through the shallows and threw herself into the deeper water, her legs churning. The current was strong, but she was stronger. She swam, following her nose. The river smells were rich and wet, but those were not the smells that pulled her. She paddled after the sharp red whisper of cold blood, the sweet, cloying stench of death. She chased them as she had often chased a red deer through the trees, and in the end she ran them down, and her jaw closed around a pale white arm. She shook it to make it move, but there was only death and blood in her mouth. By now she was tiring, and it was all she could do to pull the body back to shore. As she dragged it up the muddy bank, one of her little brothers came prowling, his tongue lolling from his mouth. She had to snarl to drive him off, or else he would have fed. Only then did she stop to shake the water from her fur. The white thing lay face down in the mud, her dead flesh wrinkled and pale, cold blood trickling from her throat. Rise, she thought. Rise and eat and run with us. The sound of horses turned her head. Men. They were coming from downwind, so she had not smelled them, but now they were almost here. Men on horses, with flapping black and yellow and pink wings and long, shiny claws in hand. Some of her younger brothers bared their teeth to defend the food they'd found, but she snapped at them until they scattered. That was the way of the wild. Deer and hares and crows fled before wolves, and wolves fled from men. She abandoned the cold white prize in the mud, where she had dragged it, and ran and felt no shame. When morning came, the hound did not need to shout at Arya or shake her awake. She had woken before him for a change, and even watered the horses. They broke their fast in silence, until Sandor said, "'This thing about your mother—' "'It doesn't matter,' Arya said in a dull voice. "'I know she's dead. I saw her in a dream.' The hound looked at her a long time, then nodded. No more was said of it. They rode on toward the mountains. In the higher hills they came upon a tiny isolated village, surrounded by grey-green sentinels and tall blue soldier pines, and Clegane decided to risk going in. We need food, he said, and a roof over our heads. They're not like to know what happened to the twins, and with any luck they won't know me. The villagers were building a wooden palisade around their homes, and when they saw the breadth of the hound's shoulders, they offered them food and shelter, and even coin, for work. "'If there's wine as well, I'll do it,' he growled at them. In the end, he settled for ale, and drank himself to sleep each night. His dream of selling Arya to Lady Arryn died there in the hills, though. "'There's frost above us, and snow in the high passes,' the village elder said. If you don't freeze or starve, the shadow cats will get you, or the cave bears. There's the clans as well. The burned men are fearless since Timit One Eye came back from the war. And half a year ago, Gunthor, son of Gurn, led the stone crows down on a village not eight miles from here. They took every woman and every scrap of grain and killed half the men. They have steel now, good swords and mail, hauberks, and they watch the high road. The stone crows, the milk snakes, the sons of the mist, all of them. Might be you'd take a few with you, but in the end they'd kill you and make off with your daughter. I'm not his daughter, Arya might have shouted, if she hadn't felt so tired. She was no one's daughter now. She was no one. Not Arya, not Weasel, not Nan, nor Ari, nor Squab, not even Lumpyhead. She was only some girl who ran with a dog by day and dreamed of wolves by night. It was quiet in the village. They had beds stuffed with straw and not too many lice. The food was plain but filling, and the air smelled of pines. All the same, Arya soon decided that she hated it. The villagers were cowards. None of them would even look at the hound's face, at least not for long. Some of the women tried to put her in a dress and make her do needlework, but they weren't Lady Smallwood, and she was having none of it. And there was one girl who took to following her, the village elder's daughter. She was of an age with Arya, but just a child. She cried if she skinned a knee, and carried a stupid cloth doll with her everywhere she went. The doll was made up to look like a man-in-arms, sort of, so the girl called him Sir Soldier and bragged how he kept her safe. "'Go away!' 
Arya told her half a hundred times. Just leave me be. She wouldn't, though, so finally Arya took the doll away from her, ripped it open, and pulled the rag stuffing out of its belly with a finger. Now he really looks like a soldier, she said, before she threw the doll in a brook. After that the girl stopped pestering her, and Arya spent her days grooming Craven and Stranger or walking in the woods. Sometimes she would find a stick and practice her needlework, but then she would remember what had happened to the twins and smash it against a tree until it broke. "'Might be we should stay here a while,' the hound told her after a fortnight. He was drunk on ale, but more brooding than sleepy. "'We'd never reach the airy, and the Freys will still be hunting survivors in the Riverlands. Sounds like they need swords here, with these clansmen raiding. We can rest up, maybe find a way to get a letter to your aunt.' Arya's face darkened when she heard that. She didn't want to stay, but there was nowhere to go, either. The next morning, when the hound went off to chop down trees and haul logs, she crawled back into bed. But when the work was done, and the tall wooden palisade was finished, the village elder made it plain that there was no place for them. "'Come winter, we will be hard-pressed to feed our own,' he explained. "'And you, a man like you, brings blood with him.' Sandor's mouth tightened. "'So you do know who I am?' "'Aye. We don't get travellers here, that's so. "'But we go to market and to fairs. "'We know about King Joffrey's dog.' "'When these stone crows come calling, "'you might be glad to have a dog.' "'Might be,' the man hesitated, "'then gathered up his courage. "'But they say you lost your belly for fighting at the Blackwater. "'They say—' "'I know what they say,' Sandor's voice sounded like two wood saws grinding together. Pay me and we'll be gone. When they left, the hound had a pouch full of coppers, a skin of sour ale, and a new sword. It was a very old sword, if truth be told, though new to him. He swapped its owner the long axe he'd taken to the twins, the one he'd used to raise the lump on Arya's head. The ale was gone in less than a day, but Clegane sharpened the sword every night, cursing the man he'd swapped with for every nick and spot of rust. If he lost his belly for fighting, why does he care if his sword is sharp? It was not a question Arya dared ask him, but she thought on it a lot. Was that why he'd run from the twins and carried her off? Back in the riverlands they found that the rains had ebbed away and the floodwaters had begun to recede. The hound turned south, back toward the trident. "'We'll make for River Run,' he told Arya as they roasted a hare he'd killed. Maybe the blackfish wants to buy himself a she-wolf. He doesn't know me. He won't even know I'm really me. Arya was tired of making for River Run. She had been making for River Run for years, it seemed, without ever getting there. Every time she made for River Run, she ended up someplace worse. He won't give you any ransom. He'll probably just hang you. He's free to try. He turned the spit. He doesn't talk like he's lost his belly for fighting. I know where we could go, Arya said. She still had one brother left. John will want me, even if no one else does. He'll call me little sister and muss my hair. It was a long way, though, and she didn't think she could get there by herself. She hadn't even been able to reach River Run. We could go to the wall. Sandor's laugh was half a growl. The little wolf bitch wants to join the Night's Watch, does she? My brother's on the wall, she said stubbornly. His mouth gave a twitch. The wall's a thousand leagues from here. We need to fight through the bloody phrase just to reach the neck. There's lizard lions in those swamps that eat wolves every day for breakfast. And if we did reach the north with our skins intact, there's iron born in half the castles and thousands of bloody buggering northmen as well. Are you scared of them? she asked. Have you lost your belly for fighting? For a moment she thought he was going to hit her. By then the hair was brown, though, skin crackling and grease popping as it dripped down into the cook fire. Sandor took it off the stick, ripped it apart with his big hands, and tossed half of it into Arya's lap. There's nothing wrong with my belly, he said as he pulled off a leg, but I don't give a rat's arse for you or your brother. I have a brother, too. Tyrion. Tyrion, 
Sir Kevin Lannister said wearily. If you are indeed innocent of Joffrey's death, you should have no difficulty proving it at trial. Tyrion turned from the window. Who is to judge me? Justice belongs to the throne. The king is dead, but your father remains hand. Since it is his own son who stands accused, and his grandson who was the victim, he has asked Lord Tyrell and Prince Oberyn to sit in judgment with him. Tyrion was scarcely reassured. Mace Tyrell had been Joffrey's good father, however briefly, and the Red Viper was, well, a snake. Will I be allowed to demand trial by battle? I would not advise that. Why not? Had it saved him in the Vale, why not here? Answer me, uncle. Will I be allowed a trial by battle and a champion to prove my innocence? Certainly, if such is your wish. However, you had best know that your sister means to name Sir Gregor Clegane as her champion in the event of such a trial. The bitch checks my moves before I make them. A pity she didn't choose a kettle black. Bronn would make short work of any of the three brothers, but the mountain that rides was a kettle of a different color. I shall need to sleep on this. I need to speak with Bronn, and soon. He didn't want to think about what this was like to cost him. Bronn had a lofty notion of what his skin was worth. Does Cersei have witnesses against me? More every day. Then I must have witnesses of my own. Tell me who you would have, and Sir Adam will send the watch to bring them to the trial. I would sooner find them myself. You stand accused of regicide and kinslaying. Do you truly imagine you will be allowed to come and go as you please? Sir Kevin waved at the table. You have quill, ink, and parchment. Write the names of such witnesses as you require, and I shall do all in my power to produce them. You have my word as a Lannister. But you shall not leave this tower, except to go to trial. Tyrion would not demean himself by begging. Will you permit my squire to come and go? The boy Podrick Payne? Certainly, if that is your wish. I shall send him to you. Do so. Sooner would be better than later, and now would be better than sooner. He waddled to the writing table. But when he heard the door open, he turned back and said, Uncle! Sir Kevin paused. Yes? I did not do this. I wish I could believe that, Tyrion. When the door closed, Tyrion Lannister pulled himself up into the chair, sharpened a quill, and pulled a blank parchment. Who will speak for me? He dipped his quill in the ink pot. The sheet was still maiden when Podrick Payne appeared some time later. My lord, the boy said. Tyrion put down the quill. Find Bronn and bring him at once. Tell him there's gold in it, more gold than he's ever dreamt of, and see that you don't return without him. Yes, my lord, I mean, uh, no, I won't. Return. He went. He had not returned by sunset, nor by moonrise. Tyrion fell asleep in the window seat to wake stiff and sore at dawn. A serving man brought porridge and apples to break his fast with a horn of ale. He ate at the table, the blank parchment before him. An hour later the serving man returned for the bowl. Have you seen my squire? Tyrion asked him. The man shook his head. Sighing, he turned back to the table and dipped the quill again. Sansa, he wrote upon the parchment. He sat staring at the name, his teeth clenched so hard they hurt. Assuming Joffrey had not simply choked to death on a bit of food, which even Tyrion found hard to swallow, Sansa must have poisoned him. Joff practically put his cup down in her lap, and he'd given her ample reason. Any doubts Tyrion might have had vanished when his wife did. One flesh, one heart, one soul. His mouth twisted. She wasted no time proving how much those vows meant to her, did she? Well, what did you expect, dwarf? And yet, where would Sansa have gotten poison? He could not believe the girl had acted alone in this. Do I really want to find her? Would the judges believe that Tyrion's child bride had poisoned a king without her husband's knowledge? I wouldn't. Cersei would insist that they had done the deed together. Even so, he gave the parchment to his uncle the next day. Sir Kevin frowned at it. Lady Sansa is your only witness? I will think of others in time. Best think of them now. The judges mean to begin the trial three days hence. 
That's too soon. You have me shut up here under guard. How am I to find witnesses to my innocence? Your sisters had no difficulty finding witnesses to your guilt. Sir Kevin rolled up the parchment. Sir Adam has men hunting for your wife. Varys has offered a hundred stags for word of her whereabouts, and a hundred dragons for the girl herself. If the girl can be found, she will be found, and I shall bring her to you. I see no harm in husband and wife sharing the same cell and giving comfort to one another. You are too kind. Have you seen my squire? I sent him to you yesterday. Did he not come? He came, Tyrion admitted, and then he went. I shall send him to you again. But it was the next morning before Podrick Payne returned. He stepped inside the room hesitantly, with fear written all over his face. Bronn came in behind him. The sellsword knight wore a jerkin studded with silver and a heavy riding cloak, with a pair of fine tooled leather gloves thrust through his sword belt. One look at Bronn's face gave Tyrion a queasy feeling in the pit of his stomach. It took you long enough. The boy begged, or I wouldn't have come at all. I am expected at Castle Stokeworth for supper. Stokeworth? Tyrion hopped from the bed. And pray, what is there for you in Stokeworth? A bride. Bronn smiled like a wolf contemplating a lost lamb. I am to wed Lawless the day after next. Lawless. Perfect, bloody perfect. Lady Tonda's lackwit daughter gets a knightly husband and a father of sorts for the bastard in her belly, and Sir Bronn of the Blackwater climbs another rung. It had Cersei's stinking fingers all over it. My bitch sister has sold you a lame horse. The girl's dim-witted. If I wanted wits, I'd marry you. Lawless is big with another man's child. And when she pops him out, I'll get her big with mine. She's not even heir to Stokeworth, Tyrion pointed out. She has an elder sister, Felice, a married sister. Married ten years and still barren, said Bronn. Her lord husband shuns her bed. It's said he prefers virgins. He could prefer goats, and it wouldn't matter. The lands will still pass to his wife when Lady Tonda dies. Unless Felice should die before her mother. Tyrion wondered whether Cersei had any notion of the sort of serpent she'd given Lady Tonda to suckle. And if she does, would she care? Why are you here, then? Bronn shrugged. You once told me that if anyone ever asked me to sell you out, you'd double the price. Yes. Is it two wives you want, or two castles? One of each would serve. But if you want me to kill Gregor Clegane for you, it had best be a damned big castle. The Seven Kingdoms were full of high-born maidens, but even the oldest, poorest, and ugliest spinster in the realm would balk at wedding such low-born scum as Bronn. Unless she was soft of body and soft of head, with a fatherless child in her belly from having been raped half a hundred times. Lady Tonda had been so desperate to find a husband for Lawless that she had even pursued Tyrion for a time, and that had been before half of King's Landing enjoyed her. No doubt Cersei had sweetened the offer somehow, and Bronn was a knight now, which made him a suitable match for a younger daughter of a minor house. I find myself woefully short of both castles and high-born maidens at the moment, Tyrion admitted, but I can offer you gold and gratitude, as before. I have gold. What can I buy with gratitude? You might be surprised. A Lannister pays his debts. Your sister is a Lannister, too. My lady wife is heir to Winterfell. Should I emerge from this with my head still on my shoulders, I may one day rule the North in her name. I could carve you out a big piece of it. If and when and might be, said Bronn. And it's bloody cold up there. Lollis is soft, warm, and close. I could be poking her two nights since. Not a prospect I would relish. Is that so? Bronn grinned. Admit it, imp. Given a choice between fucking Lawless and fighting the mountain, you'd have your britches down and cock up before a man could blink. He knows me too bloody well. Tyrion tried a different tack. I'd heard that Sir Gregor was wounded on the Red Fork, and again at Duskendale. The wounds are bound to slow him. Bronn looked annoyed. 
He was never fast. Only freakish big and freakish strong. I'll grant you he's quicker than you'd expect for a man that size. He has a monstrous long reach and doesn't seem to feel blows the way a normal man would. Does he frighten you so much? asked Tyrion, hoping to provoke him. If he didn't frighten me, I'd be a bloody fool. Bronn gave a shrug. Might be I could take him, dance around him until he was so tired of hacking at me that he couldn't lift a sword, get him off his feet somehow. When they're flat on their backs, it don't matter how tall they are. Even so, it's chancy. One misstep and I'm dead. Why should I risk it? I like you well enough, ugly little horse son that you are. But if I fight your battle, I lose either way. Either the mountain spills my guts, or I kill him and lose Stokeworth. I sell my sword. I don't give it away. I'm not your bloody brother. No, said Tyrion sadly. You're not. He waved a hand. Be gone, then. Run to Stokeworth and Lady Lawless. May you find more joy in your marriage bed than I ever found in mine. Bran hesitated at the door. What will you do, Imp? Kill Gregor myself. Won't that make for a jolly song? I hope I hear them sing it. Bran grinned one last time and walked out of the door, the castle, and his life. Pod shuffled his feet. I'm sorry. Why? Is it your fault that Bran's an insolent, black-hearted rogue? He's always been an insolent, black-hearted rogue. That's what I liked about him. Tyrion poured himself a cup of wine and took it to the window seat. Outside the day was gray and rainy, but the prospect was still more cheerful than his. He could send Podrick Payne, questing after Shagai, he supposed. But there were so many hiding places in the deep of the King's Wood that outlaws often evaded capture for decades. And Pod sometimes has difficulty finding the kitchens when I send him down for cheese. Timmet, son of Timmet, would likely be back in the Mountains of the Moon by now. And despite what he'd told Bran, going up against Sir Gregor Clegane in his own person would be a bigger farce than Joffrey's jousting dwarfs. He did not intend to die with gales of laughter ringing in his ears. So much for trial by combat. Sir Kevin paid him another call later that day, and again the day after. Sansa had not been found, his uncle informed him politely, nor the fool Sir Dantos, who'd vanished the same night. Did Tyrion have any more witnesses he wished to summon? He did not. How do I bloody well prove I didn't poison the wine when a thousand people saw me fill Joff's cup? He did not sleep at all that night. Instead, he lay in the dark, staring up at the canopy and counting his ghosts. He saw Tysha smiling as she kissed him, saw Sansa naked and shivering in fear. He saw Joffrey clawing his throat, the blood running down his neck as his face turned black. He saw Cersei's eyes, bronze wolfish smile, Shay's wicked grin. Even thought of Shay could not arouse him. He fondled himself, thinking that perhaps if he woke his cock and satisfied it, he might rest more easily afterward. But it was no good. And then it was dawn, and time for his trial to begin. It was not Sir Kevin who came for him that morning, but Sir Adam Marbrand with a dozen gold cloaks. Tyrion had broken his fast on boiled eggs, burned bacon, and fried bread, and dressed in his finest. Sir Adam, he said, I had thought my father might send the king's guard to escort me to trial. I am still a member of the royal family, am I not? You are, my lord, but I fear that most of the king's guards stand witness against you. Lord Tywin felt it would not be proper for them to serve as your guards. Guards forbid we do anything improper. Please lead on. He was to be tried in the throne room where Joffrey had died. As Sir Adam marched him through the towering bronze doors and down the long carpet, he felt the eyes upon him. Hundreds had crowded in to see him judged. At least he hoped that was why they had come. For all I know, they're all witnesses against me. He spied Queen Marguerite up in the gallery, pale and beautiful in her mourning. Twice wed and twice widowed, and only sixteen. Her mother stood tall to one side of her, her grandmother small on the other, with her ladies-in-waiting and her father's household knights packing the rest of the gallery. The dais still stood beneath the empty iron throne. 
though all but one table had been removed. Behind it sat stout Lord Mace Tyrrell in a gold mantle over green, and slender Prince Oberyn Martell in flowing robes of striped orange, yellow, and scarlet. Lord Tywin Lannister sat between them. Perhaps there's hope for me yet. The Dornishman and the High Gardener despised each other. If I can find a way to use that. The High Septon began with a prayer, asking the Father above to guide them to justice. When he was done, the father below leaned forward to say, Tyrion, did you kill King Joffrey? He would not waste a heartbeat. No. Well, that's a relief, said Oberyn Martell dryly. Did Sansa Stark do it then? Lord Tyrell demanded. I would have if I'd been her. Yet wherever Sansa was, and whatever her part in this might have been, she remained his wife. He had wrapped the cloak of his protection about her shoulders, though he'd had to stand on a fool's back to do it. The gods killed Joffrey. He choked on his pigeon pie. Lord Tyrell reddened. You would blame the bakers? Them or the pigeons? Just leave me out of it. Tyrion heard nervous laughter and knew he'd made a mistake. Guard your tongue, you little fool, before it digs your grave. There are witnesses against you, Lord Tywin said. We shall hear them first. Then you may present your own witnesses. You are to speak only with our leave. There was naught that Tyrion could do but nod. Sir Adam had told it true. The first man ushered in was Sir Balan Swan of the Kingsguard. Lord Hand, he began, after the High Septon had sworn him to speak only truth, I had the honor to fight beside your son on the Bridge of Ships. He is a brave man for all his size, and I will not believe he did this thing. A murmur went through the hall, and Tyrion wondered what mad game Cersei was playing. Why offer a witness that believes me innocent? He soon learned. Sir Balan spoke reluctantly of how he had pulled Tyrion away from Joffrey on the day of the riot. He did strike his grace, that's so. It was a fit of wrath no more, a summer storm. The mob near killed us all. In the days of the Targaryens, a man who struck one of the blood royal would lose the hand he struck him with observed the Red Viper of Dorne. Did the dwarf regrow his little hand, or did you white swords forget your duty? He was of the blood royal himself, Sir Balan answered, and the king's hand beside. No, Lord Tywin said. He was acting hand in my stead. Sir Merrin Trant was pleased to expand on Sir Balan's account when he took his place as witness. He knocked the king to the ground and began kicking him. He shouted that it was unjust that his grace had escaped unharmed from the mobs. Tyrion began to grasp his sister's plan. She began with a man known to be honest and milked him for all he would give. Every witness to follow will tell a worse tale, until I seem as bad as Magor the Cruel and Ares the Mad together, with a pinch of Aegon the Unworthy for spice. Sir Merrin went on to relate how Tyrion had stopped Joffrey's chastisement of Sansa Stark. The dwarf asked his grace if he knew what had happened to Ares Targaryen. When Sir Boros spoke up in defense of the king, the imp threatened to have him killed. Blount himself came next, to echo that sorry tale. Whatever mislike Sir Boros might harbor toward Cersei for dismissing him from the king's guard, he said the words she wanted all the same. Tyrion could no longer hold his tongue. Tell the judges what Joffrey was doing, why don't you? The big, jowly man glared at him. You told your savages to kill me if I opened my mouth. That's what I'll tell them. Tyrion, Lord Tywin said, you are to speak only when we call upon you. Take this for a warning. Tyrion subsided, seething. The Kettle Blacks came next, all three of them in turn. Osney and Osfrid told the tale of his supper with Cersei before the Battle of the Blackwater, and of the threats he'd made. "'He told her, Grace, that he meant to do her harm,' said Sir Osfrid, "'to hurt her,' his brother Osney elaborated. "'He said he would wait for a day when she was happy, and make her joy turn to ashes in her mouth.' Neither mentioned Alaya. Sir Osmond Kettleblack, a vision of chivalry in immaculate scale armor and white wool cloak, swore that King Joffrey had long known that his uncle Tyrion meant to murder him. "'It was the day they gave me the white cloak, my lords,' he told the judges. 
That brave boy said to me, Good Sir Osmond, guard me well, for my uncle loves me not. He means to be king in my place. That was more than Tyrion could stomach. Liar! He took two steps forward before the gold cloaks dragged him back. Lord Tywin frowned. Must we have you chained hand and foot like a common brigand? Tyrion gnashed his teeth. A second mistake. Fool, fool, fool of a dwarf. Keep your calm or you're doomed. No, I beg your pardons, my lords. His lies angered me. His truths, you mean, said Cersei. Father, I beg you to put him in fetters for your own protection. You see how he is. I see he's a dwarf, said Prince Oberyn. The day I fear a dwarf's wrath is the day I drown myself in a cask of red. We need no fetters. Lord Tywin glanced at the windows and rose. The hour grows late. We shall resume on the morrow. That night, alone in his tower cell, with a blank parchment and a cup of wine, Tyrion found himself thinking of his wife, not Sansa, his first wife, Tysha. The whore wife, not the wolf wife. Her love for him had been pretense, and yet he had believed and found joy in that belief. Give me sweet lies and keep your bitter truths. He drank his wine and thought of Shay. Later, when Sir Kevin paid his nightly visit, Tyrion asked for Varys. You believe the eunuch will speak in your defense? I won't know until I have talked with him. Send him here, uncle, if you would be so good. As you wish. Maesters Balabar and Franken opened the second day of trial. They had opened King Joffrey's noble corpse as well, they swore, and found no morsel of pigeon pie nor any other food lodged in the royal throat. It was poison that killed him, my lords said Balabar, as Franken nodded gravely. Then they brought forth Grand Maester Purcell, leaning heavily on a twisted cane and shaking as he walked, a few white hairs sprouting from his long chicken's neck. He had grown too frail to stand, so the judges permitted a chair to be brought in for him, and a table as well. On the table were laid a number of small jars. Purcell was pleased to put a name to each. "'Grey cup,' he said in a quavery voice, "'from the toadstool.' Nightshade, sweet sleep, demon's dance. This is blind eye. A widow's blood, this one is called, for the colour. A cruel potion. It shuts down a man's bladder and bowels until he drowns in his own poisons. This wolfsbane, here basilisk venom. And this one the tears of lease. Yes, I know them all. The imp Tyrion Lannister stole them from my chambers when he had me falsely imprisoned. Purcell, Tyrion called out, risking his father's wrath. Could any of these poisons choke off a man's breath? No. For that you must turn to a rarer poison. When I was a boy at the Citadel, my teachers named it simply the Strangler. But this rare poison was not found, was it? No, my lord, Purcell blinked at him. You used it all to kill the noblest child the gods ever put on this good earth. Tyrion's anger overwhelmed his sense. Joffrey was cruel and stupid, but I did not kill him. Have my head off if you like. I had no hand in my nephew's death. Silence, Lord Tywin said. I have told you thrice. The next time you shall be gagged and chained. After Purcell came the procession, endless and wearisome. Lords and ladies and noble knights, high-born and humble alike, they had all been present at the wedding feast, had all seen Joffrey choke, his face turning as black as a Dornish plum. Lord Redwine, Lord Seltigar, and Sir Flemont Brax had heard Tyrion threaten the king, two serving men, a juggler, Lord Giles, Sir Harbour Redwine, and Sir Philip Foote had observed him fill the wedding chalice. Lady Merriweather swore that she had seen the dwarf drop something into the king's wine while Joff and Margery were cutting the pie. Old Estermont, young Peckledon, the singer Galleon of Quay, and the squires Morris and Jothos Slint told how Tyrion had picked up the chalice as Joff was dying and poured out the last of the poisoned wine onto the floor. When did I make so many enemies? Lady Merriweather was all but a stranger. Tyrion wondered if she was blind or bought. At least Galleon of Quay had not set his account to music, or else there might have been seventy-seven bloody verses to it. 
When his uncle called that night after supper, his manner was cold and distant. He thinks I did it, too. Do you have witnesses for us? Sir Kevin asked him. Not as such, no, unless you found my wife. His uncle shook his head. It would seem the trial is going very badly for you. Oh, do you think so? I hadn't noticed. Tyrion fingered his scar. Varys has not come, nor will he. On the morrow he testifies against you. Lovely. I see. He shifted in his seat. I am curious. You are always a fair man, uncle. What convinced you? Why steal Purcell's poisons, if not to use them? Sir Kevin said bluntly. And Lady Merriweather saw nothing. There was nothing to see. But how do I prove that? How do I prove anything pinned up here? Perhaps the time has come for you to confess. Even through the thick stone walls of the Red Keep, Tyrion could hear the steady wash of rain. Say that again, uncle. I could swear you urged me to confess. If you were to admit your guilt before the throne and repent of your crime, your father would withhold the sword. You would be permitted to take the black. Tyrion laughed in his face. Those were the same terms Cersei offered Eddard Stark. We all know how that ended. Your father had no part in that. That much was true, at least. Castle Black teams with murderers, thieves, and rapists, Tyrion said. But I don't recall meeting many regicides while I was there. You expect me to believe that if I admit to being a kinslayer and kingslayer, my father will simply nod, forgive me, and pack me off to the wall with some warm woolen small clothes? He hooted rudely. Not was said of forgiveness, Sir Kevin said sternly. A confession would put this matter to rest. It is for that reason your father sends me with this offer. Thank him kindly for me, uncle, said Tyrion, but tell him I am not presently in a confessing mood. Were I you, I'd change my mood. Your sister wants your head, and Lord Tyrell, at least, is inclined to give it to her. So one of my judges has already condemned me, without hearing a word in my defense? It was no more than he expected. Will I still be allowed to speak and present witnesses? You have no witnesses, his uncle reminded him. Tyrion, if you are guilty of this enormity, the wall is a kinder fate than you deserve. And if you are blameless, there is fighting in the north, I know, but even so, it will be a safer place for you than King's Landing, whatever the outcome of this trial. The mob is convinced of your guilt. Were you so foolish as to venture out into the streets, they would tear you limb from limb. I can see how much that prospect upsets you. You are my brother's son. You might remind him of that. Do you think he would allow you to take the black if you were not his own blood and Joanna's? Tywin seems a hard man to you, I know, but he is no harder than he's had to be. Our own father was gentle and amiable, but so weak his bannermen mocked him in their cups. Some saw fit to defy him openly. Other lords borrowed our gold and never troubled to repay it. At court they japed of toothless lions. Even his mistress stole from him. A woman scarcely one step above a whore, and she helped herself to my mother's jewels. It fell to Tywin to restore House Lannister to its proper place, just as it fell to him to rule this realm when he was no more than twenty. He bore that heavy burden for twenty years, and all it earned him was a mad king's envy. Instead of the honor he deserved, he was made to suffer slights beyond count. Yet he gave the Seven Kingdoms peace, plenty, and justice. He is a just man. You would be wise to trust him. Tyrion blinked in astonishment. Sir Kevin had always been solid, stolid, pragmatic. He had never heard him speak with such fervor before. You love him. He is my brother. I... I will think on what you've said. Think carefully, then, and quickly. He thought of little else that night, but come morning was no closer to deciding if his father could be trusted. A servant brought him porridge and honey to break his fast, but all he could taste was bile at the thought of confession. They will call me Kinslayer till the end of my days. For a thousand years or more, if I am remembered at all, it will be as the monstrous dwarf who poisoned his young nephew at his wedding feast. The thought made him so bloody angry that he flung the bowl and spoon across the room and left a smear of porridge on the wall. 
Sir Adam Marbrand looked at it curiously when he came to escort Tyrion to trial, but had the good grace not to inquire. "'Lord Varys,' the herald said, "'Master of Whisperers!' Powdered, primped, and smelling of rosewater, the spider rubbed his hands one over the other all the time he spoke. "'Washing my life away,' Tyrion thought, as he listened to the eunuch's mournful account of how the imp had schemed to part Joffrey from the hound's protection, and spoken with Bran of the benefits of having Tommen as king. "'Half-truths are worth more than outright lies.' And unlike the others, Varys had documents, parchments painstakingly filled with notes, details, dates, whole conversations. So much material that its recitation took all day, and so much of it damning. Varys confirmed Tyrion's midnight visit to Grand Maester Purcell's chambers, and the theft of his poisons and potions, confirmed the threat he'd made to Cersei the night of their supper, confirmed every bloody thing but the poisoning itself. When Prince Oberyn asked him how he could possibly know all this, not having been present at any of these events, the eunuch only giggled and said, My little birds told me, knowing is their purpose and mine. How do I question a little bird? thought Tyrion. I should have had the eunuch's head off my first day in King's Landing. Damn him! And damn me for whatever trust I put in him. Have we heard it all? Lord Tywin asked his daughter as Varys left the hall. Almost, said Cersei. I beg your leave to bring one final witness before you on the morrow. As you wish, Lord Tywin said. Oh, good, thought Tyrion savagely. After this farce of a trial, execution will almost come as a relief. That night, as he sat by his window drinking, he heard voices outside his door. Sir Kevin, come for my answer, he thought at once, but it was not his uncle who entered. Tyrion rose to give Prince Oberyn a mocking bow. Are judges permitted to visit the accused? Princes are permitted to go where they will. Or so I told your guards. The Red Viper took a seat. My father will be displeased with you. The happiness of Tywin Lannister has never been high on my list of concerns. Is it Dornish wine you're drinking? From the arbor. Oberyn made a face. Red water. Did you poison him? No, did you? The prince smiled. Do all dwarfs have tongues like yours? Someone is going to cut it out one of these days. You are not the first to tell me that. Perhaps I should cut it out myself. It seems to make no end of trouble. So I have seen. I think I may drink some of Lord Redwine's grape juice after all. As you like. Tyrion served him a cup. The man took a sip, sloshed it about in his mouth, and swallowed. It will serve for the moment. I will send you up some strong Dornish wine on the morrow. He took another sip. I have turned up that golden-haired whore I was hoping for. So you found Chataias? At Chataias I bedded the black-skinned girl. Aleia, I believe she is called. Exquisite, despite the stripes on her back. But the whore I referred to is your sister. Has she seduced you yet? Tyrion asked, unsurprised. Oberyn laughed aloud. No, but she will, if I meet her prize. The queen has even hinted at marriage. Her grace needs another husband, and who better than a prince of dawn? Alaria believes I should accept. Just the thought of Cersei in our bed makes her wet, the randy wench. And we should not even need to pay the dwarf's penny. All your sister requires from me is one head, somewhat over large and missing a nose. And, said Tyrion, waiting. By way of answer, Prince Oberyn swirled his wine and said, When the young dragon conquered Dawn so long ago, he left the Lord of Highgarden to rule us after the submission of Sunspear. This Tyrell moved with his tail from keep to keep, chasing rebels and making certain that our knees stayed bent. He would arrive in force, take a castle for his own, stay a moon's turn, and ride on to the next castle. It was his custom to turn the lords out of their own chambers and take their beds for himself. One night he found himself beneath a heavy velvet canopy. A sash hung down near the pillows. Should he wish to summon a wench... 
He had a taste for Dornish women, this Lord Tyrrell, and who can blame him? So he pulled upon the sash, and when he did, a canopy above him split open, and a hundred red scorpions fell down upon his head. His death lit a fire that soon swept across Dorne, undoing all the young dragon's victories in a fortnight. The kneeling men stood up, and we were free again. "'I know the tale,' said Tyrion. "'What of it?' just this. If I should ever find a sash beside my own bed, and pull on it, I would sooner have the scorpions fall upon me than the queen in all her naked beauty. Tyrion grinned. We have that much in common, then. To be sure, I have much to thank your sister for. If not for her accusation at the feast, it might well be you judging me instead of me judging you. The prince's eyes were dark with amusement. Who knows more of poison than the Red Viper of Dawn, after all? Who has better reason to want to keep the Tyrells far from the crown? And with Joffrey in his grave, by Dornish law, the Iron Throne should pass next to his sister Myrcella, who, as it happens, is betrothed to mine own nephew, thanks to you. Dornish law does not apply. Tyrion had been so ensnared in his own troubles that he'd never stopped to consider the succession. "'My father will crown Tommen, count on that.' "'He may indeed crown Tommen, here in King's Landing. "'Which is not to say that my brother may not crown Marcella, down in Sunspear. "'Will your father make war on your niece on behalf of your nephew? "'Will your sister?' he gave a shrug. Perhaps I should marry Queen Cersei, after all, on the condition that she support her daughter over her son. Do you think she would? Never, Tyrion wanted to say, but the word caught in his throat. Cersei always resented being excluded from power on account of her sex. If Dornish law applied in the West, she would be the heir to Casterly Rock in her own right. She and Jaime were twins, but Cersei had come first into the world, and that was all it took. By championing Marcella's cause, she would be championing her own. "'I do not know how my sister would choose between Tommen and Marcella," he admitted. "'It makes no matter. My father will never give her that choice.' "'Your father,' said Prince Oberyn, "'may not live forever.' Something about the way he said it made the hairs on the back of Tyrion's neck bristle. Suddenly he was mindful of Elia again, and all that Oberyn had said as they crossed the field of ashes. He wants the head that spoke the words, not just the hand that swung the sword. It is not wise to speak such treasons in the Red Keep, my prince. The little birds are listening. Let them. Is it treason to say a man is mortal? Valar Morgullus was how they said it in Valyria of old. All men must die. And the doom came and proved it true. The Dornishmen went to the window to gaze out into the night. It is being said that you have no witnesses for us. I was hoping one look at this sweet face of mine would be enough to persuade you all of my innocence. You are mistaken, my lord. The fat flower of High Garden is quite convinced of your guilt, and determined to see you die. His precious Marguerite was drinking from that chalice, too, as he has reminded us half a hundred times. "'And you?' said Tyrion. "'Men are seldom as they appear. You look so very guilty that I am convinced of your innocence. Still, you will likely be condemned. Justice is in short supply this side of the mountains.' There has been none for Elia, Aegon, or Rhaenys. Why should there be any for you? Perhaps Joffrey's real killer was eaten by a bear. That seems to happen quite often in King's Landing. Oh, wait, the bear was at Harrenhal. Now I remember. Is that the game we are playing? Tyrion rubbed the discard nose. He had nothing to lose by telling Oberyn the truth. There was a bear at Harrenhal. And it did kill Sir Amory Lorch. How sad for him, said the Red Viper. And for you. Do all noseless men lie so badly, I wonder? I am not lying. Sir Amory dragged Princess Rhaenys out from under her father's bed and stabbed her to death. 
He had some men at arms with him, but I do not know their names. He leaned forward. It was Sir Gregor Clegane who smashed Prince Aegon's head against the wall and raped your sister Elia with his blood and brain still on his hands. What is this now? Truth? From a Lannister? Oberyn smiled coldly. Your father gave the commands, yes? No. He spoke the lie without hesitation, and never stopped to ask himself why he should. The Dornishman raised one thin black eyebrow. Such a dutiful son, and such a very feeble lie. It was Lord Tywin who presented my sister's children to King Robert, all wrapped up in crimson Lannister cloaks. Perhaps you ought to have this discussion with my father. He was there. I was at the rock, and still so young that I thought the thing between my legs was only good for pissing. Yes, but you are here now. And in some difficulty, I would say. Your innocence may be as plain as the scar on your face, but it will not save you. No more than your father will. The Dornish prince smiled. But I might. You? Tyrion studied him. You are one judge in three. How could you save me? Not as your judge. As your champion. Jamie. A white book sat on a white table in a white room. The room was round, its walls of white-washed stone hung with white woolen tapestries. It formed the first floor of White Sword Tower, a slender structure of four stories built into an angle of the castle wall overlooking the bay. The undercroft held arms and armor, the second and third floors, the small spare sleeping cells of the six brothers of the King's Guard. One of those cells had been his for eighteen years, but this morning he had moved his things to the topmost floor, which was given over entirely to the Lord Commander's apartments. Those rooms were spare as well, though spacious, and they were above the outer walls, which meant he would have a view of the sea. I will like that, he thought, the view and all the rest. As pale as the room, Jamie sat by the book in his King's Guard whites, waiting for his sworn brothers. A long sword hung from his hip, from the wrong hip. Before, he had always worn his sword on his left and drawn it across his body when he unsheathed. He had shifted it to his right hip this morning, so as to be able to draw it with his left hand in the same manner. But the weight of it felt strange there, and when he had tried to pull the blade from the scabbard, the whole motion seemed clumsy and unnatural. His clothing fit badly as well. He had donned the winter raiment of the King's Guard, a tunic and breeches of bleached white wool, and a heavy white cloak. But it all seemed to hang loose on him. Jamie had spent his days at his brother's trial, standing well to the back of the hall. Either Tyrion never saw him there, or he did not know him, but that was no surprise. Half the court no longer seemed to know him. I am a stranger in my own house. His son was dead, his father had disowned him, and his sister— she had not allowed him to be alone with her once, after that first day in the royal sept, where Joffrey lay amongst the candles. Even when they bore him across the city to his tomb in the great sept of Baelor, Circe kept a careful distance. He looked about the round room once more. White wool hangings covered the walls, and there was a white shield and two crossed longswords mounted above the hearth. The chair behind the table was old black oak with cushions of blanched cowhide, the leather worn thin, worn by the bony arse of Baristan the Bold, and Sir Gerald Hightower before him, by Prince Amon the Dragon Knight, Sir Ryan Redwine, and the Demon of Derry, by Sir Duncan the Tall, and the pale griffin Alan Connington. How could the Kingslayer belong in such exalted company? Yet... Here he was. The table itself was old weirwood, pale as bone, carved in the shape of a huge shield supported by three white stallions. By tradition, the Lord Commander sat at the top of the shield, and the brothers three to a side, on the rare occasions when all seven were assembled. The book that rested by his elbow was massive, two feet tall and a foot and a half wide, a thousand pages thick. Fine white vellum bound between covers of bleached white leather with gold hinges and fastenings. The Book of the Brothers was its formal name. 
but more often it was simply called the White Book. Within the White Book was the history of the King's Guard. Every knight who'd ever served had a page to record his name and deeds for all time. On the top left-hand corner of each page was drawn the shield the man had carried at the time he was chosen, inked in rich colors. Down in the bottom right corner was the shield of the King's Guard, snow white, empty, pure. The upper shields were all different. The lower shields were all the same. In the space between were written the facts of each man's life and service. The heraldic drawings and illuminations were done by septons sent from the great sept of Baylor three times a year, but it was the duty of the Lord Commander to keep the entries up to date. My duty now. Once he learned to write with his left hand, that is. The white book was well behind. The deaths of Sir Mandon Moore and Sir Preston Greenfield needed to be entered, and the brief bloody King's Guard service of Sandor Clegane as well. New pages must be started for Sir Balan Swan, Sir Osmond Kettleblack, and the Knight of Flowers. I will need to summon a septon to draw their shields. Sir Barristan Selmy had preceded Jamie as Lord Commander. A shield atop his page showed the arms of House Selmy, three stalks of wheat, yellow on a brown field. Jamie was amused, though unsurprised, to find that Sir Barristan had taken the time to record his own dismissal before leaving the castle. Sir Barristan of House Selmy, first-born son of Sir Lionel Selmy of Harvest Hall, served as squire to Sir Manfred Swan, named the Bold in his tenth year when he donned borrowed armor to appear as a mystery knight and attorney at Blackhaven, where he was defeated and unmasked by Duncan, Prince of Dragonflies, knighted in his sixteenth year by King Aegon V Targaryen, after performing great feats of prowess as a mystery knight in the winter tourney at King's Landing, defeating Prince Duncan the Small and Sir Duncan the Tall, Lord Commander of the King's Guard, slew Malus the Monstrous, last of the Blackfire pretenders, in single combat during the War of the Nine Penny Kings, defeated Lormel Longlance and Cedric Storm, the Bastard of Bronzegate, named to the King's Guard in his twenty-third year by Lord Commander Sir Gerald Hightower, defended the passage against all challengers in the tourney of the Silver Bridge, victor in the melee at Maidenpool, brought King Ares II to safety during the defiance of Duskendale, despite an arrow wound in the chest, avenged the murder of his sworn brother, Sir Gwain Gaunt, rescued Lady Jane Swan and her scepter from the Kingswood Brotherhood, defeating Simon Toyne and the Smiling Knight, and slaying the former. In the old town tourney defeated and unmasked the mystery knight Blackshield, revealing him as the Bastard of Uplands, sole champion of Lord Stephen's tourney at Storm's End. Whereat he unhorsed Lord Robert Baratheon, Prince Oberyn Martell, Lord Leighton Hightower, Lord John Cunnington, Lord Jason Malister, and Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. Wounded by arrow, spear, and sword at the Battle of the Trident, whilst fighting beside his sworn brothers and Rhaegar, Prince of Dragonstone. Pardoned, and named Lord Commander of the King's Guard by King Robert I Baratheon. Served in the honor guard that brought Lady Circe of House Lannister to King's Landing to wed King Robert. Led the attack on Old Wick during Balan Greyjoy's rebellion. Champion of the tourney at King's Landing in his fifty-seventh year dismissed from service by King Joffrey I Baratheon in his sixty-first year, for reasons of advanced age. The earlier part of Sir Baristan's storied career had been entered by Sir Gerald Hightower in a big, forceful hand. Selmy's own smaller and more elegant writing took over with the account of his wounding on the trident. Jamie's own page was scant by comparison. Sir Jamie of House Lannister first-born son of Lord Tywin and Lady Joanna of Casterly Rock, served against the Kingswood Brotherhood as squire to Lord Sumner Craighall, knighted in his fifteenth year by Sir Arthur Dane of the King's Guard for valour in the field, chosen for the King's Guard in his fifteenth year by King Ares II Targaryen. During the sack of King's Landing, slew King Ares II at the foot of the Iron Throne, thereafter known as the King Slayer pardoned for his crime by King Robert I Baratheon, 
served in the honor guard that brought his sister, the Lady Circe Lannister, to King's Landing to wed King Robert, champion in the tourney held at King's Landing on the occasion of their wedding. Summed up like that, his life seemed a rather scant and mingy thing. Sir Barristan could have recorded a few of his other tourney victories, at least, and Sir Gerald might have written a few more words about the deeds he'd performed when Sir Arthur Dane broke the Kingswood Brotherhood. He had saved Lord Sumner's life as Big Belly Ben was about to smash his head in, though the outlaw had escaped him, and he'd held his own against the Smiling Knight, though it was Sir Arthur who slew him. What a fight that was, and what a foe! The Smiling Knight was a madman, cruelty and chivalry all jumbled up together, but he did not know the meaning of fear. And Dane, with dawn in hand. The outlaw's long sword had so many notches by the end that Sir Arthur had stopped to let him fetch a new one. "'It's that white sword of yours I want,' the robber knight told him as they resumed, though he was bleeding from a dozen wounds by then. "'Then you shall have it, sir,' the sword of the morning replied, and made an end of it. "'The world was simpler in those days,' Jimmy thought, "'and men as well as swords were made of finer steel.' Or was it only that he had been fifteen? They were all in their graves now, the sword of the morning and the smiling night, the white bull and Prince Lewin. Sir Oswell went with his black humor, Ernest John Darry, Simon Toyne and his Kingswood Brotherhood, bluff old Sumner Craycall. And me, that boy I was, when did he die, I wonder? When I donned the white cloak? When I opened Ares's throat? That boy had wanted to be Sir Arthur Dane, but some place along the way he had become the Smiling Knight instead. When he heard the door open, he closed the white book and stood to receive his sworn brothers. Sir Osmond Kettleblack was the first to arrive. He gave Jamie a grin as if they were old brothers in arms. Sir Jamie, he said, had you looked like this to the knight, I'd have known you at once. Would you indeed? Jamie doubted that. The servants had bathed him, shaved him, and washed and brushed his hair. When he looked in a glass, he no longer saw the man who had crossed the riverlands with Brienne. But he did not see himself, either. His face was thin and hollow, and he had lines under his eyes. I look like some old man. Stand by your seat, sir. Kettleblack complied. The other sworn brothers filed in one by one. "'Sirs,' Jimmy said in a formal tone when all five had assembled, "'who guards the king?' "'My brothers, Sir Osney and Sir Osfred,' Sir Osman replied. "'And my brother, Sir Garland,' said the Knight of Flowers. "'Will they keep him safe?' "'They will, my lord.' "'Be seated, then.' The words were ritual. Before the seven could meet in session, the king's safety must be assured. Sir Boros and Sir Merin sat to his right, leaving an empty chair between them for Sir Aris Oakhart off in Dorne. Sir Osmond, Sir Balin, and Sir Loras took the seats to his left. The old and the new. Jemmy wondered if that meant anything. There had been times during its history where the King's Guard had been divided against itself, most notably and bitterly during the Dance of the Dragons. Was that something he needed to fear as well? It seemed queer to him to sit in the Lord Commander's seat where Barristan the Bold had sat for so many years. And even queerer, to sit here crippled. Nonetheless, it was his seat, and this was his King's Guard now. Tommins Seven. Jamie had served with Merrin Trant and Boris Blount for years. Adequate fighters, but Trant was sly and cruel, and Blount a bag of growly air. Sir Balin Swan was better suited to his cloak, and of course the Knight of Flowers was supposedly all a knight should be. The fifth man was a stranger to him, this Osmond Kettleblack. He wondered what Sir Arthur Dane would have to say of this lot. How is it that the King's Guard has fallen so low, most like? It was my doing, I would have to answer. I opened the door and did nothing when the vermin began to crawl inside. The king is dead, Jamie began. My sister's son, a boy of thirteen, murdered at his own wedding feast in his own hall. All five of you were present. 
All five of you were protecting him. And yet he's dead. He waited to see what they would say to that, but none of them so much as cleared a throat. The Terrell boy is angry, and Balan Swan's ashamed, he judged. From the other three, Jamie sensed only indifference. Did my brother do this thing? he asked them bluntly. Did Tyrion poison my nephew? Sir Balan shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Sir Boros made a fist. Sir Osmond gave a lazy shrug. It was Merrin Trant who finally answered. He filled Joffrey's cup with wine. That must have been when he slipped the poison in. You are certain it was the wine that was poisoned? What else? said Sir Boris Blount. The imp emptied the dregs on the floor. Why, but to spill the wine that might have proved him guilty? He knew the wine was poisoned, said Sir Merrin. Sir Balan Swan frowned. The imp was not alone on the dais. Far from it. That late in the feast we had people standing and moving about, changing places, slipping off to the privy. Servants were coming and going. The king and queen had just opened the wedding pie. Every eye was on them, or those thrice damned doves. No one was watching the wine cup. Who else was on the dais? asked Jamie. Sir Merrin answered. The king's family, the bride's family, Grand Maester Purcell, the High Septon. There's your poisoner, suggested Sir Oswald Kettleblack with a sly grin. Too holy by half, that old man. Never liked the look of him myself, he laughed. No, the Knight of Flowers said, unamused. Sansa Stark was the poisoner. You all forget my sister was drinking from that chalice as well. Sansa Stark was the only person in the hall who had reason to want Marguerite dead, as well as the king. By poisoning the wedding cup, she could hope to kill both of them. And why did she run afterward, unless she was guilty? The boy makes sense. Tyrion might yet be innocent. No one was any closer to finding the girl, however. Perhaps Jamie should look into that himself. For a start, it would be good to know how she had gotten out of the castle— Varys may have a notion or two about that. No one knew the Red Keep better than the eunuch. That could wait, however. Just now, Jamie had more immediate concerns. You say you are the Lord Commander of the King's Guard? His father had said, Go do your duty. These five were not the brothers he would have chosen, but they were the brothers he had. The time had come to take them in hand. Whoever did it, he told them, Joffrey is dead, and the Iron Throne belongs to Tommen now. I mean for him to sit on it until his hair turns white and his teeth fall out, and not from poison. Jamie turned to Sir Boris Blount. The man had grown stout in recent years, though he was big-boned enough to carry it. Sir Boris, you look like a man who enjoys his food. Henceforth you'll taste everything Tommen eats or drinks. Sir Osmond Kettleblack laughed aloud, and the Knight of Flowers smiled, but Sir Boris turned a deep beet red. I am no food taster! I am a knight of the king's guard. Sad to say, you are. Cersei should never have stripped the man of his white cloak, but their father had only compounded the shame by restoring it. My sister has told me how readily you yielded my nephew to Tyrion's sellswords. You will find carrots and peas less threatening, I hope. When your sworn brothers are training in the yard with sword and shield, you may train with spoon and trencher. Tommen loves apple cakes. Try not to let any sellswords make off with them. You speak to me thus? You? You should have died before you let Tommen be taken. As you died protecting Ares, sir? Sir Boris lurched to his feet and clasped the hilt of his sword. I won't... I won't suffer this. You should be the food taster, it seems to me. What else is a cripple good for? Jamie smiled. I agree. I am as unfit to guard the king as you are. So draw that sword you're fondling, and we shall see how your two hands fare against my one. At the end, one of us will be dead, and the king's guard will be improved. He rose. Or, if you prefer, you may return to your duties. Brah! Sir Boris hawked up a glob of green phlegm, spat it at Jamie's feet, and walked out, his sword still in its sheath. The man is craven, and a good thing. Though fat, aging, and never more than ordinary, Sir Boris could still have hacked him into bloody pieces. But Boris does not know that, 
and neither must the rest. They fear the man I was. The man I am, they'd pity. Jamie seated himself again and turned to Kettleblack. Sir Osmond, I do not know you. I find that curious. I've fought in tourneys, melees, and battles throughout the Seven Kingdoms. I know of every hedge knight, free rider, and up-jumped squire of any skill who has ever presumed to break a lance in the lists. So how is it that I have never heard of you, Sir Osmond? That I couldn't say, my lord. He had a great wide smile on his face, did Sir Osmond, as if he and Jamie were old comrades in arms playing some jolly little game. I'm a soldier, though, not no tourney knight. Where had you served before my sister found you? Here and there, my lord. I have been to Old Town in the south and Winterfell in the north. I have been to Lannisport in the west and King's Landing in the east. But I have never been to here, nor there. For want of a finger, Jamie pointed his stump at Sir Osmond's beak of a nose. I will ask once more, where have you served? In the Stepstones, some in the disputed lands. There's always fighting there. I rode with the gallant men. We fought for Lys, and some for Tyrosh. You fought for anyone who would pay you. How did you come by your knighthood? On a battlefield. Who knighted you? Sir Robert Stone. He's dead now, my lord. To be sure, Sir Robert Stone might have been some bastard from the Vale, he supposed, selling his sword in the disputed lands. On the other hand, he might be no more than a name Sir Osmond cobbled together from a dead king in a castle wall. What was Circe thinking when she gave this one a white cloak? At least Kettleblack would likely know how to use a sword and shield. Cell swords were seldom the most honorable of men, but they had to have a certain skill at arms to stay alive. Very well, sir, Jamie said. You may go. The man's grin returned. He left swaggering. Sir Merrin, Jamie smiled at the sour knight with the rust-red hair and the pouches under his eyes. I have heard it said that Joffrey made use of you to chastise Sansa Stark. He turned the white book around one-handed. Here, show me where it is in our vows that we swear to beat women and children. I did as his grace commanded me. We are sworn to obey. Henceforth you will temper that obedience. My sister is Queen Regent. My father is the King's Hand. I am Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Obey us. None other. Sir Merrin got a stubborn look on his face. Are you telling us not to obey the king? The king is eight. Our first duty is to protect him, which includes protecting him from himself. Use that ugly thing you keep inside your helm. If Tommen wants you to saddle his horse, obey him. If he tells you to kill his horse, come to me. I, as you command, my lord. Dismissed. As he left, Jamie turned to Sir Balan Swan. Sir Balan, I have watched you tilt many a time, and fought with and against you in melees. I'm told you proved your valor a hundred times over during the Battle of the Blackwater. The King's Guard is honored by your presence. The honor's mine, my lord. Sir Balan sounded wary. There's only one question I would put to you. You served us loyally, it's true. But Varys tells me that your brother rode with Renly and then Stannis, whilst your lord father chose not to call his banners at all, and remained behind the walls of Stonehelm all through the fighting. My father is an old man, my lord, well past forty. His fighting days are done. And your brother? Donal was wounded in the battle and yielded to Sir Elwood Hart. He was ransomed afterward and pledged his fealty to King Joffrey, as did many other captives. So he did said Jamie. Even so, Renly, Stannis, Joffrey, Tommen. How did he come to omit Balan Greyjoy and Rob Stark? He might have been the first knight in the realm to swear fealty to all six kings. Sir Balan's unease was plain. Donal heard, but he is Tommen's man now, you have my word. It's not Sir Donal the Constant who concerns me, it's you. Jamie leaned forward. What will you do if brave Sir Donal gives his sword to yet another usurper, and one day comes storming into the throne room, and there you stand, all in white, between your king and your blood? What will you do? I... My lord, that will never happen. 
It happened to me, Jamie said. Swan wiped his brow with the sleeve of his white tunic. You have no answer? My lord, Sir Balin drew himself up. On my sword, on my honor, on my father's name, I swear, I shall not do as you did. Jamie laughed. Good. Return to your duties, and tell Sir Donald to add a weather vane to his shield. And then he was alone with a knight of flowers. Slim as a sword, lithe and fit, Sir Loras Tyrell wore a snowy linen tunic and white wool breeches, with a gold belt around his waist and a gold rose, clasping his fine silk cloak. His hair was a soft brown tumble, and his eyes were brown as well, and bright with insolence. He thinks this is a tourney, and his tilt has just been called. Seventeen and a knight of the king's guard, said Jamie. You must be proud. Prince Amon the Dragon Knight was seventeen when he was named. Did you know that? Yes, my lord. And did you know that I was fifteen? That as well, my lord, he smiled. Jimmy hated that smile. I was better than you, Sir Loras. I was bigger, I was stronger, and I was quicker. And now you're older, the boy said, my lord. He had to laugh. This is too absurd. Tyrion would mock me unmercifully if he could hear me now, comparing cocks with this green boy. Older and wiser, sir, you should learn from me. As you learned from Sir Boris and Sir Merrin, that arrow hit too close to the mark. I learned from the white bull and Barristan the bold, Jamie snapped. I learned from Sir Arthur Dane, the sword of the morning, who could have slain all five of you with his left hand while he was taking a piss with the right. I learned from Prince Lewin of Dawn and Sir Oswald Wint and Sir Jonathan Derry. Good men, every one. Dead men, every one. He's me, Jamie realized suddenly. I am speaking to myself, as I was, all cocksure arrogance and empty chivalry. This is what it does to you, to be too good, too young. As in a sword fight, sometimes it is best to try a different stroke. It's said you fought magnificently in the battle, almost as well as Lord Renly's ghost beside you. A sworn brother has no secrets from his Lord Commander. Tell me, sir, who was wearing Renly's armor? For a moment, Loras Tyrell looked as though he might refuse, but in the end he remembered his vows. My brother, he said sullenly, Renly was taller than me and broader in the chest. His armor was too loose on me, but it suited Garland well. Was the masquerade your notion or his? Lord Littlefinger suggested it. He said it would frighten Stannis's ignorant men-at-arms. And so it did. And some knights and lordlings, too. Well, you gave the singer something to make rhymes about. I suppose that's not to be despised. What did you do with Renly? I buried him with mine own hands in a place he showed me once when I was a squire at Storm's End. No one shall ever find him there to disturb his rest. He looked at Jamie defiantly. I will defend King Tommen with all my strength, I swear it. I will give my life for his, if need be. But I will never betray Renly, by word or deed. He was the king that should have been. He was the best of them. The best dressed, perhaps, Jamie thought, but for once he did not say it. The arrogance had gone out of Sir Loras the moment he began to speak of Renly. He answered truly. He is proud and reckless and full of piss, but he is not false. Not yet. As you say, one more thing, and you may return to your duties. Yes, my lord. I still have Brienne of Tarth in a tower cell. The boy's mouth hardened. A black cell would be better. You are certain that's what she deserves? She deserves death! I told Renly that a woman had no place in the Rainbow Guard. She won the melee with a trick. I seem to recall another knight who was fond of tricks. He once rode a mare in heat against a foe mounted on a bad-tempered stallion. What sort of trickery did Brienne use? Sir Loras flushed. She leapt. It makes no matter. She won. I grant her that. His grace put a rainbow cloak around her shoulders, and she killed him, or let him die. A large difference there. The difference between my crime and the shame of Boris Blount. She had sworn to protect him, 
Sir Emon Qui, Sir Robar Royce, Sir Parmen Crane, they'd sworn as well. How could anyone have hurt him with her inside his tent and the others just outside, unless they were part of it? There were five of you at the wedding feast, Jimmy pointed out. How could Joffrey die, unless you were part of it? Sir Loras drew himself up stiffly. There was nothing we could have done. The wench says the same. She grieves for Renly as you do. I promise you I never grieve for Ares. Brienne's ugly and pighead stubborn, but she lacks the wits to be a liar, and she is loyal past the point of sense. She swore an oath to bring me to King's Landing, and here I sit. This hand I lost? Well, that was my doing as much as hers. Considering all she did to protect me, I have no doubt that she would have fought for Renly had there been a foe to fight. But a shadow? Jamie shook his head. Draw your sword, Sir Loras. Show me how you'd fight a shadow. I should like to see that. Sir Loras made no move to rise. She fled, he said. She and Caitlin Stark, they left him in his blood and ran. Why would they if it was not their work? He stared at the table. Renly gave me the van. Otherwise it would have been me helping him don his armor. He often entrusted that task to me. We had, we had prayed together that night. I left him with her. Sir Parmen and Sir Emon were guarding the tent, and Sir Robar Royce was there as well. Sir Emon swore Brienne had... Although... Yes, Jimmy prompted, sensing a doubt. The gorget was cut through. One clean stroke through a steel gorget. Renly's armor was the best, the finest steel. How could she do that? I tried myself, and it was not possible. She's freakish strong for a woman, but even the mountain would have needed a heavy axe. And why armor him and then cut his throat? He gave Jamie a confused look. If not her, though, how could it be a shadow? Ask her. Jamie came to a decision. Go to her cell. Ask your questions and hear her answers. If you are still convinced that she murdered Lord Renly, I will see that she answers for it. The choice will be yours. Accuse her or release her. All I ask is that you judge her fairly on your honor as a knight. Sir Laura stood. I shall. On my honor. We are done, then. The younger man started for the door, but there he turned back. Renly thought she was absurd. A woman dressed in man's mail pretending to be a knight? If he'd ever seen her in pink satin and mirish lace, he would not have complained. I asked him why he kept her close, if he thought her so grotesque. He said that all his other knights wanted things of him, castles or honors or riches, but all that Brienne wanted was to die for him. When I saw him all bloody, with her fled and the three of them unharmed, if she's innocent, then Robar and Emon— He could not seem to say the words. Jamie had not stopped to consider that aspect of it. I would have done the same, sir. The lie came easy, but Sir Laura seemed grateful for it. When he was gone, the Lord Commander sat alone in the white room, wondering. The Knight of Flowers had been so mad with grief for Enley that he had cut down two of his own sworn brothers, but it had never occurred to Jamie to do the same with the five who had failed to Joffrey. He was my son, my secret son. What am I if I do not lift the hand I have left to avenge mine own blood and seed? He ought to kill Sir Boris, at least, just to be rid of him. He looked at his stump and grimaced. I must do something about that. If the late Sir Jacelyn Bywater could wear an iron hand, he should have a gold one. Cersei might like that. A golden hand to stroke her golden hair and hold her hard against me. His hand could wait, though. There were other things to tend to first. There were other debts to pay. Sansa the ladder to the forecastle was steep and splintery, so Sansa accepted a hand up from Lothar Brune. Sir Lothar, she had to remind herself, the man had been knighted for his valor in the Battle of the Blackwater. Though no proper knight would wear those patched brown breeches and scuffed boots, nor that cracked and water-stained leather jerkin, 
a square-faced, stocky man with a squashed nose and a mat of nappy gray hair, Broom spoke seldom. He is stronger than he looks, though. She could tell by the ease with which he lifted her, as if she weighed nothing at all. Off the bow of the Merling King stretched a bare and stony strand, windswept, treeless, and uninviting. Even so, it made a welcome sight. They had been a long while clawing their way back on course. The last storm had swept them out of sight of land, and sent such waves crashing over the sides of the galley that Sansa had been certain they were all going to drown. Two men had been swept overboard, she had heard old Oswell saying, and another had fallen from the mast and broken his neck. She had seldom ventured out on deck herself. Her little cabin was dank and cold, but Sansa had been sick for most of the voyage, sick with terror, sick with fever, or seasick. She could keep nothing down, and even sleep came hard. Whenever she closed her eyes, she saw Joffrey tearing at his collar, clawing at the soft skin of his throat, dying with flakes of pie-crust on his lips and wine stains on his doublet. And the wind, keening in the lines, reminded her of the terrible thin sucking sound he'd made as he fought to draw in air. Sometimes she dreamed of Tyrion as well. He did nothing, she told Littlefinger once, when he paid a visit to her cabin to see if she were feeling any better. He did not kill Joffrey, true, but the dwarf's hands are far from clean. He had a wife before you, did you know that? He told me. And did he tell you that when he grew bored with her, he made a gift of her to his father's guardsmen? He might have done the same to you in time. Shed no tears for the imp, my lady. The wind ran salty fingers through her hair, and Sansa shivered. Even this close to shore, the rolling of the ship made her tummy queasy. She desperately needed a bath and a change of clothes. I must look as haggard as a corpse, and smell of vomit. Lord Peter came up beside her, cheerful as ever. Good morrow. The salt air is bracing, don't you think? It always sharpens my appetite. He put a sympathetic arm about her shoulders. Are you quite well? You look so pale. It's only my tummy, the seasickness. A little wine will be good for that. We'll get you a cup as soon as we're ashore. Peter pointed to where an old flint tower stood outlined against a bleak gray sky, the breakers crashing on the rocks beneath it. Cheerful, is it not? I fear there's no safe anchorage here. We'll put ashore in a boat. Here? She did not want to go ashore here. The fingers were a dismal place, she'd heard, and there was something forlorn and desolate about the little tower. Couldn't I stay on the ship until we make sail for White Harbor? From here the king turns east for Bravos, without us. My lord, you said, you said we were sailing home. And there it stands, miserable as it is, my ancestral home. It has no name, I fear. A great lord's seat ought to have a name, wouldn't you agree? Winterfell, the Airy, Liverun, those are castles. Lord of Harrenhal now, that has a sweet ring to it, but what was I before? Lord of Sheepshit and master of the Drearfort? It lacks a certain something. His grey-green eyes regarded her innocently. You look distraught. Did you think we were making for Winterfell, sweetling? Winterfell has been taken, burned, and sacked. All those you knew and loved are dead. What Northmen who have not fallen to the Iron Men are warring amongst themselves? Even the wall is under attack. Winterfell was the home of your childhood, Sansa. But you are no longer a child. You're a woman grown, and you need to make your own home. But not here, she said, dismayed. It looks so small and bleak and mean. It's all that, and less. The fingers are a lovely place if you happen to be a stone. But have no fear, we shan't stay more than a fortnight. I expect your aunt is already riding to meet us. He smiled. The Lady Lisa and I are to be wed. Wed? Sansa was stunned. You and my aunt? The Lord of Harrenhal and the Lady of the Airy. You said it was my mother you loved. But, of course, Lady Caitlin was dead, so even if she had loved Peter secretly and given him her maidenhood, it made no matter now. So silent, my lady, said Peter. I was certain you would wish to give me your blessing. It is a rare thing for a boy born heir to stones and sheep pellets to wed the daughter of Hoster Tully and the widow of John Arryn. 
I... I pray you will have long years together and many children and be very happy in one another. It had been years since Sansa last saw her mother's sister. She will be kind to me for my mother's sake, surely. She's my own blood. And the Vale of Arran was beautiful. All the songs said so. Perhaps it would not be so terrible to stay here for a time. Lothar and old Oswell rowed them ashore. Sansa huddled in the bow under her cloak, with a hood drawn up against the wind, wondering what awaited her. Servants emerged from the tower to meet them, a thin old woman and a fat middle-aged one, two ancient white-haired men, and a girl of two or three with a sty on one eye. When they recognized Lord Peter, they knelt on the rocks. "'My household,' he said. "'I don't know the child, another of Keller's bastards, I suppose. She pops one out every few years.' The two old men waded out up to their thighs to lift Sansa from the boat so she would not get her skirts wet. Oswell and Lothar splashed their way ashore, as did Littlefinger himself. He gave the old woman a kiss on the cheek and grinned at the younger one. "'Who fathered this one, Kella? The fat woman laughed. Oh, "'I can't rightly say, my lord. I'm not one for telling them no. "'And all the local lads are grateful, I am quite sure.' "'It is good to have you home, my lord.' said one old man. He looked to be at least eighty, but he wore a studded brigantine and a long sword at his side. How long will you be in residence? As short a time as possible, Brian, have no fear. Is the place habitable just now, would you say? If we knew you was coming, we would have laid down fresh rushes, my lord, said the crone. There's a dung fire burning. Nothing says home like the smell of burning dung, Peter turned to Sansa. Grizel was my wet nurse, but she keeps my castle now. Umfred's my steward, and Brian, didn't I name you captain of the guard the last time I was here? You did, my lord. You said you'd be getting some more men, too, but you never did. Me and the dogs stand all the watches. And very well, I'm sure. No one has made off with any of my rocks or sheep pellets, I see that plainly. Peter gestured toward the fat woman. Keller mines my vast herds. How many sheep do I have at present, Keller? She had to think a moment. Three and twenty, my lord. There was nine and twenty, but Brian's dogs killed one, and we butchered some others and salted down the meat. Ah, cold salt mutton. I must be home. When I break my fast on gull's eggs and seaweed soup, I'll be certain of it. If you like, my lord, said the old woman, Grizel. Lord Peter made a face. Come, let's see if my hall is as dreary as I recall. He led them up the strand over rocks slick with rotting seaweed. A handful of sheep were wandering about the base of the flint tower, grazing on the thin grass that grew between the sheepfold and thatched stable. Sansa had to step carefully. There were pellets everywhere. Within the tower seemed even smaller. An open stone stair wound round the inside wall from undercroft to roof. Each floor was but a single room. The servants lived and slept in the kitchen at ground level, sharing the space with a huge brindled mastiff and a half-dozen sheepdogs. Above that was a modest hall, and higher still the bedchamber. There were no windows, but arrow slits were embedded in the outer wall at intervals along the curve of the stair. Above the hearth hung a broken longsword and a battered oaken shield, its paint cracked and flaking. The device painted on the shield was one Sansa did not know— a grey stone head with fiery eyes upon a light green field. "'My grandfather's shield,' Peter explained when he saw her gazing at it. "'His own father was born in Bravos and came to the Vale as a sellsword on the hire of Lord Corbray. "'So my grandfather took the head of the Titan as his sigil when he was knighted.' "'It's very fierce,' said Sansa. "'Rather too fierce for an amiable fellow like me,' said Peter. I much prefer my mockingbird. Oswell made two more trips out to the Merling King to offload provisions. Among the loads he brought ashore were several casks of wine. Peter poured Sansa a cup, as promised. Here, my lady, that should help your tummy, I would hope. Having solid ground beneath her feet had helped already, but Sansa dutifully lifted the goblet with both hands and took a sip. The wine was very fine, an arbor vintage, she thought. It tasted of oak and fruit and hot summer nights, the flavors blossoming in her mouth like flowers opening to the sun. She only prayed that she could keep it down. 
Lord Peter was being so kind, she did not want to spoil it all by retching on him. He was studying her over his own goblet, his bright grey-green eyes full of... Was it amusement? Or something else? Sansa was not certain. Grizel, he called to the old woman. Bring some food up. Nothing too heavy. My lady has a tender tummy. Some fruit might serve, perhaps? Oswell's brought some oranges and pomegranates from the king. Yes, my lord. Might I have a hot bath as well? asked Sansa. I'll have Keller draw some water, my lady. Sansa took another sip of wine and tried to think of some polite conversation, but Lord Peter saved her the effort. When Grizel and the other servants had gone, he said, Elisa will not come alone. Before she arrives, we must be clear on who you are. Who I... I don't understand. Varus has informers everywhere. If Sansa Stark should be seen in the Vale, the eunuch will know within a moon's turn, and that would create unfortunate complications. It is not safe to be a Stark just now, so we shall tell Lisa's people that you are my natural daughter. Natural? Sansa was aghast. You mean a bastard? Well, you can scarcely be my true-born daughter. I've never taken a wife. That's well known. What should you be called? Uh, I could call myself after my mother. Caitlin? A bit too obvious. But after my mother, that would serve. Elaine, do you like it? Elaine is pretty. Sansa hoped she would remember. But couldn't I be the true-born daughter of some knight in your service? Perhaps he died gallantly in the battle, and— I have no gallant knights in my service, Elaine. Such a tale would draw unwanted questions as a corpse draws crows. It is rude to pry into the origins of a man's natural children, however. He cocked his head. So, who are you? Elaine Stone, would it be? When he nodded, she said, But who is my mother? Kella? Please, no, she said, mortified. I was teasing. Your mother was a gentlewoman of Bravos, daughter of a merchant prince. We met in Goldtown when I had charge of the port. She died giving you birth and entrusted you to the faith. I have some devotional books you can look over. Learn to quote from them. Nothing discourages unwanted questions as much as a flow of pious bleating. In any case, at your flowering, you decided you did not wish to be a scepter and wrote to me. That was the first I knew of your existence. He fingered his beard. Do you think you can remember all that? I hope. It would be like playing a game, won't it? Are you fond of games, Elaine? The new name would take some getting used to. Games? I I suppose it would depend. Grizel reappeared before he could say more, balancing a large platter. She set it down between them. There were apples and pears and pomegranates, some sad-looking grapes, a huge blood orange. The old woman had brought a round of bread as well, and a crock of butter. Peter cut a pomegranate in two with his dagger, offering half to Sansa. You should try and eat, my lady. Thank you, my lord. Pomegranate seeds were so messy, Sansa chose a pear instead and took a small delicate bite. It was very ripe. The juice ran down her chin. Lord Peter loosened the seed with the point of his dagger. You must miss your father terribly, I know. Lord Eddard was a brave man, honest and loyal, but quite a hopeless player. He brought the seed to his mouth with a knife. In King's Landing there are two sorts of people, the players and the pieces. And I was a piece? She dreaded the answer. Yes, but don't let that trouble you. You're still half a child. Every man's a piece to start with, and every maid as well. Even some who think they are players. He ate another seed. Circe, for one. She thinks herself sly, but in truth she is utterly predictable. Her strength rests on her beauty, birth, and riches. Only the first of those is truly her own, and it will soon desert her. I pity her then. She wants power, but has no notion what to do with it when she gets it. Everyone wants something, Elaine. And when you know what a man wants, you know who he is, and how to move him. As you moved Sir Dantas to poison Joffrey? 
It had to have been Dantos, she had concluded. Littlefinger laughed. Sir Dantos the Red was a skin of wine with legs. He could never have been trusted with a task of such enormity. He would have bungled it or betrayed me. Now, all Dantos had to do was lead you from the castle, and make certain you wore your silver hairnet. The Black Amethysts. But if not Dantos, who? Do you have other pieces? You could turn King's Landing upside down and not find a single man with a mockingbird sewn over his heart. But that does not mean I am friendless. Peter went to the steps. Oswell, come up here and let the Lady Sansa have a look at you. The old man appeared a few moments later, grinning and bowing. Sansa eyed him uncertainly. What am I supposed to see? Do you know him? asked Peter. No. Look closer. She studied the old man's lined, wind-burnt face, hook nose, white hair, and huge knuckly hands. There was something familiar about him, yet Sansa had to shake her head. I don't. I never saw Oswell before I got into his boat, I'm certain. Oswell grinned, showing a mouth of crooked teeth. No, but my lady might have met my three sons. It was the three sons, and that smile, too. Kettle black! Sansa's eyes went wide. You're a kettle black! Aye, my lady, as it please you. She's beside herself with joy. Lord Peter dismissed him with a wave and returned to the pomegranate again as Oswell shuffled down the steps. Tell me, Elaine, which is more dangerous, the dagger brandished by an enemy, or the hidden one pressed to your back by someone you never even see? The hidden dagger. There's a clever girl. He smiled, his thin lips bright red from the pomegranate seeds. When the imp sent off her guards, the queen had Sir Lancel hire sellswords for her. Lancel found her the cattle blacks, which delighted your little lord husband, since the lads were in his pay through his man Braun. He chuckled. But it was me who told Oswell to get his sons to King's Landing when I learned that Braun was looking for swords. Three hidden daggers, Elaine. Now perfectly placed. So one of the kettle blacks put the poison in Joff's cup? Sir Osmond had been near the king all night, he remembered. Did I say that? Lord Peter cut the blood orange in two with his dagger and offered half to Sansa. The lads are far too treacherous to be part of any such scheme, and Osmond has become especially unreliable since he joined the king's guard. That white cloak does things to a man, I find, even a man like him. He tilted his chin back and squeezed the blood orange, so the juice ran down into his mouth. I love the juice, but I loathe the sticky fingers, he complained, wiping his hands. Clean hands, Sansa. Whatever you do, make certain your hands are clean. Sansa spooned up some juice from her own orange. But if it wasn't the Kettle Blacks, and it wasn't Sir Dantos, you weren't even in the city, and it couldn't have been Tyrion. No more guesses, sweetling? She shook her head. I don't... Peter smiled. I will wager you that at some point during the evening someone told you that your hairnet was crooked and straightened it for you. Sansa raised a hand to her mouth. You cannot mean... She wanted to take me to Highgarden to marry me to her grandson, gentle, pious, good-hearted Willis Tyrell. Be grateful you were spared. He would have bored you spitless. The old woman is not boring, though. I'll grant her that. A fearsome old harridan, and not near as frail as she pretends. When I came to Highgarden to dicker for Marguerite's hand, she let her lord's son bluster while she asked pointed questions about Joffrey's nature. I praised him to the skies, to be sure, whilst my men spread disturbing tales amongst Lord Tyrell's servants. That is how the game is played. I also planted the notion of Sir Loras taking the white. Not that I suggested it. That would have been too crude. 
But men in my party supplied grisly tales about how the mob had killed Sir Preston Greenfield and raped the Lady Lollis, and slipped a few silvers to Lord Tyrrell's army of singers to sing of Ryan Redwine, Serwyn of the Mirror Shield, and Prince Amon the Dragon Knight. A harp can be as dangerous as a sword in the right hands. Mace Tyrrell actually thought it was his own idea to make Sir Loras's inclusion in the King's Guard part of the marriage contract. Who better to protect his daughter than her splendid knightly brother? And it relieved him of the difficult task of trying to find lands and a bride for a third son, never easy, and doubly difficult in Sir Loras's case. Be that as it may, Lady Olenna was not about to let Joff harm her precious darling granddaughter. But unlike her son, she also realized that under all his flowers and finery, Sir Loras is as hot-tempered as Jamie Lannister. Toss Joffrey, Marguerite, and Loras in a pot, and you've got the makings for Kingslayer stew. The old woman understood something else as well. Her son was determined to make Marguerite a queen, and for that he needed a king. But he did not need Joffrey. We shall have another wedding soon. Wait and see. Marguerite will marry Tommen. She'll keep her queenly crown and her maidenhead, neither of which she especially wants, but what does that matter? The great Western alliance will be preserved. For a time, at least. Marguerite and Tommen. Sansa did not know what to say. She had liked Marguerite Tyrell and her small, sharp grandmother as well. She thought wistfully of High Garden, with its courtyards and musicians and the pleasure barges on the Mander. A far cry from this bleak shore. At least I am safe here. Joffrey is dead. He cannot hurt me any more. And I am only a bastard girl now. Elaine Stone has no husband and no claim. And her aunt would soon be here as well. The long nightmare of King's Landing was behind her, and her mockery of a marriage as well. She could make herself a new home here, just as Peter said. It was eight long days until Lisa Arryn arrived. On five of them it rained, while Sansa sat bored and restless by the fire beside the old blind dog. He was too sick and toothless to walk a guard with Brian any more, and mostly all he did was sleep. But when she patted him he whined and licked her hand, and after that they were fast friends. When the rains let up, Peter walked with her around his holdings, which took less than half a day. He owned a lot of rocks, just as he had said. There was one place where the tide came jetting up out of a blowhole to shoot thirty feet into the air, and another where someone had chiseled the seven-pointed star of the new gods upon a boulder. Peter said that marked one of the places the Andals had landed, when they came across the sea to wrest the veil from the first men. Farther inland, a dozen families lived in huts of piled stone beside a peat bog. Mine own small folk, Peter said, though only the oldest seemed to know him. There was a hermit's cave on his land as well, but no hermit. He's dead now, but when I was a boy my father took me to see him. The man had not washed in forty years, so you can imagine how he smelled, but supposedly he had the gift of prophecy. He groped me a bit and said I would be a great man, and for that my father gave him a skin of wine. Peter snorted. I would have told him the same thing for half a cup. Finally, on a grey, windy afternoon, Brian came running back to the tower with his dogs barking at his heels to announce that riders were approaching from the southwest. Lisa, Lord Peter said, come, Elaine, let us greet her. They put on their cloaks and waited outside. The riders numbered no more than a score, a very modest escort for the Lady of the Airy. Three maids rode with her, and a dozen household knights in mail and plate. She brought a septon as well, and a handsome singer with a wisp of a moustache and long sandy curls. Could that be my aunt? Lady Lisa was two years younger than mother, but this woman looked ten years older. Thick auburn tresses fell down past her waist, but beneath the costly velvet gown and jeweled bodice her body sagged and bulged. Her face was pink and painted, her breasts heavy, her limbs thick. She was taller than Littlefinger and heavier, nor did she show any grace in the clumsy way she climbed down off her horse. Peter knelt to kiss her fingers. The king's small council commanded me to woo and win you, my lady. 
Do you think you might have me for your lord and husband? Lady Lisa pooched her lips and pulled him up to plant a kiss upon his cheek. Oh, mayhaps I could be persuaded, she giggled. Have you brought gifts to melt my heart? The king's peace. Oh, pooh, to the peace. What else have you brought me? My daughter. Littlefinger beckoned Sansa forward with a hand. My lady, allow me to present you Elaine Stone. Lisa Arryn did not seem greatly pleased to see her. Sansa did a deep curtsy, her head bowed. A bastard, she heard her aunt say. Peter, have you been wicked? Who was her mother? The wench is dead. I had hoped to take Elaine to the Airy. What am I to do with her there? I have a few notions, said Lord Peter, but just now I am more interested in what I might do with you, my lady. All the sternness melted off her aunt's round pink face, and for a moment Sansa thought Lisa Arryn was about to cry. Sweet Peter, I have missed you so. You don't know, you can't know. Yon Royce has been stirring up all sorts of trouble, demanding that I call my banners and go to war. And the others all swarm around me, Hunter and Corbray and that dreadful Nestor Royce, all wanting to wed me and take my son to ward, but none of them truly love me. Only you, Peter. I have dreamed of you so long. And I of you, my lady. He slid an arm around behind her and kissed her on the neck. How soon can we be wed? Now, said Lady Lisa, sighing, I have brought my own septon and a singer and mead for the wedding feast. Here? That did not please him. I'd sooner wed you at the airy with your whole court in attendance. Pooh to my court! I have waited so long I could not bear to wait another moment. She put her arms around him. I want to share your bed tonight, my sweet. I want us to make another child, a brother for Robert or a sweet little daughter. I dream of that as well, sweetling. Yet there is much to be gained from a great public wedding with all the veil. No! She stamped a foot. I want you now, this very night. And I must warn you, after all these years of silence and whisperings, I mean to scream when you love me. I am going to scream so loud they'll hear me in the airy. Perhaps I could bed you now and wed you later. The Lady Lisa giggled like a girl. Oh, Peter Baelish, you are so wicked. No, I say no. I am the Lady of the Airy, and I command you to wed me this very moment. Peter gave a shrug. As my lady commands, then, I am helpless before you as ever. They said their vows within the hour, standing beneath a sky-blue canopy as the sun sank in the west. Afterward, trestle tables were set up beneath a small flint tower, and they feasted on quail, venison, and roast boar, washing it down with a fine light mead. Torches were lit as dusk crept in. Lisa's singer played The Vow Unspoken, and Seasons of My Love, and Two Hearts That Beat as One. Several younger knights even asked Sansa to dance. Her aunt danced as well, her skirts whirling when Peter spun her in his arms. Mead and marriage had taken years off Lady Lisa. She laughed at everything so long as she held her husband's hand, and her eyes seemed to glow whenever she looked at him. When it was time for the bedding, her knights carried her up to the tower, stripping her as they went and shouting bawdy jests. Tyrion spared me that, Sansa remembered. It would not have been so bad being undressed for a man she loved, by friends who loved them both. By Joffrey, though. She shuddered. Her aunt had brought only three ladies with her, so they pressed Sansa to help them undress Lord Peter and march him up to his marriage bed. He submitted with good grace and a wicked tongue, giving as good as he got. By the time they had gotten him into the tower and out of his clothes, the other women were flushed, with laces unlaced, kirtles crooked, and skirts in disarray. But Littlefinger only smiled at Sansa as they marched him up to the bedchamber where his lady wife was waiting. Lady Lisa and Lord Peter had the third-story bedchamber to themselves, but the tower was small, and, true to her word, her aunt screamed. It had begun to rain outside, driving the feasters into the hall one floor below, so they heard most every word. "'Peter!' her aunt moaned. "'Oh, Peter, Peter, sweet Peter! Oh, oh! There, Peter, there! That's where you belong!' Lady Lisa's singer launched into a bawdy version of Milady's Supper, but even his singing and playing could not drown out Lisa's cries. "'Make me a baby, Peter!' 
she screamed. Make me another sweet little baby. Oh, Peter, my precious, my precious, Peter! Her last shriek was so loud that it set the dogs to barking, and two of her aunt's ladies could scarce contain their mirth. Sansa went down the steps and out into the night. A light rain was falling on the remains of the feast, but the air smelled fresh and clean. The memory of her own wedding night with Tyrion was much with her. In the dark, I am the night of flowers, he had said. I could be good to you. But that was only another Lannister lie. A dog can smell a lie, you know, the hound had told her once. She could almost hear the rough rasp of his voice. Look around you and take a good whiff. They're all liars here, and every one better than you. She wondered what had become of Sandor Clegane. Did he know that they'd killed a Joffrey? Would he care? He had been the prince's sworn shield for years. She stayed outside for a long time. When at last she sought her own bed, wet and chilled, only the dim glow of a peat fire lit the darkened hall. There was no sound from above. The young singer sat in a corner, playing a slow song to himself. One of her aunt's maids was kissing a knight in Lord Peter's chair, their hands busy beneath each other's clothing. Several men had drunk themselves to sleep, and one was in the privy, being noisily sick. Sansa found Brian's old blind dog in her little alcove beneath the steps and lay down next to him. He woke and licked her face. "'You sad old hound,' she said, ruffling his fur. "'Elaine!' her aunt Singer stood over her. "'Sweet Elaine, I am Marillion. I saw you come in from the rain. The night is chill and wet. Let me warm you.' The old dog raised his head and growled, but the singer gave him a cuff and sent him slinking off, whimpering. Marillion, she said, uncertain, you are kind to think of me, but pray forgive me, I am very tired. And very beautiful. All night I have been making songs for you in my head, a lay for your eyes, a ballad for your lips, a duet to your breasts. I will not sing them, though. They were poor things, unworthy of such beauty. He sat on her bed and put his hand on her leg. Let me sing to you with my body instead. She caught a whiff of his breath. You're drunk. I never get drunk. Mead only makes me merry. I am on fire. His hand slipped up to her thigh. And you as well. Unhand me. You forget yourself. Mercy. I have been singing love songs for hours. My blood is stirred. And yours, I know, there's no wench half so lusty as one bastard-born. Are you wet for me? I'm a maiden, she protested. Truly. Oh, Elaine, Elaine, my fair maid, give me the gift of your innocence. You will thank the gods you did. I'll have you singing louder than the Lady Lisa. Sansa jerked away from him, frightened. If you don't leave me, my, uh, my father will hang you. Lord Peter, little finger. He chuckled. Lady Lisa loves me well, and I am Lord Robert's favorite. If your father offends me, I will destroy him with a verse. He put a hand on her breast and squeezed. Let's get you out of these wet clothes. You wouldn't want them ripped, I know. Come, sweet lady, heed your heart. Sansa heard the soft sound of steel and leather. Singer, a rough voice said, best go if you want to sing again. The light was dim, but she saw a faint glimmer of a blade. The singer saw it, too. Find your own wench! The knife flashed, and he cried out, You cut me! I'll do worse if you don't go. And, quick as that, Marillion was gone. The other remained, looming over Sansa in the darkness. Lord Peter said, Watch out for you. It was Lothar Brune's voice, she realized. Not the hounds, no. How could it be? Of course it had to be Lothar. That night... Sansa scarcely slept at all, but tossed and turned, just as she had aboard the Merling King. She dreamt of Joffrey dying, but as he clawed at his throat and the blood ran down across his fingers, she saw with horror that it was her brother Rob. And she dreamed of her wedding night, too, of Tyrion's eyes devouring her as she undressed. Only then he was bigger than Tyrion had any right to be, and when he climbed into the bed his face was scarred only on one side. I'll have a song from you, he rasped, and Sansa woke and found the old blind dog beside her once again. I wish that you were lady, she said. 
Come the morning, Grizel climbed up to the bedchamber to serve the lord and lady a tray of morning bread with butter, honey, fruit, and cream. She returned to say that Elaine was wanted. Sansa was still drowsy from sleep. It took her a moment to remember that she was Elaine. Lady Lisa was still abed, but Lord Peter was up and dressed. Your aunt wishes to speak with you, he told Sansa as he pulled on a boot. I have told her who you are. Gods be good. I, I thank you, my lord. Peter yanked on the other boot. I've had about as much home as I can stomach. We'll leave for the airy this afternoon. He kissed his lady wife and licked a smear of honey off her lips, then headed down the steps. Sansa stood by the foot of the bed while her aunt ate a pear and studied her. I see it now, the lady Lisa said as she set the core aside. You look so much like Caitlin. It's kind of you to say so. It was not meant as flattery. If truth be told, you look too much like Caitlin. Something must be done. We shall darken your hair before we bring you back to the airy, I think. Darken my hair? If it please you, Aunt Lisa. You must not call me that. No word of your presence here must be allowed to reach King's Landing. I do not mean to have my son endangered. She nibbled the corner of a honeycomb. I have kept the veil out of this war. Our harvest has been plentiful, the mountains protect us, and the airy is impregnable. Even so, it would not do to draw Lord Tywin's wrath down upon us. Lisa set the comb down and licked honey from her fingers. You were wed to Tyrion Lannister, Peter says, that vile dwarf. They made me marry him. I never wanted it. No more than I did, her aunt said. John Arryn was no dwarf, but he was old. You may not think so to see me now, but on the day we wed I was so lovely I put your mother to shame. But all John desired was my father's swords to aid his darling boys. I should have refused him. But he was such an old man, how long could he live? Half his teeth were gone, and his breath smelled like bad cheese. I cannot abide a man with foul breath. Peter's breath is always fresh. He was the first man I ever kissed, you know. My father said he was too low-born, but I knew how high he'd rise. John gave him the customs for Goldtown to please me, but when he increased the incomes tenfold, my lord husband saw how clever he was and gave him other appointments, even brought him to King's Landing to be master of coin. That was hard, to see him every day and still be wed to that old, cold man. John did his duty in the bedchamber, but he could no more give me pleasure than he could give me children. His seed was old and weak. All my babies died but Robert, three girls and two boys. All my sweet little babies dead, and that old man just went on and on with a stinking breath. So you see, I have suffered too. Lady Lisa sniffed. You do know that your poor mother is dead. Tyrion told me, said Sansa. He said the phrase murdered her at the twins with Rob. Tears welled suddenly in Lady Lisa's eyes. We are women alone now, you and I. Are you afraid, child? Be brave. I would never turn away Cat's daughter. We are bound by blood. She beckoned Sansa closer. You may come kiss my cheek, Elaine. Dutifully she approached and knelt beside the bed. Her aunt was drenched in sweet scent, though under that was a sour, milky smell. Her cheek tasted of paint and powder. As Sansa stepped back, Lady Lisa caught her wrist. Now tell me, she said sharply, are you with child? The truth now, I will know if you lie. No, she said, startled by the question. You are a woman flowered, are you not? Yes. Sansa knew the truth of her flowering could not be long hidden in the airy. Tyrion didn't... he never... She could feel the blush creeping up her cheeks. I am still a maid. Was the dwarf incapable? No, he was only... he was... kind? She could not say that, not here, not to this aunt who hated him so. He... he had whores, my lady, he told me so. Whores? Lisa released her wrist. Of course he did. What woman would bed such a creature but for gold? I should have killed the imp when he was in my power, but he tricked me. He is full of low cunning, that one. 
His sellsword slew my good Sir Vardis Egan. Caitlin should not have brought him here. I told her that. She made off with our uncle, too. That was wrong of her. The blackfish was my knight of the gate. And since he left us, the mountain clans are growing very bold. Peter will soon set all that to rights, though. I shall make him Lord Protector of the Vale. Her aunt smiled for the first time, almost warmly. He may not look as tall or strong as some, but he is worth more than all of them. Trust in him, and do as he says. I shall uh, my lady. Lady Lisa seemed pleased by that. I knew that boy Joffrey. He used to call my Robert cruel names, and once he slapped him with a wooden sword. A man will tell you poison is dishonorable, but a woman's honor is different. The mother shaped us to protect our children, and our only dishonor is in failure. You'll know that when you have a child. A child? said Sansa uncertainly. Lisa waved a hand negligently. Not for many years. You are too young to be a mother. One day you shall want children, though, just as you will want to marry. I, I am married, my lady. Yes, but soon a widow. Be glad the imp preferred his whores. It would not be fitting for my son to take that dwarf's leavings, but as he never touched you. How would you like to marry your cousin, the Lord Robert? The thought made Sansa weary. All she knew of Robert Arryn was that he was a little boy and sickly. It is not me she wants her son to marry. It is my claim. No one will ever marry me for love. But lying came easy to her now. I can scarcely wait to meet him, my lady. But he is still a child, is he not? He is eight, and not robust. But such a good boy, so bright and clever. He will be a great man, Elaine. The seed is strong, my lord husband said before he died, his last words. The gods sometimes let us glimpse the future as we lay dying. I see no reason why you should not be wed as soon as we know that your Lannister husband is dead. A secret wedding, to be sure. The lord of the Airy could scarcely be thought to have married a bastard. That would not be fitting. The ravens should bring us the word from King's Landing once the imp's head rolls. You and Robert can be wed the next day. Won't that be joyous? It will be good for him to have a little companion. He played with Vardis Egan's boy when we first returned to the Airy, and my steward's sons as well, but they were much too rough, and I had no choice but to send them away. Do you read well, Elaine? Septa Mordain was good enough to say so. Robert has weak eyes, but he loves to be read too, Lady Lisa confided. He likes stories about animals the best. Do you know the little song about the chicken who dressed as a fox? I sing him that all the time. He never grows tired of it. And he likes to play hop-frog and spin the sword and come into my castle. But you must always let him win. That's only proper, don't you think? He is the lord of the airy, after all. You must never forget that. You are well born, and the Starks of Winterfell were always proud. But Winterfell has fallen, and you are really just a beggar now. So put that pride aside. Gratitude will better become you in your present circumstances. Yes, and obedience. My son will have a grateful and obedient wife. John. Day and night the axes rang. John could not remember the last time he had slept. When he closed his eyes, he dreamed of fighting. When he woke, he fought. Even in the King's Tower he could hear the ceaseless thunk of bronze and flint and stolen steel biting into wood, and it was louder when he tried to rest in the warming shed atop the wall. Mance had sledgehammers at work as well, and long saws with teeth of bone and flint. Once, as he was drifting off into an exhausted sleep, there came a great cracking from the haunted forest, and a sentinel tree came crashing down and a cloud of dirty needles. He was awake when Owen came to him, lying restless under a pile of furs on the floor of the warming shed. "'Lord Snow,' said Owen, shaking his shoulder, "'the dawn!' He gave John a hand to help pull him back onto his feet. Others were waking as well, jostling one another as they pulled on their boots and buckled their sword belts in the close confines of the shed. No one spoke. They were all too tired for talk. Few of them ever left the wall these days.' 
It took too long to ride up and down in the cage. Castle Black had been abandoned to Maester Amon, Sir Winton Stout, and a few others too old or ill to fight. "'I had a dream that the king had come,' Owen said happily. "'Maester Amon sent a raven, and King Robert came with all his strength. I dreamed I saw his golden banners.' John made himself smile. "'That would be a welcome sight to see, Owen.' Ignoring the twinge of pain in his leg, he swept a black fur cloak about his shoulders, gathered up his crutch, and went out onto the wall to face another day. A gust of wind sent icy tendrils winding through his long brown hair. Half a mile north, the wildling encampments were stirring, their campfires sending up smoky fingers to scratch against the pale dawn sky. Along the edge of the forest they had raised their tents of hide and fur, even a crude long haul of logs and woven branches. There were horse lines to the east, mammoths to the west, and men everywhere, sharpening their swords, putting points on crude spears, donning makeshift armor of hide and horn and bone. For every man that he could see, John knew there were a score unseen in the wood. The brush gave them some shelter from the elements, and hid them from the eyes of the hated crows. Already their archers were stealing forward, pushing their rolling mantlets. "'Here come our breakfast arrows,' Pip announced cheerfully as he did every morning. It's good that he can make a jape of it, John thought. Someone has to. Three days ago, one of those breakfast arrows had caught Red Allen of the Rosewood in the leg. You could still see his body at the foot of the wall, if you cared to lean out far enough. John had to think that it was better for them to smile at Pip's jest than to brood over Allen's corpse. The mantlets were slanting wooden shields, wide enough for five of the free folk to hide behind, the archers pushed them close, then knelt behind them to loose their arrows through slits in the wood. The first time the wildlings rolled them out, John had called for fire arrows and set a half dozen ablaze, but after that Mance started covering them with raw hides. All the fire arrows in the world couldn't make them catch now. The brothers had even started wagering as to which of the straw sentinels would collect the most arrows before they were done. Dolores Ed was leading with four, but Othold Yarwick, Tumber John, and Watt of Long Lake had three apiece. It was Pip who'd started naming the scarecrows after their missing brothers, too. It makes it seem as if there's more of us, he said. More of us with arrows in our bellies, Gren complained, but the custom did seem to give his brother's heart, so John let the name stand and the wagering continue. On the edge of a wall, an ornate, brass, mirish eye stood on three spindly legs. Maester Amon had once used it to peer at the stars before his own eyes had failed him. John swung the tube down to have a look at the foe. Even at this distance there was no mistaking Mance Raider's huge white tent, sewn together from the pelts of snow bears. The mirish lenses brought the wildlings close enough for him to make out faces. Of Mance himself he saw no sign this morning, but his woman, Dalla, was outside tending the fire, while her sister, Val, milked the she-goat beside the tent. Dalla looked so big it was a wonder she could move. A child must be coming very soon, John thought. He swiveled the eye east and searched amongst the tents and trees till he found the turtle. That will be coming very soon as well. The wildlings had skinned one of the dead mammoths during the night, and they were lashing the raw bloody hide over the turtle's roof. One more layer on top of the sheepskins and pelts. The turtle had a rounded top and eight huge wheels, and under the hides was a stout wooden frame. When the wildlings had begun knocking it together, Satin thought they were building a ship. Not far wrong. The turtle was a hull turned upside down and opened for an aft, a long haul on wheels. "'It's done, isn't it?' asked Gren. "'Near enough.' John shoved away the eye. It will come today, most like. Did you fill the barrels? Every one. They froze hard during the night. Pip checked. Gren had changed a great deal from the big, clumsy, red-necked boy John had first befriended. He had grown half a foot, his chest and shoulders had thickened, and he had not cut his hair nor trimmed his beard since the fist of the first men. It made him look as huge and shaggy as an aurochs, the mocking name that Sir Alistair Thorne had hung on him during training. He looked weary now, though. When John said as much, she nodded. I heard their axes all night. Couldn't sleep for all the chopping. Then go sleep now. I don't need... You do. I want you rested. Go on. I'm not going to let you sleep through the fight. He made himself smile. You're the only one who can move those bloody barrels. 
Gren went off muttering, and John returned to the far eye, searching the wildling camp. From time to time an arrow would sail past overhead, but he had learned to ignore those. The range was long and the angle was bad. The chances of being hit were small. He still saw no sign of Mance Raider in the camp, but he spied Tormund Giantsbane and two of his sons around the turtle. The sons were struggling with a mammoth hide while Tormund gnawed on the roast leg of a goat and bellowed orders. Elsewhere he found the wildling skin-changer, Varamir Sixskins, walking through the trees with his shadow-cat dogging his heels. When he heard the rattle of the winch chains and the iron groan of the cage door opening, he knew it would be Hob bringing their breakfast, as he did every morning. The sight of Mance's turtle had robbed John of his appetite. Their oil was all but gone, and the last barrel of pitch had been rolled off the wall two nights ago. They would soon run short of arrows as well, and there were no Fletchers making more. And the night before last a raven had come from the west, from Sir Dennis Malister. Bowen Marsh had chased the wildlings all the way to the Shadow Tower, it seemed, and then farther, down into the gloom of the gorge. At the Bridge of Skulls he had met the Weeper and three hundred wildlings, and won a bloody battle. But the victory had been a costly one. More than a hundred brothers slain, among them Sir Andrew Tarth and Sir Alladale Winch. The old pomegranate himself had been carried back to the Shadow Tower sorely wounded. Maester Mullen was tending him, but it would be some time before he was fit to return to Castle Black. When he had read that, John had dispatched Zai to Molestown on their best horse to plead with the villagers to help man the wall. She never returned. When he sent Molly after her, he came back to report the whole village deserted, even the brothel. Most likely Zai had followed them straight down the King's Road. Maybe we should all do the same, John reflected glumly. He made himself eat, hungry or no. Bad enough he could not sleep. He could not go on without food as well. Besides, this might be my last meal. It might be the last meal for all of us. So it was that John had a belly full of bread, bacon, onions, and cheese when he heard a horse shout, It's coming! No one needed to ask what it was. Nor did John need the maester's mirish eye to see it creeping out from amongst the tents and trees. It doesn't really look much like a turtle, Satin commented. Turtles don't have fur. Most of them don't have wheels, either, said Pip. Sound the war horn, John commanded, and Keggs blew two long blasts to wake Gren and the other sleepers who'd had the watch during the night. If the wildlings were coming, the wall would need every man. Gods know we have few enough. John looked at Pip and Keggs and Satin, Horse and Owen the Oaf, Tim Tangletongue, Mully, Spareboot, and the rest, and tried to imagine them going belly to belly and blade to blade against a hundred screaming wildlings in the freezing darkness of that tunnel, with only a few iron bars between them. That was what it would come down to, unless they could stop the turtle before the gate was breached. It's big, Horse said. Pip smacked his lips. Think of all the soup it will make. The jape was stillborn. Even Pip sounded tired. He looks half dead, thought John, but so do we all. The king beyond the wall had so many men that he could throw fresh attackers at them every time, but the same handful of black brothers had to meet every assault, and it had worn them ragged. The men beneath the wood and hides would be pulling hard, John knew, putting their shoulders into it, straining to keep the wheels turning, but once the turtle was flush against the gate they would exchange their ropes for axes. At least Mance was not sending his mammoths today. John was glad of that. Their awesome strength was wasted on the wall, and their size only made them easy targets. The last had been a day and a half in the dying, its mournful trumpetings terrible to hear. The turtle crept slowly through stones and stumps and brush. The earlier attacks had cost the free folk a hundred lives or more. Most still lay where they had fallen. In the lulls the crows would come and pay them court, but now the birds fled screeching. They liked the look of that turtle no more than he did. Satin, Horse, and the others were looking to him, John knew, waiting for his orders. He was so tired he hardly knew any more. The wall is mine, he reminded himself. Owen, Horse, to the catapults. Kegs, you and Spare Boot on the scorpions. The rest of you string your bows. Fire arrows. Let's see if we can burn it. It was likely to be a futile gesture, John knew, but it had to be better than standing helpless. 
Cumbersome and slow-moving, the turtle made for an easy shot, and his archers and crossbowmen soon turned it into a lumbering wooden hedgehog. But the wet hides protected it just as they had the mantlets, and the flaming arrows guttered out almost as soon as they struck. John cursed under his breath. "'Scorpions!' he commanded. "'Catapults!' The scorpions' bolts punched deep into the pelts, but did no more damage than the fire arrows. The rocks went bouncing off the turtle's roof, leaving dimples in the thick layers of hides. A stone from one of the trebuchets might have crushed it, but the one machine was still broken, and the wildlings had gone wide around the area where the other dropped its loads. "'John, it's still coming,' said Owen the oaf. He could see that for himself. Inch by inch, yard by yard, the turtle crept closer, rolling, rumbling, and rocking as it crossed the killing ground. Once the wildlings got it flush against the wall, it would give them all the shelter they needed, while their axes crashed through the hastily repaired outer gates. Inside, under the ice, they would clear the loose rubble from the tunnel in a matter of hours, and then there would be nothing to stop them but two iron gates— a few half-frozen corpses, and whatever brothers John cared to throw in their path, to fight and die down in the dark. To his left the catapult made a thunk and filled the air with spinning stones. They plonked down on the turtle like hail and caromed harmlessly aside. The wildling archers were still loosing arrows from behind their mantlets. One thudded into the face of a straw man, and Pip said, Four for Wad of Long Lake! We have a tie! The next shaft whistled past his own ear, however. Fie! he shouted down. I'm not in the tourney. The hides won't burn, John said, as much to himself as to the others. Their only hope was to try and crush the turtle when it reached the wall. For that they needed boulders. No matter how stoutly built the turtle was, a huge chunk of rock crashing straight down on top of it from seven hundred feet was bound to do some damage. Grin, Owen, kegs, it's time. Alongside the warming shed a dozen stout oaken barrels were lined up in a row. They were full of crushed rock, the gravel that the Black Brothers customarily spread on the footpaths to give themselves better footing atop the wall. Yesterday, after he'd seen the free folk covering the turtle with sheepskins, John told Gran to pour water into the barrels as much as they would take. The water would seep down through the crushed stone, and overnight the whole thing would freeze solid. It was the nearest thing to a boulder they were going to get. "'Why do we need to freeze it?' Gran had asked him. Why don't we just roll the barrels off the way they are? John answered, If they crash against the wall on the way down, they'll burst and loose gravel will spray everywhere. We don't want to rain pebbles on the horse, sons. He put his shoulder to the one barrel with Gren, while Keggs and Owen were wrestling with another. Together they rocked it back and forth to break the grip of the ice that had formed around its bottom. The bugger weighs a ton, said Gren. "'Tip it over and roll it,' John said. "'Careful, if it rolls over your foot, you'll end up like spare boot. Once the barrel was on its side, John grabbed a torch and waved it above the surface of the wall, back and forth, just enough to melt the ice a little. The thin film of water helped the barrel roll more easily. Too easily, in fact, they almost lost it. But finally, with four of them pooling their efforts, they rolled their boulder to the edge and stood it up again. They had four of the big oak barrels lined up above the gate by the time Pip shouted, "'There's a turtle down our door!' John braced his injured leg and leaned out for a look. "'Hoardings. Marsh should have built hoardings. So many things they should have done. The wildlings were dragging the dead giants away from the gate. Horse and Molly were dropping rocks down on them, and John thought he saw one man go down, but the stones were too small to have any effect on the turtle itself.' He wondered what the free folk would do about the dead mammoth in the path, but then he saw. The turtle was almost as wide as a long haul, so they simply pushed it over the carcass. His leg twitched, but Horse caught his arm and drew him back to safety. "'You shouldn't lean out like that,' the boy said. "'You should have built hoardings.' John thought he could hear the crash of axes on wood, but that was probably just fear ringing in his ears. He looked to Gren. "'Do it!' Gren got behind a barrel, put his shoulder against it, grunted, and began to push. Owen and Mully moved to help him. They shoved the barrel out a foot, and then another, and suddenly it was gone. They heard the thump as it struck the wall on the way down, and then much louder the crash and crack of splintering wood, followed by shouts and screams. Satin whooped, and Owen the oaf danced in circles, while Pip leaned out and called, "'That turtle was stuffed full of rabbits! Look at them hop away!' Again, John barked, 
and Gren and Keggs slammed their shoulders against the next barrel and sent it tottering out into empty air. By the time they were done, the front of Mance's turtle was a crushed and splintered ruin, and wildlings were spilling out the other end and scrambling for their camp. Satin scooped up his crossbow and sent a few quarrels after them as they ran, to see them off the faster. Gren was grinning through his beard. Pip was making japes, and none of them would die today. On the morrow, though, John glanced toward the shed. Eight barrels of gravel remained where twelve had stood a few moments before. He realized how tired he was then, and how much his wound was hurting. I need to sleep. A few hours at least. He could go to Maser Amon for some dream wine. That would help. I am going down to the King's Tower, he told them. Call me if Mance gets up to anything. Pip, you have the wall. Me? said Pip. Him? said Gren. Smiling, he left them to it and rode down in the cage. A cup of dream wine did help, as it happened. No sooner had he stretched out on the narrow bed in his cell than sleep took him. His dreams were strange and formless, full of strange voices, shouts and cries, and the sound of a war horn, blowing low and loud, a single deep booming note that lingered in the air. When he awoke, the sky was black outside the arrow slit that served him for a window, and four men he did not know were standing over him. One held a lantern. "'John Snow!' the tallest of them said brusquely. "'Pull on your boots and come with us!' His first groggy thought was that somehow the wall had fallen whilst he slept, that Mance Raider had sent more giants or another turtle and broken through the gate. But when he rubbed his eyes, he saw that the strangers were all in black. "'They're men of the Night's Watch,' John realized. "'Come where? Who are you?' The tall man gestured, and two of the others pulled John from the bed. With a lantern leading the way, they marched him from his cell and up a half-turn of stair to the old bear's solar. He saw Maester Amon standing by the fire, his hands folded around the head of a blackthorn cane. Septon Celador was half-drunk as usual, and Sir Winton Stout was asleep in a window-seat. The other brothers were strangers to him, all but one. Immaculate in his fur-trimmed cloak and polished boots, Sir Alistair Thorne turned to say, "'Here's the turncloak now, my lord, Ned Stark's bastard of Winterfell.' "'I'm no turncloak, Thorne,' John said coldly. "'We shall see.' In the leather chair behind the table, where the old bear wrote his letters, sat a big, broad, jowly man John did not know. "'Yes, we shall see,' he said again. "'You will not deny that you are John Snow, I hope, Stark's bastard?' "'Lord Snow, he likes to call himself.' So Alistair was a spare, slim man, compact and sinewy, and just now his flinty eyes were dark with amusement. "'You're the one who named me, Lord Snow,' said John. Sir Alistair had been fond of naming the boys he trained, during his time as Castle Black's master-at-arms. The old bear had sent Thorn to East Watch by the sea. "'These others must be East Watch men. The bird reached Cotter Pike, and he's sent us help. "'How many men have you brought?' he asked the man behind the table. "'It's me who'll ask the questions,' the jowly man replied. "'You've been charged with oath-breaking, cowardice, and desertion, John Snow. "'Do you deny that you abandoned your brothers to die on the fist of the first men "'and join the wildling Mance Raider, this self-styled king beyond the wall?' "'Abandoned!' John almost choked on the word. Maester Amon spoke up then. "'My lord, Donald Noy and I discussed these issues when Jon Snow first returned to us, and were satisfied by Jon's explanations.' "'Well, I am not satisfied, Maester,' said the jowly man. "'I will hear these explanations for myself. Yes, I will!' John swallowed his anger. I abandoned no one. I left the fist with Corin Halfhand to scout the Skirling Pass. I joined the wildlings under orders. The Halfhand feared that Mance might have found the Horn of Winter. The Horn of Winter? Sir Alistair chuckled. Were you commanded to count their snarks as well, Lord Snow? No, but I counted their giants as best I could. Sir! snapped the jowly man. You will address Sir Alistair as Sir! And myself as my lord. I am Jonas Slint, 
Lord of Harrenhal, and commander here at Castle Black until such time as Bowen Marsh returns with his garrison. You will grant us our courtesies, yes. I will not suffer to hear an anointed knight like the good Sir Alliser mocked by a traitor's bastard. He raised a hand and pointed a meaty finger at John's face. Do you deny that you took a wildling woman into your bed? No. John's grief over Egret was too fresh for him to deny her now. No, my lord. I suppose it was also the half-hand who commanded you to fuck this unwashed whore, Sir Alliser asked with a smirk. Sir, she was no whore, sir. The half-hand told me not to balk, whatever the wildlings asked of me, but I will not deny that I went beyond what I had to do, that I cared for her. You admit to being an oath-breaker, then, said Janos Slint. Half the men at Castle Black visited Molestown from time to time to dig for buried treasures in the brothel, John knew, but he would not dishonor Egret by equating her with the Molestown whores. I broke my vows with a woman. I admit that, yes. Yes, my lord! When Slint scowled, his jowls quivered. He was as broad as the old bear had been, and no doubt would be as bald if he lived to Mormont's age. Half his hair was gone already, though he could not have been more than forty. "'Yes, my lord,' John said. "'I rode with the wildlings and ate with them, as the half-hand commanded me, and I shared my furs with Egret. "'But I swear to you I never turned my cloak. I escaped the Magnar as soon as I could, and never took up arms against my brothers or the realm.' Lord Slint's small eyes studied him. "'Sir Glendon,' he commanded, "'bring in the other prisoner.' Sir Glendon was the tall man who had dragged John from his bed. Four other men went with him when he left the room, but they were back soon enough with a captive, a small, sallow, battered man, fettered hand and foot. He had a single eyebrow, a widow's peak, and a moustache that looked like a smear of dirt on his upper lip. But his face was swollen and mottled with bruises, and most of his front teeth had been knocked out. The East Watchmen threw the captive roughly to the floor. Lord Slint frowned down at him. "'Is this the one you spoke of?' The captive blinked yellow eyes. "'Aye.' Not until that instant did John recognize Rattleshirt. "'He is a different man without his armor,' he thought. "'Aye,' the wildling repeated. "'He's the craven killed the half-hand.' Up in the frost fangs, as it were, after we hunted down to other crows and killed them, every one. We would have done for this one, too, only he begged for his worthless life, offered to join us if we'd have him. The half-hand swore he'd see the craven dead first, but the wolf ripped Corin half to pieces, and this one opened his throat. He gave John a crack-toothed smile then and spat blood on his foot. Well, John Os Slint demanded of John harshly, do you deny it? Or will you claim Corin commanded you to kill him? He told me... The words came hard. He told me to do whatever they asked of me. Slint looked about the solar at the other East Watchmen. Does this boy think I fell off a turnip wagon onto my head? Your lies won't save you now, Lord Snow, warned Sir Alistair Thorne. We'll have the truth from you, bastard. I told you the truth. Our garons were failing, and Rattleshirt was close behind us. Corin told me to pretend to join the wildlings. You must not balk whatever is asked of you, he said. He knew they would make me kill him. Rattleshirt was going to kill him anyway. He knew that, too. So now you claim the great Corin Halfhand feared this creature? Slint looked at Rattleshirt and snorted. "'All men fear the Lord of Bones,' the wildling grumbled. Sir Glendon kicked him, and he lapsed back into silence. "'I never said that,' John insisted. Slint slammed a fist on the table. "'I heard you! Sir Alliser had your measure true enough, it seems. You lie through your bastard's teeth. Well, I will not suffer it, I will not! You might have fooled this crippled blacksmith, but not Janos Slint.' "'Oh, no!' 
Jana Slint does not swallow lies so easily. Did you think my skull was stuffed with cabbage? I don't know what your skull is stuffed with, my lord. Lord Snow's nothing if not arrogant, said Sir Alistair. He murdered Corin just as his fellow turncloaks did Lord Mormont. It would not surprise me to learn that it was all part of the same fell plot. Benjamin Stark may well have a hand in all this as well. For all we know, he is sitting in Mance's raider's tent even now. You know these Starks, my lord. I do, said John Oslint. I know them too well. John peeled off his glove and showed them his burned hand. I burned my hand defending Lord Mormont from a white, and my uncle was a man of honor. He would never have betrayed his vows. No more than you, mocked Sir Alistair. Septon Celador cleared his throat. Lord Slint, he said, this boy refused to swear his vows properly in the sept, but went beyond the wall to say his words before a heart tree. His father's gods, he said, but they are wildling gods as well. They are the gods of the north, Septon. Maester Amon was courteous but firm. My lords, when Donald Noy was slain, it was this young man, John Snow, who took the wall and held it against all the fury of the north. He has proved himself valiant, loyal, and resourceful. Were it not for him, you would have found Mance Raider sitting here when you arrived, Lord Slint. You are doing him a great wrong. John Snow was Lord Mormont's own steward and squire. He was chosen for that duty because the Lord Commander saw much promise in him, as do I. Promise? said Slint. Well, promise may turn false. Corin Halfhand's blood is on his hands. Mormont trusted him, you say. But what of that? I know what it is to be betrayed by men you trusted. Oh, yes. And I know the ways of wolves as well. He pointed at John's face. Your father died a traitor. My father was murdered. John was past caring what they did to him, but he would not suffer any more lies about his father. Slint purpled. Murder? You insolent pup! King Robert was not even cold when Lord Eddard moved against his son. He rose to his feet, a shorter man than Mormont, but thick about the chest and arms with the gut to match. A small gold spear tipped with red enamel pinned his cloak at the shoulder. Your father died by the sword, but he was highborn, a king's hand. For you, a noose will serve. Sir Alistair, take this turn cloak to an ice cell. My lord is wise. Sir Alistair seized John by the arm. John yanked away and grabbed the knight by the throat with such ferocity that he lifted him off the floor. He would have throttled him if the East Watchmen had not pulled him off. Thorn staggered back, rubbing the marks John's fingers had left on his neck. You see for yourselves, brothers. The boy is a wildling. Tyrion when dawn broke, he found he could not face the thought of food. By even fall I may stand condemned. His belly was acid with bile, and his nose itched. Tyrion scratched at it with the point of his knife. One last witness to endure, then my turn. But what to do? Deny everything? Accuse Sansa and Sir Dantos? Confess in the hope of spending the rest of his days on the wall? Let the dice fly, and pray that Red Viper could defeat Sir Gregor Clegane. Tyrion stabbed listlessly at a greasy gray sausage, wishing it were his sister. It is bloody cold on the wall, but at least I would be shut of Circe. He did not think he would make much of a ranger, but the Night's Watch needed clever men as well as strong ones. Lord Commander Mormont had said as much when Tyrion had visited Castle Black. There are those inconvenient vows, though. It would mean the end of his marriage and whatever claim he might ever have made for Casterly Rock, but he did not seem destined to enjoy either, in any case, and he seemed to recall that there was a brothel in a nearby village. It was not a life he'd ever dreamed of, but it was life, and all he had to do to earn it was trust in his father, stand up on his little stunted legs, and say, Yes, I did it, I confess. That 
was the part that tied his bowels in knots. He almost wished he had done it, since it seemed he must suffer for it anyway. "'My lord,' said Padraic Payne, "'they're here, my lord. Sir Adam and the gold cloaks, they wait without.' "'Pad, tell me true. Do you think I did it?' The boy hesitated. When he tried to speak, all he managed to produce was a weak sputter. "'I am doomed,' Tyrion sighed. "'No need to answer. You've been a good squire to me, better than I deserved. Whatever happens, I thank you for your leal service.' Sir Adam Marbrand waited at the door with six gold cloaks. He had nothing to say this morning, it seemed. "'Another good man who thinks me a kinslayer.' Tyrion summoned all the dignity he could find and waddled down the steps. He could feel them all watching him as he crossed the yard, the guards on the walls, the grooms by the stables, the scullions and washerwomen and serving girls. Inside the throne room, knights and lordlings moved aside to let them through, and whispered to their ladies. No sooner had Tyrion taken his place before the judges than another group of gold cloaks led in Shay. A cold hand tightened round his heart. Varys betrayed her, he thought. Then he remembered. No, I betrayed her myself. I should have left her with Lawless. Of course they'd question Sansa's maids. I'd do the same. Tyrion rubbed the slick scar where his nose had been, wondering why Cersei had bothered. She knows nothing that can hurt me. They plotted it together, she said, this girl he'd loved. The imp and Lady Sansa plotted it after the young wolf died. Sansa wanted revenge for her brother, and Tyrion meant to have the throne. He was going to kill his sister next, and then his own lord father, so he could be hand for Prince Tommen. But after a year or so, before Tommen got too old, he would have killed him too, so as to take the crown for his own head. How could you know all this? demanded Prince Oberyn. Why would the imp divulge such plans to his wife's maid? I overheard some, my lord, said Che, and my lady let things slip too. But most I had from his own lips. I wasn't only Lady Sansa's maid. I was his whore all the time he was here in King's Landing. On the morning of the wedding he dragged me down where they keep the dragon skulls and fucked me there with the monsters all around. And when I cried he said I ought to be more grateful, that it wasn't every girl who got to be the king's whore. That was when he told me how he meant to be king. He said that poor boy Joffrey would never know his bride the way he was knowing me. She started sobbing then. I never meant to be a whore, my lords. I was to be married. A squire he was, and a good brave boy, gentle born. But the imp saw me at the green fork and put the boy I meant to marry in the front rank of the van, and after he was killed he sent his wildlings to bring me to his tent. Shagger, the big one, and timid with a burned eye. He said if I didn't pleasure him, he'd give me to them, so I did. Then he brought me to the city, so I'd be close when he wanted me. He made me do such shameful things. Prince Oberyn looked curious. Mm, what sorts of things? Unspeakable things. As the tears rolled slowly down that pretty face, no doubt every man in the hall wanted to take Shay in his arms and comfort her. With my mouth and other parts, my lord. All my parts. He used me every way there was, and he used to make me tell him how big he was. My giant, I had to call him. My giant of Lannister. Oswald Kettleblack was the first to laugh. Boris and Merrin joined in. Then Cersei, Sir Loras, and more lords and ladies than he could count. The sudden gale of mirth made the rafters ring and shook the iron throne. It's true, Shea protested. My giant of Lannister. The laughter swelled twice as loud. Their mouths were twisted in merriment. Their bellies shook. Some laughed so hard that snot flew from their nostrils. I saved you all, Tyrion thought. I saved this vile city and all your worthless lives. There were hundreds in the throne room, every one of them laughing but his father. Or oh, so it seemed. Even the Red Viper chortled, and Mace Tyrell looked like to bust a gut. But Lord Tywin Lannister sat between them as if made of stone, his fingers steepled beneath his chin. Tyrion pushed forward. My lords! he shouted. He had to shout, to have any hope of being heard. His father raised a hand. 
Bit by bit, the hall grew silent. Get this lying whore out of my sight, said Tyrion, and I will give you your confession. Lord Tywin nodded, gestured. Shea looked half in terror as the gold cloaks formed up around her. Her eyes met Tyrion's as they marched her from the wall. Was it shame he saw there, or fear? He wondered what Cersei had promised her. You will get the gold or jewels, whatever it was you asked for, he thought as he watched her back recede. But before the moon has turned, she'll have you entertaining the gold cloaks in their barracks. Tyrion stared up at his father's hard green eyes with their flecks of cold, bright gold. Guilty, he said. So guilty. Is that what you wanted to hear? Lord Tywin said nothing. Mace Tyrell nodded. Prince Oberyn looked mildly disappointed. You admit you poisoned the king? Nothing of the sort, said Tyrion. Of Joffrey's death I am innocent. I am guilty of a more monstrous crime. He took a step toward his father. I was born. I lived. I am guilty of being a dwarf. I confess it. And no matter how many times my good father forgave me, I have persisted in my infamy. This is folly, Tyrion, declared Lord Tywin. Speak to the matter at hand. You are not on trial for being a dwarf. That is where you err, my lord. I have been on trial for being a dwarf my entire life. Have you nothing to say in your defense? Nothing but this. I did not do it. Yet now I wish I had. He turned to face the hall, that sea of pale faces. I wish I had enough poison for you all. You make me sorry that I am not the monster you would have me be, yet there it is. I am innocent, but I will get no justice here. You leave me no choice but to appeal to the gods. I demand trial by battle. Have you taken leave of your wits? His father said. No, I found them. I demand trial by battle. His sweet sister could not have been more pleased. He has that right, my lords, she reminded the judges. Let the gods judge. Sir Gregor Clegane will stand for Joffrey. He returned to the city the night before last to put his sword at my service. Lord Tywin's face was so dark that for half a heartbeat Tyrion wondered if he'd drunk some poisoned wine as well. He slammed his fist down on the table, too angry to speak. It was Mace Tyrell who turned to Tyrion and asked the question, Do you have a champion to defend your innocence? He does, my lord. Prince Oberyn of Dawn rose to his feet. The dwarf has quite convinced me. The uproar was deafening. Tyrion took a special pleasure in the sudden doubt he glimpsed in Cersei's eyes. It took a hundred gold cloaks pounding the butts of their spears against the floor to quiet the throne room again. By then, Lord Tywin Lannister had recovered himself. Let the issue be decided on the morrow, he declared in iron tones. I wash my hands of it. He gave his dwarf son a cold, angry look, then strode from the hall, out the king's door behind the iron throne, his brother Kevin at his side. Later, back in his tower cell, Tyrion poured himself a cup of wine and sent Podrick Payne off for cheese, bread, and olives. He doubted whether he could keep down anything heavier just now. Did you think I would go meekly, father? he asked the shadow, his candles etched upon the wall. I have too much of you in me for that. He felt strangely at peace, now that he had snatched the power of life and death from his father's hands and placed it in the hands of the gods. Assuming there are gods, and they give a mummer's fart. If not, then I'm in Dornish hands. No matter what happened, Tyrion had the satisfaction of knowing that he'd kicked Lord Tywin's plans to splinters. If Prince Oberyn won, it would further inflame Highgarden against the Dornish. 
Mace Terrell would see the man who crippled his son helping the dwarf who almost poisoned his daughter to escape his rightful punishment. And if the mountain triumphed, Doran Martell might well demand to know why his brother had been served with death instead of the justice Tyrion had promised him. Dorn might crown Marcella after all. It was almost worth dying to know all the trouble he'd made. Will you come to see the end, Shane? Will you stand there with the rest, watching as Sir Ellen lops my ugly head off? Will you miss your giant of Lannister when he's dead? He drained his wine, flung the cup aside, and sang lustily. He rode through the streets of the city, down from his hill on high. O'er the wines and the steps and the cobbles he rode to a woman's sigh. For she was his secret treasure, she was his shame and his bliss, and a chain and a keep are nothing compared to a woman's kiss. Sir Kevin did not visit him that night. He was probably with Lord Tywin, trying to placate the Tyrells. I have seen the last of that uncle, I fear. He poured another cup of wine. A pity he'd had Simon Silver Tongue killed before learning all the words of that song. It wasn't a bad song, if truth be told, especially compared to the ones that would be written about him henceforth. For hands of gold are always cold, but a woman's hands are warm, he sang. Perhaps he should write the other verses himself, if he lived so long. That night, surprisingly, Tyrion Lannister slept long and deep. He rose at first light, well rested and with a hearty appetite, and broke his fast on fried bread, blood sausage, apple cakes, and a double helping of eggs cooked with onions and fiery Dornish peppers. Then he begged leave of his guards to attend his champion. Sir Adam gave his consent. Tyrion found Prince Oberyn drinking a cup of red wine as he donned his armor. He was attended by four of his younger Dornish lordlings. "'Good morrow to you, my lord,' the prince said. "'Will you take a cup of wine?' "'Should you be drinking before battle?' "'I always drink before battle.' "'That could get you killed. Worse, it could get me killed.' Prince Oberyn laughed. "'The gods defend the innocent. You are innocent, I trust.' "'Only of killing Joffrey,' Tyrion admitted. "'I do hope you know what you are about to face. Gregor Clegane is large, so I have heard.' He is almost eight feet tall and must weigh thirty stone, all of it muscle. He fights with a two-handed greatsword, but needs only one hand to wield it. He has been known to cut men in half with a single blow. His armor is so heavy that no lesser man could bear the weight, let alone move in it. Prince Oberyn was unimpressed. I have killed large men before. The trick is to get them off their feet. Once they go down, they are dead. The Dornishman sounded so blithely confident that Tyrion felt almost reassured, until he turned and said, "'Damon, my spear!' Sir Damon tossed it to him, and the Red Viper snatched it from the air. "'You mean to face the mountain with a spear?' That made Tyrion uneasy all over again. In battle, ranks of massed spears made for a formidable front, but single combat against a skilled swordsman was a very different matter. We are fond of spears and dawn. Besides, it is the only way to counter his reach. Have a look, Lord Imp, but see you do not touch. The spear was turned to ash, eight feet long, the shaft smooth, thick, and heavy. The last two feet of that was steel, a slender, leaf-shaped spearhead narrowing to a wicked spike. The edges looked sharp enough to shave with. When Oberyn spun the haft between the palms of his hand, they glistened black. Oil? Or poison? Tyrion decided that he would sooner not know. I hope you are good with that, he said doubtfully. You will have no cause for complaint. Though Sir Gregor may, however thick his plate, there will be gaps at the joints, inside the elbow and knee, beneath the arms. I will find a place to tickle him, I promise you. He set the spear aside. It is said that a Lannister always pays his debts. Perhaps you will return to Sunspear with me when the day's bloodletting is done. My brother Doran would be most pleased to meet the rightful heir and Casterly Rock, especially if he brought his lovely wife, the Lady of Winterfell. 
Does the snake think I have Sansa squirreled away somewhere? Like a nut I'm hoarding for winter? If so, Tyrion was not about to disabuse him. A trip to Dawn might be very pleasant, now that I reflect on it. Plan on a lengthy visit. Prince Oberyn sipped his wine. You and Doran have many matters of mutual interest to discuss. Music, trade, history, wine. The dwarf's penny. The laws of inheritance and succession. No doubt an uncle's counsel would be a benefit to Queen Marcella in the trying times ahead. If Varys had his little birds listening, Oberyn was giving them a ripe earful. I believe I will have that cup of wine, said Tyrion. Queen Marcella? It would have been more tempting if only he did have Sansa tucked beneath his cloak. If she declared for Marcella over Tommen, would the North follow? What the Red Viper was hinting at was treason. Could Tyrion truly take up arms against Tommen, against his own father? Cersei would spit blood. It might be worth it for that alone. Do you recall the tale I told you of our first meeting imp? Prince Oberyn asked, as the bastard of God's grace knelt before him to fasten his greaves. It was not for your tale alone that my sister and I came to Casterly Rock. We were on a quest of sorts. A quest that took us to Starfall, the Arbor, Old Town, the Shield Islands, Craycall, and finally Casterly Rock. But our true destination was marriage. Doran was betrothed to Lady Malario of Norvos. So he had been left behind as Castellan of Sunspear. My sister and I were yet unpromised. Elia found it all exciting. She was of that age, and her delicate health had never permitted her much travel. I preferred to amuse myself by mocking my sister's suitors. There was little Lord Lazy Eye, Squire Squishlips, one I named the Whale That Walks, that sort of thing. The only one who was even halfway presentable was young Baylor Hightower, a pretty lad, and my sister was half in love with him, until he had the misfortune to fart once in our presence. I promptly named him Baylor Breakwind, and after that Eliah couldn't look at him without laughing. I was a monstrous young fellow. Someone should have sliced out my vile tongue. Yes, Tyrion agreed silently. Baylor Hightower was no longer young, but he remained Lord Leighton's heir, wealthy, handsome, and a knight of splendid repute. Baylor Brightsmile, they called him now. Had Eliah wed him in place of Rhaegar Targaryen, she might be in old town with her children growing tall around her. He wondered how many lives had been snuffed out by that fart. Lannisport was the end of our voyage, Prince Oberyn went on, as Sir Aaron Corgyle helped him into a padded leather tunic and began lacing it up the back. Were you aware that our mothers knew each other of old? They had been at court together as girls, I seem to recall, companions to Princess Rayla. Just so. It was my belief that the mothers had cooked up this plot between them. Squire Squishlips and his ilk, and the various pimply young maidens who had been paraded before me, were the almonds before the feast, meant only to whet our appetites. The main course was to be served at Casterly Rock. Cersei and Jamie. Such a clever dwarf. Elia and I were older, to be sure. Your brother and sister could not have been more than eight or nine. Still, a difference of five or six years is little enough. And there was an empty cabin on our ship, a very nice cabin, such as might be kept for a person of high birth, as if it were intended that we take someone back to Sunspear. A young page, perhaps, or a companion for Elia. Your lady mother meant to betroth Jamie to my sister, or Circe to me. Perhaps both. Perhaps, said Tyrion. But my father ruled the seven kingdoms, but was ruled at home by his lady wife. Or so my mother always said. Prince Oberyn raised his arms, so Lord Dagos Manwoody and the bastard of God's grace could slip a chain-mail Bernie down over his head. At old time we learned of your mother's death and the monstrous child she had born. We might have turned back there, but my mother chose to sail on. I told you of the welcome we found at Casterly Rock. 
What I did not tell you was that my mother waited as long as was decent and then broached your father about our purpose. Years later, on her deathbed, she told me that Lord Tywin had refused us brusquely. His daughter was meant for Prince Rhaegar, he informed her, and when she asked for Jamie to espouse Elia, he offered her you instead. Which offer she took for an outrage? It was. Even you can see that, surely. Oh, surely. It all goes back and back, Tyrion thought, to our mothers and fathers and theirs before them. We are puppets dancing on the strings of those who came before us, and one day our own children will take up our strings and dance on in our steads. Well, Prince Rhaegar married Elia of Dorne, not Cersei Lannister of Casterly Rock. So it would seem your mother won that tilt. She thought so, Prince Oberyn agreed. But your father is not a man to forget such slights. He taught that lesson to Lord and Lady Tarbeck once, and to the reigns of Castamere. And at King's Landing he taught it to my sister. My helm, Degas. Manwoody handed it to him, a high golden helm with a copper disc mounted on the brow, the son of Dorne. The visor had been removed, Tyrion saw. Elia and her children have waited long for justice. Prince Oberyn pulled on soft red leather gloves and took up his spear again. But this day they shall have it. The outer ward had been chosen for the combat. Tyrion had to skip and run to keep up with Prince Oberyn's long strides. The snake is eager, he thought. Let us hope he is venomous as well. The day was grey and windy. The sun was struggling to break through the clouds, but Tyrion could no more have said who was going to win that fight than the one on which his life depended. It looked as though a thousand people had come to see if he would live or die. They lined the castle wall walks and elbowed one another on the steps of keeps and towers. They watched from the stable doors, from windows and bridges, from balconies and roofs. And the yard was packed with them, so many that the gold cloaks and the knights of the king's guard had to shove them back to make enough room for the fight. Some had dragged out chairs to watch more comfortably, while others perched on barrels. We should have done this in the dragon pit. Tyrion thought sourly. We could have charged a penny a head and paid for Joffrey's wedding and funeral both. Some of the onlookers even had small children sitting on their shoulders to get a better view. They shouted and pointed to the sight of Tyrion. Cersei seemed half a child herself beside Sir Gregor. In his armor the mountain looked bigger than any man had any right to be. Beneath a long yellow surcoat bearing the three black dogs of Clegane, he wore heavy plate over chain mail, dull gray steel dented and scarred in battle. Beneath that would be boiled leather and a layer of quilting. A flat-topped great helm was bolted to his gorget, with breaths around the mouth and nose and a narrow slit for vision. The crest atop it was a stone fist. If Sir Gregor was suffering from wounds, Tyrion could see no sign of it from across the yard. He looks as though he was chiseled out of rock, standing there. His great sword was planted in the ground before him, six feet of scarred metal. Sir Gregor's huge hands, clad in gauntlets of lobstered steel, clasped the cross-hilt to either side of the grip. Even Prince Oberyn's paramour paled to the sight of him. "'You are going to fight that?' Ilaria Sand said in a hushed voice. "'I am going to kill that,' her lover replied carelessly. Tyrion had his own doubts now that they stood on the brink. When he looked at Prince Oberyn, he found himself wishing he had Bronn defending him, or even better, Jaime. The Red Viper was lightly armored, greaves, vambraces, gorget, spalder, steel codpiece. Elsewise, Oberyn was clad in supple leather and flowing silks. Over his burney he wore his scales of gleaming copper, but mail and scale together would not give him a quarter the protection of Gregor's heavy plate. With its visor removed, the prince's helm was effectively no better than a half-helm, lacking even a nasal. His round steel shield was brightly polished, and showed the sun and spear in red gold, yellow gold, white gold, and copper. Dance around him until he's so tired he can hardly lift his arm, then put him on his back. The red viper seemed to have the same notion as Bronn, but the cell sword had been blunt about the risks of such tactics. 
I hope to seven hells that you know what you are doing, Snake. A platform had been erected beside the Tower of the Hand, halfway between the two champions. That was where Lord Tywin sat with his brother, Sir Kevin. King Tommen was not in evidence. For that, at least, Tyrion was grateful. Lord Tywin glanced briefly at his dwarf son, then lifted his hand. A dozen trumpeters blew a fanfare to quiet the crowd. The high septon shuffled forward in his tall crystal crown, and prayed that the father above would help them in this judgment, and that the warrior would lend his strength to the arm of the man whose cause was just. That would be me, Tyrion almost shouted, but they would only laugh, and he was sick unto death of laughter. Sir Osmond Kettleblack brought Clegane his shield, a massive thing of heavy oak rimmed in black iron. As the mountain slid his left arm through the straps, Tyrion saw that the hounds of Clegane had been painted over. This morning Sir Gregor bore the seven-pointed star the Andals had brought to Westeros when they crossed the narrow sea to overwhelm the first men and their gods. Very pious of you, Cersei, but I doubt the gods will be impressed. There were fifty yards between them. Prince Oberyn advanced quickly, Sir Gregor more ominously. The ground does not shake when he walks, Tyrion told himself. That is only my heart fluttering. When the two men were ten yards apart, the Red Viper stopped and called out, Have they told you who I am? Sir Gregor grunted through his breaths, Some dead man. He came on inexorable. The Dornishman slid sideways. "'I am Oberyn Martell, a Prince of Dawn,' he said, as the mountain turned to keep him in sight. "'Princess Elia was my sister.' "'Who?' asked Gregor Clegane. Oberyn's long spear jabbed, but Sir Gregor took the point on his shield, shoved it aside, and bulled back at the prince, his great sword flashing. The Dornishman spun away untouched. The spear darted forward. Clegane slashed at it. Martell snapped it back, then thrust again. Metal screamed on metal as the spearhead slid off the mountain's chest, slicing through the surcoat and leaving a long, bright scratch on the steel beneath. Elia Martell, Princess of Dawn, the Red Viper hissed. You raped her. You murdered her. You killed her children. Sir Gregor grunted. He made a ponderous charge to hack at the Dornishman's head. Prince Oberyn avoided him easily. You raped her. You murdered her. You killed her children. Did you come to talk or to fight? I came to hear you confess. The Red Viper landed a quick thrust on the mountain's belly, to no effect. Gregor cut at him and missed. The long spear lanced in above his sword. Like a serpent's tongue, it flickered in and out, fainting low and landing high, jabbing at groin, shield, eyes. The mountain makes for a big target at the least, Tyrion thought. Prince Oberyn could scarcely miss, though none of his blows was penetrating Sir Gregor's heavy plate. The Dornishman kept circling, jabbing, then darting back again, forcing the bigger man to turn and turn again. Clegane is losing sight of him. The mountain's helm had a narrow eyeslit, severely limiting his vision. Oberyn was making good use of that and the length of his spear and his quickness. It went on that way for what seemed a long time. Back and forth they moved across the yard and round and round in spirals, Sir Gregor slashing at the air while Oberyn's spear struck at arm and leg twice at his temple. Gregor's big wooden shield took its share of hits as well, until a dog's head peeped out from under the star, and elsewhere the raw oak showed through. Clegane would grunt from time to time, and once Tyrion heard him mutter a curse, but otherwise he fought in a sullen silence. Not Oberyn Martell. He raped her he called, fainting. You murdered her, he said, dodging a looping cut from Gregor's great sword. You killed her children, he shouted, slamming the spear point into the giant's throat, only to have it glance off the thick steel gorget with a screech. Oberyn is toying with him, said Elaria Sand. That is fool's play, thought Tyrion. The mountain is too bloody big to be any man's toy. All around the yard the throng of spectators was creeping in toward the two combatants, edging forward inch by inch to get a better view. The king's guard tried to keep them back, shoving at the gawkers forcefully with their big white shields, but there were hundreds of gawkers and only six of the men in white armor. "'You raped her!' Prince Oberyn parried a savage cut with a spearhead. "'You murdered her!' He sent the spear point at Clegane's eyes so fast the huge man flinched back. "'You killed her children!' 
The spear flickered sideways and down, scraping against the mountain's breastplate. You raped her! You murdered her! You killed her children! The spear was two feet longer than Sir Gregor's sword, more than enough to keep him at an awkward distance. He hacked at the shaft whenever Oberyn lunged at him, trying to lop off the spearhead, but he might as well have been trying to hack the wings off a fly. You raped her! You murdered her! You killed her children! Gregor tried to bull rush, but Oberyn skipped aside and circled around his back. You raped her! You murdered her! You killed her children! Be quiet! Sir Gregor seemed to be moving a little slower, and his great sword no longer rose quite so high as it had when the contest began. Shut your bloody mouth! You raped her, the prince said, moving to the right. Enough! Sir Gregor took two long strides and brought his sword down at Oberyn's head, but the Dorisman backstepped once more. You murdered her, he said. Shut up! Gregor charged headlong right at the point of the spear which slammed into his right breast, then slid aside with a hideous steel shriek. Suddenly the mountain was close enough to strike, his huge sword flashing in a steel blur. The crowd was screaming as well. Oberyn slipped the first blow and let go of the spear, useless now that Sir Gregor was inside it. The second cut the Dornishman caught on his shield. Metal met metal with an ear-splitting clang, sending the red viper reeling. Sir Gregor followed, bellowing. He doesn't use words, he just roars like an animal, Tyrion thought. Oberyn's retreat became a headlong backward flight, mere inches ahead of the great sword as it slashed at his chest, his arms, his head. The stable was behind him. Spectators screamed and shoved at each other to get out of the way. One stumbled into Oberyn's back. Sir Gregor hacked down with all his savage strength. The Red Viper threw himself sideways, rolling. The luckless stable boy behind him was not so quick. As his arm rose to protect his face, Gregor's sword took it off between elbow and shoulder. Shut up! The mountain howled at the stable boy's scream, and this time he swung the blade sideways, sending the top half of the lad's head across the yard in a spray of blood and brains. Hundreds of spectators suddenly seemed to lose all interest in the guilt or innocence of Tyrion Lannister, judging by the way they pushed and shoved at each other to escape the yard. But the Red Viper of Dawn was back on his feet, his long spear in hand. Elia, he called at Sir Gregor. You raped her. You murdered her. You killed her children. Now say her name. The mountain whirled. Helm, shield, sword, surcoat. He was spattered with gore from head to heels. You talk too much, he grumbled. You make my head hurt. I will hear you say it. She was Elia of Dawn. The mountain snorted contemptuously and came on, and in that moment the sun broke through the low clouds that had hidden the sky since dawn. The sun of dawn, Tyrion told himself, but it was Gregor Clegane who moved first to put the sun at his back. This is a dim and brutal man, but he has a warrior's instincts. The Red Viper crouched, squinting, and sent his spear darting forward again. Sir Gregor hacked at it, but the thrust had only been a feint. Off balance, he stumbled forward a step. Prince Oberyn tilted his dented metal shield. A shaft of sunlight blazed blindingly off polished gold and copper into the narrow slit of his foe's helm. Clegane lifted his own shield against the glare. Prince Oberyn's spear flashed like lightning and found the gap in the heavy plate, the joint under the arm. The point punched through mail and boiled leather. Gregor gave a choked grunt as the Dornishman twisted his spear and yanked it free. Elia! Say it! Elia of Dorn! He was circling, spear poised for another thrust. Say it! Turion had his own prayer. Fall down and die, was how it went. Damn you, fall down and die! The blood trickling from the mountain's armpit was his own now, and he must be bleeding even more heavily inside the breastplate. When he tried to take a step, one knee buckled. Tyrion thought he was going down. Prince Oberyn had circled behind him. Elia of Dorn! he shouted. Sir Gregor started to turn, but too slow and too late. The spearhead went through the back of the knee this time, through the layers of chain and leather between the plates on thigh and calf. The mountain reeled, swayed, then collapsed face first on the ground. His huge sword went flying from his hand. Slowly, ponderously, he rolled on to his back. The Dornishman flung away his ruined shield, grasped the spear in both hands, and sauntered away. Behind him, the mountain let out a groan and pushed himself onto an elbow. Oberyn whirled cat quick and ran at his fallen foe. Elia! 
he screamed as he drove the spear down with a whole weight of his body behind it. The crack of the ashwood shaft snapping was almost as sweet a sound as Circe's wail of fury, and for an instant Prince Oberyn had wings. A snake has vaulted over the mountain. Four feet of broken spear jutted from Clegane's belly as Prince Oberyn rolled, rose, and dusted himself off. He tossed aside the splintered spear and claimed his foe's greatsword. If you die before you say her name, sir, I will hunt you through all seven hells, he promised. Sir Gregor tried to rise. The broken spear had gone through him and was pinning him to the ground. He wrapped both hands about the shaft, grunting, but could not pull it out. Beneath him was a spreading pool of red. I am feeling more innocent by the instant, Tyrion told Ilaria Sand beside him. Prince Oberyn moved closer. Say the name! He put a foot on the mountain's chest and raised the great sword with both hands. Whether he intended to hack off Gregor's head or shove the point through his eye slit was something Tyrion would never know. Clegane's hand shot up and grabbed the Thornishman behind the knee. The Red Viper brought down the great sword in a wild slash, but he was off balance, and the edge did no more than put another dent in the mountain's vambrace. Then the sword was forgotten as Gregor's hand tightened and twisted, yanking the Dornishman down on top of him. They wrestled in the dust and blood, the broken spear wobbling back and forth. Tyrion saw with horror that the mountain had wrapped one huge arm around the prince, drawing him tight against his chest like a lover. Liar of Dorn, they all heard Sir Gregor say when they were close enough to kiss. His deep voice boomed within the helm. I killed her screaming whelp. He thrust his free hand into Oberyn's unprotected face, pushing steel fingers into his eyes. Then I raped her. Clegane slammed his fist into the Dornishman's mouth, making splinters of his teeth. Then I smashed her fucking head in like this. As he drew back his huge fist, the blood on his gauntlet seemed to smoke in the cold dawn air. There was a sickening crunch. Alaria Sand wailed in terror, and Tyrion's breakfast came boiling back up. He found himself on his knees, retching bacon and sausage and apple cakes, and that double helping of fried eggs cooked up with onions and fiery Dornish peppers. He never heard his father speak the words that condemned him. Perhaps no words were necessary. I put my life in the Red Viper's hands, and he dropped it. When he remembered too late that snakes had no hands, Tyrion began to laugh hysterically. He was halfway down the serpentine steps before he realized that the gold cloaks were not taking him back to his tower room. I've been consigned to the black cells, he said. They did not bother to answer. Why waste your breath on the dead? Daenerys. Dany broke her fast under the persimmon tree that grew in the terrace garden, watching her dragons chase each other about the apex of the Great Pyramid, where the huge bronze harpy once stood. Meereen had a score of lesser pyramids, but none stood even half as tall. From here she could see the whole city, the narrow, twisty alleys and wide brick streets, the temples and granaries, hovels and palaces, brothels and baths, gardens and fountains, the great red circles of the fighting pits, and beyond the walls was the Pewter Sea, the winding Skahazadan, the dry brown hills, burnt orchards, and blackened fields. Up here in our garden, Dany sometimes felt like a god, living atop the highest mountain in the world. Do all gods feel so lonely? Some must, surely. Masandi had told her of the Lord of Harmony, worshipped by the peaceful people of Noth. He was the only true god, her little scribe said, the god who always was and always would be, who made the moon and stars and earth and all the creatures that dwelt upon them. Poor lord of harmony. Dany pitied him. It must be terrible to be alone for all time, attended by hordes of butterfly women you could make or unmake at a word. Westeros had seven gods, at least. 
though Viserys had told her that some septons said the seven were only aspects of a single god, seven facets of a single crystal. That was just confusing. The red priests believed in two gods, she had heard, but two who were eternally at war. Denny liked that even less. She would not want to be eternally at war. Miss Andy served her duck eggs and dog sausage, and half a cup of sweetened wine mixed with the juice of a lime. The honey drew flies, but a scented candle drove them off. The flies were not so troublesome up here as they were in the rest of her city, she had found. Something else she liked about the pyramid. I must remember to do something about the flies, Danny said. Are there many flies on Nath, Miss Andy? On Darth there are butterflies, the scribe responded in the common tongue. More wine? No, I must hold court soon. Danny had grown very fond of Miss Andy. The little scribe with the big golden eyes was wise beyond her years. She is brave as well. She had to be, to survive the life she's lived. One day she hoped to see this fabled isle of Noth. But Sandy said that peaceful people made music instead of war. They did not kill, not even animals. They ate only fruit and never flesh. The butterfly spirits sacred to their Lord of Harmony protected their isle against those who would do them harm. Many conquerors had sailed on Noth to blood their swords, only to sicken and die. The butterflies do not help them when the slave ships come raiding, though. I'm going to take you home one day, Miss Andy, Danny promised. If I had made the same promise to Jorah, would he still have sold me? I swear it. This one is content to stay with you, Your Grace. Noth will be there always. You are good to this, to me. And you to me. Danny took the girl by the hand. Come help me dress. Jicky helped Miss Andy bathe her while Erie was laying out her clothes. Today she wore a robe of purple samite and a silver sash, and on her head the three-headed dragon crown the Tourmaline Brotherhood had given her in Carth. Her slippers were silver as well, with heels so high that she was always half afraid she was about to topple over. When she was dressed, Miss Andy brought her a polished silver glass so she could see how she looked. Danny stared at herself in silence. Is this the face of a conqueror? So far as she could tell, she still looked like a little girl. No one was calling her Daenerys the Conqueror yet, but perhaps they would. Aegon the Conqueror had won Westeros with three dragons, but she had taken Meereen with sewer rats and a wooden cock in less than a day. Poor Grolio. He still grieved for his ship, she knew. If a war galley could ram another ship, why not a gate? That had been her thought when she commanded the captains to drive their ships ashore. Their masts had become her battering rams, and swarms of freedmen had torn their hulls apart to build mantlets, turtles, catapults, and ladders. The sellswords had given each ram a bawdy name, and it had been the mainmast of Meraxes, formerly Joso's prank, that had broken the eastern gate. Joso's cock, they called it. The fighting had raged bitter and bloody for most of a day and well into the night, before the wood began to splinter and Meraxes' iron figurehead, a laughing jester's face, came crashing through. Dany had wanted to lead the attack herself, but to a man her captains said that would be madness and her captains never agreed on anything. Instead, she remained in the rear, sitting atop her silver in a long shirt of mail. She heard the city fall from half a league away, though, when the defenders' shouts of defiance changed to cries of fear. Her dragon's head roared as one in that moment, filling the night with flame. The slaves are rising, she knew at once. My sewer rats have gnawed off their chains. When the last resistance had been crushed by the unsullied and the sack had run its course, Danny entered her city. The dead were heaped so high before the broken gate that it took her freedmen near an hour to make a path for her silver. 
Joso's cock and the great wooden turtle that had protected it, covered with horsehides, lay abandoned within. She rode past burned buildings and broken windows, through brick streets where the gutters were choked with a stiff and swollen dead. Cheering slaves lifted blood-stained hands to her as she went by and called her mother. In the plaza before the Great Pyramid, the Miranese huddled forlorn. The great masters had looked anything but great in the morning light. Stripped of their jewels and their fringed tokars, they were contemptible. A herd of old men with shriveled balls and spotted skin, and young men with ridiculous hair. Their women were either soft and fleshy, or as dry as old sticks, their face paint streaked by tears. I want your leaders, Danny told them. Give them up, and the rest of you shall be spared. How many? one old woman had asked, sobbing. How many must you have to spare us? One hundred and sixty-three, she answered. She had them nailed to wooden posts around the plaza, each man pointing at the next. The anger was fierce and hot inside her when she gave the command. It made her feel like an avenging dragon. But later, when she passed the men dying on the posts, when she heard their moans and smelled their bowels and blood, Denny put the glass aside, frowning. It was just. It was. I did it for the children. Her audience chamber was on the level below, an echoing, high-ceilinged room with walls of purple marble. It was a chilly place for all its grandeur. There had been a throne there, a fantastic thing of carved and gilded wood in the shape of a savage harpy. She had taken one long look and commanded it to be broken up for firewood. I will not sit in the harpy's lap she told them. Instead, she sat upon a simple ebony bench. It served, though she had heard the Miranese muttering that it did not befit a queen. Her blood riders were waiting for her. Silver bells tinkled in their oiled braids, and they wore the gold and jewels of dead men. Marine had been rich beyond imagining. Even her swords seemed sated, at least for now. Across the room, Grey Worm wore the plain uniform of the unsullied, his spiked bronze cap beneath one arm. These at least she could rely on, or so she hoped, and Brown Ben Plum as well, solid Ben, with his grey-white hair and weathered face, so beloved of her dragons, and D'Ario beside him, glittering in gold. D'Ario and Ben Plum, Grey Worm, Eerie, Jicky, a Sandy. As she looked at them, Danny found herself wondering which of them would betray her next. The dragon has three heads. There are two men in the world who I can trust, if I can find them. I will not be alone then. We will be three against the world, like Aegon and his sisters. Was the night as quiet as it seemed? Danny asked. It seems it was, Your Grace, said Brown Ben Plum. She was pleased. Mirene had been sacked savagely, as new fallen cities always were. But Danny was determined that should end now that the city was hers. She had decreed that murderers were to be hanged, that looters were to lose a hand, and rapists their manhood. Eight killers swung from the walls and the unsullied had filled a bushel basket with bloody hands and soft red worms. But Mirene was calm again. But for how long? A fly buzzed her head. Denny waved it off, irritated. But it returned almost at once. There are too many flies in the city. Ben Plum gave a bark of laughter. There were flies in my ale this morning. I swallowed one of them. Flies are the dead man's revenge, D'Ario smiled and stroked the center prong of his beard. Corpses breed maggots, and maggots breed flies. We will rid ourselves of the corpses, then, starting with those in the plaza below. Grey Worm, will you see to it? The queen commands these ones obey. 
Best bring sacks as well as shovels, worm, Brown Ben counseled. Well past ripe, those ones. Falling off those poles in bits and pieces and crawling with— He knows. So do I. Denny remembered the horror she had felt when she had seen the Plaza of Punishment in Astapor. I made a horror just as great. But surely they deserved it? Harsh justice is still justice. Your Grace, said Miss Andy, Giscari inter their honoured dead in crypts below their manses. If you would boil the bones clean and return them to their kin, it would be a kindness. The widows will curse me all the same. Let it be done, Denny beckoned to De Ario. How many seek audience this morning? Two have presented themselves to bask in your radiance. De Ario had plundered himself a whole new wardrobe in Mirene, and to match it he had re-dyed his trident beard and curly hair a deep, rich purple. It made his eyes look almost purple, too, as if he were some lost Valyrian. They arrived in the night on the Indigo Star, a trading galley out of Carth. A slaver, you mean, Danny frowned. Who are they? The star's master, and one who claims to speak for Astapor. I will see the envoy first. He proved to be a pale, ferret-faced man, with ropes of pearls and spun gold hanging heavy about his neck. Your worship, he cried, my name is Gale. I bring greetings to the Mother of Dragons from King Cleon of Astapor, Cleon the Great. Then he stiffened. I left a council to rule Astapor, a healer, a scholar, and a priest. Your worship, those sly rogues betrayed your trust. It was revealed that they were scheming to restore the good masters to power and the people to chains. Great Cleon exposed their plots and hacked their heads off with a cleaver, and the grateful folk of Astapor have crowned him for his valor. Noble Gale said Miss Andy, in the dialect of Astapor. Is this the same Cleon once owned by Grasdan Mo Ulhor? Her voice was guileless, yet the question plainly made the envoy anxious. The same, he admitted. A great man! Miss Andy leaned close to Denny. He was a butcher in Grasdan's kitchen, the girl whispered in her ear. It was said he could slaughter a pig faster than any man in Astapor. I have given Astapor a butcher king. Denny felt ill, but she knew she must not let the envoy see it. I will pray that King Cleon rules well and wisely. What would he have of me? Gael rubbed his mouth. Perhaps we should speak more privily, Your Grace. I have no secrets for my captains and commanders. As you wish. Great Cleon bids me declare his devotion to the Mother of Dragons. Your enemies are his enemies, he says, and chief among them are the wise masters of Yunkai. He proposes a pact between Astapor and Mirene against the Yunkai. I swore no harm would come to Yunkai if they released their slaves, said Denny. These Yunkish thugs cannot be trusted, your worship. Even now they plot against you. New levies have been raised and can be seen drilling outside the city walls. Warships are being built. Envoys have been sent to Nugis and Volantis in the west to make alliances and hire sellswords. They have even dispatched riders to Vaistothrak to bring a Karasar down upon you. Great Cleon bid me tell you not to be afraid. Astapor remembers. Astapor will not forsake you. To prove his faith, great Cleon offers to seal your alliance with a marriage. A marriage? To me? Gael smiled. His teeth were brown and rotten. Great Cleon will give you many strong sons. Denny found herself bereft of words, but little Miss Sandy came to her rescue. Did his first wife give him sons? The envoy looked at her unhappily. Great Cleon has three daughters by his first wife. Two of his newer wives are with child, but he means to put all of them aside if the mother of dragons will consent to wed him. How noble of him, 
said Danny. "'I will consider all you've said, my lord.' She gave orders that Gale be given chambers for the night, somewhere lower in the pyramid. "'All my victories turn to dross in my hands,' she thought. "'Whatever I do, all I make is death and horror.' When word of what had befallen Astapor reached the streets, as it surely would, tens of thousands of newly freed Miranese slaves would doubtless decide to follow her when she went west, for fear of what awaited them if they stayed. Yet it might well be that worse would await them on the march. Even if she emptied every granary in the city and left Mirene to starve, how could she feed so many? The way before her was fraught with hardship, bloodshed, and danger. Sir Jorah had warned her of that. He'd warned her of so many things. He'd... No, I will not think of Jorah Mormont. Let him keep a little longer. I shall see this traitor, Captain, she announced. Perhaps he would have some better tidings. That proved to be a forlorn hope. The master of the Indigo Star was Carthine, so he wept copiously when asked about Astapor. The city bleeds. Dead men rot, unburied in the streets. Each pyramid is an armed camp, and the markets have neither food nor slaves for sale. And the poor children... King Cleaver's thugs have seized every high-born boy in Astapor to make new unsullied for the trade, though it will be years before they are trained. The thing that surprised Dany most was how unsurprised she was. She found herself remembering Eroa, the Lazarine girl she had once tried to protect, and what had happened to her. It will be the same in Mirene once I march, she thought. The slaves from the fighting pits, bred and trained to slaughter, were already proving themselves unruly and quarrelsome. They seemed to think they owned the city now, and every man and woman in it. Two of them had been among the eight she'd hanged. There is no more I can do, she told herself. What do you want of me, Captain? Slaves, he said. My holds are full to bursting with ivory, ambergris, zorse hides, and other fine goods. I would trade them here for slaves, to sell in lease in Volantis. We have no slaves for sale, said Dany. My queen, to Ario stepped forward, the riverside is full of Miranese, begging leave to be allowed to sell themselves to this Carthine. They are thicker than the flies. Dany was shocked. They want to be slaves? The ones who come are well spoken and gently born, sweet queen. Such slaves are prized. In the free cities they will be tutors, scribes, bed-slaves, even healers and priests. They will sleep in soft beds, eat rich foods, and dwell in manses. Here they have lost all, and live in fear and squalor. I see. Perhaps it was not so shocking if these tales of Astapor were true. Denny thought a moment. Any man who wishes to sell himself into slavery may do so. Or woman. She raised her hand. But they may not sell their children, nor a man his wife. In Astapor, the city took a tenth part of the price each time a slave changed hands, Sandy told her. We'll do the same, Danny decided. Wars were won with gold as much as swords. A tenth part. In gold or silver coin or ivory, Mirene has no need of saffron, cloves, or zorse hides. It shall be done as you command, glorious queen, said the Ario. My storm crows will collect your tenth. If the storm crows saw to the collections, at least half the gold would somehow go astray, Danny knew. But the second sons were just as bad, and the unsullied were as unlettered as they were incorruptible. Records must be kept, she said. Seek among the freedmen for men who can read, write, and do sums. His business done, the captain of the Indigo Star bowed and took his leave. Denny shifted uncomfortably on the ebony bench. She dreaded what must come next, yet she knew she had put it off too long already. Yunkai and Astapor, threats of war, marriage proposals, the march west looming over all. I need my knights. I need their swords, and I need their counsel. 
Yet the thought of seeing Jorah Mormont again made her feel as if she'd swallowed a spoonful of flies, angry, agitated, sick. She could almost feel them buzzing round her belly. I am the blood of the dragon. I must be strong. I must have fire in my eyes when I face them, not tears. Tell Belwas to bring my knights, Dany commanded, before she could change her mind. My good knights. Strong Belwas was puffing from the climb when he marched them through the doors, one meaty hand wrapped tight around each man's arm. Sir Barristan walked with his head held high, but Sir Jorah stared at the marble floor as he approached. The one is proud, the other guilty. The old man had shaved off his white beard. He looked ten years younger without it. But her balding bear looked older than he had. They halted before the bench. Strong Bell was stepped back and stood with his arms crossed across his scarred chest. Sir Jorah cleared his throat. Carlisi! She had missed his voice so much, but she had to be stern. Be quiet. I will tell you when to speak. She stood. When I sent you down into the sewers, part of me hoped I'd seen the last of you. It seemed a fitting end for liars to drown in slavers' filth. I thought the gods would deal with you, but instead you returned to me. My gallant knights of Westeros, an informer and a turncloak. My brother would have hanged you both. Viserys would have, anyway. She did not know what Rhaegar would have done. I will admit you helped win me the city. Sir Jorah's mouth tightened. We won you the city. We sewer rats. Be quiet, she said again, though there was truth to what he said. While Joso's cock and the other rams were battering the city gates and her archers were firing flights of flaming arrows over the walls, Danny had sent two hundred men along the river under cover of darkness to fire the hulks in the harbor. But that was only to hide their true purpose. As the flaming ships drew the eyes of the defenders on the walls, a few half-mad swimmers found the sewer mouths and pried loose a rusted iron grating. Sir Jorah, Sir Baristan, Strong Belwas, and twenty brave fools slipped beneath the brown water and up the brick tunnel, a mixed force of sellswords, unsullied, and freedmen. Denny had told them to choose only men who had no families, and preferably no sense of smell. They had been lucky as well as brave. It had been a moon's turn since the last good rain, and the sewers were only thigh-high. The oil cloth they'd wrapped around their torches kept them dry, so they had light. A few of the freedmen were frightened of the huge rats until strong Belwas caught one and bit it in two. One man was killed by a great pale lizard that reared up out of the dark water to drag him off by the leg, but when next ripples were spied, Sir Jorah butchered the beast with his blade. They took some wrong turnings, but once they found the surface, strong Belwas led them to the nearest fighting pit where they surprised a few guards and struck the chains off the slaves. Within an hour, half the fighting slaves in Mirene had risen. "'You helped win the city,' she repeated stubbornly, "'and you have served me well in the past. Sir Baristan saved me from the titan's bastard, and from the sorrowful man in Carth. Sir Jorah saved me from the poisoner in Vase Dothrak, and again from Drogo's bloodviders after my son and stars had died.' So many people wanted her dead, sometimes she lost count. And yet you lied, deceived me, betrayed me. She turned to Sir Baristan. You protected my father for many years, fought beside my brother on the trident. But you abandoned Viserys in his exile and bent your knee to the usurper instead. Why? And tell it true. Some truths are hard to hear. Robert was a, a good knight, chivalrous, brave. He spared my life and the lives of many others. Prince Viserys was only a boy. It would have been years before he was fit to rule, and— Forgive me, my queen, but you asked for truth. Even as a child, your brother Viserys oft seemed to be his father's son in ways that— Rhaegar never did. 
His father's son. Denny frowned. What does that mean? The old knight did not blink. Your father is called the Mad King in Westeros. Has no one ever told you? Viserys did. The Mad King. The usurper called him that, the usurper and his dogs. The Mad King. It was a lie. Why ask for truth? Sir Baristan said softly, if you close your ears to it. He hesitated, then continued. I told you before that I used a false name, so the Lannisters would not know that I'd joined you. That was less than half of it, Your Grace. The truth is, I wanted to watch you for a time before pledging you my sword, to make certain that you were not my father's daughter. If she was not her father's daughter, who was she? Mad, he finished. But I see no taint in you. Taint? Denny bristled. I am no maester to quote history at you, Your Grace. Swords have been my life, not books. But every child knows that the Targaryens have always danced too close to madness. Your father was not the first. King Jaehaerys once told me that madness and greatness are two sides of the same coin. Every time a new Targaryen is born, he said, the gods toss the coin in the air, and the world holds its breath to see how it will end. Jaehaerys. This old man knew my grandfather. The thought gave her pause. Most of what she knew of Westeros had come from her brother, and the rest from Sir Jorah. Sir Baristan would have forgotten more than the two of them had ever known. This man can tell me what I came from. So I am a coin in the hands of some god? Is that what you are saying, sir? No, oh, Sir Baristan replied. You are the true-born heir of Westeros. To the end of my days I shall remain your faithful knight. Should you find me worthy to bear a sword again? If not, I am content to serve strong Belwas as his squire. What if I decide you're only worthy to be my fool? Danny asked scornfully. Or perhaps my cook? I would be honored, Your Grace, Selmy said with quiet dignity. I can bake apples and boil beef as well as any man, and I've roasted many a duck over a campfire. I hope you like them greasy, with charred skin and bloody bones. That made her smile. I'd have to be mad to eat such fare. Ben Plum, come give Sir Baristan your longsword. But Whitebeard would not take it. I flung my sword at Joffrey's feet, and have not touched one since. Only from the hand of my queen will I accept a sword again. As you wish. Danny took the sword from Brown Ben and offered it hilt first. The old man took it reverently. Now kneel, she told him and swear it to my service. He went to one knee and laid the blade before her as he said the words. Denny scarcely heard them. He was the easy one, she thought. The other will be harder. When Sir Baristan was done, she turned to Jorah Mormont. And now you, sir, tell me true. The big man's neck was red, whether from anger or shame, she did not know. I have tried to tell you true, half a hundred times. I told you our stand was more than he seemed. I warned you that Zaro and Piat Pri were not to be trusted. I warned you— You warned me against everyone except yourself. His insolence angered her. He should be humbler. He should beg for my forgiveness. Trust no one but Jorah Mormont, you said. And all the time you were the spider's creature. I am no man's creature. I took the eunuch's gold, yes. I learned some ciphers and wrote some letters. But that was all. All? You spied on me and sold me to my enemies. For a time, he said it grudgingly. I stopped. When? When did you stop? I made one report from Carth, but... From Carth? Denny had been hoping it had ended much earlier. What did you write from Carth? 
that you were my man now, that you wanted no more of their schemes? Sir Jorah could not meet her eyes. When Carl Drogo died, you asked me to go with you to Yiti and the Jade Sea. Was that your wish or Robert's? That was to protect you, he insisted, to keep you away from them. I knew what snakes they were. Snakes? And what are you, sir? Something unspeakable occurred to her. You told them I was carrying Drogo's child. Khaleesi, do not think to deny it, sir, Sir Baristan said sharply. I was there when the eunuch told the council, and Robert decreed that her grace and her child must die. You were the source, sir. There was even talk that you might do the deed for a pardon. A lie, Sir Jorah's face darkened. I would never. Daenerys, it was me who stopped you from drinking the wine. Yes. And how was it you knew the wine was poisoned? I... I but suspected. The caravan brought a letter from Barris. He warned me there would be attempts. He wanted you watched, yes, but not harmed. He went to his knees. If I had not told them, someone else would have. You know that. I know you betrayed me. She touched her belly where her son, Rago, had perished. I know a poisoner tried to kill my son because of you. That's what I know. No, no, he shook his head. I never meant... Forgive me. You have to forgive me. Have to? It was too late. He should have begun by begging forgiveness. She could not pardon him as she'd intended. She had dragged the wine cellar behind her horse until there was nothing left of him. Didn't the man who brought him deserve the same? This is Jorah, my fierce bear, the right arm that never failed me. I would be dead without him, but I can't forgive you, she said. I can't. You forgave the old man. He lied to me about his name. You sold my secrets to the men who killed my father and stole my brother's throne. I protected you. I fought for you, killed for you. Kissed me, she thought. Betrayed me. I went down into the sewers like a rat for you. It might have been kinder if you'd died there. Danny said nothing. There was nothing to say. Danerous, he said, I have loved you. And there it was. Three treasons will you know, once for blood and once for gold and once for love. The gods do nothing without a purpose, they say. You did not die in battle, so it must be they still have some use for you. But I don't. I will not have you near me. You are banished, sir. Go back to your masters in King's Landing and collect your pardon, if you can, or to Astapor. No doubt the Butcher King needs knights. No, he reached for her. Daenerys, please, hear me. She slapped his hand away. Do not ever presume to touch me again, or to speak my name. You have until dawn to collect your things and leave this city. If you're found in Meereen, past break of day, I will have strong Belwas twist your head off. I will. Believe that. She turned her back on him, her skirts swirling. I cannot bear to see his face. Remove this liar from my sight, she commanded. I must not weep. I must not. If I weep, I will forgive him. Strong Belwas seized Sir Jorah by the arm and dragged him out. When Danny glanced back, the knight was walking as if drunk, stumbling and slow. She looked away until she heard the doors open and close. Then she sank back onto the ebony bench. He's gone, then. My father and my mother, my brothers, Sir Willem Dare, Drogo, who was my son in stars, his son who died inside me, and now Sir Jorah. The queen has a good heart, D'Ario purred through his deep purple whiskers. But that one is more dangerous than all the Osnaks and Miros rolled up in one. His strong hands caressed the hilts of his matched blades, those wanton golden women. You need not even say the word, my radiance. 
Only give the tiniest nod, and your D'Ario shall fetch you back his ugly head. Leave him be. The scales are balanced now. Let him go home. Then he pictured Jora moving amongst old, gnarled oaks and tall pines, past flowering thorn bushes, grey stones bearded with moss, and little creeks running icy down steep hillsides. She saw him entering a hall built of huge logs, where dogs slept by the hearth and the smell of meat and mead hung thick in the smoky air. "'We are done for now,' she told her captains. It was all she could do not to run back up the wide marble stairs— Erie helped to slip from her court clothes and into more comfortable garb, baggy woolen breeches, a loose felted tunic, a painted Northrocky vest. "'You are trembling, Khaleesi,' the girl said as she knelt to lace up Danny's sandals. "'I'm cold,' Danny lied. "'Bring me the book I was reading last night.' She wanted to lose herself in the words, in other times and other places. The fat, leather-bound volume was full of songs and stories from the Seven Kingdoms, children's stories, if truth be told, too simple and fanciful to be true history. All the heroes were tall and handsome, and you could tell the traitors by their shifty eyes. Yet she loved them all the same. Last night she had been reading of the three princesses in the Red Tower, locked away by the king for the crime of being beautiful. When her handmaid brought the book, Danny had no trouble finding the page where she had left off but it was no good. She found herself reading the same passage half a dozen times. Sir Jora gave me this book as a bride's gift, the day I wed Carl Drogo. But the aria was right. I shouldn't have banished him. I should have kept him, or I should have killed him. She played at being a queen, yet sometimes she still felt like a scared little girl. Viserys always said what a dolt I was. Was he truly mad? She closed the book. She could still recall Ser Jorah if she wished, or send to Ario to kill him. Danny fled from the choice, out onto the terrace. She found Regal asleep beside the pool, a green and bronze coil basking in the sun. Drogon was perched up atop the pyramid, in the place where the huge bronze harpy had stood before she had commanded it to be pulled down. He spread his wings and roared when he spied her. There was no sign of Viserion, but when she went to the parapet and scanned the horizon, she saw pale wings in the far distance, sweeping above the river. He is hunting. They grow bolder every day yet it still made her anxious when they flew too far away. One day one of them may not return, she thought. Your Grace, she turned to find Sir Paristan behind her. What more would you have of me, sir? I spared you, I took you into my service, now give me some peace. Forgive me, Your Grace. It was only, now that you know who I am, the old man hesitated. A knight of the king's guard is in the king's presence day and night. For that reason our vows require us to protect his secrets as we would his life. But your father's secrets by rights belong to you now, along with his throne, and I thought perhaps you might have questions for me. Questions? She had a hundred questions, a thousand, ten thousand. Why couldn't she think of one? "'Was my father truly mad?' she blurted out. "'Why do I ask that?' "'Viserys said this talk of madness was a ploy of the usurpers.' "'Viserys was a child, and the queen sheltered him as much as she could. "'Your father always had a little madness in him, I now believe. "'That he was charming and generous as well, so his lapses were forgiven. "'His reign began with such promise.' but as the years passed, the lapses grew more frequent until— Danny stopped him. Do I want to hear this now? Sir Baristan considered a moment. Perhaps not. Not now. Not now, she agreed. One day, one day you must tell me all, the good and the bad. 
There is some good to be said of my father, surely. There is, your grace, of him and those who came before him. Your grandfather, Jeheris, and his brother, their father, Aegon, your mother, and Rhaegar, him most of all. I wish I could have known him. Her voice was wistful. I wish she could have known you, the old knight said. When you are ready, I will tell you all. Then he kissed him on the cheek and sent him on his way. That night her handmaids brought her lamb with a salad of raisins and carrots soaked in wine and a hot flaky bread dripping with honey. She could eat none of it. Did Rhaegar ever grow so weary? she wondered. Did Aegon, after his conquest? Later, when the time came for sleep, Dany took Eri into bed with her for the first time since the ship. But even as she shuddered in release and wound her fingers through her handmaid's thick black hair, she pretended it was Drogo holding her. Only somehow his face kept turning into Daario's. If I want Daario, I need only say so. She lay with Eri's legs entangled in her own. His eyes looked almost purple today. Danny's dreams were dark that night, and she woke three times from half-remembered nightmares. After the third time, she was too restless to return to sleep. Moonlight streamed through the slanting windows, silvering the marble floors. A cool breeze was blowing through the open terrace doors. Erie slept soundly beside her, her lips slightly parted, one dark brown nipple peeping out above the sleeping silks. For a moment, Denny was tempted, but it was Drogo she wanted. Or perhaps to Ario. Not eerie. The maid was sweet and skillful, but all her kisses tasted of duty. She rose, leaving Eerie asleep in the moonlight. Jiki and Miss Sandy slept in their own beds. Danny slipped on a robe and padded barefoot across the marble floor, out onto the terrace. The air was chilly, but she liked the feel of grass between her toes and the sound of the leaves whispering to one another. Wind ripples chased each other across the surface of the little bathing pool and made the moon's reflection dance and shimmer. She leaned against a low brick parapet to look down upon the city. Marine was sleeping, too. Lost in dreams of kinder days, perhaps. Night covered the streets like a black blanket, hiding the corpses and the gray rats that came up from the sewers to feast on them, the swarms of stinging flies. Distant torches glimmered red and yellow where her sentries walked their rounds, and here and there she saw the faint glow of lanterns bobbing down an alley. Perhaps one was Sir Jora, leading his horse slowly toward the gate. Farewell, old bear. Farewell, betrayer. She was Daenerys Stormborn, the unburnt, Khaleesi and queen, mother of dragons, slayer of warlocks, breaker of chains, and there was no one in the world that she could trust. Your Grace, Miss Sandy stood at her elbow, wrapped in a bedrobe, wooden sandals on her feet. I woke and saw that you were gone. Did you sleep well? What are you looking at? My city, said Danny. I was looking for a house with a red door. But by night all the doors are black. A red door? Miss Sandy was puzzled. What house is this? No house. It does not matter. Danny took the younger girl by the hand. Never lie to me, Miss Sandy. Never betray me. I never would, Miss Sandy promised. Look, dawn comes. The sky had turned a cobalt blue from the horizon to the zenith, and behind the line of low hills to the east a glow could be seen, pale gold and oyster pink. Danny held Miss Sandy's hand as they watched the sun come up. All the gray bricks became red and yellow and blue and green and orange. The scarlet sands of the fighting pits 
transformed them into bleeding sores before her eyes. Elsewhere the golden dome of the Temple of the Graces blazed bright, and bronze stars winked along the walls, where the light of the rising sun touched the spikes on the helms of the unsullied. On the terrace a few flies stirred sluggishly. A bird began to chirp in the persimmon tree, and then two more. Danny cocked her head to hear their song, but it was not long before the sounds of the waking city drowned them out. The sounds of my city. That morning she summoned her captains and commanders to the garden, rather than descending to the audience chamber. Aegon the Conqueror brought fire and blood to Westeros, but afterward he gave them peace, prosperity, and justice. But all I have brought to Slaver's Bay is death and ruin. I have been more cow than queen, smashing and plundering than moving on. There is nothing to stay for, said Brown Ben Plum. Your grace, the slavers brought their doom on themselves, said Ario Naharis. You have brought freedom as well, Miss Sandy pointed out. Freedom to starve? asked Danny sharply. Freedom to die? Am I a dragon or a harpy? Am I mad? Do I have the taint? A dragon, Sir Baristan said with certainty. Marine is not Westeros, your grace. But how can I rule seven kingdoms if I cannot rule a single city? He had no answer to that. Danny turned away from them to gaze out over the city once again. My children need time to heal and learn. My dragons need time to grow and test their wings. And I need the same. I will not let this city go the way of Astapor. I will not let the harpy of Yunkai chain up those I freed all over again. She turned back to look at their faces. I will not march. What will you do then, Khaleesi? asked Rakaro. Stay, she said, rule, and be a queen. Jamie. The king sat at the head of the table, a stack of cushions under his arse, signing each document as it was presented to him. Only a few more, your grace, Sir Kevin Lannister assured him. This is a bill of attainder against Lord Edmure Tully, stripping him of River Run and all its lands and incomes, for rebelling against his lawful king. This is a similar attainder against his uncle, Sir Brendan Tully, uh, the Buckfish. Tommen signed them one after the other, dipping the quill carefully and writing his name in a broad, childish hand. Jimmy watched from the foot of the table, thinking of all those lords who aspired to a seat on the king's small council. They can bloody well have mine. If this was power, why did it taste like tedium? He did not feel especially powerful, watching Tommen dip his quill in the ink pot again. He felt bored and sore. Every muscle in his body ached, and his ribs and shoulders were bruised from the battering they'd gotten, courtesy of Sir Adam Marbrand. Just thinking of it made him wince. He could only hope the man would keep his mouth shut. Jamie had known Marbrand since he was a boy, serving as a page at Casterly Rock. He trusted him as much as he trusted anyone, enough to ask him to take up shields and tourney swords. He had wanted to know if he could fight with his left hand. And now I do. The knowledge was more painful than the beating that Sir Adam had given him, and the beating was so bad he could hardly dress himself this morning. If they had been fighting in earnest, Jamie would have died two dozen deaths. It seemed so simple, changing hands. It wasn't. Every instinct he had was wrong. He had to think about everything, where once he just moved. And while he was thinking, Marbrand was thumping him. His left hand couldn't even seem to hold a long sword properly. Sir Adam had disarmed him thrice, sending his blade spinning. This grants said lands, incomes, and castle to Sir Emon Frey and his lady wife, Lady Jenna. Sir Kevin presented another sheaf of parchments to the king. Tommen dipped and signed. 
This is a decree of legitimacy for a natural son of Lord Roose Bolton of the Dreadfort. And this name's Lord Bolton, your warden of the north. Tommin dipped, signed, dipped, signed. This grants Sir Rolf Spicer title to the castle Castamere, and raises him to the rank of lord. Tommin scrawled his name. I should have gone to Sir Ellen Payne, Jemmy reflected. The king's justice was not a friend as Marbrand was, and might well have beat him bloody. But without a tongue, he was not like to boast of it afterward. All it would take would be one chance remark by Sir Adam in his cups, and the whole world would soon know how useless he'd become. Lord Commander of the King's Guard. It was a cruel jape, that, though not quite so cruel as the gift his father had sent him. This is your royal pardon for Lord Gawain Westerling, his lady wife and his daughter Jane, welcoming them back into the King's peace, Sir Kevin said. This is a pardon for Lord Jonas Bracken of Stonehenge. This is a pardon for Lord Vance. This for Lord Goodbrook. This for Lord Mouton of Maidenpool. Jamie pushed himself to his seat. You seem to have these matters well in hand, Uncle. I shall leave his grace to you. As you wish, Sir Kevin rose as well. Jamie, you should go to your father. This breach between you is his doing. Nor will he mend it by sending me mocking gifts. Tell him that, if you can pry him away from the Tyrells long enough. His uncle looked distressed. The gift was heartfelt. We thought that it might encourage you to grow a new hand. Jamie turned to Tommen. Though he had Joffrey's golden curls and green eyes, the new king shared little else with his late brother. He inclined to plumpness. His face was pink and round, and he even liked to read. He is still shy of nine, this son of mine. The boy is not the man. It would be seven years before Tommen was ruling in his own right. Until then the realm would remain firmly in the hands of his lord grandfather. Sire, he asked, do I have your leave to go? As you like, Sir Uncle. Tommen looked back to Sir Kevin. Can I seal them now, great uncle? Pressing his royal seal into the hot wax was his favorite part of being king, so far. Jamie strode from the council chamber. Outside the door he found Sir Merrin Trant standing stiff at guard in white scale armor and snowy cloak. If this one should learn how feeble I am, or Kettle Black or Blount should hear of it. Remain here until his grace is done, he said, then escort him back to Magor's. Trant inclined his head. As you say, my lord. The outer ward was crowded and noisy that morning. Jamie made for the stables, where a large group of men were saddling their horses. Steel shanks, he called. Are you off then? As soon as my lady is mounted, said Steel shanks Walton, my lord of Bolton expects us. Here she is now. A groom led a fine gray mare out the stable door. On her back was mounted a skinny, hollow eyed girl wrapped in a heavy cloak. Gray it was, like the dress beneath it, and trimmed with white satin. The clasp that pinned it to her breast was wrought in the shape of a wolf's head with slitted opal eyes. The girl's long brown hair blew wild in the wind. She had a pretty face, he thought, but her eyes were sad and wary. When she saw him, she inclined her head. Sir Jamie, she said in a thin, anxious voice, you are kind to see me off. Jamie studied her closely. You know me, then? She bit her lip. You may not recall, my lord, as I was littler then, but I had the honor to meet you at Winterfell when King Robert came to visit my father, Lord Eddard. She lowered her big brown eyes and mumbled, I'm Arya Stark. Jamie had never paid much attention to Arya Stark, but it seemed to him that this girl was older. I understand you're to be married. I am to wed Lord Bolton's son, Ramsay. He used to be a snow, but his grace has made him a Bolton. They say he's very brave. I am so happy. Then why do you sound so frightened? I wish you joy, my lady. Jamie turned back to Steelshanks. You have the coin you were promised? Aye, and we've shared it out. You have my thanks. The Northman grinned. A Lannister always pays his debts. Always, said Jamie, with a last glance at the girl. 
He wondered if there was much resemblance. Not that it mattered. The real Arya Stark was buried in some unmarked grave in Flea Bottom, in all likelihood. With her brothers dead, and both parents, who would dare name this one a fraud? Good speed, he told Steelshanks. Nage raised his peace banner, and the Northmen formed a column as ragged as their fur cloaks and trotted out the castle gate. The thin girl on the grey mare looked small and forlorn in their midst. A few of the horses still shied away from the dark splotch on the hard-packed ground, where the earth had drunk the life's blood of the stable-boy Gregor Clegane had killed so clumsily. The sight of it made Jamie angry all over again. He had told his king's guard to keep the crowd out of the way, but that oaf, Sir Boros, had let himself be distracted by the duel. The fool boy himself shared some of the blame, to be sure, the dead Dornishman as well, and Clegane most of all. The blow that took the boy's arm off had been mischance. But that second cut... Well, Gregor is paying for it now. Grand Maester Purcell was tending to the man's wounds, but the howls heard ringing from the maester's chambers suggested that the healing was not going as well as it might. "'The flesh mortifies and the wounds ooze pus,' Purcell told the council. "'Even maggots will not touch such foulness. His convulsions are so violent that I have had to gag him to prevent him from biting off his tongue. I have cut away as much tissue as I dare, and treated the rot with boiling wine in bread-mould, to no avail. The veins in his arm are turning black. When I leached him, all the leeches died. My lords, I must know what malignant substance Prince Oberyn used on his spear. Let us detain these other Dornishmen until they are more forthcoming. Lord Tywin had refused him. There will be trouble enough with Sunspear over Prince Oberyn's death. I do not mean to make matters worse by holding his companions captive. Then I fear Sir Gregor may die. Undoubtedly. I swore as much in the letter I sent to Prince Doran with his brother's body. But it must be seen to be the sword of the king's justice that slays him, not a poisoned spear. Heal him. Grand Maester Purcell blinked in dismay. My lord... Heal him, Lord Tywin said again, vexed. You are aware that Lord Varys has sent fishermen into the waters around Dragonstone? They report that only a token force remains to defend the island. The Lysini are gone from the bay, and the great part of Lord Stannis's strength with them. Well and good, announced Purcell. Let Stannis rot in lease, I say. We are well rid of the man and his ambitions. Did you turn into an utter fool when Tyrion shaved your beard? This is Stannis Baratheon. The man will fight to the bitter end, and then some. If he is gone, it can only mean he intends to resume the war. Most likely he will land at Storm's End and try and rouse the Storm Lords. If so, he's finished. But a bolder man might roll the dice for dawn. If he should win Sunspear to his cause, he might prolong this war for years. So we will not offend the Martells any further, for any reason. The Dornish men are free to go, and you will heal Sir Gregor. And so the mountain screamed, day and night. Lord Tywin Lannister could cow even the stranger, it would seem. As Jamie climbed the winding steps of White Sword Tower, he could hear Sir Boros snoring in his cell. Sir Balan's door was shut as well. He had the king tonight and would sleep all day. Aside from Blount's snores, the tower was very quiet. That suited Jimmy well enough. I ought to rest myself. Last night, after his dance with Sir Adam, he'd been too sore to sleep. But when he stepped into his bedchamber, he found his sister waiting for him. She stood beside the open window, looking over the curtain walls and out to sea. The bay wind swirled around her, flattening her gown against her body in a way that quickened Jamie's pulse. It was white, that gown, like the hangings on the wall and the draperies on his bed. Swirls of tiny emeralds brightened the ends of her wide sleeves and spiraled down her bodice. Larger emeralds were set in the golden spiderweb that bound her golden hair. The gown was cut low, to bare her shoulders and the tops of her breasts. She is so beautiful. He wanted nothing more than to take her in his arms. Cersei, he closed the door softly. Why are you here? Where else could I go? When she turned to him, there were tears in her eyes. 
Father's made it clear that I am no longer wanted on the council. Jamie, won't you talk to him? Jamie took off his cloak and hung it from a peg on the wall. I talk to Lord Tywin every day. Must you be so stubborn? All he wants is to force me from the King's Guard and send me back to Casterly Rock. That need not be so terrible. He is sending me back to Casterly Rock as well. He wants me far away, so he'll have a free hand with Tommen. Tommen is my son, not his. Tommen is the king. He is a boy, a frightened little boy, who saw his brother murdered at his own wedding. And now they are telling him that he must marry. The girl is twice his age and twice a widow. He eased himself into a chair, trying to ignore the ache of bruised muscles. The Tyrells are insisting. I see no harm in it. Tommen's been lonely since Marcella went to Dorne. He likes having Marguerite and her ladies about. Let them wed. He is your son. He is my seed. He's never called me father. No more than Joffrey ever did. You warned me a thousand times never to show any undue interest in them. To keep them safe. You as well. How would it have looked if my brother had played the father to the king's children? Even Robert might have grown suspicious. Well, he's beyond suspicion now. Robert's death still left a bitter taste in Jamie's mouth. It should have been me who killed him, not Cersei. I only wished he'd died at my hands, when I still had two of them. If I'd let king slaying become a habit, as he liked to say, I could have taken you as my wife for all the world to see. I'm not ashamed of loving you, only of the things I've done to hide it. That boy at Winterfell... Did I tell you to throw him out the window? If you'd gone hunting as I begged you, nothing would have happened. But no, you had to have me. You could not wait until we returned to the city. I'd waited long enough. I hated watching Robert stumble to your bed every night, always wondering if maybe this night he'd decide to claim his rights as husband. Jamie suddenly remembered something else that troubled him about Winterfell. At River Run. Caitlin Stark seemed convinced I'd sent some footpad to slit her son's throat. That I'd given him a dagger. That, she said scornfully, Tyrion asked me about that. There was a dagger. The scars on Lady Caitlin's hands were real enough. She showed them to me. Did you— Oh, don't be absurd. Cersei closed the window. Yes, I hoped the boy would die. So did you. Even Robert thought that would have been for the best. We kill our horses when they break a leg, and our dogs when they go blind, but we are too weak to give the same mercy to crippled children, he told me. He was blind himself at the time, from drink. Robert? Jimmy had guarded the king long enough to know that Robert Baratheon said things in his cups that he would have denied angrily the next day. Were you alone when Robert said this? You don't think he said it to Ned Stark, I hope. Of course we were alone. Us and the children. Cersei removed her hairnet and draped it over a bedpost, then shook out her golden curls. Perhaps Myrcella sent this man with a dagger. Do you think so? It was meant as mockery, but she'd cut right to the heart of it. Jamie saw at once. Not Myrcella. Joffrey. Cersei frowned. Joffrey had no love for Rob Stark, but the younger boy was nothing to him. He was only a child himself. A child hungry for a pat on the head from that sot you let him believe was his father. He had an uncomfortable thought. Tyrion almost died because of this bloody dagger. If he knew the whole thing was Joffrey's work, that might be why— I don't care why, Cersei so said. He can take his reasons down to hell with him. If you had seen how Joff died— he fought, Jamie, he fought for every breath, but it was as if some malign spirit had its hands about his throat. He had such terror in his eyes. When he was little, he'd run to me when he was scared or hurt, and I would protect him. But that night there was nothing I could do. Tyrion murdered him in front of me, and there was nothing I could do. Cersei sank to her knees before his chair and took Jamie's good hand between both of hers. Joff is dead. And Marcella's in dawn. Tommen's all I have left. You mustn't let father take him from me, Jamie, please. Lord Tywin has not asked for my approval. I can talk to him, but he will not listen. He will if you agree to leave the King's Guard. 
I am not leaving the Kingsguard. His sister fought back tears. Jamie, you're my shining knight. You cannot abandon me when I need you most. He is stealing my son, sending me away. And unless you stop him, father is going to force me to wed again. Jamie should not have been surprised, but he was. The words were a blow to his gut harder than any that Sir Adam Marbrand had dealt him. Who? Oh, does it matter? Some lord or other, someone father thinks he needs. I don't care. I will not have another husband. You are the only man I want in my bed ever again. Then tell him that. She pulled her hands away. You are talking madness again. Would you have us ripped apart as Mother did that time she caught us playing? Tommen would lose the throne, Marcella her marriage. I want to be your wife. We belong to each other, but it can never be, Jamie. We are brother and sister. The Targaryens. We are not Targaryens. Quiet, he said scornfully. So loud you'll wake my sworn brothers. We can't have that now, can we? People might learn that you had come to see me. Jamie, she sobbed, don't you think I want it as much as you do? It makes no matter who they wed me to. I want you at my side. I want you in my bed. I want you inside me. Nothing has changed between us. Let me prove it to you. She pushed up his tunic and began to fumble with the laces of his breeches. Jamie felt himself responding. No, he said, not here. They had never done it in White Sword Tower, much less in the Lord Commander's chambers. Cersei, this is not the place. You took me in the sept. This is no different. She drew out his cock and bent her head over it. Jamie pushed her away with the stump of his right hand. No, not here, I said. He forced himself to stand. For an instant he could see confusion in her bright green eyes, and fear as well. Then rage replaced it. Circe gathered herself together, got to her feet, straightened her skirts. Was it your hand they hacked off in Harren Hall, or your manhood? As she shook her head, her hair tumbled around her bare white shoulders. I was a fool to come. You lacked the courage to avenge Joffrey. Why would I think that you'd protect Tommen? Tell me, if the imp had killed all three of your children, would that have made you wroth? Tyrion is not going to harm Tommen or Marcella. I am still not certain he killed Joffrey. Her mouth twisted in anger. How can you say that? After all his threats— Threats mean nothing. He swears he did not do it. Oh, he swears, is that it? And dwarfs don't lie, is that what you think? Not to me. No more than you would. You great golden fool. He's lied to you a thousand times, and so have I. She bound up her hair again and scooped up the hairnet from the bedpost where she'd hung it. Think what you will. The little monster is in a black cell, and soon Sir Illyn will have his head off. Perhaps you'd like it for a keepsake. She glanced to the pillow. He can watch over you as you sleep alone in that cold white bed. Until his eyes rot out, that is. You had best go, Cersei. You're making me angry. Oh, an angry cripple. How terrifying. She laughed. A pity Lord Tywin Lannister never had a son. I could have been the heir he wanted, but I lacked the cock. And speaking of such, best tuck yours away, brother. It looks rather sad and small, hanging from your britches like that. When she was gone, Jamie took her advice, fumbling one-handed at his laces. He felt a bone-deep ache in his phantom fingers. I've lost a hand, a father, a son, a sister, and a lover. And soon enough I will lose a brother. And yet they keep telling me House Lannister won this war. Jamie donned his cloak and went downstairs, where he found Sir Boris Blount having a cup of wine in the common room. When you're done with your drink, tell Sir Loras I'm ready to see her. Sir Boris was too much of a coward to do much more than glower. You are ready to see who? Just tell Loras. Aye. Sir Boris drained his cup. Aye, Lord Commander. He took his own good time about it, though, or else the night of flowers proved hard to find. Several hours had passed by the time they arrived, the slim, handsome youth and the big, ugly maid. Jamie was sitting alone in the round room, leafing idly through the white book. "'Lord Commander,' Sir Loras said, "'you wished to see the maid of Tarth?' "'I did.' Jamie waved them closer with his left hand. 
You have talked with her, I take it? As you commanded, my lord. And? The lad tensed. I... It may be it happened as she says, sir. That it was Stannis. I cannot be certain. Varys tells me that the Castellan of Storm's End perished strangely as well, said Jamie. Sir Courtenay Penrose, said Brienne sadly, a good man. A stubborn man. One day he stood square in the way of the King of Dragonstone. The next he leapt from a tower. Jamie stood. Sir Loras, we will talk more of this later. You may leave Brienne with me. The wench looked as ugly and awkward as ever, he decided, when Tyrell left them. Someone had dressed her in woman's clothes again, but this dress fit much better than that hideous pink rag the goat had made her wear. "'Blue is a good color on you, my lady,' Jamie observed. "'It goes well with your eyes.' "'She does have astonishing eyes.' Brienne glanced down at herself, flustered. Scepter Donis padded out the bodice to give it that shape. She said you sent it to me. She lingered by the door, as if she meant to flee at any second. You look different, he managed a half-smile. More meat on the ribs and fewer lice in my hair, that's all. The stump's the same. Close the door and come here. She did as he bid her. The white cloak is new, but I'm sure I'll soil it soon enough. That wasn't... I was about to say that it becomes you. She came closer, hesitant. Jamie, did you mean what you told Sir Loras? About... about King Renly and the Shadow? Jamie shrugged. I would have killed Renly myself if we'd met in battle. What do I care who cut his throat? You said I had honor. I'm the bloody Kingslayer, remember? When I say you have honor, that's like a whore of outsafing your maidenhood. He leaned back and looked up at her. Steelshanks is on his way back north, to deliver Arya Stark to Roose Bolton. You gave her to him? she cried, dismayed. You swore an oath to Lady Caitlin with a sword at my throat. But never mind. Lady Caitlin's dead. I could not give her back her daughters even if I had them. And the girl my father sent with Steelshanks was not Arya Stark. Not Arya Stark? You heard me. My lord father found some skinny northern girl, more or less the same age, with more or less the same coloring. He dressed her up in white and gray, gave her a silver wolf to pin her cloak, and sent her off to wed Bolton's bastard. He lifted his stump to point at her. I wanted to tell you that before you went galloping off to rescue her and got yourself killed for no good purpose. You're not half bad with a sword, but you're not good enough to take on two hundred men by yourself. Brienne shook her head. When Lord Bolton learns that your father paid him with false coin. Oh, he knows. Lannister's lie, remember? It makes no matter. This girl serves his purpose just as well. Who is going to say that she isn't Arya Stark? Everyone the girl was close to is dead, except for her sister, who has disappeared. Why would you tell me all this, if it's true? You are betraying your father's secrets. The hands of secrets, he thought. I no longer have a father. I pay my debts like every good little lion. I did promise Lady Stark her daughters, and one of them is still alive. My brother may know where she is, but if so, he isn't saying. Cersei is convinced that Sansa helped him murder Joffrey. The wench's mouth got stubborn. I will not believe that gentle girl a poisoner. Lady Caitlin said that she had a loving heart. It was your brother. There was a trial, Sir Laura said. Two trials, actually. Words and swords both failed him. A bloody mess. Did you watch from your window? My cell faces the sea. I heard the shouting, though. Prince Oberyn of Dorne is dead. Sir Gregor Clegane lies dying, and Tyrion stands condemned before the eyes of gods and men. They're keeping him in a black cell till they kill him. Brienne looked at him. You do not believe he did it. Jamie gave her a hard smile. See, wench, we know each other too well. Tyrion's wanted to be me since he took his first step, but he'd never follow me in Kingslaying. Sansa Stark killed Joffrey. My brothers kept silent to protect her. 
He gets these fits of gallantry from time to time. The last one cost him a nose. This time it will mean his head. No, Brienne said. It was not my lady's daughter. It could not have been her. There's the stubborn, stupid wench that I remember. She reddened. My name is Brienne of Tarth, Jamie sighed. I have a gift for you. He reached down under the Lord Commander's chair and brought it out, wrapped in folds of crimson velvet. Brienne approached as if the bundle was like to bite her, reached out a huge freckled hand, and flipped back a fold of cloth. Rubies glimmered in the light. She picked the treasure up gingerly, curled her fingers around the leather grip, and slowly slid the sword free of its scabbard. Blood and black the ripples shone. A finger of reflected light ran red along the edge. Is this Valyrian steel? I have never seen such colors. All right. There was a time that I would have given my right hand to wield a sword like that. Now it appears I have. So the blade is wasted on me. Take it. Before she could think to refuse, he went on. A sword so fine must bear a name. It would please me if you would call this one Oath Keeper. One more thing. The blade comes with a price. Her face darkened. I told you. I will never serve such foul creatures as us. Yes, I recall. Hear me out, Brienne. Both of us swore oaths concerning Sansa Stark. Cersei means to see that the girl is found and killed, wherever she has gone to ground. Brienne's homely face twisted in fury. If you believe that I would harm my lady's daughter for a sword, you— Just listen, he snapped, angered by her assumption. I want you to find Sansa first and get her somewhere safe. How else are the two of us going to make good our stupid vows to your precious dead Lady Caitlin? The wench blinked. I, I thought— I know what you thought. Suddenly Jamie was sick of the sight of her. She bleats like a bloody sheep. When Ned Stark died, his great sword was given to the king's justice, he told her. But my father felt that such a fine blade was wasted on a mere headsman. He gave Sir Illyn a new sword, and that ice melted down and reforged. There was enough metal for two new blades. You're holding one. So you'll be defending Ned Stark's daughter with Ned Stark's own steel, if that makes any difference to you. Sir, I... I owe you an apology. He cut her off. Take the bloody sword and go before I change my mind. There's a bay mare in the stables, as homely as you are, but somewhat better trained. Chase after steel shanks, search for Sansa, or ride home to your Isle of Sapphires. It's not to me. I don't want to look at you anymore. Jamie, Kingslayer! He reminded her. Best use that sword to clean the wax out of your ears, wench. We're done. Stubbornly, she persisted. Joffrey was your... My king. Leave it at that. You say Sansa killed him. Why protect her? Because Joff was no more to me than a squirt of seed in Cersei's cunt, and because he deserved to die. I have made kings and unmade them. Sansa Stark is my last chance for honor. Jamie smiled thinly. Besides, kingslayers should band together. Are you ever going to go? Her big hand wrapped tight around Oathkeeper. I will. And I will find the girl and keep her safe, for her lady mother's sake. And for yours. She bowed stiffly, whirled, and went. Jamie sat alone at the table while the shadows crept across the room. As dusk began to settle, he lit a candle and opened the white book to his own page. Quill and ink he found in a drawer. Beneath the last line Sir Baristan had entered, he wrote in an awkward hand that might have done credit to a six-year-old being taught his first letters by a maester. Defeated in the Whispering Wood by the young wolf Rob Stark during the War of the Five Kings. Held captive at River Run and ransomed for a promise unfulfilled. Captured again by the brave companions, and maimed at the word of Vargo Hoet, their captain, losing his sword hand to the blade of Zalo the Fat. Returned safely to King's Landing by Brienne, the maid of Toth. When he was done, more than three quarters of his page still remained to be filled between the gold line on the crimson shield on top and the blank white shield at the bottom. 
Sir Gerald Hightower had begun his history, and Sir Barristan Selmy had continued it. But the rest Jamie Lannister would need to write for himself. He could write whatever he chose, henceforth. Whatever he chose. John. The wind was blowing wild from the east, so strong the heavy cage would rock whenever a gust got it in its teeth. It skirled along the wall, shivering off the ice, making John's cloak flap against the bars. The sky was slate gray, the sun no more than a faint patch of brightness behind the clouds. Across the killing ground he could see the glimmer of a thousand campfires burning, but their lights seemed small and powerless against such gloom and cold. A grim day. John Snow wrapped gloved hands around the bars and held tight as the wind hammered at the cage once more. When he looked straight down past his feet, the ground was lost in shadow, as if he were being lowered into some bottomless pit. Well, death is a bottomless pit of sorts, he reflected, and when this day's work is done, my name will be shadowed forever. Bastard children were born from lust and lies, men said. Their nature was wanton and treacherous. Once John had meant to prove them wrong, to show his lord father that he could be as good and true a son as Rob. I made a botch of that. Rob had become a hero king. If John was remembered at all, it would be as a turncloak, an oath-breaker, and a murderer. He was glad that Lord Eddard was not alive to see his shame. I should have stayed in that cave with the grit. If there was a life beyond this one, he hoped to tell her that. She will claw my face the way the eagle did, and curse me for a coward, but I'll tell her all the same. He flexed his sword hand, as Maester Amon had taught him. The habit had become part of him, and he would need his fingers to be limber to have even half a chance of murdering Mance Raider. They had pulled him out this morning after four days in the ice, locked up in a cell five by five by five, too low for him to stand, too tight for him to stretch out on his back. The stewards had long ago discovered that food and meat kept longer in the icy storerooms carved from the base of the wall, but prisoners did not. "'You will die in here, Lord Snow,' Sir Alliser had said just before he closed the heavy wooden door, and John had believed it. But this morning they had come and pulled him out again, and marched him, cramped and shivering, back to the King's Tower to stand before jowly Janos Slint once more. "'That old maester says I cannot hang you,' Slint declared. "'He has written Cotter Pike, and even had the bloody gall to show me the letter. "'He says you are no turncloak.' "'Amon's lived too long, my lord,' Sir Alliser assured him. "'His wits have gone dark as his eyes.' "'Aye,' Slint said. "'A blind man with a chain about his neck, who does he think he is?' "'Amon Targaryen.' John thought, a king's son and a king's brother and a king who might have been. But he said nothing. Still, Slint said, I will not have it said that Janos Slint hanged a man unjustly. I will not. I have decided to give you one last chance to prove you are as loyal as you claim, Lord Snow. One last chance to do your duty, yes? He stood. Mance Raider wants to parley with us. He knows he has no chance now that Janos Slint has come. So he wants to talk, this king beyond the wall. But the man is craven and will not come to us. No doubt he knows I'd hang him. Hang him by his feet from the top of the wall on a rope two hundred feet long. But he will not come. He asks that we send an envoy to him. We're sending you, Lord Snow. Sir Alliser smiled. Me. John's voice was flat. Why me? "'You rode with these wildlings,' said Thorn. "'Mance Raider knows you. He will be more inclined to trust you.' "'That was so wrong, John might have laughed. "'You've got it backward. "'Mance suspected me from the first. "'If I show up in his camp wearing a black cloak again and speaking for the Night's Watch, "'he'll know that I betrayed him.' "'He asked for an envoy. We are sending one,' said Slint. If you are too craven to face this turncloak king, we can return you to your ice cell. This time without the furs, I think, yes. No need for that, my lord, said Sir Alliser. Lord Snow will do as we ask. He wants to show us that he is no turncloak. He wants to prove himself a loyal man of the Night's Watch. Thorn was much the more clever of the two, John realized. 
This had his stink all over it. He was trapped. I'll go, he said in a clipped, curt voice. My lord, John Oslint reminded him. You'll address me. I'll go, my lord. But you are making a mistake, my lord. You are sending the wrong man, my lord. Just the sight of me is going to anger Mance. My lord would have a better chance of reaching terms if he sent— Terms? Sir Alistair chuckled. Janos Slint does not make terms with lawless savages, Lord Snow. No, he does not. We're not sending you to talk with Mance Raider, Sir Alistair said. We're sending you to kill him. The wind whistled through the bars, and John Snow shivered. His leg was throbbing, and his head. He was not fit to kill a kitten. Yet here he was. The trap had teeth. With Maester Amon insisting on John's innocence, Lord Janos had not dared to leave him in the ice to die. This was better. Our honor means no more than our lives, so long as the realm is safe. Corn half hand had said in the frost fangs. He must remember that. Whether he slew Mance or only tried and failed, the free folk would kill him. Even desertion was impossible, if he'd been so inclined. To Mance he was a proven liar and betrayer. When the cage jerked to a halt, John swung down onto the ground and rattled Long Claw's hilt to loosen the bastard blade in its scabbard. The gate was a few yards to his left, still blocked by the splintered ruins of the turtle, the carcass of a mammoth, ripening within. There were other corpses, too, strewn amidst broken barrels, hardened pitch, and patches of burnt grass, all shadowed by the wall. John had no wish to linger here. He started walking toward the wildling camp, past the body of a dead giant whose head had been crushed by a stone. A raven was pulling out bits of brain from the giant's shattered skull, it looked up as he walked by. Snow! It screamed at him. Snow! Snow! Then it opened its wings and flew away. No sooner had he started out than a lone rider emerged from the wildling camp and came toward him. He wondered if Mance was coming out to parley in no man's land. That might make it easier, though nothing will make it easy. But as the distance between them diminished, John saw that the horseman was short and broad, with gold rings glinting on thick arms and a white beard spreading out across his massive chest. Arr! Tormund boomed when they came together. John Snow the Crow! I feared we'd seen the last of you. I never knew you feared anything, Tormund. That made the wildling grin. Well said, lad. I see your cloak is black. Mance won't like that. If you've come to change sides again, best climb back on that wall of yours. They've sent me to treat with the king beyond the wall. Treat? Tommen laughed. Now there's a word. Ha! Huh. Mance wants to talk, that's true enough. Can't say he'd want to talk with you, though. I'm the one they've sent. I see that. Best come along, then. You want to ride? I can walk. You fought us hard here, Tormund turned his garron back toward the wildling camp. You and your brothers, I give you that. Two hundred dead and a dozen giants. Mag himself went in that gate of yours and never did come out. He died on the sword of a brave man named Donald Noy. Aye, some great lord was he, this Donald Noy. One of your shiny knights in their steel small clothes. A blacksmith. He only had one arm. A one-armed smith slew Mag the Mighty? Huh? That must have been a fight to see. Nance will make a song of it, see if he don't. Tormund took a waterskin off his saddle and pulled the cork. This will warm us some. To Donald Noy and Mag the Mighty. He took a swig and handed it down to John. To Donald Noy and Mag the Mighty. The skin was full of mead, but a mead so potent that it made John's eyes water and sent tendrils of fire snaking through his chest. After the ice cell and the cold dry down in the cage, the warmth was welcome. Tormund took the skin back and downed another swig, then wiped his mouth. The Magnar of Thin swore to us that he'd have the gate wide open, so all we'd need to do was stroll through singing. He was going to bring the whole wall down. He brought down part, John said, on his head. 
Ha!' said Tormund. "'Well, I never had much use for steer. "'When a man's got no beard, nor hair, nor ears, "'you can't get a good grip on him when you fight.' "'He kept his horse at a slow walk "'so John could limp beside him. "'What happened to that leg?' "'An arrow. "'One of your grits, I think.' "'That's a woman for you. "'One day she's kissing you, "'the next she's filling you with arrows. "'She's dead.' Eh? Tormund gave a sad shake of the head. A waste. If I'd been ten years younger, I'd have stolen her myself. That hair she had. Where are the hottest fires burn out quickest? He lifted the skin of mead. To a grit, kissed by fire. He drank deep. To a grit, kissed by fire. John repeated when Tormund handed him back the skin. He drank even deeper. Was it you killed her? My brother. John had never learned which one, and hoped he never would. You bloody crows. Tormund's tone was gruff, yet strangely gentle. That long spear stole me daughter. Munda, me little autumn apple. Took her right out of my tent with all four of her brothers about. Toreg slept through it, the great lout, and Torwind... Well, Torwind the Tame, that says all the need saying, don't it? The young ones gave the lad a fight, though. And Munda? asked John. She's my own blood, said Tormund proudly. She broke his lip for him and bit one ear half off, and I hear he's got so many scratches on his back he can't wear a cloak. She likes him well enough, though. And why not? He don't fight with no spear, you know. Never has. So where do you think he got that name, huh? John had to laugh. Even now, even here. Egret had been fond of Longspear Reich. He hoped he found some joy with Tormund's Munda. Someone needed to find some joy somewhere. You know nothing, Jon Snow, Egret would have told him. I know that I'm going to die, he thought. I know that much, at least. All men die, he could almost hear her say. And women, too and every beast that flies or swims or runs. It's not the when a dying that matters. It's the how of it, Jon Snow. Easy for you to say, he thought back. You died brave in battle, storming the castle of a foe. I'm going to die a turncloak and a killer. Nor would his death be quick unless it came on the end of Mance's sword. Soon they were among the tents. It was the usual wildling camp, a sprawling jumble of cook-fires and piss-pits, children and goats wandering freely, sheep bleeding among the trees, horse-hides pegged up to dry. There was no plan to it, no order, no defences. But there were men and women and animals everywhere. Many ignored him, but for every one who went about his business there were ten who stopped to stare, children squatting by the fires, old women in dog-carts, Cave dwellers with painted faces, raiders with claws and snakes and severed heads painted on their shields, all turned to have a look. John saw spearwives, too, their long hair streaming in the piney wind that sighed between the trees. There were no true hills here, but Mance Raider's white fur tent had been raised on a spot of high stony ground right on the edge of the trees. The king beyond the wall was waiting outside, his ragged red and black cloak blowing in the wind. Arma Dog said was with him, John saw, back from her raids and feints along the wall, and Varamir Six Skins as well, attended by his shadow cat and two lean grey wolves. When they saw who the watch had sent, Arma turned her head and spat, and one of Varamir's wolves bared its teeth and growled. You must be very brave or very stupid, John Snow, Mance Raider said to come back to us wearing a black cloak? What else would a man of the Night's Watch wear? Kill him, urged Tarma. Send his body back up in that cage of theirs and tell them to send us someone else. I'll keep his head for my standard. A turncloak's worse than a dog. I warned you he was false. Varamir's tone was mild, but his shadowcat was staring at John hungrily through slitted gray eyes. I never did like the smell of him. "'Pull in your claws, beastling!' Tormund Giant Spain swung down off his horse. "'The lad's here to hear. "'You lay a paw on him, might be I'll take me that shadow-skin cloak I've been warning.' 
Tormund Crow lover, Harmer sneered. You are a great sack of wind, old man. The skin changer was grey faced, round shouldered, and bald, a mouse of a man with a wolfling's eyes. Once a horse is broken to the saddle, any man can mount him, he said in a soft voice. Once a beast's been joined to a man, any skin changer can slip inside and ride him. Oro was withering inside his feathers, so I took the eagle for my own. But the joining works both ways, Warg. Oro lives inside me now, whispering how much he hates you. And I can soar above the wall and see with eagle eyes. So we know, said Mance. We know how few you were when you stopped the turtle. We know how many came from Eastwatch. We know how your supplies have dwindled. Pitch, oil, arrow, spears, even your stare is gone, and that cage can only lift so many. We know. And now you know we know. He opened the flap of the tent. Come inside. The rest of you wait here. What, even me? said Tormund. Particularly you. Always. It was warm within. A small fire burned beneath the smoke holes, and a brazier smoldered near the pile of furs where Dalla lay, pale and sweating. Her sister was holding her hand. Val, John remembered. I was sorry when Jarl fell, he told her. Val looked at him with pale gray eyes. He always climbed too fast. She was as fair as he'd remembered. Slender, full-breasted, graceful even at rest, with high, sharp cheekbones and a thick braid of honey-colored hair that fell to her waist. Dalla's time is near, Mance explained. She and Val will stay. They know what I mean to say. John kept his face as still as ice. Foul enough to slay a man in his own tent under truce. Must I murder him in front of his wife as their child is being born? He closed the fingers of his sword hand. Mance was not wearing armor, but his own sword was sheathed on his left hip. And there were other weapons in the tent, daggers and dirks, a bow and a quiver of arrows, a bronze-headed spear lying beside that big black horn. John sucked in his breath. A war horn. A bloody great war horn. Yes, Mance said. The horn of winter, that Joraman once blew to wake giants from the earth. The horn was huge, eight feet along the curve, and so wide at the mouth that he could have put his arm inside up to the elbow. If this came from an aurochs, it was the biggest that ever lived. At first he thought the bands around it were bronze, but when he moved closer he realized they were gold. Old gold, more brown than yellow, and graven with runes. Egret said you never found the horn. Did you think only crows could lie? I liked you well enough for a bastard, but I never trusted you. A man needs to earn my trust. John faced him. If you've had the horn of Joraman all along, why haven't you used it? Why bother building turtles and sending thens to kill us in our beds? If this horn is all the songs say, why not just sound it and be done? It was Dalla who answered him, Dalla, great with child, lying on her pile of furs beside the brazier. We free folk know things you kneelers have forgotten. Sometimes the short road is not the safest, John Snow. The horned lord once said that sorcery is a sword without a hilt. There is no safe way to grasp it. Mance ran a hand along the curve of the great horn. No man goes hunting with only one arrow in his quiver, he said. I had hoped that Steer and Jarl would take your brothers unawares and open the gate for us. I drew your garrison away with feints and raids and secondary attacks. Bowen Marsh swallowed that lure as I knew he would, but your band of cripples and orphans proved to be more stubborn than anticipated. Don't think you've stopped us, though. The truth is you are too few and we are too many. I could continue the attack here and still send ten thousand men to cross the Bay of Seals on rafts and take East Watch from the rear. I could storm the Shadow Tower, too. I know the approaches as well as any man alive. I could send men and mammoths to dig out the gates at the castles you've abandoned, all of them at once. Why don't you, then? 
John could have drawn Longclaw then, but he wanted to hear what the wildling had to say. Blood, said Mance Raider. I'd win in the end, yes, but you'd bleed me, and my people have blood enough. Your losses haven't been that heavy. Not at your hands. Mance studied John's face. You saw the fist of the first men. You know what happened there. You know what we are facing. The others, they grow stronger as the days grow shorter and the nights colder. First they kill you, then they send your dead against you. The giants have not been able to stand against them, nor the Thens, the Ice River clans, the Hornfoots. Nor you? Nor me. There was anger in that admission, and bitterness too deep for words. Raymond Redbeard, Bale the Bard, Gendel and Gorn, the Horned Lord, they all came south to conquer, but I've come with my tail between my legs to hide behind your wall. He touched the horn again. If I sound the horn of winter, the wall will fall. Or so the songs would have me believe. There are those among my people who want nothing more. But once the wall is fallen, Dalla said, what will stop the others? Mance gave her a fond smile. It's a wise woman I've found, a true queen. He turned back to John. Go back and tell them to open their gate and let us pass. If they do, I will give them the horn, and the wall will stand until the end of days. Open the gate and let them pass. Easy to say, but what must follow? Giants camping in the ruins of Winterfell? Cannibals in the wolf's wood? Chariots sweeping across the barrel lands? Free folk stealing the daughters of shipwrights and silversmiths from White Harbor and fishwives off the stony shore? Are you a true king? John asked suddenly. I've never had a crown on my head or sat my arse on a bloody throne, if that's what you're asking, Mance replied. My birth is as low as a man's can get. No septons ever smeared my head with oils. I don't own any castles, and my queen wears furs and amber, not silk and sapphires. I am my own champion, my own fool, and my own harpist. You don't become king beyond the wall because your father was. The free folk won't follow a name, and they don't care which brother was born first. They follow fighters. When I left the Shadow Tower, there were five men making noises about how they might be the stuff of kings. Tormund was one, the Magnar another. The other three I slew, when they made it plain they'd sooner fight than follow. You can kill your enemies, John said bluntly, but can you rule your friends? If we let your people pass, are you strong enough to make them keep the king's peace and obey the laws? Whose laws? The laws of Winterfell and King's Landing? Mance laughed. When we want laws, we'll make our own. You can keep your king's justice, too, and your king's taxes. I'm offering you the horn, not our freedom. We will not kneel to you. What if we refuse the offer? John had no doubt that they would. The old bear might at least have listened, though he would have balked at the notion of letting thirty or forty thousand wildlings loose on the Seven Kingdoms. But Alistair Thorne and Janos Slint would dismiss the notion out of hand. If you refuse, Mance Raider said, Tormund Giant Spain will sound the horn of winter three days hence, at dawn. He could carry the message back to Castle Black and tell them of the horn, but if he left Mance still alive, Lord Janos and Sir Alliser would seize on that as proof that he was a turncloak. A thousand thoughts flickered through John's head. If I can destroy the horn, smash it here and now— But before he could begin to think that through, he heard the low moan of some other horn, made faint by the tent's hide walls. Mance heard it, too. Frowning, he went to the door. John followed. The war horn was louder outside. Its call had stirred the wildling camp. Three hornfoot men jogged past, carrying long spears. Horses were whinnying and snorting, giants roaring in the old tongue, and even the mammoths were restless. Outrider's horn, Tormund told Mance. Something's coming, 
Varamir sat cross-legged on the half-frozen ground, his wolves circled restlessly around him. A shadow swept over him, and John looked up to see the eagle's blue-gray wings. Coming from the east. When the dead walk, walls and stakes and swords mean nothing, he remembered. You cannot fight the dead, John Snow. No man knows that half so well as me. Harma scowled. East? The whites should be behind us. East, the skin changer repeated. Something's coming. The others? John asked. Mance shook his head. The others never come when the sun is up. Chariots were rattling across the killing ground, jammed with riders, waving spears of sharpened bone. The king groaned. Where the bloody hell do they think they're going? Quinn, get those fools back where they belong. Someone bring my horse. The mare, not the stallion. I'll warn my armor, too. Mance glanced suspiciously at the wall. Atop the icy parapets, the straw soldiers stood collecting arrows, but there was no sign of any other activity. Come on, man, up your raiders. Tormund, find your sons and give me a triple line of spears. Aye, said Tormund, striding off. The mousy little skin-changer closed his eyes and said, I see them. They're coming along the streams and game trails. Who? Men. Men on horses. Men in steel and men in black. Crows. Mance made the word a curse. He turned on John. Did my old brothers think they'd catch me with my britches down if they attacked while we were talking? If they planned an attack, they never told me about it. John did not believe it. Lord Janos lacked the men to attack the wildling camp. Besides, he was on the wrong side of the wall, and the gate was sealed with rubble. He had a different sort of treachery in mind. This can't be his work. If you're lying to me again, you won't be leaving here alive, Mance warned. His guards brought him his horse and armor. Elsewhere around the camp, John saw people running at cross purposes, some men forming up as if to storm the wall, while others slipped into the woods, women driving dog carts east, mammoths wandering west. He reached back over his shoulder and drew Longclaw, just as a thin line of rangers emerged from the fringes of the wood three hundred yards away. They wore black mail, black half-helms, and black cloaks. Half-armored, Mance drew his sword. "'You knew nothing of this, did you?' he said to John coldly. Slow as honey on a cold morning, the rangers swept down on the wildling camp, picking their way through clumps of gorse and stands of trees, over roots and rocks. Wildlings flew to meet them, shouting war cries and waving clubs and bronze swords and axes made of flint, galloping headlong at their ancient enemies. A shout, a slash, and a fine, brave death, John had heard brothers say of the free folk's way of fighting. Believe what you will, John told the king beyond the wall, but I knew nothing of any attack. Hama thundered past before Mance could reply, riding at the head of thirty raiders. Her standard went before her, a dead dog impaled on a spear, raining blood at every stride. Mance watched as she smashed into the rangers. "'Might be you're telling it true,' he said. "'Those look like East Watchmen, satyrs on horses. Connor Pike always had more guts than sense. He took the Lord of Bones at Longbarrow. He might have thought to do the same with me. If so, he's a fool. He doesn't have the men. He—' Mance! the shout came. It was a scout, bursting from the trees on a lathered horse. Mance! there's more! They're all around us! Iron men! Iron! A host of iron men! Cursing, Mance swung up into the saddle. Faramir, stay and see that no harm comes to Dalla. The king beyond the wall pointed his sword at John. And keep a few extra eyes on this crow. If he runs, rip out his throat. Aye, I'll do that. The skin-changer was a head shorter than John, slumped and soft, but that shadow-cat could disembowel him with one paw. "'They're coming from the north, too,' Varamir told Mance. "'You best go.' Mance donned his helm with its raven wings. His men were mounted up as well. "'Arrow ahead, Mance snapped. "'To me! Form wedge!' Yet when he slammed his heels into the mare and flew across the field of the rangers, the men who raced to catch him lost all semblance of formation.' John took a step toward the tent, thinking of the Horn of Winter, but the shadow-cat blocked him, tail lashing. The beast's nostrils flared, and slaver ran from his curved front teeth. He smells my fear. He missed Ghost more than ever, then. The two wolves were behind him, growling. Banners, he heard Varamir murmur. I see golden banners. Oh, 
A mammoth lumbered by, trumpeting, a half-dozen bowmen in the wooden tower on his back. The king, no. Then the skin-changer threw back his head and screamed. The sound was shocking, ear-piercing, thick with agony. Faramir fell, writhing, and the cat was screaming too, and high, high in the eastern sky against the wall of cloud, John saw the eagle burning. For a heartbeat it flamed brighter than a star, wreathed in red and golden orange, its wings beating wildly at the air as if it could fly from the pain. Higher it flew, and higher, and higher still. The scream brought Val out of the tent, white-faced. What is it? What's happened? Varamir's wolves were fighting each other and the shadow-cat had raced off into the trees, but the man was still twisting on the ground. "'What's wrong with him?' Val demanded, horrified. "'Where's Mance?' "'There,' John pointed. "'Gone to fight.' The king led his ragged wedge into a knot of rangers, his sword flashing. "'Gone? He can't be gone. Not now. It's started.' "'The battle?' He watched the rangers scatter before Harmer's bloody dog's head. The raiders screamed and hacked and chased the men in black back into the trees. But there were more men coming from the wood, a column of horse. Knights on heavy horse, John saw. Harma had to regroup and wheel to meet them, but half of her men had raced too far ahead. The birth! Val was shouting at him. Trumpets were blowing all around, loud and brazen. The wildlings have no trumpets, only war horns. They knew that as well as he did. The sound sent free folk running in confusion. Some toward the fighting, others away. A mammoth was stomping through a flock of sheep that three men were trying to herd off west. The drums were beating as the wildlings ran to form squares and lines but they were too late, too disorganized, too slow. The enemy was emerging from the forest, from the east, the northeast, the north. Three great columns of heavy horse, all dark, glinting steel and bright wool surcoats. Not the men of East Watch. Those had been no more than a line of scouts. An army. The king? John was as confused as the wildlings. Could Rob have returned? Had the boy on the Iron Throne finally bestirred himself? You'd best get back inside the tent, he told Val. Across the field, one column had washed over Harma Dog's head. Another smashed into the flank of Tormund's spearmen, as he and his sons desperately tried to turn them. The giants were climbing onto their mammoths, though, and the knights on their barded horses did not like that at all. He could see how the coursers and destriers screamed and scattered at the sight of those lumbering mountains. But there was fear on the wildling's side as well, hundreds of women and children rushing away from the battle, some of them blundering right under the hooves of Garons. He saw an old woman's dog-cart veer into the path of three chariots to send them crashing into each other. "'Gods!' Val whispered. "'Gods, why are they doing this?' "'Go inside the tent and stay with Dalla. It's not safe out here.' It wouldn't be a great deal safer inside, but she didn't need to hear that. "'I need to find the midwife,' Val said. "'You're the midwife.' I'll stay here until Mance comes back. He had lost sight of Mance, but now he found him again, cutting his way through a knot of mounted men. The mammoths had shattered the center column, but the other two were closing like pincers. On the eastern edge of the camps, some archers were loosing fire arrows at the tents. He saw a mammoth pluck a knight from his saddle and fling him forty feet with a flick of its trunk. Wildlings streamed past, women and children running from the battle, some with men hurrying them along. A few of them gave John dark looks, but Longclaw was in his hand, and no one troubled him. Even Varamir fled, crawling off on his hands and knees. More and more men were pouring from the trees, not only knights now, but free riders and mounted bowmen and men at arms and jacks and kettle helms, dozens of men, hundreds of men. A blaze of banners flew above them. The wind was whipping them too wildly for John to see the sigils, but he glimpsed a seahorse, a field of birds, a ring of flowers. And yellow, so much yellow, yellow banners with a red device. Whose arms were those? East and north and northeast, he saw bands of wildlings trying to stand and fight, but the attackers rode right over them. The free folk still had the numbers, but the attackers had steel armor and heavy horses. In the thickest part of the fray, John saw Mance standing tall in his stirrups. His red and black cloak and raven-winged helm made him easy to pick out. He had his sword raised, and men were rallying to him when a wedge of knights smashed into them with lance and sword and long-axe. Mance's mare went up on her hind legs, kicking, and a spear took her through the breast. Then the steel tide washed over him. It's done, John thought. They're breaking. The wildlings were running, throwing down their weapons. Hornfoot men and cave dwellers and thins and bronze scales. They were running. Mance was gone. Someone was waving Harma's head on a pole. Tormund's lines had broken. Only the giants on their mammoths were holding hairy islands in a red steel sea. 
The fires were leaping from tent to tent, and some of the tall pines were going up as well. And through the smoke another wedge of armored riders came, on barded horses. Floating above them were the largest banners yet, royal standards as big as sheets, a yellow one with long pointed tongues that showed a flaming heart, and another like a sheet of beaten gold, with a black stag prancing and rippling in the wind. Robert, John thought for one mad moment, remembering poor Owen. But when the trumpets blew again and the knights charged, the name they cried was Stannis, Stannis, Stannis. John turned away and went inside the tent. Are you? Outside the inn, on a weathered gibbet, a woman's bones were twisting and rattling at every gust of wind. I know this inn. There hadn't been a gibbet outside the door when she had slept here with her sister Sansa under the watchful eye of Septa Mordain, though. We don't want to go in, Arya decided suddenly. There might be ghosts. You know how long it's been since I had a cup of wine? Sandor swung down from the saddle. Besides, we need to learn who holds the ruby ford. Stay with the horses if you want. It's no hair off my arse. What if they know you? Sandor no longer troubled to hide his face. He no longer seemed to care who knew him. They might want to take you captive. Let them try. He loosened his longsword in its scabbard and pushed through the door. Arya would never have a better chance to escape. She could ride off on Craven and take Stranger, too. She chewed her lip. Then she led the horses to the stables and went in after him. They know him. The silence told her that. But that wasn't the worst thing. She knew them, too. Not the skinny innkeep, nor the women, nor the field hands by the hearth but the others. The soldiers. She knew the soldiers. "'Looking for your brother, Sandor?' Polliver's hand was down the bodice of the girl on his lap, but now he slid it out. "'Looking for a cup of wine. And keep a flagon of red?' Clegane threw a handful of coppers on the floor. "'I don't want no trouble, sir,' the innkeep said. "'Then don't call me sir,' his mouth twitched. Are you deaf, fool? I ordered wine. As the man ran off, Clegane shouted after him, Two cups! The girl's thirsty, too. There are only three, Arya thought. Polliver gave her a fleeting glance, and the boy beside him never looked at her at all. But the third one gazed long and hard. He was a man of middling height and build, with a face so ordinary that it was hard to say how old he was. The tickler. The tickler and Polliver both. The boy was a squire, judging by his age and dress. He had a big white pimple on one side of his nose and some red ones on his forehead. Is this the lost puppy Sir Gregor spoke of? He asked the tickler. The one who piddled in the rushes and ran off? The tickler put a warning hand on the boy's arm and gave a short, sharp shake of his head. Ah, you read that plain enough. The squire didn't, or else he didn't care. Sir said his puppy brother tucked his tail between his legs when the battle got too warm at King's Landing. He said he ran off whimpering. He gave the hound a stupid, mocking grin. Clegane studied the boy and never said a word. Polliver shoved the girl off his lap and got to his feet. The lad's drunk, he said. The man at arms was almost as tall as the hound, though not so heavily muscled. A spade-shaped beard covered his jaws and jowls, thick and black and neatly trimmed, but his head was more bald than not. He can't hold his wine, is all. Then he shouldn't drink. The puppy doesn't skip. The boy began till the tickler casually twisted his ear between thumb and forefinger. The words became a squeal of pain. The innkeep came scurrying back with two stone cups and a flagon on a pewter platter. Sandor lifted the flagon to his mouth. Arya could see the muscles in his neck working as he gulped. When he slammed it back down on the table, half the wine was gone. Now you can pour. Best pick up those coppers, too. It's the only coin you'll like to see today. We'll pay when we're done drinking said Polliver. When you're done drinking, you'll tickle the innkeep to see where he keeps his gold, the way you always do. The innkeep suddenly remembered something in the kitchen. The locals were leaving, too, and the girls were gone. The only sound in the common room was the faint crackling of the fire in the hearth. We should go, too, Arya knew. If you're looking for Sir, you come too late, 
Polliver said. He was at Harren Hall, but now he's not. The Queen sent for him. He wore three blades on his belt, Arya saw, a long sword on his left hip, and on his right a dagger and a slimmer blade, too long to be a dirk and too short to be a sword. King Joffrey's dead, you know, he added, poisoned at his own wedding feast. Arya edged farther into the room. Joffrey's dead. She could almost see him with his blond curls and his mean smile and his fat, soft lips. Joffrey's dead. She knew it ought to make her happy, but somehow she still felt empty inside. Joffrey was dead. But if Rob was dead too, what did it matter? So much for my brave brothers of the King's Guard, the hound gave a snort of contempt. Who killed him? The imp, it's thought. Him and his little wife. What wife? I forgot you've been hiding under a rock. The northern girl, Winterfell's daughter. We heard she killed the king with a spell and afterward changed into a wolf with big leather wings like a bat and flew out a tower window. But she left the dwarf behind and Cersei means to have his head. That's stupid, Arya thought. Sansa only knows songs, not spells. And she never married the imp. The hound sat on the bench closest to the door. His mouth twitched, but only the burned side. She ought to dip him in wildfire and cook him, or tickle him till the moon turns black. He raised his wine cup and drained it straight away. He's one of them, Arya thought when she saw that. She bit her lips so hard she tasted blood. He's just like they are. I should kill him when he sleeps. So Gregor took Harrenhal, Sandor said. Didn't require much taking, said Polliver. The cell swords fled as soon as they knew we were coming, all but a few. One of the cooks opened a postern gate for us to get back at Howitt for cutting off his foot. He chuckled. We kept him to cook for us a couple of winches to warm our beds and put all the rest to the sword. All the rest? Arya blurted out. Well, Sarah kept Howitt to pass the time. Sandor said, The blackfish are still in River Run? Not for long, said Polliver. He's under siege. Old Frey's going to hang Edmure Tully unless he yields the castle. The only real fighting's around Raven Tree, Blackwoods and Brackens. The Brackens are ours now. The hound poured a cup of wine for Arya and another for himself, and drank it down while staring at the hearth fire. The little bird flew away, did she? Well, bloody good for her. She shit on the imp's head and flew off. They'll find her, said Polliver, if it takes half the gold and casterly rock. A pretty girl, I hear, said the tickler. Honey, sweet. He smacked his lips and smiled. And courteous, the hound agreed. A proper little lady. Not like her bloody sister. They found her, too, said Polliver. A sister? She's for Bolton's bastard, I hear. Arya sipped her wine so they could not see her mouth. She didn't understand what Polliver was talking about. Sansa has no other sister. Sandor Clegane laughed aloud. What's so bloody funny? asked Polliver. The hound never flicked an eye at Arya. If I'd wanted you to know, I'd have told you. Are there ships at salt pans? Salt pans? How should I know? The traders are back at Maidenpool, I heard. Randall Tarley took the castle and locked Mouton in a tower cell. I haven't heard shit about salt pans. The tickler leaned forward. Would you put to sea without bidding farewell to your brother? It gave Arya chills to hear him ask a question. Sir, would sooner you return to Harrenhal with us, Sandor? I bet he would. Or King's Landing. Bugger that. Bugger him. Bugger you. The tickler shrugged, straightened, and reached a hand behind his head to rub the back of his neck. Everything seemed to happen at once then. Sandor lurched to his feet. Polliver drew his long sword, and the tickler's hand whipped around in a blur to send something silver flashing across the common room. If the hound had not been moving, the knife might have cored the apple of his throat. Instead, it only grazed his ribs and wound up quivering in the wall near the door. He laughed, then, a laugh as cold and hollow as if it had come from the bottom of a deep well. I was hoping you'd do something stupid. His sword slid from its scabbard just in time to knock aside Polliver's first cut. 
Arya took a step backward as the long steel song began. The tickler came off the bench with a short sword in one hand and a dagger in the other. Even the chunky brown-haired squire was up, fumbling for his sword hilt. She snatched her wine cup off the table and threw it at his face. Her aim was better than it had been at the twins. The cup hit him right on his big white pimple, and he went down hard on his tail. Oliver was a grim, methodical fighter, and he pressed Sandor steadily backward, his heavy longsword moving with brutal precision. The hound's own cuts were sloppier, his parries rushed, his feet slow and clumsy. He's drunk, Arya realized with dismay. He drank too much too fast, with no food in his belly. And the tickler was sliding around the wall to get behind him. She grabbed the second wine cup and flung it at him, but he was quicker than the squire had been, and ducked his head in time. The look he gave her then was cold with promise. "'Is there gold hidden in the village?' she could hear him ask. The stupid squire was clutching the edge of a table and pulling himself to his knees. Arya could taste the beginnings of panic in the back of her throat. Fear cuts deeper than swords. Fear cuts deeper—' Sandor gave a grunt of pain. The burned side of his face ran red from temple to cheek, and the stub of his ear was gone. That seemed to make him angry. He drove back Polliver with a furious attack, hammering at him with the old nicked longsword he had swapped for in the hills. The bearded man gave way, but none of the cuts so much as touched him. And then the tickler leapt over a bench quick as a snake, and slashed at the back of the hound's neck with the edge of his short sword. They're killing him. Arya had no more cups, but there was something better to throw. She drew the dagger they'd robbed off the dying archer, and tried to fling it at the tickler the way he'd done. It wasn't the same as throwing a rock or a crab apple, though. The knife wobbled and hit him in the arm hilt first. He never even felt it. He was too intent on Clegane. As he stabbed, Clegane twisted violently aside, winning himself half a heartbeat's respite. Blood ran down his face and from the gash in his neck. Both of the mountain's men came after him, hard, Polliver hacking at his head and shoulders, while the tickler dotted in to stab at back and belly. The heavy stone flagon was still on the table. Arya grabbed it with two hands, but as she lifted it, someone grabbed her arm. The flagon slipped from her fingers and crashed to the floor. Wrenched around, she found herself nose to nose with the squire. You stupid, you forgot all about him. His big white pimple had burst, she saw. Are you the puppy's puppy? He had his sword in his right hand, and her arm in his left. But her own hands were free, so she jerked his knife from its sheath and sheathed it again in his belly, twisting. He wasn't wearing mail or even boiled leather, so it went right in, the same way Needle had when she killed the stable boy at King's Landing. The squire's eyes got big, and he let go of her arm. Arya spun to the door and wrenched the tickler's knife from the wall. Polliver and the tickler had driven the hound into a corner behind a bench, and one of them had given him an ugly red gash on his upper thigh to go with his other wounds. Sandor was leaning against the wall, bleeding and breathing noisily. He looked as though he could barely stand, let alone fight. "'Throw down the sword, and we'll take you back to Harrenhal,' Polliver told him. "'So Gregor can finish me himself?' the tickler said. "'Maybe he'll give you to me.' "'If you want me, come get me!' Sandor pushed away from the wall and stood in a half-crouch behind the bench, his sword held across his body. "'You'll think we won't,' said Polliver. "'You're drunk!' "'Might be,' said the hound. "'But you're dead!' His foot lashed out and caught the bench, driving it hard into Polliver's shins. Somehow the bearded man kept his feet, but the hound ducked under his wild slash and brought his own sword up in a vicious backhand cut. Blood spattered on the ceiling and walls. The blade caught in the middle of Polliver's face, and when the hound wrenched it loose, half his head came with it. The tickler backed away. Arya could smell his fear. The short sword in his hand suddenly seemed almost a toy against the long blade the hound was holding, and he wasn't armored either. He moved swiftly, light on his feet, never taking his eyes off Sandor Clegane. It was the easiest thing in the world for Arya to step up behind him and stab him. "'Is there gold hidden in the village?' she shouted as she drove the blade up through his back. "'Is there silver? Gems?' She stabbed twice more. "'Is there food? Where is Lord Beric?' She was on top of him by then, still stabbing. "'Where did he go? How many men were with him? How many knights? How many bowmen? How many, how many, how many, how many, how many, how many? Is there gold in the village?' Her hands were red and sticky when Sandor dragged her off him. Enough, was all he said. He was bleeding like a butchered pig himself and dragging one leg when he walked. There's one more, Arya reminded him. The squire had pulled the knife out of his belly and was trying to stop the blood with his hands. 
When the hound yanked him upright, he screamed and started to blubber like a baby. Mercy, he wept. Please, don't kill me. Mother of mercy. Do I look like your bloody mother? The hound looked like nothing human. You killed this one, too, he told Arya. Pricked him in his bowels. That's the end of him. He'll be a long time dying, though. The boy didn't seem to hear him. I came for the girls, he whimpered. Make me a man, Polly said. Oh, gods, please take me to a castle, a maester. Take me to a maester. My father's got gold. It was only for the girls. Mercy, sir. The hound gave him a crack across the face that made him scream again. Don't call me sir. He turned back to Arya. This one is yours, she-wolf. You do it. She knew what he meant. Arya went to Polliver and knelt in his blood long enough to undo his sword belt. Hanging beside his dagger was a slimmer blade, too long to be a dirk, too short to be a man's sword, but it felt just right in her hand. You remember where the heart is? the hound asked. She nodded. The squire rolled his eyes. Mercy! Needle slipped between his ribs and gave it to him. Good. Sandor's voice was thick with pain. If these three were whoring here, Gregor must hold the ford as well as Harrenhal. More of his pets could ride up any moment, and we've killed enough of the bloody buggers for one day. Where will we go? she asked. Salt pans. He put a big hand on her shoulder to keep from falling. Get some wine, she wolf, and take whatever coin they have as well. We'll need it. If there's ships at salt pans, we can reach the Vale by sea. His mouth twitched at her as more blood ran down from where his ear had been. Maybe Lady Lisa will marry you to her little Robert. There's a match I'd like to see. He started to laugh, then groaned instead. When the time came to leave, he needed Arya's help to get back up on Stranger. He had tied a strip of cloth about his neck and another around his thigh, and taken the squire's cloak off its peg by the door. The cloak was green, with a green arrow on a white bend, but when the hound wadded it up and pressed it to his ear, it soon turned red. Arya was afraid he would collapse the moment they set out, but somehow he stayed in the saddle. They could not risk meeting whoever held the ruby ford, so instead of following the king's road, they angled south by east, through weedy fields, woods, and marshes. It was hours before they reached the banks of the trident. The river had returned meekly to its accustomed channel, Arya saw. All its wet brown rage vanished with the rains. It's tired, too, she thought. Close by the water's edge they found some willows rising from a jumble of weathered rocks. Together the rocks and trees formed a sort of natural fort where they could hide from both river and trail. "'Here will do,' the hound said. "'Water the horses and gather some dead wood for a fire.' When he dismounted, he had to catch himself on a tree limb to keep him falling. Won't the smoke be seen? Anyone wants to find us, all they need to do is follow my blood. Water and wood. But bring me that wine skin first. When he got the fire going, Sandor propped up his helm in the flames, emptied half the wine skin into it, and collapsed back against a jut of moss covered stone, as if he never meant to rise again. He made Arya wash out the squire's cloak and cut it into strips. Those went into his helm as well. If I had more wine, I'd drink till I was dead to the world. Maybe I ought to send you back to that bloody inn for another skin or three. No, Arya said. He wouldn't, would he? If he does, I'll just leave him in right off. Sandor laughed at the fear on her face. I jest, wolf girl. A bloody jest. Find me a stick, about so long and not too big around, and wash the mud off it. I hate the taste of mud. He didn't like the first two sticks she brought him. By the time she found one that suited him, the flames had scorched his dog's snout black all the way to the eyes. Inside, the wine was boiling madly. Get the cup from my bedroll and dip it half full, he told her. Be careful. You knock the damn thing over, I will send you back for more. Take the wine and... Poured on my wounds. Think you can do that? Arya nodded. Then what are you waiting for? He growled. 
Her knuckles brushed the steel the first time she filled the cup, burning her so badly she got blisters. Arya had to bite her lip to keep from screaming. The hound used the stick for the same purpose, clamping it between his teeth as she poured. She did the gash in his thigh first, then the shallower cut on the back of his neck. Sandor coiled his right hand into a fist and beat against the ground when she did his leg. When it came to his neck, he bit the stick so hard it broke, and she had to find him a new one. She could see the terror in his eyes. Turn your head. She trickled the wine down over the raw red flesh where his ear had been, and fingers of brown blood and red wine crept over his jaw. He did scream then, despite the stick. Then he passed out from the pain. Arya figured the rest out by herself. She fished the strips they'd made of the squire's cloak out of the bottom of the helm and used them to bind the cuts. When she came to his ear, she had to wrap up half his head to stop the bleeding. By then dusk was settling over the trident. She let the horses graze, then hobbled them for the night and made herself as comfortable as she could in a niche between two rocks. The fire burned a while and died. Arya watched the moon through the branches overhead. Sir Gregor the mountain, she said softly. Dunson, Wrath the sweetling, Sir Illin, Sir Merin, Queen Circe. It made her feel queer to leave out Polliver and the tickler, and Joffrey, too. She was glad he was dead, but she wished she could have been there to see him die, or maybe kill him herself. Polliver said that Sansa killed him, and the imp. Could that be true? The imp was a Lannister, and Sansa... I wish I could change into a wolf and grow wings and fly away. If Sansa was gone, too, there were no more Starks but her. John was on the wall a thousand leagues away, but he was a snow. And these different aunts and uncles the hound wanted to sell her to, they weren't Starks either. They weren't wolves. Sandor moaned, and she rolled onto her side to look at him. She had left his name out, too, she realized. Why had she done that? She tried to think of Micah, but it was hard to remember what he'd looked like. She hadn't known him long. All he ever did was play at swords with me. The Hound, she whispered, and Valar Morgulis. Maybe he'd be dead by morning. But when the pale dawn light came filtering through the trees, it was him who woke her with the toe of his boot. She had dreamed she was a wolf again, chasing a riderless horse up a hill with a pack behind her, but his foot brought her back just as they were closing for the kill. The hound was still weak, every movement slow and clumsy. He slumped in the saddle and sweated, and his ear began to bleed through the bandage. He needed all his strength just to keep from falling off stranger. Had the mountain's men come hunting them, she doubted if he would even be able to lift a sword. Arya glanced over her shoulder. But there was nothing behind them but a crow flitting from tree to tree. The only sound was the river. Long before noon, Sandor Clagain was reeling. There were hours of daylight still remaining when he called a halt. I need to rest, was all he said. This time, when he dismounted, he did fall. Instead of trying to get back up, he crawled weakly under a tree and leaned up against the trunk. Bloody hell, he cursed. Bloody hell! When he saw Arya staring at him, he said, I'd skin you alive for a cup of wine, girl. She brought him water instead. He drank a little of it, complained that it tasted of mud, and slid into a noisy, fevered sleep. When she touched him, his skin was burning up. Arya sniffed at his bandages the way Maester Lewin had done sometimes when treating her cut or scrape. His face had bled the worst, but it was the wound on his thigh that smelled funny to her. She wondered how far this salt pans was, and whether she could find it by herself. I wouldn't have to kill him. If I just rode off and left him, he'd die all by himself. He'll die of fever and lie there beneath that tree until the end of days. But maybe it would be better if she killed him herself. She had killed the squire at the inn, and he hadn't done anything except grab her arm. The hound had killed Micah. Micah and more. I bet he's killed a hundred Micahs. He probably would have killed her, too, if not for the ransom. Needle glinted as she drew it. Polliver had kept it nice and sharp, at least. She turned her body sideways in a water-dancer's stance without even thinking about it. 
Dead leaves crunched beneath her feet. Quick as a snake, she thought. Smooth as summer silk. His eyes opened. You remember where the heart is? he asked in a hoarse whisper. As still as stone she stood. I I was only Don't lie, he growled. I hate liars. I hate gutless frauds even worse. Go on. Do it. When Arya did not move, he said, I killed your butcher's boy. I cut him near in half and laughed about it after. He made a queer sound, and it took her a moment to realize he was sobbing. And the little bird, your pretty sister. I stood there in my white cloak and let them beat her. I took the bloody song. She never gave it. I meant to take her, too. I should have. I should have fucked her bloody and ripped her heart out before leaving her for that dwarf. A spasm of pain twisted his face. Do you mean to make me beg, bitch? Do it. The gift of mercy. Avenge your little Michael. Micah. Arya stepped away from him. You don't deserve the gift of mercy. The hound watched her saddle craven through eyes bright with fever. Not once did he attempt to rise and stop her. But when she mounted, he said, A real wolf would finish a wounded animal. Maybe some real wolves will find you, Arya thought. Maybe they'll smell you when the sun goes down. Then he would learn what wolves did to dogs. You shouldn't have hit me with an axe, she said. You should have saved my mother. She turned her horse and rode away from him, and never looked back once. On a bright morning six days later she came to a place where the trident began to widen out and the air smelled more of salt than trees. She stayed close to the water, passing fields and farms, and a little after midday a town appeared before her. Salt pans, she hoped. A small castle dominated the town, no more than a holdfast, really, a single tall square keep with a bailey and a curtain wall. Most of the shops and inns and alehouses around the harbour had been plundered or burned, though some looked still inhabited. But the port was there, and eastward spread the Bay of Crabs, its waters shimmering blue and green in the sun. And there were ships. Three, Thoraya, there are three. Two were only river galleys, shallow draft boats made to ply the waters of the Trident. The third was bigger, a salt-sea trader with two banks of oars, a gilded prow, and three tall masts with furled purple sails. Her hull was painted purple, too. Arya rode Craven down to the docks to get a better look. Strangers are not so strange in a port as they are in little villages, and no one seemed to care who she was or why she was here. I need silver. The realization made her bite her lip. They had found a stag and a dozen coppers on Polliver, eight silvers on the pimply squire she'd killed, and only a couple of pennies in the tickler's purse. But the hound had told her to pull off his boots and slice open his blood-drenched clothes, and she'd turned up a stag in each toe, and three golden dragons sewn in the lining of his jerkin. Sandor had kept it all, though. That wasn't fair. It was mine as much as his. If she had given him the gift of mercy, she hadn't, though. She couldn't go back no more than she could beg for help. Begging for help never gets you any. She would have to sell Craven and hope she brought enough. The stable had been burnt, she learned from a boy by the docks, but the woman who'd owned it was still trading behind the sept. Arya found her easily, a big, robust woman with a good horsey smell to her. She liked Craven at first look, asked Arya how she'd come by her, and grinned at her answer. She's a well-bred horse, that's plain enough, and I don't doubt she belonged to a knight, sweetling, she said. But the knight wasn't no dead brother of yours. I've been dealing with a castle there many a year, so I know what gentle-born folk is like. This mare is well-bred, but you're not. She poked a finger at Arya's chest. Found her or stole her, never mind which, that's how it was. Only way a scruffy little thing like you comes to ride a palfrey. Arya bit her lip. Does that mean you won't buy her? 
The woman chuckled. It means you'll take what I give you, sweetling. Else we go down to the castle and maybe you get nothing. Or even hanged for stealing some good knight's horse. A half dozen other salt pans folks were around, going about their business. So Arya knew she couldn't kill the woman. Instead, she had to bite her lip and let herself be cheated. The purse she got was pitifully flat, and when she asked for more for the saddle and bridle and blanket, the woman just laughed at her. She would never have cheated the hound, she thought during the long walk back to the docks. The distance seemed to have grown by miles since she'd ridden it. The purple galley was still there. If the ship had sailed while she was being robbed, that would have been too much to bear. A cask of mead was being rolled up the plank when she arrived. When she tried to follow, a sailor up on deck shouted down at her in a tongue she did not know. "'I want to see the captain,' Arya told him. He only shouted louder. But the commotion drew the attention of a stout gray-haired man in a coat of purple wool, and he spoke the common tongue. "'I am captain here,' he said. "'What is your wish? Be quick, child. We have a tide to catch.' "'I want to go north to the wall. Here, I can pay.' She gave him the purse. "'The Night's Watch has a castle on the sea.' "'East Watch?' The captain spilled out the silver onto his palm and frowned. "'Is this all you have?' "'It is not enough,' Arya knew, without being told. She could see it on his face. "'I wouldn't need a cabin or anything,' she said. "'I could sleep down in the holder.' "'Take her on as a cabin girl,' said a passing wasman, a bolt of wool over one shoulder. "'She can sleep with me.' "'Mind your tongue,' the captain snapped. "'I could work,' said Arya. "'I could scrub the decks. I scrubbed the castle steps once, or I could row.' "'No,' he said. "'You couldn't.' He gave her back her coins. "'It would make no difference if you could, child. The North has nothing for us. Ice and war and pirates.' We saw a dozen pirate ships making north as we rounded Crackclaw Point, and I have no wish to meet them again. From here we bend our oars for home, and I suggest you do the same. I have no home, Arya thought. I have no pack, and now I don't even have a horse. The captain was turning away when she said, What ship is this, my lord? He paused long enough to give her a weary smile. This is the galley-ass Titan's daughter. Of the free city of Bravos. Wait, Arya said suddenly. I have something else. She had stuffed it down inside her small clothes to keep it safe, so she had to dig deep to find it, while the oarsmen laughed and the captain lingered with obvious impatience. One more silver will make no difference, child, he finally said. It's not silver. Her fingers closed on it. It's iron. Here. She pressed it into his hand, the small black iron coin that Jock and Hagar had given her. So worn, the man whose head it bore had no features. It's probably worthless, but... The captain turned it over and blinked at it, then looked at her again. This? How? Jock and said to say the words, too. Arya crossed her arms against her chest. Valar Morgullus! she said, as loud as if she'd known what it meant. Valar Doheris, he replied, touching his brow with two fingers. Of course you shall have a cabin. Samwell He sucks harder than mine, Jilly stroked the babe's head as she held him to her nipple. He's hungry, said the blonde woman Val, the one the black brothers called the wildling princess. He's lived on goat's milk up to now, and potions from that blind maester. The boy did not have a name yet, no more than Jilly's did. That was the wildling way. Not even Mance Raider's son would get a name till his third year, it would seem, though Sam had heard the brothers calling him the Little Prince, and born in battle. He watched the child nurse at Jilly's breast, and then he watched John watch. John is smiling. A sad smile still, but definitely a smile of sorts. Sam was glad to see it. It is the first time I've seen him smile since I got back. They had walked from the night fort to Deep Lake, and from Deep Lake to Queensgate, following a narrow track from one castle to the next, never out of sight of the wall. A day and a half from Castle Black, as they trudged along on calloused feet, Jilly heard horses behind them, and turned to see a column of black riders coming from the west. My brothers, Sam assured her. No one uses this road but the night's watch. It had turned out to be Sir Dennis Malister from the Shadow Tower, along with the wounded Bowen Marsh and the survivors from the fight at the Bridge of Skulls. 
When Sam saw Dywin, giant and dolorous Ed Tollett, he broke down and wept. It was from them that he learned about the battle beneath the wall. Stannis landed his knights at Eastwatch, and Carter Pike led him along the ranger's roads to take the wildlings unawares, Giant told him. He smashed them. Mance Raider was taken captive, a thousand of his best slain, including Harma Dogshead. The rest scattered like leaves before a storm, we heard. The gods are good, Sam thought. If he had not gotten lost as he made his way south from Craster's Keep, he and Jilly might have walked right into the battle, or into Mance Raider's camp, at the very least. That might have been well enough for Jilly and the boy, but not for him. Sam had heard all the stories about what wildlings did with captured crows. He shuddered. Nothing that his brothers told him prepared him for what he found at Castle Black, however. The common hall had burned to the ground, and the great wooden stair was a mound of broken ice and scorched timbers. Donald Noy was dead, along with Rast, Deaf Dick, Red Allen, and so many more. Yet the castle was more crowded than Sam had ever seen, not with black brothers, but with the king's soldiers, more than a thousand of them. There was a king in the king's tower for the first time in living memory, and banners flew from the Lance, Harden's Tower, the Grey Keep, the Shield Hall, and other buildings that had stood empty and abandoned for long years. The big one, the gold with the black stag, that's the royal standard of House Baratheon, he told Jilly, who had never seen banners before. The fox in flowers is House Florent, the turtle is Estermont, the swordfish is Bar Emon, and the crossed trumpets are for Wensington. They're all bright as flowers, Jilly pointed. I like those yellow ones with the fire. Look, and some of the fighters have the same thing on their blouses. A fiery heart. I don't know whose sigil that is. He found out soon enough. Queen's men, Pip told him, after he let out a whoop and shouted, Run and bar the doors, lads! It's Sam the Slayer! Come back from the grave! Well, Gwen was hugging Sam so hard he thought his ribs might break. But best you don't go asking where the Queen is. Stannis left her at Eastwatch with their daughter and his fleet. He brought no woman but the Red One. The Red One? said Sam uncertainly. Melisandre of Ashai, said Gwen, the King's sorceress. They say she burned a man alive at Dragonstone so Stannis would have favorable winds for his voyage north. She rode beside him in the battle, too, and gave him his magic sword. Lightbringer, they call it. Wait till you see it. It glows like it had a piece of sun inside it. He looked at Sam again and grinned a big, helpless, stupid grin. I still can't believe you're here. Jon Snow had smiled to see him, too, but it was a tired smile, like the one he wore now. You made it back after all, he said, and brought Jilly out as well. You've done well, Sam. John had done more than well himself to hear Gren tell it. Yet even capturing the Horn of Winter and a wildling prince had not been enough for Sir Alistair Thorne and his friends, who still named him Turncloak. Though Maester Amon said his wound was healing well, John bore other scars, deeper than the ones around his eye. He grieves for his wildling girl and for his brothers. It's strange, he said to Sam. Craster had no love for Mance, nor Mance for Craster, but now Craster's daughter is feeding Mance's son. I have the milk, Jilly said, her voice soft and shy. Mine takes only a little. He's not so greedy as this one. The wildling woman, Val, turned to face them. I've heard the Queen's men saying that the Red Woman means to give Mance to the fire as soon as he is strong enough. John gave her a weary look. Mance is a deserter from the Night's Watch. The penalty for that is death. If the Watch had taken him, he would have been hanged by now. But he's the king's captive, and no one knows the king's mind but the Red Woman. I want to see him, Val said. I want to show him his son. He deserves that much before you kill him. Sam tried to explain. No one is permitted to see him but Maester Amon, my lady. If it were in my power, Mance could hold his son. John's smile was gone. I'm sorry, Val. He turned away. Sam and I have duties to return to. Well, Sam does, anyway. We'll ask about your seeing Mance. That's all I can promise. Sam lingered long enough to give Jilly's hand a squeeze and promised to return again after supper. Then he hurried after. There were guards outside the door, Queen's men with spears. John was halfway down the steps, but he waited when he heard Sam puffing after him. 
You're more than fond of Jilly, aren't you? Sam reddened. Jilly's good. She's good and kind. He was glad that his long nightmare was done, glad to be back with his brothers at Castle Black. But some nights, alone in his cell, he thought of how warm Jilly had been when they'd curled up beneath the furs with the babe between them. She... she made me braver, John. Not brave, but braver. You know you cannot keep her, John said gently, no more than I could stay with the grit. You said the word, Sam, the same as I did, the same as all of us. I know. Jilly said she'd be a wife to me, but I told her about the words and what they meant. I don't know if that made her sad or glad, but I told her. He swallowed nervously and said, John, could there be honor in a lie if it were told for a, a good purpose? It would depend on the lie and the purpose, I suppose. John looked at Sam. I wouldn't advise it. You're not made to lie, Sam. You blush and squeak and stammer. I do, said Sam. But I could lie in a letter. I'm better with a quill in hand. I had a, a thought. When things are more settled here, I thought maybe the best thing for Jilly... I thought I might send her to Horn Hill, to my mother and sisters and my... my f f father. If Jilly were to say the babe was but mine... He was blushing again. My mother would warn him, I know. She would find some place for Jilly, some kind of service. It wouldn't be as hard as serving Craster. And Lord Randall, he he would never say so, but he might be pleased to believe I got a bastard and some wildling girl. At least it would prove I was man enough to lie with a woman and father a child. He told me once that I was sure to die a maiden, that no woman would ever, you know. John, if I did this, wrote this lie, would that be a good thing? The life the boy would have. Growing up a bastard in his grandfather's castle? John shrugged. That depends in great part on your father and what sort of boy this is. If he takes after you... He won't. Craster's his real father. You saw him. He was hard as an old tree stump, and Jilly is stronger than she looks. If the boy shows any skill with sword or lance, he should have a place with your father's household guard at the least, John said. It's not unknown for bastards to be trained as squires and raised to knighthood. But you'd best be sure Jilly can play this game convincingly. From what you've told me of Lord Randall, I doubt he would take kindly to being deceived. More guards were posted on the steps outside the tower. These were king's men, though. Sam had quickly learned the difference. The king's men were as earthy and impious as any other soldiers, but the queen's men were fervid in their devotion to Melisandre of Ashai and her lord of light. "'Are you going to the practice yard again?' Sam asked as they crossed the yard. "'Is it wise to train so hard before your leg's done healing?' John shrugged. "'What else is there for me to do? Marsh has removed me from duty for fear that I'm still a turncloak.' "'It's only a few who believe that,' Sam assured him. "'Sir Alistair and his friends. Most of the brothers know better. King Stannis knows as well, I'll wager. You brought him the Horn of Winter and captured Mance Raider's son.' All I did was protect Val and the babe against looters when the wildlings fled, and keep them there until the rangers found us. I never captured anyone. King Stannis keeps his men well in hand, that's plain. He lets them plunder some, but I've only heard of three wildling women being raped, and the men who did it have all been gelded. I suppose I should have been killing the free folk as they ran. Sir Alistair has been putting it about that the only time I bared my sword was to defend our foes. I failed to kill Mance Raider because I was in league with him, he says. That's only Sir Alliser, said Sam. Everyone knows the sort of man he is. With his noble birth, his knighthood, and his long years in the watch, Sir Alliser Thorne might have been a strong challenger for the Lord Commander's title. But almost all the men he'd trained during his years as master-at-arms despised him. His name had been offered, of course, but after running a week sixth on the first day, and actually losing votes on the second, Thorne had withdrawn to support Lord Jano Slint. What everyone knows is that Sir Alliser is a knight from a noble line and trueborn, while I'm the bastard who killed Corn Halfhand and bedded with a spearwife. The warg, I've heard them call me. How can I be a warg without a wolf, I ask you? His mouth twisted. I don't even dream of ghost any more. All my dreams are of the crypts, of the stone kings on their thrones. 
Sometimes I hear Rob's voice and my father's as if they were at a feast. But there's a wall between us, and I know that no place has been set for me. The living have no place at the feasts of the dead. It tore the heart from Sam to hold his silence then. Bran's not dead, John, he wanted to say. He's with friends, and they're going north on a giant elk to find a three-eyed crow in the depths of the haunted forest. It sounded so mad that there were times Sam Tarley thought he must have dreamt it all, conjured it whole from fever and fear and hunger. But he would have blurted it out anyway if he had not given his word. Three times he had sworn to keep the secret, once to Bran himself, once to that strange boy, Jojen Reed, and last of all to Cold Hands. The world believes the boy is dead, his rescuer had said as they parted. Let his bones lie undisturbed. We want no seekers coming after us. Swear it, Sam Well of the Night's Watch. Swear it for the life you owe me. Miserable Sam shifted his weight and said, Lord Janos will never be chosen, Lord Commander. It was the best comfort he had to offer John, the only comfort. That won't happen. Sam, you're a sweet fool. Open your eyes. It's been happening for days. John pushed his hair back out of his eyes and said, I may know nothing, but I know that. Now pray excuse me. I need to hit someone very hard with a sword. There was naught that Sam could do but watch him stride off toward the armory in the practice yard. That was where John Snow spent most of his waking hours. With Sir Andrew dead and Sir Alistair disinterested, Castle Black had no master at arms, so John had taken it on himself to work with some of the Rora recruits, Satin, Horse, Hop Robin with his club foot, Aaron and Emric. And when they had duties, he would train alone for hours with sword and shield and spear, or match himself against anyone who cared to take him on. Sam, you're a sweet fool, he could hear John saying, all the way back to the maester's keep. Open your eyes. It's been happening for days. Could he be right? A man needed the votes of two-thirds of the sworn brothers to become the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, and after nine days and nine votes no one was even close to that. Lord Janos had been gaining true, creeping up past first Bowen Marsh and then Othul Yarwick, but he was still well behind Sir Dennis Malister of the Shadow Tower and Cotter Pike of East Watch by the Sea. One of them will be the new Lord Commander, surely, Sam told himself. Stannis had posted guards outside the maester's door, too. Within, the rooms were hot and crowded with the wounded from the battle, black brothers, king's men, and queen's men, all three. Clytus was shuffling amongst them with flagons of goat's milk and dream wine, but Maester Amon had not yet returned from his morning call on Mance Raider. Sam hung his cloak upon a peg and went to lend a hand. But even as he fetched and poured and changed dressings, John's words nagged at him. Sam, you're a sweet fool. Open your eyes. It's been happening for days. It was a good hour before he could excuse himself to feed the ravens. On the way up to the rookery, he stopped to check the tally he had made of last night's count. At the start of the choosing, more than thirty names had been offered, but most had withdrawn once it became clear they could not win. Seven remained as of last night. Sir Dennis Malister had collected 213 tokens, Carter Pike 187, Lord Slint 74, Othel Yarwick 60, Bowen Marsh 49, Three Finger Hob 5, and Dolorous Ed Tollet 1. Pip and his stupid japes. Sam shuffled through the earlier counts. Sir Dennis, Carter Pike, and Bowen Marsh had all been falling since the third day, Othel Yarwick since the sixth. Only Lord Janos Slint was climbing day after day after day. He could hear the birds quarking in the rookery, so he put the papers away and climbed the steps to feed them. Three more ravens had come in, he saw with pleasure. Snow! they cried at him. Snow! 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 He had taught them that. Even with the newcomers, the ravenry seemed dismally empty. Few of the birds that Amon had sent off had returned as yet. One reached Stannis, though. One found a dragonstone, and a king who still cared. A thousand leagues south, Sam knew, his father had joined House Tarley to the cause of the boy on the Iron Throne, but neither King Joffrey nor little King Tommen had bestirred himself when the watch cried out for help. What good is a king who will not defend his realm? he thought angrily, remembering the night on the fist of the first men and the terrible trek to Craster's Keep through darkness, fear, and falling snow. 
The Queen's men made him uneasy, it was true, but at least they had come. That night at supper Sam looked for John Snow, but did not see him anywhere in the cavernous stone vault where the brothers now took their meals. He finally took a place on the bench near his other friends. Pip was telling Dolorous Ed about the contest they had to see which of the straw soldiers could collect the most wilding arrows. You were leading most of the way, but Watt of Longlake got three in the last day and passed you. I never win anything, Dolorous Ed complained. The gods always smiled on Watt, though. When the wildlings knocked him off the bridge of skulls, somehow he landed in a nice deep pool of water. How lucky was that, missing all those rocks? Was it a long fall? Gren wanted to know. Did landing in the pool of water save his life? No, said Dolores Head. He was dead already from that axe in his head. Still, it was pretty lucky missing the rocks. Three-Finger Hob had promised the brothers roast haunch of mammoth that night, maybe in hopes of cadging a few more votes. If that was his notion, he should have found a younger mammoth, Sam thought as he pulled a string of gristle out from between his teeth. Sighing, he pushed the food away. There would be another vote shortly, and the tensions in the air were thicker than the smoke. Carter Pike sat by the fire, surrounded by rangers from Eastwatch. Sir Dennis Malister was near the door with a smaller group of Shadow Tower men. General Slint has the best place, Sam realized, halfway between the flames and the drafts. He was alarmed to see Bowen Marsh beside him, wan-faced and haggard, his head still wrapped in linen, but listening to all that Lord Janos had to say. When he pointed out that to his friends, Pip said, "'Hey, look down there. That's Sir Alistair whispering with Othel Yarwick.' After the meal, Maester Amon rose to ask if any of the brothers wished to speak before they cast their tokens. Dolores Ed got up, stone-faced and glum as ever. "'I just want to say to whoever is voting for me that I would certainly make an awful Lord Commander. But so would all these others.' He was followed by Bowen Marsh, who stood with one hand on Lord Slint's shoulder. "'Brothers and friends, I am asking that my name be withdrawn from this choosing. My wound still troubles me, and the task is too large for me, I fear. But not for Lord Janos here, who commanded the gold cloaks at King's Landing for many years. Let us all give him our support.' Sam heard angry mutters from Carter Pike's end of the room, and Sir Dennis looked at one of his companions and shook his head. "'It is too late. The damage is done.' He wondered where John was and why he had stayed away. Most of the brothers were unlettered, so by tradition the choosing was done by dropping tokens into a big pot-bellied iron kettle that Three-Finger Hob and Owen the Oaf had dragged over from the kitchens. The barrels of tokens were off in a corner behind a heavy drape, so the voters could make their choice unseen. You were allowed to have a friend cast your token if you had duty, so some men took two tokens, three or four, and Sir Dennis and Carter Pike voted for the garrisons they had left behind. When the hall was finally empty, save for them, Sam and Clytus upended the kettle in front of Maester Amon. A cascade of seashells, stones, and copper pennies covered the table. Amon's wrinkled hands sorted with surprising speed, moving the shells here, the stones there, the pennies to one side, the occasional arrowhead, nail, and acorn off to themselves. Sam and Clytus counted the piles, each of them keeping his own tally. Tonight it was Sam's turn to give his results first. Two hundred and three for Sir Dennis Malister, he said. One hundred and sixty-nine for Carter Pike. One hundred and thirty-seven for Lord Janos Slint. Seventy-two for Othel Yarwick. Five for Three-Finger Hob, and two for Dolores Ed. I had one hundred and sixty-eight for Pike, Clytus said. We are two votes short by my count, and one by Sam's. Sam's count is correct, said Maester Amon. John Snow did not cast a token. It makes no matter. No one is close. Sam was more relieved than disappointed. Even with Bowen Marsh's support, Lord Janos was still only third. Who are these five who keep voting for Three-Finger Hob? he wondered. "'Brothers who want him out of the kitchens?' said Clytus. "'Sir Dennis is down ten votes since yesterday,' Sam pointed out. "'And Connor Pike is down almost twenty. That's not good.' "'Not good for their hopes of becoming Lord Commander, certainly,' said Maester Amon. "'Yet it may be good for the Night's Watch, in the end. That is not for us to say. Ten days is not unduly long. There was once a choosing that lasted near two years, some seven hundred votes.' 
The brothers will come to a decision in their own time. Yes, Sam thought, but what decision? Later, over cups of watered wine in the privacy of Pip's cell, Sam's tongue loosened, and he found himself thinking aloud. Carter Pike and Sir Dennis Malister have been losing ground, but between them they still have almost two-thirds, he told Pip and Gren. Either one would be fine as Lord Commander. Someone needs to convince one of them to withdraw and support the other. Someone? said Gren, doubtfully. What someone? Gren is so dumb he thinks someone might be him, said Pip. Maybe when someone is done with Pike and Malister, he should convince King Stannis to marry Queen Cersei, too. King Stannis is married, Gren objected. What am I going to do with him, Sam? sighed Pip. Carter Pike and Sir Dennis don't like each other much, Gren argued stubbornly. They fight about everything. Yes, but only because they have different ideas about what's best for the watch, said Sam. If we explained... We, said Pip. How did someone change the we? I'm the mummer's monkey, remember? And Gren is... well, Gren. He smiled at Sam and wiggled his ears. You now, you're a lord's son and the maester's steward. And Sam the slayer, said Gren. You slew another. It was the dragon glass that killed it, Sam told him for the hundredth time. A lord's son, the maester's steward, and Sam the slayer, Pip mused. You could talk to them, might be. I could, said Sam, sounding as gloomy as Dolores said, if I wasn't too craven to face them. John John prowled around Satin in a slow circle, sword in hand, forcing him to turn. "'Get your shield up,' he said. "'It's too heavy,' the old town boy complained. "'It's as heavy as it needs to be to stop a sword,' John said. "'Now get it up!' He stepped forward, slashing. Satin jerked the shield up in time to catch the sword on its rim and swung his own blade at John's ribs. "'Good,' John said, when he felt the impact on his own shield. "'That was good. But you need to put your body into it. Get your weight behind the steel, and you'll do more damage than with arm strength alone. Come try it again. Drive at me. But keep the shield up, or I'll ring your head like a bell. Instead, Satin took a step backward and raised his visor. John, he said in an anxious voice. When he turned, she was standing behind him with half a dozen queen's men around her. Small wonder the yard grew so quiet. He had glimpsed Melisandre at her night fires and coming and going about the castle, but never so close. She's beautiful, he thought. But there was something more than a little unsettling about red eyes. My lady. The king would speak with you, John Snow. John thrust the practice sword into the earth. Might I be allowed to change? I am in no fit state to stand before a king. "'We shall await you atop the wall,' said Melisandre. "'We,' John heard, not he. "'It's as they say. This is his true queen, not the one he left at Eastwatch.' He hung his mail and plate inside the armory, returned to his own cell, discarded his sweat-stained clothes, and donned a fresh set of blacks. It would be cold and windy in the cage, he knew, and colder and windier still on top of the ice, so he chose a heavy hooded cloak. Last of all, he collected Longclaw, and slung the bastard sword across his back. Melisandre was waiting for him at the base of the wall. She had sent her queensmen away. "'What does his grace want of me?' John asked her as they entered the cage. "'All you have to give, Jon Snow. He is a king.' He shut the door and pulled the bell cord. The winch began to turn. They rose. The day was bright and the wall was weeping, long fingers of water trickling down its face and glinting in the sun. In the close confines of the iron cage she was acutely aware of the red woman's presence. She even smells red. The scent reminded him of Micken's forge, of the way iron smelled when red hot. The scent was smoke and blood. Kissed by fire, he thought, remembering a grit. The wind got in amongst Melisandre's long red robes and sent them flapping against John's legs as he stood beside her. "'You are not cold, my lady?' he asked her. She laughed. Never. The ruby at her throat seemed to pulse in time with the beating of her heart. 
The Lord's fire lives within me, John Snow. Feel. She put her hand on his cheek and held it there while he felt how warm she was. That is how life should feel, she told him. Only death is cold. They found Stannis Baratheon standing alone at the edge of the wall, brooding over the field where he had won his battle and the great green forest beyond. He was dressed in the same black breeches, tunic, and boots that a brother of the Night's Watch might wear. Only his cloak set him apart, a heavy golden cloak trimmed in black fur and pinned with a brooch in the shape of a flaming heart. "'I have brought you the bastard of Winterfell, your grace,' said Melisandre. Stannis turned to study him. Beneath his heavy brow were eyes like bottomless blue pools. His hollow cheeks and strong jaw were covered with a short crop of blue-black beard that did little to conceal the gauntness of his face, and his teeth were clenched. His neck and shoulders were clenched as well, and his right hand. John found himself remembering something Donald Noy once said about the Baratheon brothers. Robert was the true steel. Stannis is pure iron, black and hard and strong, but brittle, the way iron gets. He'll break before he bends. Uneasily he knelt, wondering why this brittle king had need of him. Rise, I have heard much and more of you, Lord Snow. I am no lord, sire, John rose. I know what you have heard, that I am a turncloak and craven, that I slew my brother Corrin Halfhand, so the wildlings would spare my life, that I rode with Mance Raider and took a wildling wife. Aye, all that and more. You are a warg, too, they say, a skin-changer who walks at night as a wolf. King Stannis had a hard smile. How much of it is true? I had a dire wolf, ghost. I left him when I climbed the wall near Greyguard and had not seen him since. Corrin Halfhand commanded me to join the wildlings. He knew they would make me kill him to prove myself and told me to do whatever they asked of me. The woman was named Egret. I broke my vows with her, but I swear to you on my father's name that I never turned my cloak. I believe you, the king said. That startled him. Why? Stannis snorted. I know Janos Slint, and I knew Ned Stark as well. Your father was no friend of mine, but only a fool would doubt his honor or his honesty. You have his look. A big man, Stannis Baratheon, towered over John, but he was so gaunt that he looked ten years older than he was. I know more than you might think, Jon Snow. I knew it was you who found the dragon-glass dagger that Randall Tarly's son used to slay the other. Ghost found it. The blade was wrapped in a ranger's cloak and buried beneath the fist of the first men. There were other blades as well, spearheads, arrowheads, all dragon-glass. I know you hurled the gate here, King Stannis said. If not, I would have come too late. Donald Noy held the gate. He died below in the tunnel, fighting the king of the giants. Stannis grimaced. Nori made my first sword for me, and Robert's warhammer as well. Had the god seen fit to spare him, he would have made a better lord commander for your order than any of these fools who are squabbling over it now. Cotter Pike and Sir Dennis Manister are no fools, sire, John said. They're good men and capable. Othel Yarwick as well, in his own way. Lord Mormont trusted each of them. Your Lord Mormont trusted too easily. Else he would not have died as he did. But we were speaking of you. I have not forgotten that it was you who brought us this magic horn and captured Mance Raider's wife and son. Dalla died. John was saddened by that still. Val is her sister. She and the babe did not require much capturing, Your Grace. You had put the wildlings to flight, and the skin changer Mance had left to guard his queen went mad when the eagle burned. John looked at Melisandre. Some say that was your doing. She smiled, her long copper hair tumbling across her face. The Lord of Light has fiery talons, John Snow. John nodded and turned back to the king. Your grace, you spoke of Val. She has asked to see Mance Raider, to bring his son to him. It would be a, a kindness. The man is a deserter from your order. Your brothers are all insisting on his death. Why should I do him a kindness? 
John had no answer for that. If not for him, for Val, for her sister's sake, the child's mother. You are fond of this Val? I scarcely know her. They tell me she is comely. Very, John admitted. Beauty can be treacherous. My brother learned that lesson from Circe Lannister. She murdered him. Do not doubt it. Your father and John are in as well. He scowled. You rode with these wildlings. Is there any honor in them, do you think? Yes, John said. But their own sort of honor, sire. And Mance Raider? Yes, I think so. In the Lord of Bones? John hesitated. Rattleshirt, we called him. Treacherous and bloodthirsty. If there's honor in him, he hides it down beneath his suit of bones. And this other man, this Tormund of the many names who eluded us after the battle, answer me truly. Tormund Giant's Bane seemed to me the sort of man who would make a good friend and a bad enemy, Your Grace. Stannis gave a curt nod. Your father was a man of honor. He was no friend to me, but I saw his worth. Your brother was a rebel and a traitor who meant to steal half my kingdom. But no man can question his courage. What of you? Does he want me to say I love him? John's voice was stiff and formal as he said, I am a man of the Night's Watch. Words. Words are wind. Why do you think I abandoned Dragonstone and sailed to the wall, Lord Snow? I am no lord, sire. You came because we sent for you, I hope, though I could not say why you took so long about it. Surprisingly, Stannis smiled at that. You are bold enough to be a Stark. Yes, I should have come sooner. If not for my hand, I might not have come at all. Lord Seaworth is a man of humble birth, but he reminded me of my duty, when all I could think of was my rights. I had the cart before the horse, Davos said. I was trying to win the throne to save the kingdom when I should have been trying to save the kingdom to win the throne. Stannis pointed north. There is where I'll find the foe that I was born to fight. His name may not be spoken, Melisandre added softly. He is the god of night and terror, Jon Snow, and these shapes in the snow are his creatures. They tell me that you slew one of these walking corpses to save Lord Mormont's life, Stannis said. It may be that this is your war as well, Lord Snow, if you will give me your help. My sword is pledged to the Night's Watch, Your Grace, Jon Snow answered carefully. That did not please the king. Stannis ground his teeth and said, I need more than a sword from you. John was lost. My lord, I need the north. The north? I... My brother Rob was king in the north. Your brother was the rightful lord of Winterfell. If he had stayed home and done his duty, instead of crowning himself and riding off to conquer the Riverlands, he might be alive today. Be that as it may, you are not Rob, no more than I am Robert. The harsh words had blown away whatever sympathy John might have had for Stannis. I loved my brother, he said, and I mine. Yet they were what they were, and so are we. I am the only true king in Westeros, north or south, and you are Ned Stark's bastard. Stannis studied him with those dark blue eyes. Tywin Lannister has named Roose Bolton his warden of the north to reward him for betraying your brother. The Iron Men are fighting amongst themselves since Balan Greyjoy's death, yet they still hold Moat Caelin, Deepwood Mott, Torrent Square, and most of the Stony Shore. Your father's lands are bleeding, and I have neither the strength nor the time to staunch the wounds. What is needed is a Lord of Winterfell, a loyal Lord of Winterfell. He is looking at me, John thought, stunned. Winterfell is no more. Theon Greyjoy put it to the torch. Granite does not burn easily, Stannis said. The castle can be rebuilt in time. It's not the walls that make a lord, it's the man. Your Northmen do not know me, have no reason to love me, yet I will need their strength in the battles yet to come. 
I need a son of Edward Stark to win them to my banner. He would make me Lord of Winterfell. The wind was gusting, and John felt so light-headed he was half afraid it would blow him off the wall. Your grace, he said, you forget I am a Snow, not a Stark. It's you who are forgetting, King Stannis replied. Melisandre put a warm hand on John's arm. A king can remove the taint of bastardy with a stroke, Lord Snow. Lord Snow. Sir Alistair Thorne had named him that to mock his bastard birth. Many of his brothers had taken to using it as well, some with affection, others to wound. But suddenly it had a different sound to it in John's ears. It sounded real. Yes, he said hesitantly. Kings have legitimized bastards before, but I am still a brother of the Night's Watch. I knelt before a heart tree and swore to hold no lands and father no children. John. Alessandra was so close he could feel the warmth of her breath. Rolor is the only true god. A vow sworn to a tree has no more power than one sworn to your shoes. Open your heart and let the light of the Lord come in. Burn these weirwoods and accept Winterfell as a gift of the Lord of Light. When John had been very young, too young to understand what it meant to be a bastard, he used to dream that one day Winterfell might be his. Later, when he was older, he had been ashamed of those dreams. Winterfell would go to rob, and then his sons, or to Bran or Rickon, should rob die childless. And after them came Sansa and Arya. Even to dream otherwise seemed disloyal, as if he were betraying them in his heart, wishing for their deaths. I never wanted this, he thought, as he stood before the blue-eyed king and the red woman. I loved Rob, loved all of them. I never wanted any harm to come to any of them, but it did. And now there's only me. All he had to do was say the word, and he would be John Stark, and never more a snow. All he had to do was pledge this king his fealty, and Winterfell was his. All he had to do was forswear his vows again. And this time it would not be a ruse. To claim his father's castle, he must turn against his father's gods. King Stannis gazed off north again, his gold cloak streaming from his shoulders. It may be that I am mistaken in you, Jon Snow. We both know the things that are said of bastards. You may lack your father's honor or your brother's skill in arms. But you are the weapon the Lord has given me. I have found you here as you found the cache of dragon glass beneath the fist, and I mean to make use of you. Even Azar Ahai did not win his war alone. I killed a thousand wildlings, took another thousand captive, and scattered the rest, but we both know they will return. Alessandra has seen that in her fires. This tormented Thunderfist is likely reforming them even now and planning some new assault. And the more we bleed each other, the weaker we shall all be when the real enemy falls upon us. John had come to that same realization. As you say, Your Grace. He wondered where this king was going. Whilst your brothers have been struggling to decide who shall lead them, I have been speaking with this man's raider. He ground his teeth. A stubborn man, that one, and prideful. He will leave me no choice but to give him to the flames. But we took other captives as well, other leaders. The one who calls himself the Lord of Bones, some of their clan chiefs, the new Magnar of Fen. Your brothers will not like it, no more than your father's lords, but I mean to allow the wildlings through the wall. Those who will swear me their fealty, pledge to keep the king's peace and the king's laws, and take the Lord of Light as their god. Even the giants, if those great knees of theirs can bend, I will settle them on the gift. Once I have wrested it away from your new Lord Commander, when the cold winds rise, we shall live or die together. It is time we made alliance against our common foe. He looked at John. Would you agree? My father dreamed of resettling the gift, John admitted. He and my uncle Benjamin used to talk of it. He never thought of settling it with wildlings, though. But he never rode with wildlings, either. He did not fool himself. The free folk would make for unruly subjects and dangerous neighbors. Yet when he weighed Ygritte's red hair against the cold blue eyes of the whites, the choice was easy. 
I agree. Good, King Stannis said. For the surest way to seal a new alliance is with a marriage. I mean to wed my Lord of Winterfell to this wildling princess. Perhaps John had ridden with the free folk too long. He could not help but laugh. Your grace, he said, captive or no, if you think you can just give Val to me, I fear you have a deal to learn about wildling women. Whoever weds her had best be prepared to climb in her tower window and carry her off at sword point. Whoever? Stannis gave him a measuring look. Does this mean you will not wed the girl? I warn you, she is part of the price you must pay, if you want your father's name and your father's castle. This match is necessary to help assure the loyalty of our new subjects. Are you refusing me, Jon Snow? No, Jon said, too quickly. It was Winterfell the king was speaking of, and Winterfell was not to be lightly refused. I mean, this has all come very suddenly, Your Grace. Might I beg you for some time to consider? As you wish. But consider quickly. I am not a patient man, as your black brothers are about to discover. Stannis put a thin, fleshless hand on John's shoulder. Say nothing of what we've discussed here today. To anyone. But when you return, you need only bend your knee, lay your sword at my feet, and pledge yourself to my service. And you shall rise again as John Stark, the Lord of Winterfell. Tyrion When he heard noises through the thick wooden door of his cell, Tyrion Lannister prepared to die. Past time, he thought. Come on, come on, make an end to it. He pushed himself to his feet. His legs were asleep from being folded under him. He bent down and rubbed the knives from them. I will not go stumbling and waddling to the headsman's block. He wondered whether they would kill him down here in the dark or drag him through the city so Sir Ellen Payne could lop his head off. After his mummer's farce of a trial, his sweet sister and loving father might prefer to dispose of him quietly, rather than risk a public execution. I could tell the mob a few choice things, if they let me speak. But would they be that foolish? As the keys rattled and the door to his cell pushed inward, creaking, Tyrion pressed back against the dampness of the wall, wishing for a weapon. I could still bite and kick. I'll die with a taste of blood in my mouth, that's something. He wished he'd been able to think of some rousing last words. Bugger you all was not like to earn him much of a place in the histories. Torchlight fell across his face. He shielded his eyes with a hand. Come on, are you frightened of a dwarf? Do it, you son of a poxy whore! His voice had grown hoarse from disuse. Is that any way to speak about Our Lady Mother? A man moved forward, a torch in his left hand. This is even more ghastly than my cell at River Run, though not quite so dank. For a moment, Tyrion could not breathe. You? Well, most of me. Jemmy was gaunt, his hair hacked short. I left a hand at Harrenhal. Bringing the brave companions across the narrow sea was not one of father's better notions. He lifted his arm, and Tyrion saw the stump. A bark of hysterical laughter burst from his lips. Oh, gods, he said. Jimmy, I am so sorry, but gods be good. Look at the two of us, handless and noseless, the Lannister boys. There were days when my hand smelled so bad I wished I was noseless. Jimmy lowered the torch so the light bathed his brother's face. An impressive scar. Tyrion turned away from the glare. They made me fight a battle without my big brother to protect me. I heard tell you almost burned the city down. A filthy lie! I only burned the river. Abruptly Tyrion remembered where he was and why. Are you here to kill me? Now that's ungrateful. Perhaps I should leave you here to rot, if you're going to be so discourteous. Rotting is not the fate Cersei has in mind for me. Well, no, if truth be told. You're to be beheaded on the morrow, out on the old tourney grounds. Tyrion laughed again. Will there be food? You'll have to help me with my last words. My wits have been running about like a rat in a root cellar. You won't need last words. I'm rescuing you. Jamie's voice was strangely solemn. Who said I required rescue? You know, I'd almost forgotten what an annoying little man you are. Now that you've reminded me, I do believe I'll let Cersei cut your head off after all. 
Oh, no, you won't. He waddled out of the cell. Is it day or night up above? I've lost all sense of time. Three hours past midnight. The city sleeps. Timmy slid the torch back into its sconce on the wall between the cells. The corridor was so poorly lit that Tyrion almost stumbled on the turnkey, sprawled across the cold stone floor. He prodded him with a toe. Is he dead? Asleep. The other three as well. The eunuch dosed their wine with sweet sleep, but not enough to kill them. Or so he swears. He is waiting back at the stair, dressed up in a septon's robe. You're going down into the sewers, and from there to the river. A galley is waiting in the bay. Varus has agents in the free cities who will see that you do not lack for funds, but try not to be conspicuous. Cersei will send men after you, I have no doubt. You might do well to take another name. Another name? Oh, certainly. And when the faceless men come to kill me, I'll say, No, you have the wrong man. I'm a different dwarf with a hideous facial scar. Both Lannisters laughed at the absurdity of it all. Then Jamie went to one knee and kissed him quickly once on each cheek, his lips brushing against the puckered ribbon of scar tissue. Thank you, brother, Tyrion said, for my life. It was a debt I owed you. Jamie's voice was strange. A debt? He cocked his head. I do not understand. Good. Some doors are best left closed. Oh, dear, said Tyrion. Is there something grim and ugly behind it? Could it be that someone said something cruel about me once? I'll try not to weep. Tell me. Tyrion. Jamie is afraid. Tell me, Tyrion said again. His brother looked away. Tysha, he said softly. Tysha! His stomach tightened. What of her? She was no whore. I never have bought her for you. That was a lie that father commanded me to tell. Tysha was... She was what she seemed to be, a crofter's daughter, chance met on the road. Tyrion could hear the faint sound of his own breath whistling hollowly through the scar of his nose, Jamie could not meet his eyes. Tysha. He tried to remember what she had looked like. A girl, she was only a girl, no older than Sansa. My wife, he croaked, she wed me. For your gold, father said. She was low-born. You were a Lannister of Casterly Rock. All she wanted was the gold, which made her no different from a whore, so, so it would not be a lie, not truly, and... He said that you required a sharp lesson, that you would learn from it, and thank me later. Thank you. Tyrion's voice was choked. He gave her to his guards, a barracks full of guards. He made me watch. I and more than watch. I took her too, my wife. I never knew he would do that. You must believe me. Oh, must I? Tyrion snarled. Why should I believe you about anything ever? She was my wife. Tyrion, he hit him. It was a slap, backhanded, but he put all his strength into it, all his fear, all his rage, all his pain. Jamie was squatting, unbalanced. The blow sent him tumbling backward to the floor. I, I suppose I earned that. No, oh, you've earned more than that, Jamie. You and my sweet sister and our loving father, yes, I can't begin to tell you what you've earned. But you'll have it, that I swear to you. A Lannister always pays his debts. Tyrion waddled away, almost stumbling over the turnkey again in his haste. Before he had gone a dozen yards, he bumped up against an iron gate that closed the passage. Oh, gods! It was all he could do not to scream. Jamie came up behind him. I have the jailer's keys. Then use them! Tyrion stepped aside. Jamie unlocked the gate, pushed it open, and stepped through. He looked back over his shoulder. Are you coming? Not with you, Tyrion stepped through. Give me the keys and go. I will find Varys on my own. He cocked his head and stared up at his brother with his mismatched eyes. Jamie, can you fight left-handed? Rather less well than you, Jamie said bitterly. Good. Then we will be well matched if we should ever meet again. The cripple and the dwarf. Jamie handed him the ring of keys. I gave you the truth. You owe me the same. Did you do it? Did you kill him? The question was another knife twisting in his guts. Are you sure you want to know? asked Tyrion. 
Joffrey would have been a worse king than Ares ever was. He stole his father's dagger and gave it to a footpad to slit the throat of Brandon Stark. Did you know that? I... I thought he might have. What a son takes after his father. Joff would have killed me as well once he came into his power. For the crime of being short and ugly, of which I am so conspicuously guilty. You have not answered my question. You poor, stupid, blind, crippled fool! Must I spell every little thing out for you? Very well. Cersei is a lying whore. She's been fucking Lancel and Osmond Kettleblack and probably Moonboy, for all I know. And I am the monster they all say I am. Yes, I killed your vile son. He made himself grin. It must have been a hideous sight to see there in the torch-lit gloom. Jamie turned without a word and walked away. Tyrion watched him go, striding on his long, strong legs, and part of him wanted to call out to tell him that it wasn't true, to beg for his forgiveness. But then he thought of Tysha, and he held his silence. He listened to the receding footsteps until he could hear them no longer, then waddled off to look for Varys. The eunuch was lurking in the dark of a twisting turnpike stair, garbed in a moth-eaten brown robe with a hood that hid the paleness of his face. "'You are so long, I feared that something had gone amiss,' he said when he saw Tyrion. "'Oh, no,' Tyrion assured him in poisonous tones. "'What could possibly have gone amiss?' He twisted his head back to stare up. "'I sent for you during my trial.' "'I could not come. The Queen had me watched night and day. I dared not help you.' "'You're helping me now.' "'Am I? Ah.' Uh... Varys giggled. It seemed strangely out of place in this place of cold stone and echoing darkness. "'Your brother can be most persuasive.' "'Varys, you are as cold and slimy as a slug. Has anyone ever told you? You did your best to kill me. Perhaps I ought to return the favor. The eunuch sighed. "'The faithful dog is kicked, and no matter how the spider weaves, he is never loved. But if you slay me here, I fear for you, my lord.' You may never find your way back to daylight. His eyes glittered in the shifting torchlight, dark and wet. These tunnels are full of traps for the unwary. Tyrion snorted. Unwary? I am the wariest man who ever lived. You helped see to that. He rubbed at his nose. So tell me, wizard, where is my innocent maiden wife? I have found no trace of Lady Sansa in King's Landing, sad to say. "'Nor of Sir Dantos Hollard, who by right should have turned up somewhere drunk by now. "'They were seen together on the serpentine steps the night she vanished. "'After that, nothing. "'There was much confusion that night. "'My little birds are silent.' "'Varys gave a gentle tug at the dwarf's sleeve and pulled him into the stair. "'My lord, we must away. Your path is down.' "'That's no lie, at least.' Tyrion waddled along in the eunuch's wake, his heels scraping against the rough stone as they descended. It was very cold within the stairwell, a damp, bone-chilling cold that set him to shivering at once. "'What part of the dungeons are these?' he asked. "'Magor the Cruel decreed four levels of dungeons for his castle,' Varys replied. "'On the upper level there are large cells where common criminals may be confined together. They have narrow windows set high in the walls.' The second level has the smaller cells where high-born captives are held. They have no windows, but torches in the halls cast light through the bars. On the third level, the cells are smaller and the doors are wood. The black cells, men call them. That was where you were kept and Eddard Stark before you. But there is a level lower still. Once a man is taken down to the fourth level, he never sees the sun again, nor hears a human voice, nor breathes a breath free of agonizing pain. Magor had the cells on the fourth level, built for torment. They had reached the bottom of the steps. An unlighted door opened before them. This is the fourth level. Give me your hand, my lord. It is safer to walk in darkness here. There are things you would not wish to see. Tyrion hung back a moment. Varys had already betrayed him once. Who knew what game the eunuch was playing? And what better place to murder a man than down in the darkness, in a place that no one knew existed? His body might never be found. On the other hand, what choice did he have? To go back up the steps and walk out the main gate? No, that would not serve. Jamie would not be afraid, he thought, before he remembered what Jamie had done to him. He took the eunuch by the hand and let himself be led through the black, following the soft scrape of leather on stone. 
Barris walked quickly from time to time, whispering, A careful, there are three steps ahead, or the tunnel slopes downward here, my lord. I arrived here at King's Hand, riding through the gates at the head of my own sworn men, Tyrion reflected, and I leave like a rat scuttling through the dark, holding hands with a spider. A light appeared ahead of them, too dim to be daylight, and grew as they hurried toward it. After a while he could see it was an arched doorway, closed off by another iron gate. Varys produced a key. They stepped through into a small round chamber. Five other doors opened off the room, each barred in iron. There was an opening in the ceiling as well, and a series of rungs set in the wall below, leading upward. An ornate brazier stood to one side, fashioned in the shape of a dragon's head. The coals and the beast's yawning mouth had burnt down to embers, but they still glowed with a sullen orange light. Dim as it was, the light was welcome after the blackness of the tunnel. The juncture was otherwise empty, but on the floor was a mosaic of a three-headed dragon wrought in red and black tiles. Something niggled at Tyrion for a moment. Then it came to him. This is the place Shea told me of, when Varys first led her to my bed. We are below the Tower of the Hand. Yes. Frozen hinges screamed in protest as Varys pulled open a long closed door. Flakes of rust drifted to the floor. This will take us out to the river. Tyrion walked slowly to the ladder, ran his hand across the lowest rung. This will take me up to my bedchamber. Your lord father's bedchamber now? He looked up the shaft. How far must I climb? My lord, you are too weak for such follies, and there is besides no time we must go. I have business above. How far? Two hundred and thirty rungs, but whatever you intend. Two hundred and thirty rungs, and then? The tunnel to the left. But hear me. How far along to the bedchamber? Tyrion lifted a foot to the lowest rung of the ladder. No more than sixty feet. Keep one hand on the wall as you go. You will feel the doors. The bedchamber is the third. He sighed. This is folly, my lord. Your brother has given you your life back. Would you cast it away and mine with it? Varys, the only thing I value less than my life just now is yours. Wait for me here. He turned his back on the eunuch and began to climb, counting silently as he went. Rung by rung he ascended into darkness. At first he could see the dim outline of each rung as he grasped it, and the rough grey texture of the stone behind, but as he climbed the black grew thicker. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. By thirty his arms trembled with a strain of pulling. He paused a moment to catch his breath and glanced down. A circle of faint light shone far below, half obscured by his own feet. Tyrion resumed his ascent. Thirty-nine, forty, forty-one. By fifty his legs burned. The ladder was endless, numbing. Sixty-eight, sixty-nine, seventy. By eighty his back was a dull agony. Yet still he climbed. He could not have said why. One thirteen, one fourteen, one fifteen... At two hundred and thirty the shaft was black as pitch, but he could feel the warm air flowing from the tunnel to his left, like the breath of some great beast. He poked about awkwardly with a foot and edged off the ladder. The tunnel was even more cramped than the shaft. Any man of normal size would have had to crawl on hands and knees, but Tyrion was short enough to walk upright. At last a place made for dwarfs. His boots scuffed softly against the stone. He walked slowly, counting steps, feeling for gaps in the walls. Soon he began to hear voices, muffled and indistinct at first, then clearer. He listened more closely. Two of his father's guardsmen were joking about the imp's whore, saying how sweet it would be to fuck her, and how bad she must want a real cock in place of the dwarf's stunted little thing. "'Most like it's got a crook in it,' said Lum. That led him into a discussion of how Tyrion would die on the morrow. "'He'll weep like a woman and beg for mercy, you'll see,' Lum insisted. Lester figured he'd face the axe brave as a lion, being a Lannister, and he was willing to bet his new boots on it. "'Ah, shit in your boots,' said Lum. "'You know they'd never fit these feet of mine. Tell you what, if I win, you can scour my bloody mail for a fortnight.' For the space of a few feet Tyrion could hear every word of their haggling, but when he moved on the voices faded quickly. "'Small wonder Varys did not want me to climb the bloody ladder,' Tyrion thought, smiling in the dark. Little birds, indeed. 
He came to the third door and fumbled about for a long time before his fingers brushed a small iron hook set between two stones. When he pulled down on it, there was a soft rumble that sounded loud as an avalanche in the stillness, and a square of dull orange light opened a foot to his left. The hearth! He almost laughed. The fireplace was full of hot ash and a black log with a hot orange heart burning within. He edged past gingerly, taking quick steps so as not to burn his boots, the warm cinders crunching softly under his heels. When he found himself in what had once been his bedchamber, he stood a long moment, breathing the silence. Had his father heard? Would he reach for his sword, raise the hue and cry? My lord, a woman's voice called. That might have hurt me once, when I still felt pain. The first step was the hardest. When he reached the bed, Tyrion pulled the draperies aside, and there she was, turning toward him with a sleepy smile on her lips. It died when she saw him. She pulled the blankets up to her chin, as if that would protect her. Were you expecting someone taller, sweetling? Big, wet tears filled her eyes. I never meant those things I said the Queen made me. Please, your father frightens me so. She sat up, letting the blanket slide down to her lap. Beneath it she was naked, but for the chain about her throat, a chain of linked golden hands, each holding the next. My Lady Shay, Tyrion said softly, all the time I sat in the black cell waiting to die, I kept remembering how beautiful you were. In silk, or rough spun, or nothing at all. My lord will be back soon. You should go, or— Did you come to take me away? Did you ever like it? He cupped her cheek, remembering all the times he had done this before, all the times he'd slid his hands around her waist, squeezed her small, firm breasts, stroked her short, dark hair, touched her lips, her cheeks, her ears, all the times he had opened her with a finger to probe her secret sweetness and make her moan. Did you ever like my touch? More than anything, she said, my giant of Lannister. That was the worst thing you could have said, sweetling. Tyrion slid a hand under his father's chain and twisted. The links tightened, digging into her neck. For hands of gold are always cold, but a woman's hands are warm, he said. He gave cold hands another twist as the warm ones beat away his tears. Afterward he found Lord Tywin's dagger on the bedside table and shoved it through his belt. A lion-headed mace, a pole-axe, and a crossbow had been hung on the walls. The pole-axe would be clumsy to wield inside a castle, and the mace was too high to reach, but a large wooden iron chest had been placed against the wall directly under the crossbow. He climbed up, pulled down the bow and a leather quiver, packed with quarrels, jammed a foot into the stirrup, and pushed down until the bowstring cocked. Then he slipped the bolt into the notch. Jamie had lectured him more than once on the drawbacks of crossbows. If Lum and Lester emerged from wherever they were talking, He'd never have time to reload, but at least he'd take one down to hell with him. Lum, if he had a choice. You'll have to clean your own mail, Lum. You lose. Waddling to the door, he listened a moment, then eased it open slowly. A lamp burned in a stone niche, casting wan yellow light over the empty hallway. Only the flame was moving. Tyrion slid out, holding the crossbow down against his leg. He found his father where he knew he'd find him, seated in the dimness of the privy tower, bedrobe hiked up around his hips. At the sound of steps, Lord Tywin raised his eyes. Tyrion gave him a mocking half-bow. My lord. Tyrion. If he was afraid, Tywin Lannister gave no hint of it. Who released you from your cell? I'd love to tell you, but I swore a holy oath. The eunuch. His father decided, I'll have his head for this. Is that my crossbow? Put it down. Will you punish me if I refuse, father? This escape is folly. You are not to be killed, if that is what you fear. It's still my intent to send you to the wall, but I could not do it without Lord Tyrell's consent. Put down the crossbow, and we will go back to my chambers and talk of it. We can talk here just as well. Perhaps I don't choose to go to the wall, father. It's bloody cold up there, and I believe I've had enough coldness from you. So just tell me something, and I'll be on my way. One simple question. You owe me that much? I owe you nothing. You've given me less than that all my life. But you'll give me this. What did you do with Tysha? Tysha? 
He does not even remember her name. The girl I married. Oh, yes, your first whore. Tyrion took aim at his father's chest. The next time you say that word, I'll kill you. You do not have the courage. Shall we find out? It's a short word, and it seems to come so easily to your lips. Tyrion gestured impatiently with a bow. Tysha! What did you do with her after my little lesson? I don't recall. Try harder. Did you have her killed? His father pursed his lips. There was no reason for that. She'd learned her place, and had been well paid for her day's work, I seem to recall. I suppose the steward sent her on her way. I never thought to inquire. On her way where? Wherever whores go. Tyrion's finger clenched. The crossbow whanged just as Lord Tywin started to rise. The bolt slammed into him above the groin, and he sat back down with a grunt. The quarrel had sunk deep right to the fletching. Blood seeped out around the shaft, dripping down into his pubic hair and over his bare thighs. You shot me, he said incredulously, his eyes glassy with shock. You always were quick to grasp a situation, my lord, Tyrion said. That must be why you're the hand of the king. You... you are no... no son of mine? Now that's where you're wrong, father. Why, I believe I'm you writ small. Do me a kindness now and die quickly. I have a ship to catch. For once his father did what Tyrion asked him. The proof was the sudden stench, as his bowels loosened in the moment of death. Well, he was in the right place for it, Tyrion thought. But the stink that filled the privy gave ample evidence that the oft-repeated jape about his father was just another lie. Lord Tywin Lannister did not, in the end, shit gold. Samwell The king was angry. Sam saw that at once. As the black brothers entered one by one and knelt before him, Stannis shoved away his breakfast of hard bread, salt beef, and boiled eggs, and eyed them coldly. Beside him the red woman Melisandre looked as if she found the scene amusing. "'I have no place here,' Sam thought anxiously, when her red eyes fell upon him. "'Someone had to help Maester Amon up the steps. Don't look at me, I'm just the Maester Steward.' The others were contenders for the old bear's command, all but Bowen Marsh, who had withdrawn from the contest, but remained Castellan and Lord Steward. Sam did not understand why Melisandre should seem so interested in him. King Stannis kept the Black Brothers on their knees for an extraordinarily long time. "'Rise,' he said at last. Sam gave Maester Amon his shoulder to help him back up. The sound of Lord Janos slint clearing his throat broke the strange silence. "'Your Grace, let me say how pleased we are to be summoned here. When I saw your banners from the wall, I knew the realm was saved. There comes a man who ne'er forgets his duty,' I said to good Sir Alicer. "'A strong man, and a true king. May I congratulate you on your victory over the savages? The singers will make much of it, I know. The singers may do as they like.' Stannis snapped. Spare me your fawning, Janos. It will not serve you. He rose to his feet and frowned at them all. Lady Melisandre tells me that you have not yet chosen a Lord Commander. I am displeased. How much longer must this folly last? Sire, said Bowen Marsh, in a defensive tone, no one has achieved two-thirds of the vote yet. It has only been ten days. Nine days too long. I have captives to dispose of, a realm to order, a war to fight. Choices must be made, decisions that involve the Wall and the Night's Watch. By rights, your Lord Commander should have a voice in those decisions. He should, yes, said Janos Slint. But it must be said. We brothers are only simple soldiers. Soldiers, yes. And your Grace will know that soldiers are most comfortable taking orders. They would benefit from your royal guidance, it seems to me, for the good of the realm, to help them choose wisely. The suggestion outraged some of the others. "'Do you want the king to wipe our arses for us, too?' said Carter Pike angrily. "'The choice of a lord commander belongs to the sworn brothers and to them alone,' insisted Sir Dennis Malister. "'If they choose wisely, they won't be choosing me,' moaned Dolores Ed. Maester Amon, calm as always, said, "'Your Grace, the Night's Watch has been choosing its own leader since Brandon the Builder raised the wall. Through J. R. Mormont we have had nine hundred and ninety-seven lords commander in unbroken succession, each chosen by the men he would lead. 
a tradition many thousands of years old. Stannis ground his teeth. It is not my wish to tamper with your rights and traditions. As to royal guidance, Janos, if you mean that I ought to tell your brothers to choose you, have the courage to say so. That took Lord Janos aback. He smiled uncertainly and began to sweat. But Bowen Marsh beside him said, Who better to command the black cloaks than a man who once commanded the gold, sire? Any of you, I would think. Even the cook. The look the king gave slint was cold. Janos was hardly the first gold cloak ever to take a bribe, I grant you, but he may have been the first commander to fatten his purse by selling places and promotions. By the end, he must have had half the officers in the city watch paying him part of their wages. Isn't that so, Janos? Slint's neck was purpling. Lies! All lies! A strong man makes enemies, your grace knows that. They whisper lies behind your back. Naught was ever proven. Not a man came forward. Two men who were prepared to come forward died suddenly on their rounds. Stannis narrowed his eyes. Do not trifle with me, my lord. I saw the proof John Arryn laid before the small council. If I had been king, you would have lost more than your office, I promise you. But Robert shrugged away your little lapses. They all steal, I recall him saying. Better a thief we know than when we don't. The next man might be worse. Lord Peter's words in my brother's mouth, I'll warrant. Littlefinger had a nose for gold, and I'm certain he arranged matters so the crown profited as much from your corruption as you did yourself. Lord Slint's jowls were quivering, but before he could frame a further protest, Maester Amon said, Your Grace, by law, a man's past crimes and transgressions are wiped clean when he says his words and becomes a sworn brother of the Night's Watch. I am aware of that. If it happens that Lord Janos here is the best the Night's Watch can offer, I shall grit my teeth and choke him down. It is not to me which man of you is chosen, so long as you make a choice. We have a war to fight. Your Grace, said Sir Dennis Malister, in tones of wary courtesy, if you are speaking of the wildlings, I am not, and you know that, sir. And you must know that whilst we are thankful for the aid you rendered us against a man's raider, we can offer you no help in your contest for the throne. The Night's Watch takes no part in the wars of the Seven Kingdoms for eight thousand years. I know your history, Sir Dennis. The king said brusquely, I give you my word, I shall not ask you to lift your swords against any of the rebels and usurpers who plague me. I do expect that you will continue to defend the wall, as you always have. We'll defend the wall to the last man, said Carter Pike. Probably me, said Dolor said in a resigned tone. Stannis crossed his arms. I shall require a few other things from you as well, things that you may not be so quick to give. I want your castles. And I want the gift. Those blunt words burst among the Black Brothers like a pot of wildfire tossed onto a brazier. Marsh, Malister, and Pike all tried to speak at once. King Stannis let them talk. When they were done, he said, I have three times the men you do. I can take the lands if I wish, but I would prefer to do this legally with your consent. Well, the gift was given to the Night's Watch in perpetuity, Your Grace, Bowen Marsh insisted which means it cannot be lawfully seized, attainted, or taken from you. But what was given once can be given again. What will you do with a gift? demanded Cutter Pike. Make better use of it than you have. As to the castles, East Watch, Castle Black, and the Shadow Tower shall remain yours. Garrison them as you always have, but I must take the others for my garrisons if we are to hold the wall. You do not have the men objected Bowen Marsh. Some of the abandoned castles are scarce more than ruins, said Othel Yarwick, the first builder. Ruins can be rebuilt. Rebuilt, Yarwick said. But who will do the work? That is my concern. I shall require a list from you detailing the present state of every castle and what might be required to restore it. I mean to have them all garrisoned again within the year and night fires burning before their gates. Night fires? But when Marsh gave Melisandre an uncertain look, we're to light night fires now? You are. The woman rose in a swirl of scarlet silk, her long copper bright hair tumbling about her shoulders. Swords alone cannot hold this darkness back. Only the light of the Lord can do that. Make no mistake, good sirs and valiant brothers. 
The war we've come to fight is no petty squabble over lands and honours. Ours is a war for life itself, and should we fail, the world dies with us. The officers did not know how to take that, Sam could see. Bowen Marsh and Othel Yarwick exchanged a doubtful look. Janos Slint was fuming, and Three-Finger Hob looked as though he would sooner be back chopping carrots. But all of them seemed surprised to hear Maester Amon murmur, "'It is the war for the dawn you speak of, my lady. But where is the prince that was promised?' "'He stands before you,' Narasandra declared, "'though you do not have the eyes to see.' Stannis Baratheon is Azor a high come again, the warrior of fire. In him the prophecies are fulfilled. The red comet blazed across the sky to herald his coming, and he bears Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes. Her words seemed to make the king desperately uncomfortable, Sam saw. Stannis ground his teeth and said, You called and I came, my lords. Now you must live with me or die with me. Best get used to that. He made a brusque gesture. That's all. Maester, stay a moment. And you, Tarly. The rest of you may go. Me? Sam thought, stricken, as his brothers were bowing and making their way out. What does he want with me? You are the one that killed the creature in the snow, King Stannis said, when only the four of them remained. Sam the Slayer, Melisandre smiled. Sam felt his face turning red. No, my lady, uh, your grace, I mean, uh, I am... Yes, I'm Samuel Tarley, yes. Your father is an able soldier, King Stannis said. He defeated my brother once at Ashford. Maesterell has been pleased to claim the honors for that victory, but Lord Randall had decided matters before Tyrell ever found the battlefield. He slew Lord Catherine with that great Valyrian sword of his and sent his head to Ares. The king rubbed his jaw with a finger. You are not the sort of son I would expect such a man to have. I, I am not the sort of son he wanted, sire. If you had not taken the black, you would make a useful hostage, Stannis mused. He has taken the black, sire, Maester Amon pointed out. I am well aware of that, the king said. I am aware of more than you know, Amon Targaryen. The old man inclined his head. I am only Amon, sire. We give up our house names when we forge our maester's chains. The king gave that a curt nod, as if to say he knew and did not care. You slew this creature with an obsidian dagger, I am told, he said to Sam. Y yes, your grace. John Snow gave it to me. Dragon glass. The red woman's laugh was music. Frozen fire in the tongue of old Valyria. Small wonder it is anathema to these cold children of the other. On Dragonstone, where I had my seat, there is much of this obsidian to be seen in the old tunnels beneath the mountain, the king told Sam. Chunks of it, boulders, ledges. The great part of it was black, as I recall. But there was some green as well, some red, even purple. I have sent word to Sir Roland, my castellan, to begin mining it. I will not hold Dragonstone for very much longer, I fear, but perhaps the Lord of Light shall grant us enough frozen fire to arm ourselves against these creatures before the castle falls. Sam cleared his throat. S sire the dagger, the dragon glass, only shattered when I tried to stab a white. Melisandre smiled. Necromancy animates these whites, yet they are still only dead flesh. Steel and fire will serve for them. The ones you call the others are something more. Demons made of snow and ice and cold, said Stannis Baratheon, the ancient enemy. The only enemy that matters. He considered Sam again. I am told that you and this wildling girl passed beneath the wall through some magic gate. The, the black gate, Sam stammered, below the night fort. The night fort is the largest and oldest of the castles on the wall, the king said. That is where I intend to make my seat whilst I fight this war. You will show me the skate. I, said Sam, I w will if... If it is still there, if it will open for a man not of the black, if... You will, snapped Stannis. I shall tell you when. Maester Amon smiled. Your grace, he said, before we go, I wonder if you would do us the great honor of showing us this wondrous blade we have all heard so very much of. 
You want to see Lightbringer? A blind man? Sam shall be my eyes. The king frowned. Everyone else has seen the thing. Why not a blind man? His sword belt and scabbard hung from a peg near the hearth. He took the belt down and drew the long sword out. Steel scraped against wood and leather, and radiance filled the solar, shimmering, shifting, a dance of gold and orange and red light, all the bright colors of fire. Tell me, Samuel. Maester Amon touched his arm. It glows, said Sam in a hushed voice, as if it were on fire. There are no flames, but the steel is yellow and red and orange, all flashing and glimmering like sunshine on water, but prettier. I wish you could see it, Maester. I see it now, Sam. A sword full of sunlight. So lovely to behold. The old man bowed stiffly. Your grace, my lady, this was most kind of you. When King Stannis sheathed the shining sword, the room seemed to grow very dark, despite the sunlight streaming through the window. Very well, you've seen it. You may return to your duties now. And remember what I said. Your brothers will choose a Lord Commander tonight, or I shall make them wish they had. Mr. Amon was lost in thought as Sam helped him down the narrow turnpike stair. But as they were crossing the yard, he said, I felt no heat. Did you, Sam? Heat? From the sword? He thought back. The air around it was shimmering the way it does above a hot brazier. Yet you felt no heat, did you? and the scabbard that held the sword. It is wood and leather, yes? I heard the sound when his grace drew out the blade. Was the leather scorched, Sam? Did the wood seem burnt or blackened? No, Sam admitted. Not that I could see. Maester Amon nodded. Back in his own chambers he asked Sam to set a fire and help him to his chair beside the hearth. It is hard to be so old, he sighed as he settled onto the cushion, and harder still to be so blind. I miss the sun. And books. I miss books most of all. Amon waved a hand. I shall have no more need of you till the choosing. The choosing? Maester, isn't there something you could do? What the king said of Lord Janos— I recall, Maester Amon said. But, Sam, I am a maester, chained and sworn. My duty is to counsel the Lord Commander, whoever he might be. It would not be proper for me to be seen to favor one contender over another. I'm not a maester, said Sam. Could I do something? Amon turned his blind white eyes toward Sam's face and smiled softly. Why, I don't know, Samwell. Could you? I could, Sam thought. I have to. He had to do it right away, too. If he hesitated, he was certain to lose his courage. I am a man of the night's watch, he reminded himself as he hurried across the yard. I am. I can do this. There had been a time when he had quaked and squeaked if Lord Mormont so much as looked at him, but that was the old Sam, before the fist of the first men and Craster's Keep, before the whites and cold hands and the other on his dead horse. He was braver now. Jilly made me braver, he'd told John. It was true. It had to be true. Carter Pike was the scarier of the two commanders, so Sam went to him first, while his courage was still hot. He found him in the old shield hall, dicing with three of his East Watch men and a red-headed sergeant who had come from Dragonstone with Stannis. When Sam begged leave to speak with him, though, Pike barked an order, and the others took the dice and coins and left them. No man would ever call Carter Pike handsome, though the body under his studied brigantine and rough-spun breeches was lean and hard and wiry strong. His eyes were small and close-set, his nose broken, his widow's peak as sharply pointed as the head of a spear. The pox had ravaged his face badly, and the beard he'd grown to hide the scars was thin and scraggly. "'Sam the Slayer,' he said by way of greeting, "'are you sure you stabbed another and not some child snow knight?' "'This isn't starting well. It was the dragon glass that killed it, my lord,' Sam explained feebly. "'I no doubt. "'Well, out with it, Slayer.' Did the maester send you to me? The maester? Sam swallowed. I, I just left him, my lord. That wasn't truly a lie, but if Pike chose to read it wrong, it might make him more inclined to listen. Sam took a deep breath and launched into his plea. Pike cut him off before he'd said twenty words. You want me to kneel down and kiss the hem of Malister's pretty cloak, is that it? 
I might have known. You lordlings all flock like sheep. Well, tell Amon that he's wasted your breath and my time. If anyone withdraws, it should be Malister. The man's too bloody old for the job. Maybe you ought to go tell him that. We choose him, and we'll like to be back here in a year, choosing someone else. He's old, Sam agreed, but he's what ex experienced. At sitting in his tower and fussing over maps, maybe. What did he plan to do, write letters to the whites? He's a knight, well and good, but he's not a fighter, and I don't give a kettle of piss who he unhorsed in some fool tourney fifty years ago. The half-hand fought all his battles. Even an old blind man should see that. And we need a fighter more than ever with this bloody king on top of us. Today it's ruins and empty fields. Well and good, but what will his grace want come tomorrow? You think Malister has the belly to stand up to Stannis Baratheon and that red bitch? He laughed. I don't. You won't support him, then? said Sam, dismayed. Are you Sam the Slayer or Deaf Dick? No, I won't support him. Pike jabbed a finger at his face. Understand this, boy. I don't want the bloody job and never did. I fight best with a deck beneath me, not a horse, and Castle Black is too far from the sea. But I'll be buggered with a red-hot sword before I turn the Night's Watch over to that preening eagle from the Shadow Tower. And you can run back to the old man and tell him I said so, if he asks. He stood. Get out of my sight. It took all the courage Sam had left in him to say, well, What if there was someone else? Could you s support someone else? Oh, Bowen Marsh? The man counts spoons. Othel's a follower, does what he's told, and does it well, but no more than that. Slint? Well, his men like him, I'll grant you. And it would almost be worth it to stick him down the royal craw and see if Stannis gags, but no. There's too much of King's Landing in that one. A toad grows wings and thinks he's a bloody dragon. Pike laughed. Who does that leave, Hob? We could pick him, I suppose. Only then, who's going to boil your mutton, Slayer? You look like a man who likes his bloody mutton. There was nothing more to say. Defeated, Sam could only stammer out his thanks and take his leave. I will do better with Sir Dennis, he tried to tell himself as he walked through the castle. Sir Dennis was a knight, high-born and well-spoken, and he had treated Sam most courteously when he'd found him and Jilly on the road. Sir Dennis will listen to me. He has to. The commander of the Shadow Tower had been born beneath the booming tower of Seaguard, and looked every inch a Malister. Sable trimmed his collar and accented the sleeves of his black velvet doublet. A silver eagle fastened its claws in the gathered folds of his cloak. His beard was white as snow. His hair was largely gone, and his face was deeply lined, it was true. Yet he still had grace in his movements and teeth in his mouth, and the years had dimmed neither his blue-gray eyes nor his courtesy. "'My lord of Tarley,' he said, when his steward brought Sam to him in the lance where the Shadow Tower men were staying, "'I am pleased to see that you have recovered from your ordeal. Might I offer you a cup of wine? Your lady mother is a Florent, I recall.' One day I must tell you about the time I unhorsed both of your grandfathers in the same tourney. Not today, though. I know we have more pressing concerns. You come for Mr. Amon, to be sure. Does he have counsel to offer me? Sam took a sip of wine and chose his words with care. A maester chained and sworn, it would not be proper for him to be seen as having influenced the choice of Lord Commander. The old knight smiled. Which is why he has not come to me himself. Yes, I quite understand, Samwell. Amon and I are both old men and wise in such matters. Say what you came to say. The wine was sweet, and Sir Dennis listened to Sam's plea with grave courtesy, unlike Carter Pike. But when he was done, the older knight shook his head. I agree that it would be a dark day in our history if a king were to name our Lord Commander. This king especially. He is not like to keep his crown for long. But— truly, Samwell. It ought to be Pike who withdraws. I have more support than he does, and I am better suited to the office. You are, Sam agreed. But Carter Pike might serve. It's said he has oft proved himself in battle. He did not mean to offend Sir Dennis by praising his rival, but how else could he convince him to withdraw? Many of my brothers have proved themselves in battle. It is not enough. Some matters cannot be settled with a battle-axe. Maester Amon will understand that, though Carter Pike does not. The Lord Commander of the Night's Watch is a lord, first and foremost. He must be able to treat with other lords. 
and with kings as well. He must be a man worthy of respect. Sir Dennis leaned forward. We are the sons of great lords, you and I. We know the importance of birth, blood, and that early training that can never be replaced. I was a squire at twelve, a knight at eighteen, a champion at two and twenty. I have been the commander at the Shadow Tower for thirty-three years. Blood, birth, and training have fitted me to deal with kings. Pike! Well, did you hear him this morning, asking if his grace would wipe his bottom? Samwell, it is not my habit to speak unkindly of my brothers, but let us be frank. The Ironborn are a race of pirates and thieves, and Cutter Pike was raping and murdering when he was still half a boy. Maester Harmune reads and writes his letters, and has for years. No, loath as I am to disappoint Maester Amon, I could not in honour stand aside for Pike of Eastwatch. This time Sam was ready. Might you for someone else, if it was someone more suitable? Sir Dennis considered a moment. I have never desired the honour for its own sake. At the last choosing I stepped aside gratefully when Lord Mormont's name was offered, just as I had for Lord Corgyle at the choosing before that. So long as the knight's watch remains in good hands, I am content. But Bowen Marsh is not equal to the task, no more than Othel Yarwick. And this so-called Lord of Harrenhal is a butcher's whelp, up-jumped by the Lannisters. Small wonder he is venal and corrupt. There's another man, Sam blurted out. Lord Commander Mormont trusted him. So did Donald Noy and Corin Halfhand. Though he's not as highly born as you, he comes from old blood. He was castle-born and castle-raised, and he learned sword and lance from a knight and letters from a maester of the citadel. His father was a lord, and his brother a king. Sir Dennis stroked his long white beard. Mayhaps he said, after a long moment. He is very young, but mayhaps he might serve, I grant you, though I would be more suitable. I have no doubt of that. I would be the wiser choice. John said there could be honor in a lie if it were told for the right reason. Sam said, If we do not choose a Lord Commander tonight, King Stannis means to name Cotter Pike. He said as much to Maester Amon this morning after all of you had left. I see, Sir Dennis Rose. I must think on this. Thank you, Samwell, and give my thanks to Maester Amon as well. Sam was trembling by the time he left the lance. What have I done? he thought. What have I said? If they caught him in his lie, they would... What? Send me to the wall? Rip my entrails out? Turn me into a white? Suddenly it all seemed absurd. How could he be so frightened of Cotter Pike and Sir Dennis Malister when he had seen a raven eating small Paul's face? Pike was not pleased by his return. You again? Make it quick. You are starting to annoy me. I only need a moment more, Sam promised. You won't withdraw for Sir Dennis, you said, but you might for someone else. Who is it this time? Slayer you? No. A fighter. Donald Noy gave him the wall when the wildlings came, and he was the old bear squire. The only thing is, he's bastard-born. Cotter Pike laughed. Bloody hell! That would shove a spear up Malister's arse, wouldn't it? Might be worth it just for that. How bad could the boy be? He snorted. I'd be better, though. I'm what's needed. Any fool can see that. Any fool, Sam agreed. Even me. But, well, I shouldn't be telling you, but... King Stannis means to force Sir Dennis on us if we do not choose a man tonight. I heard him tell Maester Amon that after the rest of you were sent away. John Iron Emmet was a long, lanky young ranger whose endurance, strength, and swordsmanship were the pride of Eastwatch. John always came away from their sessions stiff and sore and woke the next day covered with bruises, which was just the way he wanted it. He would never get any better going up against the likes of Satin and Horse, or even Gren. Most days he gave as good as he got, John liked to think, but not today. He had hardly slept last night, and after an hour of restless tossing he had given up even the attempt, dressed and walked the top of the wall till the sun came up, wrestling with Stannis Baratheon's offer. 
The lack of sleep was catching up with him now, and Emmett was hammering him mercilessly across the yard, driving him back on his heels with one long, looping cut after another, and slamming him with his shield from time to time for good measure. John's arm had gone numb from the shock of impact, and the edgeless practice sword seemed to be growing heavier with every passing moment. He was almost ready to lower his blade and call a halt, when Emmett fainted low and came in over his shield with a savage forehand slash that caught John on the temple. He staggered, his helm and head both ringing from the force of the blow. For half a heartbeat, the world beyond his eye slit was a blur. And then the years were gone, and he was back at Winterfell once more, wearing a quilted leather coat in place of mail and plate. His sword was made of wood, and it was Rob who stood facing him, not Iron Emmet. Every morning they had trained together since they were big enough to walk, Snow and Stark spinning and slashing about the wards of Winterfell, shouting and laughing, sometimes crying when there was no one else to see. They were not little boys when they fought, but knights and mighty heroes. I'm Prince Amon the Dragon Knight, John would call out, and Rob would shout back, Well, I'm Florian the Fool, or Rob would say, I'm the Young Dragon, and John would reply, I'm Sir Ryan Redwine. That morning he called at first. I'm Lord of Winterfell, he cried, as he had a hundred times before. Only this time, this time, Rob had answered, You can't be Lord of Winterfell. You're bastard-born. My lady mother says you can't ever be the Lord of Winterfell. I thought I had forgotten that. John could taste blood in his mouth from the blow he'd taken. In the end, Halder and Horse had to pull him away from Iron Emmet, one man on either arm. The ranger sat on the ground dazed, his shield half in splinters, the visor of his helm knocked askew, and his sword six yards away. "'John, enough!' Alder was shouting. "'He's down! You disarmed him! Enough!' "'No, not enough! Never enough!' John let his sword drop. "'I'm sorry,' he muttered. "'Emmett, are you hurt?' Iron Emmett pulled his battered helm off. "'Was there some part of yield you could not comprehend, Lord Snow?' It was said amiably, though. Emmett was an amiable man, and he loved the Song of Swords. Warrior, defend me, he groaned. Now I know how Corn Halfhand must have felt. That was too much. John wrenched free of his friends and retreated to the armory alone. His ears were still ringing from the blow Emmett had dealt him. He sat on the bench and buried his head in his hands. Why am I so angry? he asked himself, but it was a stupid question. Lord of Winterfell. I could be the Lord of Winterfell, my father's heir. It was not Lord Eddard's face he saw floating before him, though. It was Lady Caitlin's. With her deep blue eyes and hard, cold mouth, she looked a bit like Stannis. Iron, he thought, but brittle. She was looking at him the way she used to look at him at Winterfell, whenever he had bested Rob at swords or sums or most anything. Who are you? That look had always seemed to say. This is not your place. Why are you here? His friends were still out in the practice yard, but John was in no fit state to face them. He left the armory by the back, descending a steep flight of stone steps to the wormways, the tunnels that linked the castle's keeps and towers below the earth. It was a short walk to the bathhouse, where he took a cold plunge to wash the sweat off and soaked in a hot stone tub. The warmth took some of the ache from his muscles and made him think of Winterfell's muddy pools steaming and bubbling in the godswood. Winter fell, he thought. Theon left it burned and broken, but I could restore it. Surely his father would have wanted that, and Rob as well. They would never have wanted the castle left in ruins. You can't be the Lord of Winterfell. You're bastard-born, he heard Rob say again. And the stone kings were growling at him with granite tongues. You do not belong here. This is not your place. When John closed his eyes, he saw the heart tree, with its pale limbs, red leaves, and solemn face. The weirwood was the heart of Winterfell, Lord Eddard always said. But to save the castle, John would have to tear that heart up by its ancient roots and feed it to the red woman's hungry fire god. I have no right, he thought. Winterfell belongs to the old gods. The sound of voices echoing off the vaulted ceiling brought him back to Castle Black. I don't know, a man was saying, in a voice thick with doubts. Maybe if I knew the man better. 
Lord Stannis didn't have much good to say of him, I'll tell you that. When has Stannis Baratheon ever had much good to say of anyone? Sir Alistair's flinty voice was unmistakable. If we let Stannis choose our Lord Commander, we become his bannermen in all but name. Tywin Lannister is not like to forget that, and you know it will be Lord Tywin who wins in the end. He's already beaten Stannis once on the Blackwater. Lord Tywin favors Slint, said Bowen Marsh in a fretful, anxious voice. I can show you his letter, Othol. Our faithful friend and servant, he called him. John Snow sat up suddenly, and the three men froze at the sound of the slosh. My lords, he said with cold courtesy. What are you doing here, bastard? Thorne asked. Bathing. But don't let me spoil your plotting. John climbed from the water, dried, dressed, and left them to conspire. Outside he found he had no idea where he was going. He walked past the shell of the Lord Commander's Tower, where once he'd saved the old bear from a dead man, past the spot where Ygritte had died with that sad smile on her face, past the King's Tower where he and Satin and Deaf Dick Follard had waited for the Magnar and his thens, past the heaped and charred remains of the great wooden stair. The inner gate was open, so John went down the tunnel, through the wall. He could feel the cold around him, the weight of all the ice above his head. He walked past the place where Donald Noy and Mag the Mighty had fought and died together, through the new outer gate, and back into the pale, cold sunlight. Only then did he permit himself to stop, to take a breath, to think. Othel Yarwick was not a man of strong convictions, except when it came to wood and stone and mortar. The old bear had known that. Thorn and Marsh will sway him. Yarwick will support Lord Janos, and Lord Janos will be chosen Lord Commander. And what does that leave me, if not Winterfell? A wind swirled against the wall, tugging at his cloak. He could feel the cold coming off the ice the way heat comes off a fire. John pulled up his hood and began to walk again. The afternoon was growing old, and the sun was low in the west. A hundred yards away was the camp where King Stannis had confined his wildling captives within a ring of ditches, sharpened stakes, and high wooden fences. To his left were three great fire pits, where the victors had burned the bodies of all the free folk to die beneath the wall, huge pelted giants and little horn-foot men alike. The killing ground was still a desolation of scorched weeds and hardened pitch, but Mance's people had left traces of themselves everywhere. A torn hide that might have been part of a tent, a giant's maul, the wheel of a chariot, a broken spear, a pile of mammoth dung. On the edge of the haunted forest, where the tents had been, John found an oak wood stump, and sat. Egrit wanted me to be a wildling. Stannis wants me to be the Lord of Winterfell. But what do I want? The sun crept down the sky to dip behind the wall where it curved through the western hills. John watched as that towering expanse of ice took on the reds and pinks of sunset. Would I sooner be hanged for a turn cloak by Lord Janos, or forswear my vows, marry Val, and become the Lord of Winterfell? It seemed an easy choice when he thought of it in those terms. Though if Ygrit had still been alive, it might have been even easier. Val was a stranger to him. She was not hard on the eyes, certainly, and she had been sister to Mance Raider's queen, but still— I would need to steal her if I wanted her love. But she might give me children. I might some day hold a son of my own blood in my arms. A son was something Jon Snow had never dared dream of, since he decided to live his life on the wall. I could name him Rob. Val would want to keep her sister's son, but we could foster him at Winterfell, and Jilly's boy as well. Sam would never need to tell his lie. We'd find a place for Jilly, too, and Sam could come visit her once a year or so. Mance's son and Craster's would grow up brothers, as I once did with Rob. He wanted it, John knew then. He wanted it as much as he had ever wanted anything. I have always wanted it, he thought guiltily. May the gods forgive me. It was a hunger inside him, sharp as a dragon-glass blade. A hunger, he could feel it. It was food he needed. Prey, a red deer that stank of fear, or a great elk proud and defiant. He needed to kill and fill his belly with fresh meat and hot, dark blood. His mouth began to water with the thought. It was a long moment before he understood what was happening. When he did, he bolted to his feet. Ghost! 
He turned toward the wood, and there he came, padding silently out of the green dusk, the breath coming warm and white from his open jaws. Ghost! he shouted, and the dire wolf broke into a run. He was leaner than he had been, but bigger as well, and the only sound he made was the soft crunch of dead leaves beneath his paws. When he reached John, he leapt, and they rustled amidst brown grass and long shadows as the stars came out above them. "'God's wolf, where have you been?' John said, when Ghost stopped worrying at his forearm. "'I thought you died on me, like Rob and Egrit and all the rest. I've had no sense of you, not since I climbed the wall, not even in dreams.' The dire wolf had no answer, but he licked John's face with a tongue like a wet rasp, and his eyes caught the last light and shone like two great red suns. Red eyes, John realized, but not like Melisandre's. He had a weirwood's eyes. Red eyes, red mouth, white fur, blood and bone like a heart tree. He belongs to the old gods, this one. And he alone, of all the dire wolves, was white. Six pups they'd found in the late summer snows, him and Rob, five that were gray and black and brown for the five Starks, and one white, as white as snow. He had his answer then. Beneath the wall the Queen's men were kindling their night fire. He saw Melisandre emerge from the tunnel with the king beside her to lead the prayers she believed would keep the dark away. Come, ghost, John told the wolf. With me? You're hungry, I know. I could feel it. They ran together for the gate, circling wide around the night fire, where reaching flames clawed at the black belly of the night. The king's men were much in evidence in the yards of Castle Black. They stopped as John went by and gaped at him. None of them had ever seen a dire wolf before, he realized, and Ghost was twice as large as the common wolves that prowled their southern greenwoods. As he walked toward the armory, John chanced to look up and saw Val standing in her tower window. I'm sorry, he thought. I'm not the man to steal you out of there. In the practice yard he came upon a dozen king's men with torches and long spears in their hands. Their sergeant looked at Ghost and scowled, and a couple of his men lowered their spears until the knight who led them said, Move aside and let them pass. To John he said, You're late for your supper. Then get out of my way, sir, John replied, and he did. He could hear the noise even before he reached the bottom of the steps, raised voices, curses, someone pounding on a table. John stepped into the vault all but unnoticed. His brothers crowded the benches and the tables, but more were standing and shouting than were sitting, and no one was eating. There was no food. What's happening here? Lord Janos Slint was bellowing about turn cloaks and treason. Iron Emmet stood on a table with a naked sword in his fist. Three-Finger Hob was cursing a ranger from the Shadow Tower. Some East Watch man slammed his fist onto the table again and again, demanding quiet. But all that did was add to the din echoing off the vaulted ceiling. Pip was the first to see John. He grinned at the sight of Ghost, put two fingers in his mouth, and whistled as only a mummer's boy could whistle. The shrill sound cut through the clamor like a sword. As John walked toward the tables, more of the brothers took note and fell quiet. A hush spread across the cellar, until the only sounds were John's heels clicking on the stone floor and the soft crackle of the logs in the hearth. Sir Alice Thorne shattered the silence. The turn cloak graces us with his presence at last. Lord Janos was red-faced and quivering. The beast, he gasped. Look! The beast that tore the life from half-hand. A warg walks among us, brothers. A warg! This, this creature is not fit to lead us. This beastling is not fit to live. Ghost bared his teeth, but John put a hand on his head. My lord, he said, will you tell me what's happened here? Maester Amon answered from the far end of the hall. Your name has been put forth as Lord Commander, John. That was so absurd, John had to smile. By who? he said, looking for his friends. This had to be one of Pip's japes, surely. But Pip shrugged at him, and Grant shook his head. It was Dolores Ed Tollard who stood. By me? Aye, it's a terrible, cruel thing to do to a friend, but better you than me. Lord Janos started sputtering again. This, this is an outrage. We ought to hang this boy. Yes, hang him, I say. Hang him for a turncloak and a warg, along with his friend Mance Raider. Lord Commander, I will not have it. I will not suffer it. Cotter Pike stood up. You won't suffer it. 
Might be you had those gold cloaks trained to lick your bloody arse, but you're wearing a black cloak now. Any brother may offer any name for our consideration, so long as the man has set his vows, Sir Dennis Malister said. Tollet is well within his rights, my lord. A dozen men started to talk at once, each trying to drown out the others, and before long half the hall was shouting once more. This time it was Sir Alistair Thorne who leapt up on the table and raised his hands for quiet. Brothers, he cried, this gains us not. I say we vote. This king, who has taken the king's tower, has posted men at all the doors to see that we do not eat nor leave till we have made a choice. So be it. We will choose, and choose again all night if need be, until we have our lord. But before we cast our tokens, I believe our first builder has something to say to us. Othony Arwick stood up slowly, frowning. The big builder rubbed his long lantern jaw and said, Well, I'm pulling my name out. If you wanted me, you had ten chances to choose me, and you didn't. Not enough of you, anyway. I was going to say that those who were casting a token for me ought to choose Lord Janos. Sir Alistair nodded. Lord Slint is the best possible. I wasn't done, Alistair. Yarwick complained. Lord Slint commanded the city watch in King's Landing, we all know, and he was Lord of Harrenhal. He's never seen Harrenhal, Carter Pike shouted out. Well, that's so, said Yarwick. Anyway, now that I'm standing here, I don't recall why I thought Slint would be such a good choice. That would be sort of kicking King Stannis in the mouth, and I don't see how that serves us. Might be Snow would be better. He's been longer on the wall. He's been Stark's nephew, and he served the old bear squire. Yarvik shrugged. Pick who you want, just so it's not me. He sat down. Janos Slint had turned from red to purple, John saw, but Sir Alistair Thorne had gone pale. The East Watch man was pounding his fist on the table again, but now he was shouting for the kettle. Some of his friends took up the cry. Kettle! they roared as one. Kettle! 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 The kettle was in the corner by the hearth, a big black pot-bellied thing with two huge handles and a heavy lid. Maester Amon said a word to Sam and Clytus, and they went and grabbed the handles and dragged the kettle over to the table. A few of the brothers were already queuing up by the token barrels, as Clytus took the lid off and almost dropped it on his foot. With a raucous scream and a clap of wings, a huge raven burst out of the kettle. It flapped upward, at seeking the rafters, perhaps, or a window to make its escape, but there were no rafters in the vault, nor windows either. The raven was trapped. Cawing loudly, it circled the hall once, twice, three times, and John heard Samuel Tarley shout, I know that bird. That's Lord Mormont's raven. The raven landed on the table nearest John. Snow, it cawed. It was an old bird, dirty and bedraggled. Snow, it said again. Snow, snow, snow. It walked to the end of the table, spread its wings again, and flew to John's shoulder. Lord Janos Slint sat down so heavily he made a thump, but Sir Alistair filled the vault with mocking laughter. Sir Piggy thinks we're all fools, brothers, he said. He's taught the bird this little trick. They all say snow. Go up to the rookery and hear for yourselves. Mormont's bird had more words than that. The raven cocked its head and looked at John. Orn, it said hopefully. When it got neither corn nor answer, it quirked and muttered, Kettle, kettle, kettle. The rest was arrowheads, a torrent of arrowheads, a flood of arrowheads, arrowheads enough to drown the last few stones and shells, and all the copper pennies, too. When the count was done, John found himself surrounded. Some clapped him on the back, whilst others bent the knee to him, as if he were a lord in truth. Satin, Owen the Oaf, Alder, Toad, Spare Boot, Giant, Mully, Ulmer of the Kingswood, Sweet Donald Hill, and half a hundred more pressed around him. Dywin clacked his wooden teeth and said, Gods be good, our Lord Commander still in swaddling clothes. Iron Emmet said, I hope this don't mean I can't beat the bloody piss out of you next time we train, my Lord. Three Finger Hob wanted to know if he'd still be eating with the men, or if he'd want his meals sent up to a solar. Even Bowen Marsh came up to say he would be glad to continue as Lord Steward, if that was Lord Snow's wish. Lord Snow, said Carter Pike, if you muck this up, I'm going to rip your liver out and eat it raw with onions. 
Sir Dennis Malister was more courteous. It was a hard thing young Samuel asked of me, the old knight confessed. When Lord Corgyle was chosen, I told myself, no matter, he has been longer on the wall than you have, your time will come. When it was Lord Mormont, I thought, he is strong and fierce, but he is old, your time may yet come. But you are half a boy, Lord Snow, and now I must return to the Shadow Tower, knowing that my time will never come. He smiled a tired smile. Do not make me die regretful. Your uncle was a great man, your lord father and his father as well. I shall expect full as much of you. Aye, said Carterpike, and you can start by telling those king's men that it's done and we want our bloody supper. Supper, screamed the raven. Supper, supper. The king's men cleared the door when they told them of the choosing, and Three Finger Hob and half a dozen helpers went trotting off to the kitchen to fetch the food. John did not wait to eat. He walked across the castle, wondering if he were dreaming, with a raven on his shoulder and ghost at his heels. Pip, Gren, and Sam trailed after him, chattering, but he hardly heard a word until Gren whispered, Sam did it. And Pip said, Sam did it. Pip had brought a wineskin with him, and he took a long drink and chanted, Sam, Sam, Sam the wizard, Sam the wonder, Sam, Sam the marvel man, he did it. But when did you hide the raven in the kettle, Sam, and how in seven hells could you be certain it would fly to John? It would have mucked up everything if the bird had decided to perch on Jano Slint's fat head. I had nothing to do with the bird, Sam insisted. When it flew out of the kettle, I almost wet myself. John laughed, half amazed that he still remembered how. You're all a bunch of mad fools, do you know that? Us? said Pip. You call us fools? We're not the ones who got chosen as the 998th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. You best have some wine, Lord John. I think you're going to need a lot of wine. So John Snow took the wineskin from his hand and had a swallow, but only one. The wall was his. The night was dark, and he had a king to face. Sansa She awoke all at once, every nerve a-tingle. For a moment she did not remember where she was. She had dreamt that she was little, still sharing a bedchamber with her sister Arya. But it was her maid she heard tossing in sleep, not her sister, and this was not Winterfell, but the airy. And I am Elaine Stone, a bastard girl. The room was cold and black, though she was warm beneath the blankets. Dawn had not yet come. Sometimes she dreamed of Sir Illin Payne and woke with her heart thumping, but this dream had not been like that. Home. It was a dream of home. The airy was no home. It was no bigger than Magor's Holdfast, and outside its sheer white walls was only the mountain and the long, treacherous descent past sky and snow and stone to the gates of the moon on the valley floor. There was no place to go and little to do. The older servants said these halls rang with laughter when her father and Robert Baratheon had been John Arryn's wards, but those days were many years gone. Her aunt kept a small household, and seldom permitted any guests to ascend past the gates of the moon. Aside from her aged maid, Sansa's only companion was the Lord Robert, eight going on three, and Marillion. There was always Marillion. When he played for them at supper, the young singer often seemed to be singing directly at her. Her aunt was far from pleased. Lady Lisa doted on Marillion and had banished two serving girls and even a page for telling lies about him. Lisa was as lonely as she was. Her new husband seemed to spend more time at the foot of the mountain than he did atop it. He was gone now, had been gone the past four days, meeting with the Corbrays. From bits and pieces of overheard conversations, Sansa knew that John Arryn's bannermen resented Lisa's marriage and begrudged Peter his authority as Lord Protector of the Vale. The senior branch of House Royce was close to open revolt over her aunt's failure to aid Rob in his war, and the Wayne Woods, Red Forts, Belmores, and Templetons were giving them every support. The mountain clans were being troublesome as well, and old Lord Hunter had died so suddenly that his two younger sons were accusing their elder brother of having murdered him. The Vale of Arryn might have been spared the worst of the war, but it was hardly the idyllic place that Lady Lisa had made it out to be. I am not going back to sleep, Sansa realized. My head is all a tumult. 
She pushed her pillow away reluctantly, threw back the blankets, went to her window, and opened the shutters. Snow was falling on the airy. Outside the flakes drifted down as soft and silent as memory. Was this what woke me? Already the snowfall lay thick upon the garden below, blanketing the grass, dusting the shrubs and statues with white, and weighing down the branches of the trees. The sight took Sansa back to cold nights long ago, in the long summer of her childhood. She had last seen snow the day she'd left Winterfell. That was a lighter fall than this, she remembered. Rob had melting flakes in his hair when he hugged me, and the snowball Arya tried to make kept coming apart in her hands. It hurt to remember how happy she had been that morning. Helen had helped her mount, and she'd ridden out with a snowflake swirling around her, off to see the great wide world. I thought my song was beginning that day, but it was almost done. Santa left the shutters open as she dressed. It would be cold, she knew, though the Ares towers encircled the garden and protected it from the worst of the mountain winds. She donned silken small clothes and a linen shift, and over that a warm dress of blue lamb's wool. Two pairs of hose for her legs, boots that laced up to her knees, heavy leather gloves, and finally a hooded cloak of soft white fox fur. Her maid rolled herself more tightly in her blanket as the snow began to drift in the window. Sansa eased open the door and made her way down the winding stair. When she opened the door to the garden, it was so lovely that she held her breath, unwilling to disturb such perfect beauty. The snow drifted down and down, all in ghostly silence, and lay thick and unbroken on the ground. All color had fled the world outside. It was a place of whites and blacks and grays. White towers and white snow and white statues, black shadows and black trees, the dark gray sky above. A pure world, Santa thought. I do not belong here. Yet she stepped out all the same. Her boots tore ankle-deep holes into the smooth white surface of the snow, yet made no sound. Sansa drifted past frosted shrubs and thin dark trees, and wondered if she were still dreaming. Drifting snowflakes brushed her face as light as lovers' kisses, and melted on her cheeks. At the center of the garden, beside the statue of the weeping woman that lay broken and half buried on the ground, she turned her face up to the sky and closed her eyes. She could feel the snow on her lashes, taste it on her lips. It was the taste of Winterfell, the taste of innocence, the taste of dreams. When Sansa opened her eyes again, she was on her knees. She did not remember falling. It seemed to her that the sky was a lighter shade of gray. Dawn, she thought, another day, another new day. It was the old day she hungered for, prayed for. But who could she pray to? The garden had been meant for a god's wood once, she knew, but the soil was too thin and stony for a weirwood to take root. A god's wood without gods, as empty as me. She scooped up a handful of snow and squeezed it between her fingers. Heavy and wet, the snow packed easily. Sansa began to make snowballs, shaping and smoothing them until they were round and white and perfect. She remembered a summer's snow in Winterfell when Arya and Bran had ambushed her as she emerged from the keep one morning. They had each had a dozen snowballs to hand, and she'd had none. Bran had been perched on the roof of the covered bridge, out of reach, but Sansa had chased Arya through the stables and around the kitchen until both of them were breathless. She might even have caught her, but she'd slipped on some ice. Her sister came back to see if she was hurt. When she said she wasn't, Arya hit her in the face with another snowball, but Sansa grabbed her leg and pulled her down and was rubbing snow in her hair when Jory came along and pulled them apart, laughing. What do I want with snowballs? She looked at her sad little arsenal. There's no one to throw them at. She let the one she was making drop from her hand. I could build a snow knight instead, she thought, or even... She pushed two of her snowballs together, added a third, packed more snow in around them, and patted the whole thing into the shape of a cylinder. When it was done, she stood it on end and used the tip of her little finger to poke holes in it for windows. The crenellations around the top took a little more care, but when they were done, she had a tower. I need some walls now, Sansa thought, and then a keep. She set to work. The snow fell and the castle rose. Two walls ankle-high, the inner taller than the outer, Towers and turrets, keeps and stairs, a round kitchen, a square armory, the stables along the inside of the west wall. It was only a castle when she began, but before very long Sansa knew it was Winterfell.
She found twigs and fallen branches beneath the snow and broke off the ends to make the trees for the godswood. For the gravestones in the lickyard she used bits of bark. Soon her gloves and her boots were crusty white. Her hands were tingling and her feet were soaked and cold, but she did not care. The castle was all that mattered. Some things were hard to remember, but most came back to her easily, as if she had been there only yesterday. The library tower, with a steep stone work stair twisting about its exterior, the gatehouse, two huge bulwarks, the arched gate between them, crenellations all along the top. And all the while the snow kept falling, piling up in drifts around her buildings as fast as she raised them. She was patting down the pitched roof of the great hall when she heard a voice and looked up to see her maid calling from her window. "'Was my lady well? Did she wish to break her fast?' Sansa shook her head and went back to shaping snow, adding a chimney to one end of the great hall, where the hearth would stand inside. Dawn stole into her garden like a thief. The gray of the sky grew lighter still, and the trees and shrubs turned a dark green beneath their stoles of snow. A few servants came out and watched her for a time, but she paid them no mind, and they soon went back inside, where it was warmer. Sansa saw Lady Lisa gazing down from her balcony, wrapped up in a blue velvet robe trimmed with fox fur. But when she looked again, her aunt was gone. Maester Coleman popped out of the rookery and peered down for a while, skinny and shivering, but curious. Her bridges kept falling down. There was a covered bridge between the armory and the main keep, and another that went from the fourth floor of the bell tower to the second floor of the rookery, but no matter how carefully she shaped them, they would not hold together. The third time one collapsed on her, she cursed aloud and sat back in helpless frustration. Pack the snow around a stirk, Sansa. She did not know how long he had been watching her, or when he had returned from the veil. A stick? she asked. That will give it strength enough to stand, I think, Peter said. May I come into your castle, my lady? Sansa was wary. Don't break it. Be gentle, he smiled. Winterfell has withstood fiercer enemies than me. It is Winterfell, is it not? Yes, Sansa admitted. He walked along outside the walls. I used to dream of it in those years after Cat went north with Eddard Stark. In my dreams it was ever a dark place and cold. No, it was always warm, even when it snowed. Water from the hot springs is piped through the walls to warm them, and inside the glass gardens it was always like the hottest day of summer. She stood, towering over the great white castle. I can't think how to do the glass roof over the gardens. Littlefinger stroked his chin, where his beard had been before Lisa had asked him to shave it off. The glass was locked in frames, no? Twigs are your answer. Peel them and cross them, and use bark to tie them together into frames. I'll show you. He moved through the garden, gathering up twigs and sticks and shaking the snow from them. When he had enough, he stepped over both walls with a single long stride and squatted on his heels in the middle of the yard. Sansa came closer to watch what he was doing. His hands were deft and sure, and before long he had a criss-crossing latticework of twigs, very like the one that roofed the glass gardens of Winterfell. "'We will need to imagine the glass, to be sure,' he said, when he gave it to her. "'This is just right,' she said. He touched her face. "'And so is that.' Sansa did not understand. And so was what? Your smile, my lady. Should I make another for you? If you would. Nothing could please me more. She raised the walls of the glass gardens while Littlefinger roofed them over, and when they were done with that, he helped her extend the walls and build the guards hall. When she used sticks for the covered bridges, they stood just as he had said they would. The first keep was simple enough, an old round drum tower, but Sansa was stymied again when it came to putting the gargoyles around the top. Again he had the answer. "'It's been snowing on your castle, my lady,' he pointed out. "'What do the gargoyles look like when they're covered with snow?' Sansa closed her eyes to see them in memory. "'They're just white lumps.' "'Well, then, gargoyles are hard, but white lumps should be easy.' And they were. The broken tower was easier still. They made a tall tower together, kneeling side by side to roll it smooth, and when they'd raised it, Sansa stuck her fingers through the top, grabbed a handful of snow, and flung it full in his face. Peter yelped as the snow slid down under his collar. That was unchivalrously done, my lady. As was bringing me here when you swore to take me home. 
She wondered where this courage had come from to speak to him so frankly. From Winterfell, she thought. I am stronger within the walls of Winterfell. His face grew serious. Yes, I played you false in that. And in one other thing as well. Sansa's stomach was a flutter. What other thing? I told you that nothing could please me more than to help you with your castle. I fear that was a lie as well. Something else would please me more. He stepped closer. This. Sansa tried to step back, but he pulled her into his arms, and suddenly he was kissing her. Feebly she tried to squirm, but only succeeded in pressing herself more tightly against him. His mouth was on hers, swallowing her words. He tasted of mint. For half a heartbeat she yielded to his kiss, before she turned her face away and wrenched free. What are you doing? Peter straightened his cloak. Kissing a snowmaid. You're supposed to kiss her. Sansa glanced up at Lisa's balcony, but it was empty now. Your lady wife. I do. Lisa has no cause for complaint. He smiled. I wish you could see yourself, my lady. You are so beautiful. You're crusted over with snow like some little bear cub, but your face is flushed and you can scarcely breathe. How long have you been out here? You must be very cold. Let me warm you, Sansa. Take off those gloves. Give me your hands. I won't. He sounded almost like Marillion, the night he'd gotten so drunk at the wedding. Only this time Lothar Brune would not appear to save her. Sir Lothar was Peter's man. You shouldn't kiss me. I might have been your own daughter. Might have been, he admitted with a rueful smile. But you're not, are you? You are Eddard Stark's daughter and Kat's. But I think you might be even more beautiful than your mother was when she was your age. Peter, please. Her voice sounded so weak. Please. A castle! The voice was loud, shrill, and childish. Littlefinger turned away from her. Lord Robert, he sketched the bow, should you be out in the snow without your gloves? Did you make the snow castle, Lord Littlefinger? Elaine did most of it, my lord, Sansa said. It's meant to be Winterfell. Winterfell? Robert was small for eight, a stick of a boy with splotchy skin and eyes that were always runny. Under one arm he clutched the threadbare cloth doll he carried everywhere. Winterfell is the seat of House Stark, Sansa told her husband to be, the great castle of the north. It's not so great, the boy knelt before the gatehouse. Look, here comes a giant to knock it down. He stood his doll in the snow and moved it jerkily. Tromp, tromp. I'm a giant, I'm a giant, he chanted. Ho, 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 open your gates or I'll mash them and smash them. Swinging the doll by the legs, he knocked the top off one gatehouse tower and then the other. It was more than Sansa could stand. No, but stop that. Instead, he swung the doll again and a foot of wall exploded. She grabbed for his hand, but she caught the doll instead. There was a loud ripping sound as the thin cloth tore. Suddenly she had the doll's head, Robert had the legs and body, and the rag and sawdust stuffing was spilling in the snow. Lord Robert's mouth trembled. You killed him, he wailed. Then he began to shake. It started with no more than a little shivering, but within a few short heartbeats he had collapsed across the castle, his limbs flailing about violently. White towers and snowy bridges shattered and fell on all sides. Sansa stood horrified, but Peter Baelish seized her cousin's wrists and shouted for the maester. Guards and serving girls arrived within instants to help restrain the boy, Maester Coleman, a short time later. Robert Arryn's shaking sickness was nothing new to the people of the Eyrie, and Lady Lisa had trained them all to come rushing at the boy's first cry. The maester held the little lord's head and gave him half a cup of dream wine, murmuring soothing words. Slowly the violence of the fit seemed to ebb away, till nothing remained but a small shaking of the hands. "'Help him to my chambers,' Coleman told the guards. "'A leeching will help calm him.' "'It was my fault,' Sansa showed them the doll said. "'I ripped his doll in two. I never meant to, but—' "'His lordship was destroying the castle,' said Peter. "'A giant,' the boy whispered, weeping. "'It wasn't me. It was a giant hurt the castle.' She killed him! I hate her! She's a bastard, and I hate her! I don't want to be leeched! My lord, your blood needs thinning, said Maester Coleman. It is the bad blood that makes you angry, and the rage that brings on the shaking. Come now. They led the boy away. My lord husband, Sansa thought, as she contemplated the ruins of Winterfell. 
The snow had stopped, and it was colder than before. She wondered if Lord Robert would shake all through their wedding. At least Joffrey was sound of body. A mad rage seized hold of her. She picked up a broken branch and smashed the torn doll's head down on top of it, then pushed it down atop the shattered gatehouse of her snow castle. The servants looked aghast, but when Littlefinger saw what she'd done, he laughed. If the tales be true, that's not the first giant to end up with his head on Winterfell's walls. Those are only stories, she said, and left him there. Back in her bedchamber, Sansa took off her cloak and her wet boots and sat beside the fire. She had no doubt that she would be made to answer for Lord Robert's fit. Perhaps Lady Lisa will send me away. Her aunt was quick to banish anyone who displeased her, and nothing displeased her quite so much as people she suspected of mistreating her son. Sansa would have welcomed a banishment. The gates of the moon was much larger than the airy and livelier as well. Lord Nestor Royce seemed gruff and stern, but his daughter Miranda kept his castle for him, and everyone said how frolicsome she was. Even Sansa's supposed bastardy might not count too much against her below. One of King Robert's base-born daughters was in service to Lord Nestor, and she and Lady Miranda were said to be fast friends, as close as sisters. I will tell my aunt that I don't want to marry Robert. Not even the high septon himself could declare a woman married if she refused to say the vows. She wasn't a beggar, no matter what her aunt said. She was thirteen. A woman flowered and wed, the heir to Winterfell. Sansa felt sorry for her little cousin sometimes, but she could not imagine ever wanting to be his wife. I would sooner be married to Tyrion again. If Lady Lisa knew that, surely she'd send her away. Away from Robert's pouts and shakes and runny eyes, away from Marillion's lingering looks, away from Peter's kisses. I will tell her, I will. It was late that afternoon when Lady Lisa summoned her. Sansa had been marshalling her courage all day, but no sooner did Marillion appear at her door than all her doubts returned. Lady Lisa requires your presence in the high hall. The singer's eyes undressed her as he spoke, but she was used to that. Marillion was comely, there was no denying it. Boyish and slender, with smooth skin, sandy hair, a charming smile. But he had made himself well hated in the Vale by everyone but her aunt and little Lord Robert. To hear the servants talk, Sansa was not the first maid to suffer his advances, and the others had not had Lothar Brune to defend them. But Lady Lisa would hear no complaints against him. Since coming to the Airy, the singer had become her favorite. He sang Lord Robert to sleep every night, and tweaked the noses of Lady Lisa's suitors with verses that made mock of their foibles. Her aunt had showered him with golden gifts, costly clothes, a gold arm-ring, a belt studded with moonstones, a fine horse. She had even given him her late husband's favorite falcon. It all served to make Marillion unfailingly courteous in Lady Lisa's presence, and unfailingly arrogant outside it. "'Thank you,' Sansa told him stiffly. "'I know the way.' He would not leave. My lady said to bring you. Bring me? She did not like the sound of that. Are you a guardsman now? Littlefinger had dismissed the Ares captain of guards and put Sir Lothar Brune in his place. Do you require guarding? Marillion said lightly. I am composing a new song you should know. A song so sweet and sad it will melt even your frozen heart. The roadside rose, I mean to call it. "'about a base-born girl, so beautiful she bewitched every man who laid eyes upon her. "'I am a Stark of Winterfell,' she longed to tell him. "'Instead she nodded, and let him escort her down the tower steps and along a bridge. "'The high hall had been closed as long as she'd been at the airy. "'Sansa wondered why her aunt had opened it. "'Normally she preferred the comfort of her solar, "'or the cosy warmth of Lord Arryn's audience chamber with its view of the waterfall.' Two guards in sky-blue cloaks flanked the carved wooden doors of the high hall, spears in hand. "'No one is to enter so long as Elaine is with Lady Lisa,' Marillion told them. "'Aye.' The men let them pass, then crossed their spears. Marillion swung the door shut and barred them with a third spear, longer and thicker than those the guards had borne. Sansa felt a prickle of unease. "'Why did you do that?' "'My lady awaits you.' She looked about uncertainly. Lady Lisa sat on the dais in a high-backed chair of carved weirwood, alone. To her right was a second chair, taller than her own, with a stack of blue cushions piled on the seat, but Lord Robert was not in it. 
Sansa hoped he recovered. Aurelion was not like to tell her, though. Sansa walked down the blue silk carpet between rows of fluted pillars, slim as lancers. The floors and walls of the high hall were made of milk-white marble veined with blue. Shafts of pale daylight slanted down through narrow arched windows along the eastern wall. Between the windows were torches, mounted in high iron sconces, but none of them was lit. Her footsteps fell softly on the carpet. Outside the wind blew cold and lonely. Amidst so much white marble even the sunlight looked chilly, somehow, though not half so chilly as her aunt. Lady Lisa had dressed in a gown of cream-colored velvet and a necklace of sapphires and moonstones. Her auburn hair had been done up in a thick braid and fell across one shoulder. She sat in the high seat watching her niece approach, her face red and puffy beneath the paint and powder. On the wall behind her hung a huge banner, the moon and falcon of House Arryn in cream and blue. Sansa stopped before the dais and curtsied. "'My lady, you sent for me.' She could still hear the sound of the wind and the soft chords Merillion was playing at the foot of the hall. "'I saw what you did,' the Lady Lisa said. Sansa smoothed down the folds of her skirt. "'I trust Lord Robert is better. I never meant to rip his doll. He was smashing my snow castle. I only—' "'Will you play the coy deceiver with me?' her aunt said. "'I was not speaking of Robert's doll. I saw you kissing him.' The high hall seemed to grow a little colder. The walls and floor and columns might have turned to ice. He kissed me. Lisa's nostrils flared. And why would he do that? He has a wife who loves him. A woman grown, not a little girl. He has no need for the likes of you. Confess, child. You threw yourself at him. That was the way of it. Santa took a step backward. That's not true. Where are you going? Are you afraid? Such wanton behavior must be punished but I will not be hard on you. We keep a whipping boy for Robert, as is the custom in the free cities. His health is too delicate for him to bear the rod himself. I shall find some common girl to take your whipping, but first you must own up to what you've done. I cannot abide a liar, Elaine. I was building a snow castle, Sansa said. Lord Peter was helping me, and then he kissed me. That's what you saw. Have you no honor? Her aunt said sharply. Or do you take me for a fool? You do, don't you? You take me for a fool. Yes, I see that now. I am not a fool. You think you can have any man you want because you're young and beautiful. Don't think I haven't seen the looks you give Marillion. I know everything that happens in the area, little lady, and I have known your like before, too. But you are mistaken if you think big eyes and strumpet smiles will win you, Peter. He is mine. She rose to her feet. They all tried to take him from me. My lord father, my husband, your mother— Caitlin, most of all. She liked to kiss my Peter, too. Oh, yes, she did. Sansa retreated another step. My mother? Yes, your mother, your precious mother. My own sweet sister, Caitlin. Don't you think to play the innocent with me, you vile little liar? All those years in River Run, she played with Peter as if he were her little toy. She teased him with smiles and soft words and wanton looks, and made his night a torment. No. My mother is dead, she wanted to shriek. She was your own sister, and she's dead. She didn't, she wouldn't. How would you know? Were you there? Lisa descended from the high seat, her skirts swirling. Did you come with Lord Bracken and Lord Blackwood, the time they visited to lay their feud before my father? Lord Bracken's singer played for us, and Caitlin danced six dances with Peter that night. Six! I counted! When the lords began to argue, my father took them up to his audience chamber, so there was no one to stop us drinking— Edmure got drunk, young as he was, and Peter tried to kiss your mother, only she pushed him away. She laughed at him. He looked so wounded I thought my heart would burst, and afterward he drank until he passed out of the table. Uncle Brynden carried him up to bed before my father could find him like that. But you remember none of it, do you? She looked down angrily. Do you? Is she drunk or mad? I was not born, my lady. You were not born, but I was. So do not presume to tell what is true. I know what is true. You kissed him. He kissed me, Sansa insisted again. I never wanted— Be quiet. I haven't given you leave to speak. You enticed him, just as your mother did that night in River Run, with her smiles and her dancing. You think I could forget? That was the night I stole up to his bed to give him comfort. 
I bled, but it was the sweetest hurt. He told me he loved me then, but he called me Cat just before he fell back to sleep. Even so, I stayed with him until the sky began to lighten. Your mother did not deserve him. She would not even give him her favor to wear when he fought Brandon Stark. I would have given him my favor. I gave him everything. He is mine now, not Caitlin's, and not yours. All of Santa's resolve had withered in the face of her aunt's onslaught. Lisa Arryn was frightening her as much as Queen Cersei ever had. "'He's yours, my lady,' she said, trying to sound meek and contrite. "'May I have your leave to go?' "'You may not.' Her aunt's breath smelled of wine. "'If you were anyone else, I would banish you. Send you down to Lord Nestor at the gates of the moon, or back to the fingers. How would you like to spend your life on that bleak shore, surrounded by slatterns and sheep pellets? That was what my father meant for Peter. Everyone thought it was because of that stupid duel with Brandon Stark, but that wasn't so.' Father said I ought to thank the gods that so great a lord as John Arran was willing to take me soiled, but I knew it was only for the swords. I had to marry John, or my father would have turned me out as he did his brother, but it was Peter I was meant for. I am telling you all this, so you will understand how much we love each other, how long we have suffered and dreamed of one another. We made a baby together, a precious little baby. Lisa put her hands flat against her belly as if the child was still there. When they stole him from me, I made a promise to myself that I would never let it happen again. John wished to send my sweet Robert to Dragonstone, and that sot of a king would have given him to Cersei Lannister, but I never let them. No more than I'll let you steal my Peter Littlefinger. Do you hear me, Elaine, or Sansa, or whatever you call yourself? Do you hear what I am telling you? Yes, I swear, I won't ever kiss him again or, or entice him. Sansa thought that was what her aunt wanted to hear. So you admit it now. It was you, just as I thought. You are as wanton as your mother. Lisa grabbed her by the wrist. Come with me now. There is something I want to show you. You're hurting me, Santa squirmed. Please, Aunt Lisa, I haven't done anything. I swear it. Her aunt ignored her protests. Marillion, she shouted. I need you, Marillion. I need you. The singer had remained discreetly in the rear of the hall, but at Lady Arryn's shout he came at once. My lady... Play us a song. Play. The false and the fair. Marillion's fingers brushed the strings. The Lord, he came a-riding upon a rainy day. Hey, nanny, hey, nanny, hey, nanny, hey. Lady Lisa pulled at Sansa's arm. It was either walk or be dragged, so she chose to walk, halfway down the hall and between a pair of pillars, to a white weirwood door set in the marble wall. The door was firmly closed, with three heavy bronze bars to hold it in place, but Sansa could hear the wind outside worrying at its edges. When she saw the crescent moon carved in the wood, she planted her feet. The moon door! She tried to yank free. Why are you showing me the moon door? You squeak like a mouse now, but you were bold enough in the garden, weren't you? You were bold enough in the snow. The lady sat a sewing upon a rainy day, Marillion sang. Hey, nonny, hey, nonny, hey, nonny, hey. Open the door, Lisa commanded. Open it, I say. You will do it, or I'll send for my guards. She shoved Sansa forward. Your mother was brave, at least. Lift off the bars. If I do as she says, she will let me go. Sansa grabbed one of the bronze bars, yanked it loose, and tossed it down. The second bar clattered to the marble, then the third. She had barely touched the latch when the heavy wooden door flew inward and slammed back against the wall with a bang. Snow had piled up around the frame, and it all came blowing in at them, borne on a blast of cold air that left Sansa shivering. She tried to step backward, but her aunt was behind her. Lisa seized her by the wrist and put her other hand between her shoulder blades, propelling her forcefully toward the open door. Beyond was white sky, falling snow, and nothing else. "'Look down,' said Lady Lisa. "'Look down!' She tried to wrench free, but her aunt's fingers were digging into her arm like claws, Lisa gave her another shove, and Sansa shrieked. Her left foot broke through a crust of snow and knocked it loose. There was nothing in front of her but empty air and a way castle six hundred feet below, clinging to the side of the mountain. Don't! Sansa screamed. You're scaring me! Behind her, Marillion was still playing his wood harp and singing, Hey, nonny, hey, nonny, hey, nonny, hey. Do you still want my leave to go? Do you? No. Sansa planted her feet and tried to squirm backward, but her aunt did not budge. Not this way, please. She put a hand up. 
her fingers scrabbling at the door frame, but she could not get a grip, and her feet were sliding on the wet marble floor. Lady Lisa pressed her forward inexorably. Her aunt outweighed her by three stone. The lady lay a-kissing upon a mound of hay, Marillion was singing. Santa twisted sideways, hysterical with fear, and one foot slipped out over the void. She screamed, Hey, nonny, hey, nonny, hey, nonny, hey. The wind flapped her skirts up and bit at her bare legs with cold teeth. She could feel snowflakes melting on her cheeks. Santa flailed, found Lisa's thick auburn braid, and clutched it tight. My hair! her aunt shrieked. Let go of my hair! She was shaking, sobbing. They teetered on the edge. Far off she heard the guards pounding on the door with their spears, demanding to be let in. Marillion broke off a song. Lisa, what's the meaning of this? The shout cut through the sobs and heavy breathing. Footsteps echoed down the high hall. Get back from there! Lisa, what are you doing? The guards were still beating at the door. Littlefinger had come in the back way, through the Lord's entrance behind the dais. As Lisa turned, her grip loosened enough for Santa to rip free. She stumbled to her knees where Peter Baelish saw her. He stopped suddenly. Elaine, what is the trouble here? Her? Lady Lisa grabbed a handful of Sansa's hair. She's the trouble. She kissed you. Tell her, Sansa begged. Tell her we were just building a castle. Be quiet, her aunt screamed. I never gave you leave to speak. No one cares about your castle. She's a child, Lisa, Cat's daughter. What did you think you were doing? I was going to marry her to Robert. She has no gratitude, no, no decency. You are not hers to kiss, not hers. I was teaching her a lesson, that was all. I see. He stroked his chin. I think she understands now. Isn't that so, Alain? Yes, sobbed Sansa. I understand. I don't want her here. Her aunt's eyes were shiny with tears. Why did you bring her to the Vale, Peter? This isn't her place. She doesn't belong here. We'll send her away, then, back to King's Landing, if you like. He took a step toward them. Let her up now. Let her away from the door. No! Lisa gave Sansa's head another wrench. Snow eddied around them, making their skirts snap noisily. You can't want her. You can't. She's a stupid, empty-headed little girl. She doesn't love you the way I have. I've always loved you. I've proved it, haven't I? Tears ran down her aunt's puffy red face. I gave you my maiden's gift. I would have given you a son, too, but they murdered him with moon tea, with tansy and mint and wormwood, a spoon of honey and a drop of pennyroyal. It wasn't me. I never knew. I only drank what father gave me. That's past and done, Lisa. Lord Hoster's dead, and his old maester as well. Littlefinger moved closer. Have you been at the wine again? You ought not to talk so much. We don't want Elaine to know more than she should, do we? Or Marillion? Lady Lisa ignored that. Cat never gave you anything. It was me who got you your first post, who made John bring you to court so we could be close to one another. You promised me you would never forget that. Nor have I. We're together just as you always wanted, just as we always planned. Just let go of Sansa's hair. I won't. I saw you kissing in the snow. She's just like her mother. Caitlin kissed you in the God's wood, but she never meant it. She never wanted you. Why did you love her best? It was me. It was always me. I know, love. He took another step. And I am here. All you need to do is take my hand. Come on. He held it out to her. There's no cause for all these tears. Tears, tears, tears. She sobbed hysterically. No need for tears. But that's not what you said in King's Landing. You told me to put the tears in John's wine, and I did. For Robert, and for us. And I wrote Caitlin and told her the Lannisters had killed my lord husband, just as you said. That was so clever. You were always clever. I told father that. I said, Peter's so clever, he'll rise high, he will, he will. And he's sweet and gentle, and I have his little baby in my belly. Why did you kiss her? Why? We're together now. We're together after so long, so very long. Why would you want to kiss her? Lisa, Peter sighed, after all the storms we've suffered, you should trust me better. I swear. I shall never leave your side again for as long as we both shall live. Truly? She asked, weeping. Oh, truly? Truly. Now unhand the girl and come give me a kiss. Lisa threw herself into Littlefinger's arms, sobbing. As they hugged, Sansa crawled from the moon door on hands and knees and wrapped her arms around the nearest pillar. 
She could feel her heart pounding. There was snow on her hair, and her right shoe was missing. It must have fallen. She shuddered and hugged the pillar tighter. Littlefinger let Lisa sob against his chest for a moment, then put his hands on her arms and kissed her lightly. "'My sweet, silly, jealous wife,' he said, chuckling. "'I've only loved one woman, I promise you.' Lisa Arryn smiled tremulously. "'Only one? Oh, Peter, do you swear it, only one?' "'Only cat.' He gave her a short, sharp shove. Lisa stumbled backward, her feet slipping on the wet marble, and— then she was gone. She never screamed. For the longest time there was no sound but the wind. Marillion gasped. You! You! The guards were shouting outside the door, pounding with the butts of their heavy spears. Lord Peter pulled Sansa to her feet. You're not hurt? When she shook her head, he said, Run, let my guards in, then. Quick now, there's no time to lose. This singer's killed my lady wife. Epilogue. The road up to Old Stones went twice round the hill before reaching the summit. Overgrown and stony, it would have been slow going even in the best of times, and last night's snow had left it muddy as well. Snow and autumn in the riverlands, it's unnatural, Merritt thought gloomily. It had not been much of a snow, true, just enough to blanket the ground for a night. Most of it had started melting away as soon as the sun came up. Still, Merritt took it for a bad omen. Between rains, floods, fire, and war, they had lost two harvests and a good part of a third. An early winter would mean famine all across the riverlands. A great many people would go hungry, and some of them would starve. Merritt only hoped he wouldn't be one of them. I may, though. With my luck, I just may. I never did have any luck. Beneath the castle ruins, the lower slopes of the hill were so thickly forested that half a hundred outlaws could well have been lurking there— they could be watching me even now. Merritt glanced about and saw nothing but gorse, bracken, thistle, sedge, and blackberry bushes between the pines and grey-green sentinels. Elsewhere, skeletal elm and ash and scrub oaks choked the ground like weeds. He saw no outlaws, but that meant little. Outlaws were better at hiding than honest men. Merritt hated the woods, if truth be told, and he hated outlaws even more. Outlaws stole my life. He had been known to complain when in his cups. He was too often in his cups, his father said, often and loudly. Too true, he thought ruefully. You needed some sort of distinction, the twins, else they were liable to forget you were alive. But a reputation as the biggest drinker in the castle had done little to enhance his prospects, he'd found. I once hoped to be the greatest knight who ever couched a lance. The gods took that away from me. Why shouldn't I have a cup of wine from time to time? It helps my headaches. Besides, my wife is a shrew. My father despises me. My children are worthless. What do I have to stay sober for? He was sober now, though. Well, he'd had two horns of ale when he broke his fast, and a small cup of red when he set out, but that was just to keep his head from pounding. Merritt could feel the headache building behind his eyes, and he knew that if he gave it half a chance, he would soon feel as if he had a thunderstorm raging between his ears. Sometimes his headaches got so bad that it even hurt too much to weep. Then all he could do was rest on his bed in a dark room with a damp cloth over his eyes and curse his luck and the nameless outlaw who had done this to him. Just thinking about it made him anxious. He could nowise afford a headache now. If I bring Peter back home safely, all my luck will change. He had the gold. All he needed to do was climb to the top of old stones, meet the bloody outlaws in the ruined castle, and make the exchange. A simple ransom. Even he could not muck it up, unless he got a headache, one so bad that it left him unable to ride. He was supposed to be at the ruins by sunset, not weeping in a huddle at the side of the road. Merritt rubbed two fingers against his temple. Once more around the hill, and there I am. When the message had come in, and he had stepped forward to offer to carry the ransom, his father had squinted down and said, You, Merritt? and started laughing through his nose, that hideous <laughs> laugh of his. Merritt practically had to beg before they'd give him the bloody bag of gold. Something moved in the underbrush along the side of the road. Merritt reined up hard and reached for his sword, but it was only a squirrel. Stupid! 
he told himself, shoving the sword back in his scabbard without ever having gotten it out. Outlaws don't have tails. Bloody hell, Merrick! Get hold of yourself! His heart was thumping in his chest as if he were some green boy on his first campaign. As if this were the King's Wood, and it was the old brotherhood I was going to face, not the Lightning Lord's sorry lot of brigands. For a moment he was tempted to trot right back down the hill and find the nearest alehouse. That bag of gold would buy a lot of ale, enough for him to forget all about Peter Pimple. Let them hang him. He brought this on himself. It's no more than he deserves, wandering off with some bloody camp follower like a stag in rut. His head had begun to pound. Soft now, but he knew it would get worse. Merritt rubbed the bridge of his nose. He really had no right to think so ill of Peter. I did the same myself when I was his age. In his case, all it got him was a pox. But still, he shouldn't condemn. Horrors did have charms, especially if you had a face like Peter's. The poor lad had a wife, to be sure, but she was half the problem. Not only was she twice his age, but she was betting his brother Walder, too, if the talk was true. There was always lots of talk around the twins, and only a little was ever true. But in this case, Merritt believed it. Black Walder was a man who took what he wanted, even his brother's wife. He'd had Edwin's wife, too. That was common knowledge. Fair Walder had been known to slip into his bed from time to time, and some even said he'd known the seventh Lady Frey a deal better than he should have. Small wonder he refused to marry. Why buy a cow when there were udders all around begging to be milked? Cursing under his breath, Merritt jammed his heels into his horse's flanks and rode on up the hill. As tempting as it was to drink the gold away, he knew that if he didn't come back with Peter Pimple, he had as well not come back at all. Lord Walder would soon turn to a ninety. His ears had started to go, his eyes were almost gone, and his gout was so bad that he had to be carried everywhere. He could not possibly last much longer. All his sons agreed. And when he goes, everything will change, and not for the better. His father was querulous and stubborn, with an iron will and a wasp's tongue, but he did believe in taking care of his own. All of his own, even the ones who had displeased and disappointed him, even the ones whose names he can't remember. Once he was gone, though. When Sir Stevron had been heir, that was one thing. The old man had been grooming Stevron for sixty years, and had pounded it into his head that blood was blood. But Stevron had died whilst campaigning with a young wolf in the west. Of waiting, no doubt, lame Lothar had quipped when the raven brought them the news, and his sons and grandsons were a different sort of fray. Stevron's son, Sir Ryman, stood to inherit now, a thick-witted, stubborn, greedy man. And after Ryman came his own sons, Edwin and Black Walder, who were even worse. Fortunately, lame Lothar once said, they hate each other even more than they hate us. Merritt wasn't certain that was fortunate at all, and for that matter, Lothar himself might be more dangerous than either of them. Lord Walder had ordered the slaughter of the Starks at Roslyn's wedding, but it had been lame Lothar who had plotted it out with Roos Bolton, all the way down to which songs would be played. Lothar was a very amusing fellow to get drunk with, but Merritt would never be so foolish as to turn his back on him. In the twins, you learned early that only full-blood siblings could be trusted and them not very far. It was like to be every son for himself when the old man died, and every daughter as well. The new lord of the crossing would doubtless keep on some of his uncles, nephews, and cousins at the twins, the ones he happened to like or trust, or more likely the ones he thought would prove useful to him. The rest of us you'll shove out to fend for ourselves. The prospect worried Merritt more than words could say. He would be forty in less than three years, too old to take up the life of a hedge knight, even if he'd been a knight, which, as it happened, he wasn't. He had no land, no wealth of his own. He owned the clothes on his back, but not much else, not even the horse he was riding. He wasn't clever enough to be a maester, pious enough to be a septon, or savage enough to be a sellsword. The gods gave me no gift but birth, and they stinted me there. What good was it to be the son of a rich and powerful house if you were the ninth son? When you took grandsons and great-grandsons into account, Merritt stood a better chance of being chosen High Septon than he did of inheriting the twins. I have no luck, he thought bitterly. 
I have never had any bloody luck. He was a big man, broad around the chest and shoulders, if only of middling height. In the last ten years he had grown soft and fleshy, he knew. But when he'd been younger, Merritt had been almost as robust as Sir Hostine, his eldest full brother, who was commonly regarded as the strongest of Lord Walder Frey's brood. As a boy, he'd been packed off to Craig Hall to serve his mother's family as a page. When old Lord Sumner had made him a squire, everyone had assumed he would be Sir Merritt in no more than a few years, but the outlaws of the Kingswood Brotherhood had pissed on those plans. While his fellow squire, Jamie Lannister, was covering himself in glory, Merritt had first caught the pox from a camp follower, then managed to get captured by a woman, the one called the White Fawn. Lord Sumner had ransomed him back from the outlaws, but in the very next fight he'd been felled by a blow from a mace that had broken his helm and left him insensible for a fortnight. Everyone gave him up for dead, they told him later. Merritt hadn't died, but his fighting days were done. Even the lightest blow to his head brought on blinding pain and reduced him to tears. Under these circumstances knighthood was out of the question, Lord Sumner told him, not unkindly. He was sent back to the twins to face Lord Walder's poisonous disdain. After that Merritt's luck had only grown worse. His father had managed to make a good marriage for him somehow. He wed one of Lord Darry's daughters, back when the Darry's stood high in King Ares's favor. But it seemed as if he no sooner had deflowered his bride than Ares lost his throne. Unlike the Freys, the Darys had been prominent Targaryen loyalists, which cost them half their lands, most of their wealth, and almost all their power. As for his lady wife, she found him a great disappointment from the first, and insisted on popping out nothing but girls for years, three live ones, a stillbirth, and one that died in infancy before she finally produced a son. His eldest daughter had turned out to be a slut, his second a glutton. When Amy was caught in the stables with no fewer than three grooms, he'd been forced to marry her off to a bloody hedge knight. That situation could not possibly get any worse, he thought, until Sir Pate decided he could win renown by defeating Sir Gregor Clegane. Amy had come running back a widow, to Merritt's dismay and the undoubted delight of every stable hand in the twins. Merritt had dared to hope that his luck was finally changing when Roose Bolton chose to wed his Walter instead of one of her slimmer, comelier cousins. The Bolton alliance was important for House Frey, and his daughter had helped secure it. He thought that must surely count for something. The old man had soon disabused him. "'He picked her because she's fat,' Lord Walter said. "'You think Bolton gave a mummer's fart that she was your whelp? Think he sat about thinking, heh! Merritt Muttonhead, that's the very man I need for a good father. Your wald is a sow in silk, that's why he picked her, and I'm not like to thank you for it. We'd have had the same alliance at half the price if your little pork thing put down a spoon from time to time. The final humiliation had been delivered with a smile when lame Lothar had summoned him to discuss his role in Rosalind's wedding. We must each play our part according to our gifts, his half-brother told him. You shall have one task and one task only, Merritt, but I believe you are well suited to it. I want you to see to it that great John Umber is so bloody drunk that he can hardly stand, let alone fight. And even that I failed at. He'd cousined the huge Northmen into drinking enough wine to kill any three normal men. Yet after Rosalind had been bedded, the great John still managed to snatch the sword of the first man to accost him and break his arm in the snatching. It had taken eight of them to get him into chains, and the effort had left two men wounded, one dead, and poor old Sir Leslin Haig short half a ear. When he couldn't fight with his hands any longer, Umber had fought with his teeth. Merritt paused a moment and closed his eyes. His head was throbbing like that bloody drum they'd played at the wedding, and for a moment it was all he could do to stay in the saddle. "'I have to go on,' he told himself. If he could bring back Peter Pimple, surely it would put him in Sir Ryman's good graces.' Peter might be a whisker on the hapless side, but he wasn't as cold as Edwin, nor as hot as Black Walder. The boy will be grateful for my part, and his father will see that I'm loyal, a man worth having about. But only if he was there by sunset with the gold. Merritt glanced at the sky. Right on time. He needed something to steady his hands. He pulled up the water skin, hung from his saddle, uncorked it, and took a long swallow. The wine was thick and sweet, so dark it was almost black. Gods, it tasted good. 
The curtain wall of old stones had once encircled the brow of the hill, like the crown on a king's head. Only the foundation remained, and a few waist-high piles of crumbling stone spotted with lichen. Merritt rode along the line of the wall until he came to the place where the gatehouse would have stood. The ruins were more extensive here, and he had to dismount to lead his palfrey through them. In the west the sun had vanished behind a bank of low clouds. Gorse and bracken covered the slopes, and once inside the vanished walls the weeds were chest-high. Merritt loosened his sword in its scabbard and looked about warily, but saw no outlaws. Could I have come on the wrong day? He stopped and rubbed his temples with his thumbs, but that did nothing to ease the pressure behind his eyes. Seven bloody hells! From somewhere deep within the castle, faint music came drifting through the trees. Merritt found himself shivering, despite his cloak. He pulled open his water-skin and had another drink of wine. I could just get back on my horse, ride to Old Town, and drink the gold away. No good ever came from dealing with outlaws. That vile little bitch, Wenda, had burned a fawn into the cheek of his arse while she had him captive. No wonder his wife despised him. I have to go through with this. Peter Pimple might be Lord of the Crossing one day. Edwin has no sons, and Black Walder's only got bastards. Peter will remember who came to get him. He took another swallow, corked the skin up, and led his paw free through broken stones, gorse, and thin wind-whipped trees, following the sounds to what had been the castle ward. Fallen leaves lay thick upon the ground, like soldiers after some great slaughter. A man in patched, faded greens was sitting cross-legged atop a weathered stone sepulchre, fingering the strings of a wood-harp. The music was soft and sad. Merritt knew the song. I in the halls of the kings who are gone, Jenny would dance with her ghosts. Get off there, Merritt said. You're sitting on a king. Old Christopher don't mind my bony arse. The hammer of justice, they called him. Been a long while since he heard any new songs. The outlaw hopped down. Trim and slim, he had a narrow face and foxy features, but his mouth was so wide that his smile seemed to touch his ears. A few strands of thin brown hair were blowing across his brow. He pushed them back with his free hand and said, "'Do you remember me, my lord?' "'No,' Merritt frowned. "'Why would I?' "'I sang at your daughter's wedding. "'And passing well, I thought. "'That pate she married was a cousin.' We're all cousins in Seven Streams. Didn't stop him from turning niggard when it was time to pay me. He shrugged. Why is it your lord father never has me play at the twins? Don't I make enough noise for his lordship? He likes it loud, I have been hearing. You bring the gold? asked a harsher voice behind him. Merritt's throat was dry. Bloody outlaws always hiding in the bushes. It had been the same in the Kingswood. You'd think you'd caught five of them, and ten more would spring from nowhere. When he turned, they were all around him. An ill-favored gaggle of leathery old men and smooth-cheeked lads, younger than Peter Pimple, a lot of them clad in rough-spun rags, boiled leather, and bits of dead men's armor. There was one woman with them, bundled up in a hooded cloak three times too big for her. Merritt was too flustered to count them, but there seemed to be a dozen at the least, maybe a score. I asked the question. The speaker was a big bearded man with crooked green teeth and a broken nose, taller than Merritt, though not so heavy in the belly. A half-helm covered his head, a patched yellow cloak, his broad shoulders. Where's our gold? In my saddlebag. A hundred golden dragons. Merritt cleared his throat. You'll get it when I see that Peter— A squat, one-eyed outlaw strode forward before he could finish, reached into the saddlebag, bold as you please, and found the sack. Merritt started to grab him, then thought better of it. The outlaw opened the drawstring, removed a coin, and bit it. "'Tastes right,' he hefted the sack. "'Feels right, too.' "'We're going to take the gold, and keep Peter, too,' Merritt thought in sudden panic. "'That's the whole ransom, all you asked for.' His palms were sweating. He wiped them on his britches. "'Which one of you is Beric Dondarrion?' Don Darion had been a lord before he turned outlaw. He might still be a man of honor. 
"'Why, that would be me,' said the one-eyed man. "'You're a bloody liar, Jack,' said the big-bearded man in the yellow cloak. "'It's my turn to be Lord Berwick.' "'Does that mean I have to be Thoros?' the singer laughed. "'My lord, sad to say, Lord Berwick was needed elsewhere. "'The times are troubled, and there are many battles to fight, "'but we'll sort you out to see wood. Have no fear.' Merritt had plenty of fear. His head was pounding, too. Much more of this, and he'd be sobbing. "'You have your gold?' he said. "'Give me my nephew, and I'll be gone.' Peter was actually more a great half-nephew, but there was no need to go into that. "'He's in the guard's wood,' said the man in the yellow cloak. "'We'll take you to him. Not you hold his horse.' Merritt handed over the bridle reluctantly. He did not see what other choice he had. "'My water-skin,' he heard himself say. "'A swallow of wine to settle my—' "'We don't drink with your sort,' Yellow Cloak said curtly. "'It's this way. Follow me.' Leaves crunched beneath their heels, and every step sent a spike of pain through Merritt's temple. They walked in silence, the wind gusting around them. The last light of the setting sun was in his eyes as he clambered over the mossy hummocks that were all that remained of the keep. Behind was the god's wood. Peter Pimple was hanging from the limb of an oak, a noose tight around his long, thin neck. His eyes bulged from a black face staring down at Merritt accusingly. "'You came too late,' they seemed to say. "'But he hadn't. He hadn't. He had come when they told him. "'You killed him!' he croaked. "'Sharp as a blade, this one,' said the one-eyed man. An aurochs was thundering through Merritt's head. "'Mother, have mercy,' he thought. "'I brought the gold.' "'That was good of you,' said the singer amiably. "'We'll see that it's put to good use.' Merritt turned away from Peter. He could taste the bile in the back of his throat. "'You—you you had no right.' "'We had a rope,' said Yellow Cloak. "'That's right enough.' Two of the outlaws seized Merritt's arms and bound them tight behind his back. He was too deep in shock to struggle. "'No!' was all he could manage. I only came to ransom Peter. You said if you had the gold by sunset he wouldn't be harmed. Well, said the singer, you've got to stare, my lord. That was a lie of sorts, as it happens. The one-eyed outlaw came forward with a long coil of hempen rope. He looped one end around Merritt's neck, pulled it tight, and tied a hard knot under his ear. The other end he threw over the limb of the oak. The big man in the yellow cloak caught it. "'What are you doing?' Merritt knew how stupid that sounded, but he could not believe what was happening even then. "'You'd never dare hang a fray!' Yellow cloak laughed. "'That other one, the pimply boy, he said the same thing.' "'He doesn't mean it. He cannot mean it. My father will pay you. I'm worth a good ransom, more than Peter, twice as much.' The singer sighed. "'Lord Walder might be half-blind and gouty, but he's not so stupid as to snap the same bait twice. Next time he'll send a hundred swords, instead of a hundred dragons, I fear.' "'He will,' Merritt tried to sound stern, but his voice betrayed him. "'He'll send a thousand swords and kill you all.' "'He has to catch us first. The singer glanced up at poor Peter. "'And he can't hang us twice, now can he?' He drew a melancholy air from the strings of his wood-harp. "'Here now, don't soil yourself. All you need to do is answer me a question, and I'll tell them to let you go.' Merritt would tell them anything, if it meant his life. "'What do you want to know? I'll tell you true, I swear it.' The outlaw gave him an encouraging smile. "'Well, as it happens, we're looking for a dog that ran away.' "'A dog?' Merritt was lost. "'What kind of dog?' He answers to the name Sandor Clegane. Thoros says he was making for the twins. We found the ferryman who took him across the trident, and the poor sod he robbed on the king's road. Did you see him at the wedding, perchance? The red wedding? Merritt's skull felt as if it were about to split. But he did his best to recall. There had been so much confusion, but surely someone would have mentioned Joffrey's dog sniffing round the twins. "'He wasn't in the castle, not at the main feast. "'He might have been at the bastard feast or in the camps, but 
No, someone would have said. He would have had a child with him, said the singer, a skinny girl about ten, or perhaps a boy the same age. I don't think so, said Merritt. Not that I knew. No. Ah, that's a pity. Well, up you go. No! Merritt squealed loudly. No, don't! I gave you your answer. You said you'd let me go. Seems to me that what I said was I'd tell them to let you go. The singer looked at Yellow Cloak. Lem, let him go. Go bugger yourself, the big outlaw replied brusquely. The singer gave Merritt a helpless shrug and began to play The Day They Hanged Black Robin. Please! The last of Merritt's courage was running down his leg. I've done you no harm. I brought the gold the way you said. I answered your question. I have children! That young wolf never will, said the one-eyed outlaw. Merritt could hardly think for the pounding in his head. He shamed us. The whole realm was laughing. We had to cleanse the stain on our honor. His father had said all that, and more. Maybe so. What do a bunch of bloody peasants know about a lord's honor? Yellow Cloak wrapped the end of the rope around his hand three times. We know some about murder, though. Not murder? His voice was shrill. It was vengeance. We had a right to our vengeance. It was war. Aegon, we called him Jingle Bell, a poor lackwood, never hurt anyone. Lady Stark cut his throat. We lost half a hundred men in the camps. Sir Garth Goodbrook, Kyra's husband, and Sir Titos, Jared's son. Someone smashed his head in with an axe. Stark's direwolf killed four of our wolfhounds and tore the kennelmaster's arm off his shoulder, even after we'd filled him full of quarrels. So you sewed his head on Rob Stark's neck after both of them were dead, said Yellow Cloak. My father did that. All I did was drink. You wouldn't kill a man for drinking. Merritt remembered something then, something that might be the saving of him. They say Lord Berwick always gives a man a trial, that he won't kill a man unless something's proved against him. You can't prove anything against me. The Red Wedding was my father's work, and Ryman's and Lord Bolton's. Lothar rigged the tents to collapse and put the crossbowmen in the gallery with the musicians. Bastard Walder led the attack on the camps. They're the ones you want, not me. I only drank some wine. You have no witness. As it happens, you're wrong there. The singer turned to the hooded woman. My lady. The outlaws parted as she came forward, saying no word. When she lowered her hood, something tightened inside Merritt's chest, and for a moment he could not breathe. No. No, I saw her die. She was dead for a day and night before they stripped her naked and threw her body in the river. Raymond opened her throat from ear to ear. She was dead. Her cloak and collar hid the gash his brother's blade had made, but her face was even worse than he remembered. The flesh had gone pudding soft in the water and turned the color of curdled milk. Half her hair was gone, and the rest had turned as white and brittle as a crone's. Beneath her ravaged scalp her face was shredded skin and black blood where she had raked herself with her nails. But her eyes were the most terrible thing. Her eyes saw him, and they hated. "'She don't speak,' said the big man in the yellow cloak. "'You bloody bastards cut her throat too deep for that.' But she remembers. He turned to the dead woman and said, What do you say, my lady? Was he part of it? Lady Caitlin's eyes never left him. She nodded. Merritt Frey opened his mouth to plead, but the noose choked off his words. His feet left the ground, the rope cutting deep into the soft flesh beneath his chin. Up into the air he jerked, kicking and twisting, up and up and up. Appendix. The Kings and Their Courts. The King on the Iron Throne. Joffrey Baratheon, the first of his name, a boy of thirteen years, the eldest son of King Robert I Baratheon and Queen Circe of House Lannister. His mother, Queen Circe of House Lannister, Queen Regent and Protector of the Realm. Circe's Sworn Swords. Sir Osfrid Kettleblack, younger brother to Sir Osmond Kettleblack of the King's Guard. Sir Osney Kettleblack, youngest brother of Sir Osmond and Sir Osfrid. 
His sister, Princess Marcella, a girl of nine, a ward of Prince Doran Martel at Sunspear. His brother, Prince Tommin, a boy of eight, next heir to the Iron Throne. His grandfather, Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, Warden of the West and Hand of the King. His uncles and cousins, paternal. His father's brother, Stannis Baratheon, rebel Lord of Dragonstone, styling himself King Stannis I. Stannis's daughter, Shireen, a girl of eleven. His father's brother, Renly Baratheon, rebel Lord of Storm's End, murdered in the midst of his army. His grandmother's brother, Sir Eldon Estermont. Sir Eldon's son, Sir Amon Estermont. Sir Amon's son, Sir Alan Estermont. His uncles and cousins, maternal. His mother's brother, Sir Jamie Lannister, called the Kingslayer, a captive at River Run. His mother's brother, Tyrion Lannister, called the Imp, a dwarf, wounded in the Battle of the Blackwater. Tyrion Squire, Podrick Payne. Tyrion's captain of guards, Sir Bronn of the Blackwater, a former sellsword. Tyrion's concubine, Shay, a camp follower now serving as bedmaid to Lawless Stokeworth. His grandfather's brother, Sir Kevin Lannister. Sir Kevin's son, Sir Lancel Lannister, formerly squire to King Robert, wounded in the Battle of the Blackwater, near death. His grandfather's brother, Tygett Lannister, died of a pox. Tygett's son, Tyrek Lannister, a squire, missing since the Great Riot. Tyrek's infant wife, Lady Ermesand Hayford. His base-born siblings, King Robert's bastards. Maya Stone, a maid of nineteen, in the service of Lord Nestor Royce, of the Gates of the Moon. Gendry, an apprentice smith, a fugitive in the Riverlands and ignorant of his heritage. Edric Storm, King Robert's only acknowledged bastard son, a ward of his uncle Stannis on Dragonstone. His King's Guard, Sir Jamie Lannister, Lord Commander, Sir Merrin Trant, Sir Balan Swan, Sir Osmond Kettleblack, Sir Loras Tyrell, the Knight of Flowers, Sir Aris Oakhart. His small council. Lord Tywin Lannister, Hand of the King. Sir Kevin Lannister, Master of Laws. Lord Peter Baelish, called Littlefinger, Master of Coin. Varys, a eunuch, called the Spider, Master of Whisperers. Lord Mace Tyrell, Master of Ships. Grand Maester Purcell. His court and retainers, Sir Illyn Payne, the King's Justice, a headsman. Lord Haleen, the Pyromancer, a wisdom of the Guild of Alchemists. Moonboy, a jester and fool. Ormond of Old Town, the Royal Harper and Bard. Dantos Hollard, a fool and a drunkard, formerly a knight called Sir Dantos the Red. Jalabar Show. Prince of the Red Flower Vale, an exile from the Summer Isles. Lady Tonda Stokeworth, her daughter Felice, wed to Sir Balman Birch. Her daughter Lalas, thirty-four, unwed, and soft of wits, with child after being raped. Her healer and counsellor, Maester Franken. Lord Giles Rosby, a sickly old man. Sir Talad, a promising young knight. Lord Moros Slint, a squire eldest son of the former commander of the city watch. Jothos Slint, his younger brother, a squire. Danos Slint, younger still, a page. Sir Boris Blount, a former knight of the King's Guard, dismissed for cowardice by Queen Cersei. Josman Peckledon, a squire and a hero of the Battle of the Blackwater. Sir Philip Foote, made Lord of the Marches for his valor during the Battle of the Blackwater. Sir Lothor Brun, named Lothor Appleeater for his deeds during the Battle of the Blackwater, a former free rider in service to Lord Baelish. Other lords and knights at King's Landing, Mathis Rowan, Lord of Golden Grove, Paxter Redwine, Lord of the Arbor, Lord Paxter's twin sons, Sir Horace and Sir Hobber, mocked as horror and slobber, Lord Redwine's healer, Maester Balabar, Ardrian Seltigar, the Lord of Claw Isle, Lord Alessander Stedman, called Penny Lover, Sir Bonifer Hasty, called the Good, a famed knight, Sir Donald Swan, heir to Stonehelm, 
Sir Ronnet Connington, called Red Ronnet, the Knight of Griffin's Roost. Oran Waters, the Bastard of Driftmark. Sir Dermot of the Rainwood, a famed knight. Sir Timon Scrapesword, a famed knight. The People of King's Landing. The City Watch, the Gold Cloaks. Sir Jacelyn Bywater, called Iron Hand, commander of the City Watch, slain by his own men during the Battle of the Blackwater. Sir Adam Marbrand, commander of the City Watch, Sir Jacelyn's successor. Chataya, owner of an expensive brothel. Aleya, her daughter. Dancy, Marie, Jade, Chataya's girls. Tobo Mott, a master armorer. Iron Belly, a blacksmith. Hamish the Harper, a famed singer. Collio Quinus, a Taroshi singer. Bethany Fairfingers, a woman singer. Alaric of Isin, a singer far travelled. Galleon of Quay, a singer notorious for the length of his songs. Simon Silvertongue, a singer. King Joffrey's banner shows the crowned stag of Baratheon, black on gold, and the lion of Lannister, gold on crimson, combatant. The King in the North, the King of the Trident Rob Stark, Lord of Winterfell, King in the North, and King of the Trident, the eldest son of Eddard Stark, Lord of Winterfell, and Lady Caitlin of House Tully, his direwolf Greywind, his mother, Lady Caitlin of House Tully, widow of Lord Eddard Stark, his siblings, his sister, Princess Sansa, a maid of twelve, a captive in King's Landing. Sansa's direwolf, lady, killed at Castle Darry. His sister, Princess Arya, a girl of ten, missing and presumed dead. Arya's direwolf, Nymeria, lost near the trident. His brother, Prince Brandon, called Bran, heir to the north, a boy of nine, believed dead. Bran's direwolf, Summer. Bran's companions and protectors, Mira Reed, a maid of sixteen, daughter of Lord Howland Reed of Greywater Watch. Jojen Reed, her brother, thirteen. Hodor, a simple-minded stable boy, seven feet tall. His brother, Prince Rickon, a boy of four, believed dead. Rickon's direwolf, Shaggy Dog. Rickon's companion and protector, Osha, a wildling captive who served as a scullion at Winterfell. His half-brother, Jon Snow, a sworn brother of the Night's Watch. John's direwolf, Ghost. His uncles and aunts, paternal. His father's elder brother, Brandon Stark, slain at the command of King Ares II Targaryen. His father's sister, Lyanna Stark, died in the Mountains of Dorne during Robert's Rebellion. His father's younger brother, Benjen Stark, a man of the Night's Watch, lost beyond the wall. His uncles, aunts, and cousins, maternal. His mother's younger sister, Lisa Arryn, Lady of the Airy, and widow of Lord John Arryn, their son, Robert Arryn, Lord of the Airy. His mother's younger brother, Sir Edmure Tully, heir to Riverrun. His grandfather's brother, Sir Brynden Tully, called the Blackfish. His sworn swords and companions, his squire, Oliver Frey. Sir Wendell Manderley, second son to the Lord of White Harbour. Patrick Malister, heir to Seaguard. Daisy Mormont, eldest daughter of Lady Meg Mormont and heir to Bear Island. John Umber, called the Small John, heir to Last Hearth. Donald Locke, Owen Norrie, Robin Flint, Northman. His lords, bannermen, captains, and commanders, with Rob's army in the Westerlands. Sir Brendan Tully, the Blackfish, commanding the scouts and outriders. John Umber, called the Great John, commanding the van. Rickard Carstark, Lord of Carhold, Galbart Glover, Master of Deepwood Mott, Meg Mormont, Lady of Bear Island, Sir Stevron Frey, eldest son of Lord Walder Frey and heir to the twins, died at Oxcross, Sir Stevron's eldest son, Sir Ryman Frey, Sir Ryman's son, Black Walder Frey, Martin Rivers, a bastard son of Lord Walder Frey. With Roose Bolton's host at Harringall, Roose Bolton, Lord of the Dreadfort, Sir Anis Frey, Sir Jared Frey, Sir Hostein Frey, Sir Danwell Frey, their bastard half-brother, Ronel Rivers, 
Sir Willis Manderley, heir to White Harbor. Sir Kyle Condon, a knight in his service. Ronald Stout. Varga Hoet of the Free City of Kohor, captain of a sellsword company, the Brave Companions. His lieutenant, Erswick, called the Faithful. His lieutenant, Septon Ut. Timian of Dorn. Rorg, Igo, Fat Zalo, Biter, Tog Joth of Ibn, Pig, Three Toes, his men, Kyburn, a chainless maester and sometimes necromancer, his healer. With the Northern Army attacking Duskendale, Robert Glover of Deepwood Mott, Sir Helmon Tolhart of Torren Square, Harion Karstark, sole surviving son of Lord Rickard Karstark and heir to Carhold. Travelling north with Lord Eddard's bones, Hallas Mullen, captain of guards for Winterfell, Jax, Quent, Shad, guardsmen. His Lord Bannerman and Castellans in the north, Wyman Mandalay, Lord of Whiteharbor, Howland Reed, Lord of Greywater Watch, a Clannagman, Moore's Umber, called Crowfood, and Hother Umber, called Horsbane, uncles to Great John Umber, joint Castellans at the last hearth. Iessa Flint, Lady of Widow's Watch, Anzu Locke, Lord of Old Castle, an old man, Clay Sirwin, Lord of Sirwin, a boy of fourteen, killed in battle at Winterfell, his sister Janelle Sirwin, a maid of two and thirty, now the Lady of Sirwin, Leobald Tallhart, younger brother to Sir Helmon, Castellan at Torrent Square, killed in battle at Winterfell, Leobald's wife, Barina of House Hornwood, Leobald's son, Brandon, a boy of fourteen. Leobald's son, Beren, a boy of ten. Sir Helmon's son, Benfred, killed by ironmen on the stony shore. Sir Helmon's daughter, Edara, a girl of nine, heir to Torren Square. Lady Sybil, wife to Robert Glover, a captive of Asha Greyjoy at Deepwood Mott. Robert's son, Gawain, three, rightful heir to Deepwood Mott, a captive of Asha Greyjoy. Robert's daughter, Arena, a babe of one, a captive of Asha Greyjoy at Deepwood Mott. Larence Snow, a bastard son of Lord Hornwood and ward of Galbart Glover, thirteen, a captive of Asha Greyjoy at Deepwood Mott. The banner of the King in the North remains as it has for thousands of years, the grey direwolf of the Starks of Winterfell, running across an ice-white field. THE KING IN THE NARROW SEA Stannis Baratheon, the first of his name, second son of Lord Stephen Baratheon and Lady Cassanna of House Estermont, formerly Lord of Dragonstone. His wife, Queen Selyse of House Florent. Princess Shireen, their daughter, a girl of eleven. Patchface, her lackwit fool. His base-born nephew, Edric Storm, a boy of twelve, bastard son of King Robert by Delina Florent. His squires, Devon Seaworth and Brian Faring. His court and retainers, Lord Alistair Florent, Lord of Brightwater Keep and Hand of the King, the Queen's uncle. Sir Axel Florent, Castellan of Dragonstone and leader of the Queen's men, the Queen's uncle. Lady Melisandre of Ashai, called the Red Woman, Priestess of Valor, the Lord of Light and God of Flame and Shadow. Maester Pylos, Healer, Tutor, Counselor. Sir Davos Seaworth, called the Onion Knight and sometimes Shorthand, once a smuggler. Davos's wife, Lady Maria, a carpenter's daughter. Their seven sons, Dale, lost in the Blackwater, Allard, lost in the Blackwater, Mathos, lost in the Blackwater, Marek, lost in the Blackwater, Devon, squire to King Stannis, Stannis, a boy of nine years, Stephen, a boy of six years. Salador San of the Free City of Lys, styling himself Prince of the Narrow Sea and Lord of Blackwater Bay, Master of the Valyrian and a fleet of sister galleys. Mazo Mar, a eunuch in his hire. Corain Southmantes, captain of his galley, Shiala's Dance. Porridge and Lamprey, two jailers. His Lord's Bannerman, Monteris Velaryon, Lord of the Tides and Master of Driftmark, a boy of six. Durham Bar Emon, Lord of Shop Point, a boy of fifteen years. Sir Gilbert Faring, Castellan of Storm's End. Lord Elwood Meadows, Sir Gilbert's second. Maester Jern, 
Sir Gilbert's counsellor and healer. Lord Lucas Chittering, called Little Lucas, a youth of sixteen. Lester Morrigan, Lord of Crowsnest. His knights and sworn swords, Sir Lomas Estamont, the king's maternal uncle, his son, Sir Andrew Estamont. Sir Roland Storm, called the Bastard of Night Song, a base-born son of the late Lord Brian Caron. Sir Parmen Crane, called Parmen the Purple, held captive at High Garden. Sir Aaron Florent, younger brother to Queen Celise, held captive at High Garden. Sir Gerald Gower, Sir Tristan of Tally Hill, formerly in service to Lord Gunster Sunglass. Lewis, called the Fishwife, Omer Blackberry. King Stannis has taken for his banner the fiery heart of the Lord of Light, a red heart surrounded by orange flames upon a yellow field. Within the heart is the crowned stag of House Baratheon in black. THE QUEEN ACROSS THE WATER Daenerys Targaryen, the first of her name, Khaleesi of the Dothraki, called Daenerys Stormborn, the Unburnt, Mother of Dragons, sole surviving heir of Ares the Second Targaryen, widow of Khal Drogo of the Dothraki. Her growing dragons, Drogon, Viserion, Rhaegal. Her queen's guard, Sir Jorah Mormont, formerly Lord of Bear Island, exiled for slaving, Jogo, Co and Bloodrider, the Whip, Ago, Co and Bloodrider, the Bow, Rakaro, Co and Bloodrider, the Arak, Strong Belwas, a former eunuch slave from the fighting pits of Mirin, his aged squire, Arstan, called Whitebeard, a man of Westeros, her handmaids, Iri, a Dothraki girl, fifteen, Jiki, a Dothraki girl, fourteen. Grolio, captain of the great Cog Valyrian, a Pentoshi seafarer in the hire of Illyrio Mopatis. Her late kin, Rhaegar, her brother, prince of Dragonstone and heir to the Iron Throne, slain by Robert Baratheon on the Trident. Rhaenys, Rhaegar's daughter by Elia of Dorne, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Aegon, Rhaegar's son by Elia of Dorne, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Viserys, her brother, styling himself King Viserys, the third of his name, called the Beggar King, slain in Vaestoth Rock by Khal Drogo. Drogo, her husband, a great Khal of the Dothraki, never defeated in battle, died of a wound. Rhaegar, her stillborn son by Khal Drogo, slain in the womb by Miri Mazdur. Her known enemies... Carl Pono, once co to Drogo, Carl Jocko, once co to Drogo, Mago, his blood rider, the Undying of Carth, a band of warlocks, Piat Pri, a Carthine warlock, the Sorrowful Men, a guild of Carthine assassins, her uncertain allies, past and present, Zaro Jean Daxos, a merchant prince of Carth, Quaith, a masked shadowbinder from Ashai, Illyrio Mopatis, a magister of the free city of Pentos, who brokered her marriage to Khal Drogo. In Astapor, Krasnis Mo Naklaus, a wealthy slave trader, his slave Missandei, a girl of ten of the peaceful people of Noth, Grasdan Mo Ulhor, an old slave trader, very rich, his slave Cleon, a butcher and cook, Grey Worm, a eunuch of the Unsullied, and Yunkai, Grasdan Mo Eras, envoy and nobleman. Miro of Bravos, called the Titan's Bastard, captain of the Second Sons, a free company. Brown Ben Plum, a sergeant in the Second Sons, a soul sword of dubious descent. Prendal Nagesin, a Giscari soul sword, captain of the Storm Crows, a free company. Salor the Bald, a Carthine soul sword, captain of the Storm Crows. The Ario Naharis, a flamboyant Tarashi sellsword, captain of the Storm Crows. In Mirin, Osnak Zopal, a hero of the city. The banner of Daenerys Targaryen is the banner of Aegon the Conqueror and the dynasty he established, a three headed dragon, red on black. King of the Isles and the North. Balan Greyjoy, 
the ninth of his name since the gray king, styling himself king of the Iron Islands and the North, king of salt and rock, son of the sea wind, and lord reaper of pike. His wife, Queen Alanis, of House Harlaw, their children, Roderick, their eldest son, slain at Seaguard during Greyjoy's rebellion, Maron, their second son, slain at Pike during Greyjoy's rebellion, Asha, their daughter, captain of the Black Wind and conqueror of Deepwood Mott, Theon, their youngest son, captain of the Sea Bitch, and briefly, Prince of Winterfell, Theon's squire, Wex Pike, bastard son of Lord Botley's half brother, a mute lad of twelve, Theon's crew, the men of the Sea Bitch, Erzin, Maron Botley, called Fish Whiskers, Stig, Given Harlaw, Cadwile. His brothers, Euron, called Crow's Eye, Captain of the Silence, a notorious outlaw, pirate, and raider. Victarion, Lord Captain of the Iron Fleet, Master of the Iron Victory. Aeron, called Damp Hair, a priest of the Drowned God. His household on Pike, Maester Windermere, Healer and Counselor, Helia, Keeper of the Castle. His warriors and sworn swords, Dagmer, called Cleftjaw, Captain of Foam Drinker, Bluetooth, a longship captain, Uller, Skite, oarsman and warriors, Andrick the Unsmiling, a giant of a man, Carl, called Carl the Maid, beardless but deadly. People of Lordsport, Otter Gimpney, innkeeper and whoremonger, Sigrin, a shipwright. His Lord's Bannerman, Sawain Botley, Lord of Lordsport on Pike, Lord Winch of Ironholt on Pike. Stonehouse, Drum, and Good Brother of Old Wick, Lord Good Brother, Spar, Lord Merlin, and Lord Farwind of Great Wick, Lord Harlaw of Harlaw, Volmark, Meyer, Stone Tree, and Kenning of Harlaw, Oakwood and Tawny of Orkmont, Lord Blacktide of Blacktide, Lord Saltcliffe and Lord Sunderley of Saltcliffe. Other Houses, Great and Small House Arryn the Arryns are descended from the kings of mountain and vale, one of the oldest and purest lines of Andal nobility. House Arryn has taken no part in the war of the five kings, holding back its strength to protect the vale of Arryn. The Arryn sigil is the moon and falcon, white upon a sky-blue field. The Arryn words are, as high as honor. Robert Arryn, Lord of the Airy, Defender of the Vale, Warden of the East, a sickly boy of eight years. His mother, Lady Lisa of House Tully, third wife and widow of Lord John Arryn, and sister to Caitlin Stark. Their household, Marillion, a handsome young singer, much favored by Lady Lisa, Maester Coleman, Counselor, Healer, and Tutor, Sir Marwyn Belmore, Captain of Guards, Mord, a brutal jailer. His lords, bannermen, knights, and retainers. Lord Nestor Royce, high steward of the Vale and castellan of the Gates of the Moon, of the junior branch of House Royce. Lord Nestor's son, Sir Albar. Lord Nestor's daughter, Miranda. Maya Stone, a bastard girl in his service, natural daughter of King Robert I Baratheon. Lord Yon Royce, called Bronze Yon, Lord of Runestone, of the senior branch of House Royce, cousin to Lord Nestor. Lord Yon's eldest son, Sir Ander. Lord Yon's second son, Sir Robar, a knight of Renly Baratheon's Rainbow Guard, slain at Storm's End by Sir Loras Tyrell. Lord Yon's youngest son, Sir Waymar, a man of the Night's Watch, lost beyond the wall. Sir Lynn Corbray, a suitor to Lady Lisa. Michael Redfort, his squire. Lady Anya Wainwood. Lady Anya's eldest son and heir, Sir Morton, a suitor to Lady Lisa. Lady Anya's second son, Sir Donal, the Knight of the Gate. Eon Hunter, Lord of Longbow Hall, an old man, and a suitor to Lady Lisa. Horton Redfort, Lord of Redfort. House Florent The Florents of Brightwater Keep are Tyrell Bannermen, despite a superior claim to High Garden by virtue of a blood tie to House Gardener, the old Kings of the Reach. At the outbreak of the War of the Five Kings, Lord Alistair Florent followed the Tyrells in declaring for King Renly. 
but his brother Sir Axel chose King Stannis, whom he had served for years as Castellan of Dragonstone. Their niece Selys was, and is, King Stannis's queen. When Renly died at Storm's End, the Florence went over to Stannis with all their strength, the first of Renly's bannermen to do so. The sigil of House Florent shows a fox head in a circle of flowers. Alistair Florent, Lord of Brightwater. His wife, Lady Malara, of House Crane. Their children, Alakine, heir to Brightwater, Melissa, wed to Lord Randall Tarley, Rhea, wed to Lord Leighton Hightower, his siblings, Sir Axel, Castellan of Dragonstone, Sir Ryam, died in a fall from a horse, Sir Ryam's daughter, Queen Selyse, wed to King Stannis Baratheon, Sir Ryam's son, Sir Imry, commanding Stannis Baratheon's fleet on the Blackwater, lost with the fury, Sir Ryam's second son, Sir Erin, held captive at Highgarden, Sir Colin, Sir Colin's daughter, Delina, wed to Sir Hosman Norcross, Delina's son, Edric Storm, a bastard of King Robert I Baratheon, twelve years of age, Delina's son, Alistair Norcross, eight, Delina's son, Renly Norcross, a boy of two, Sir Colin's son, Maester Omer, in service at Old Oak, Sir Colin's son, Merrill, a squire on the arbor, his sister, Rylene, wed to Sir Richard Crane. House Frey Powerful, wealthy, and numerous, the Freys are bannermen to House Tully, but they have not always been diligent in their duty. When Robert Baratheon met Rhaegar Targaryen on the Trident, the Freys did not arrive until the battle was done, and thereafter Lord Hoster Tully always called Lord Walder the late Lord Frey. It is also said of Walder Frey that he is the only lord in the Seven Kingdoms who could field an army out of his breeches. At the onset of the War of the Five Kings, Rob Stark won Lord Walder's allegiance by pledging to wed one of his daughters or granddaughters. Two of Lord Walder's grandsons were sent to Winterfell to be fostered. Walder Frey, Lord of the Crossing By his first wife, Lady Perra of House Royce, Sir Stavron, their eldest son, died after the Battle of Oxcross. Married Karenna Swan, died of a wasting illness. Stevron's eldest son, Sir Ryman, heir to the twins. Ryman's son, Edwin, wed to Janice Hunter. Edwin's daughter, Walda, a girl of eight. Ryman's son, Walder, called Black Walder. Ryman's son, Peter, called Peter Pimple. Married Melinda Caron. Peter's daughter, Para, a girl of five. Married Jane Lydon, died in a fall from a horse. Stevron's son, Aegon, a half-wit called Jingle Bell. Stevron's daughter, Maegel, died in childbed, married Sir Dathan Vance. Maegel's daughter, Marianne, a maiden. Maegel's son, Walder Vance, a squire. Maegel's son, Patrick Vance. Married Marcella Wainwood, died in childbed. Stevron's son, Walton, married Deanna Harding. Walton's son, Stephen, called the Sweet. Walton's daughter, Walda, called Fair Walda. Walton's son, Brian, a squire. Sir Emmon, married Jenna of House Lannister. Emmon's son, Sir Cleos, married Jane Derry. Cleos's son, Tywin, a squire of eleven. Cleos's son, Willem, a page at Ashmark, nine. Emmon's son, Sir Lionel, married Melissa Craycall. Emmon's son, Tyon, a captive at Riverrun. Emmon's son, Walder, called Red Walder, fourteen, a squire at Casterly Rock. Sir Anise married Tyanna Wilde, died in childbed. Anise's son, Aegon Bloodborne, an outlaw. Anise's son, Rhaegar, married Jane Beesbury. Rhaegar's son, Robert, a boy of thirteen. Rhaegar's daughter, Walda, a girl of ten, called White Walda. Rhaegar's son, Jonas, a boy of eight. Perianne married Sir Leslin Haig. Perianne's son, Sir Harris Haig. Harris's son, Walder Haig, a boy of four. Perianne's son, Sir Donald Haig. Perianne's son, Alan Haig, a squire. By his second wife, Lady Serena of House Swan. Sir Jared, their eldest son, married Alice Frey. Jared's son, Sir Titos, married Joey Blantree. Titos's daughter, Zia, a maid of fourteen. 
Titus's son, Zachary, a boy of twelve, training at the Sept of Old Town. Jared's daughter, Kyra, married Sir Garth Goodbrook. Kyra's son, Walder Goodbrook, a boy of nine. Kyra's daughter, Jane Goodbrook, six. Septon Lucian, in service at the great Sept of Baylor in King's Landing. By his third wife, Lady Amory of House Craycall. Sir Hostine, their eldest son, married Bellina Haywick. Hostine's son, Sir Arwood, married Riella Royce. Arwood's daughter, Riella, a girl of five. Arwood's twin sons, Andrew and Alan, three. Lady Lythine, married Lord Lucius Viprin. Lythine's daughter, Eliana, married Sir John Wilde. Eliana's son, Ricard Wilde, four. Lythine's son, Sir Damon Viprin. Simond, married Betharios of Bravos. Simon's son, Alessander, a singer. Simon's daughter, Alex, a maid of seventeen. Simon's son, Bradamar, a boy of ten, fostered on Bravos as a ward of Oro Tendiris, a merchant of that city. Sir Danwell married Winifrey Went, many stillbirths and miscarriages. Merritt married Maria Darry. Merritt's daughter, Amory, called Amy, a widow of sixteen, married Sir Pate of the Blue Fork. Merritt's daughter, Walda, called Fat Walda, a wife of fifteen years, married Lord Roose Bolton. Merritt's daughter, Marissa, a maid of thirteen. Merritt's son, Walder, called Little Walder, a boy of seven, taken captive at Winterfell while a ward of Lady Caitlin Stark. Sir Jeremy, drowned, married Carolee Wainwood. Jeremy's son, Sandor, a boy of twelve, a squire to Sir Donald Wainwood. Jeremy's daughter, Cynthia, a girl of nine, a ward of Lady Anya Wainwood. Sir Raymond, married Beany Beesbury. Raymond's son, Robert, sixteen, in training at the Citadel in Old Town. Raymond's son, Malwyn, fifteen, apprenticed to an alchemist in Lease. Raymond's twin daughters, Sarah and Sarah, maiden girls of fourteen. Raymond's daughter, Circe, six, called Little Bee. By his fourth wife, Lady Alyssa of House Blackwood. Lothar, their eldest son, called Lame Lothar, married Leonella Lefford. Lothar's daughter, Tysane, a girl of seven. Lothar's daughter, Walda, a girl of four. Lothar's daughter, Emberly, a girl of two. Sir Jamos, married Sally Page. Jamos's son, Walder, called Big Walder, a boy of eight, taken captive at Winterfell while a ward of Lady Caitlin Stark. Jamos's twin sons, Dickon and Mathis, five. Sir Whalen, married Silver Page. Whalen's son, Hoster, a boy of twelve, a squire to Sir Damon Page. Whalen's daughter, Marianne, called Mary, a girl of eleven. Lady Moria, married Sir Flemont Brax. Moria's son, Robert Brax, nine, fostered at Casterly Rock as a page. Moria's son, Walder Brax, a boy of six. Moria's son, John Brax, a babe of three. Tita, called Tita the Maid, a maid of twenty-nine. By his fifth wife, Lady Saria of House Went, no progeny. By his sixth wife, Lady Bethany of House Rosby, Sir Perwin, their eldest son, Sir Benfrey, married Gianna Frey, a cousin, Benfrey's daughter, Della, called Deaf Della, a girl of three, Benfrey's son, Osmond, a boy of two, Maester Willimon, in service at Longbow Hall, Oliver, squire to Rob Stark, Rosalind, a maid of sixteen. By his seventh wife, Lady Anara of House Faring. Arwen, a maid of fourteen. Wendell, their eldest son, a boy of thirteen, fostered at Seaguard as a page. Colmar, promised to the faith, eleven. Walter, called Tyr, a boy of ten. Elmar, formerly betrothed to Arya Stark, a boy of nine. Shiri, a girl of six. His eighth wife, Lady Joyeuse of House Erinford. No prodigy as yet. Lord Walder's natural children by sundry mothers. Walder Rivers called Bastard Walder. Bastard Walder's son, Sir Amon Rivers. Bastard Walder's daughter, Walder Rivers. Maester Melwis in service at Rosby. Jane Rivers, Martin Rivers, Riger Rivers, Ronell Rivers, Malara Rivers, others. House Lannister. 
The Lannisters of Casterly Rock remain the principal support of King Joffrey's claim to the Iron Throne. They boast of descent from Lan the Clever, the legendary trickster of the Age of Heroes. The gold of Casterly Rock and the Golden Tooth has made them the wealthiest of the great houses. The Lannister sigil is a golden lion upon a crimson field. Their words are, Hear me roar. Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, Warden of the West, Shield of Lannisport, and Hand of the King. His son, Sir Jamie, called the Kingslayer, a twin to Queen Cersei, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard and Warden of the East, a captive at River Run. His daughter, Queen Cersei, twin to Jamie, widow of King Robert I Baratheon, Queen Regent for her son Joffrey. Her son, King Joffrey Baratheon, a boy of thirteen. Her daughter, Princess Marcella Baratheon, a girl of nine, a ward of Prince Doran Martell in Dorne. Her son, Prince Tommen Baratheon, a boy of eight, heir to the Iron Throne. His dwarf son, Tyrion, called the Imp, called Half-Man, wounded and scarred on the Blackwater. His siblings, Sir Kevin, Lord Tywin's eldest brother, Sir Kevin's wife Dorna of House Swift, their son, Sir Lancel, formerly esquire to King Robert, wounded and near death. Their son, Willem, twin to Martin, a squire, captive at River Run. Their son, Martin, twin to Willem, a squire, a captive with Rob Stark. Their daughter, Janai, a girl of two. Jenna, his sister, wed to Sir Emon Frey. Their son, Sir Cleos Frey, a captive at River Run. Their son, Sir Lionel. Their son, Tyon Frey, a squire, a captive at River Run. Their son, Walder, called Red Walder, a squire at Casterly Rock. Sir Tygett, his second brother, died of a pox. Tygett's widow, Darlessa, of House Marbrand. Their son, Tyrek, squire to the king, missing. Gerion, his youngest brother, lost at sea. Gerion's bastard daughter, Joy, eleven. His cousin, Sir Stafford Lannister, brother to the late Lady Joanna, slain at Oxcross. Sir Stafford's daughters, Serena and Muriel. Sir Stafford's son, Sir Davin. His cousins, Sir Damien Lannister, married Lady Shiera Craig Hall. His son, Sir Lucian. His daughter, Lana. Married Lord Ontario Jast. Margot married Lord Titus Peak. His household, Maester Craylin, healer, tutor, and counselor. Vilar, captain of guards. Lum and Red Lester, guardsmen. White Smile Watt, a singer. Sir Benedict Broom, master at arms. His lords, Bannerman, Damon Marbrand, Lord of Ashmark. Sir Adam Marbrand, his son and heir. Roland Craycall, Lord of Craycall. His brother, Sir Burton Craycall, killed by Lord Beric Dondarrion and his outlaws. His son and heir, Sir Tybalt Craycall. His second son, Sir Lyle Craycall, called Strongbore, a captive at Pink Maiden Castle. His youngest son, Sir Merlon Craycall. Andros Brax, Lord of Hornvale, drowned during the Battle of the Camps. His brother, Sir Rupert Brax, slain at Oxcross. His eldest son, Sir Titos Brax, now Lord of Hornvale, a captive at the Twins. His second son, Sir Robert Brax, slain at the Battle of the Fords. His third son, Sir Flemont Brax, now heir. Lord Leo Lefford, drowned at the Stone Mill. Reginard Estrin, Lord of Windhall, a captive at the Twins. Gawain Westerling, Lord of the Crag, a captive at Seaguard. His wife, Lady Sybil of House Spicer. Her brother, Sir Rolf Spicer. Her cousin, Sir Samuel Spicer. Their children, Sir Reynold Westerling, Jane, a maid of sixteen years. Elena, a girl of twelve. Rollam, a boy of nine. Lewis Lydon, Lord of the Deep Den. Lord Ontario Jast, a captive at Pink Maiden Castle. Lord Philip Plum. His sons, Sir Dennis Plum, Sir Peter Plum, and Sir Harwin Plum, called Hardstone. Quentin Bainfort, Lord of Bainfort, a captive of Lord Jonas Bracken. His knights and captains, Sir Horace Swift, good father to Sir Kevin Lannister. Sir Horace's son, Sir Stephen Swift. Sir Stephen's daughter, Joanna. Sir Horace's daughter, Shirley, married Sir Melwyn Sarsfield. Sir Forley Prester. Sir Garth Greenfield, a captive at Raventree Hall. Sir Lyman de Vickery, a captive at Wayfarer's Rest. 
Lord Selmond Staxpear, his son, Sir Stephen Staxpear, his younger son, Sir Alan Staxpear, Terence Kenning, Lord of Casey, Sir Kenos of Casey, a knight in his service, Sir Gregor Clegane, the mountain that rides, Polliver, Chiswick, Rath the Sweetling, Dunson, and the Tickler, soldiers in his service, Sir Amory Lorch, fed to a bear by Vargo Hoet after the fall of Harrenhal. House Martell. Dorn was the last of the seven kingdoms to swear fealty to the Iron Throne. Blood, custom, and history all set the Dornishmen apart from the other kingdoms. At the outbreak of the War of the Five Kings, Dorn took no part. With the betrothal of Marcella Baratheon to Prince Tristane, Sunspear declared its support for King Joffrey and called its banners. The Martell banner is a red sun pierced by a golden spear. Their words are unbowed, unbent, unbroken. Doran Nymeros Martell, Lord of Sunspear, Prince of Dorne, his wife Malario of the free city of Norvos, their children, Princess Ariane, their eldest daughter, heir to Sunspear, Prince Quentin, their elder son, Prince Tristane, their younger son, betrothed to Myrcella Baratheon. His siblings, his sister, Princess Elia, wife of Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, slain during the sack of King's Landing. Their children, Princess Rhaenys, a young girl, slain during the sack of King's Landing. Prince Aegon, a babe, slain during the sack of King's Landing. His brother, Prince Oberyn, called the Red Viper. Prince Oberyn's paramour, Ilaria Sand. Prince Oberyn's bastard daughters, Obara, Nymeria, Tyene, Cervella, Elia, Obella, Doria, Larisa, called the Sand Snakes. Prince Oberyn's companions, Harmon Uller, Lord of Hellholt, Harmon's brother, Sir Olwick Uller, Sir Ryan Illyrian, Sir Ryan's natural son, Sir Damon Sand, the Bastard of God's Grace, Dagos Manwoody, Lord of Kingsgrave, Dagos's sons, Moors and Dickon, Dagos's brother, Sir Miles Manwoody, Sir Aaron Corgyle, Sir Desiel Dalt, the Knight of Lemonwood, Miria Jordain, heir to the Tor, Lara Blackmont, Lady of Blackmont, her daughter, Janessa Blackmont, her son, Peros Blackmont, a squire, his household, Ario Hota, or Norvashi Selsword, Captain of Guards, Maester Caliot, Counselor, Healer, and Tutor, his Lord's Bannerman, Harmon Uller, Lord of Hellholt, Edric Dane, Lord of Starfall, Delon Illyrian, Lady of God's Grace, Dagos Manwoody, Lord of Kingsgrave, Lara Blackmont, Lady of Blackmont, Tremond Gargalan, Lord of Saltshore, Anders Ironwood, Lord of Ironwood, Nymella Toland, House Tully. Lord Edmund Tully of Riverrun was one of the first of the river lords to swear fealty to Aegon the Conqueror. The victorious Aegon rewarded him by raising House Tully to dominion over all the lands of the Trident. The Tully sigil is a leaping trout, silver, on a field of rippling blue and red. The Tully words are family, duty, honor. Hoster Tully, Lord of Riverrun. His wife, Lady Manisa, of House Went, died in childbed. Their children, Caitlin, widow of Lord Eddard Stark of Winterfell. Her eldest son, Rob Stark, Lord of Winterfell, King in the North, and King of the Trident. Her daughter, Sansa Stark, a maid of twelve, captive at King's Landing. Her daughter, Arya Stark, ten, missing for a year. Her son, Brandon Stark, eight, believed dead. Her son, Rickon Stark, four, believed dead. Lisa, widow of Lord John Arran of the Airy. Her son, Robert, Lord of the Airy and Defender of the Vale, a sickly boy of seven years. Sir Edmure, his only son, heir to River Run, Sir Edmure's friends and companions, Sir Mark Piper, heir to Pink Maiden, Lord Lymond Goodbrook, Sir Ronald Vance, called the Bad, and his brothers, Sir Hugo, Sir Ellery, and Kurth, Patrick Malister, Lucas Blackwood, Sir Perwin Frey, Tristan Riger, Sir Robert Page, his brother, Sir Brendan, called the Blackfish, his household, Maester Vyman, Counselor, Healer, and Tutor. Sir Desmond Grell, Master at Arms. Sir Robin Riger, Captain of the Guard. Long Lou, Elwood, Delp, Guardsman. Utherides Wayne, Steward of River Run. Raymond the Rhymer, a singer. His Lord's Bannerman. 
Jonas Bracken, Lord of the Stonehenge, Jason Malister, Lord of Seagard, Walder Frey, Lord of the Crossing, Clement Piper, Lord of Pink Maiden Castle, Carol Vance, Lord of Wayfarer's Rest, Norbert Vance, Lord of Atranta, Theomar Smallwood, Lord of Acorn Hall, his wife, Lady Ravella of House Swan, their daughter, Carellan, William Mouton, Lord of Maidenpool, Shella Went, dispossessed Lady of Harrenhal, Sir Holman Page, Titos Blackwood, Lord of Raventree, House Tyrell. The Tyrells rose to power as stewards to the kings of the Reach, whose domain included the fertile plains of the southwest from the Dornish marches and Blackwater Rush to the shores of the Sunset Sea. Through the female line they claimed descent from Garth Greenhand, gardener king of the first men, who wore a crown of vines and flowers and made the land bloom. When Mern the Ninth, last king of House Gardner, was slain on the field of fire, his steward, Harlan Tyrell, surrendered High Garden to Aegon the Conqueror. Aegon granted him the castle and dominion over the reach. The Tyrell sigil is a golden rose on a grass-green field. Their words are growing strong. Lord Mace Tyrell declared his support for Renly Baratheon at the onset of the War of the Five Kings, and gave him the hand of his daughter, Marguerite. Upon Renly's death, Highgarden made alliance with House Lannister, and Margaery was betrothed to King Joffrey. Mace Tyrell, Lord of Highgarden, Warden of the South, Defender of the Marches, and High Marshal of the Reach. His wife, Lady Allery, of House Hightower of Old Town. Their children, Willis, their eldest son, heir to Highgarden. Sir Garland, called the Gallant, their second son. His wife, Lady Leonette, of House Fossaway. Sir Loras, the Knight of Flowers, their youngest son, a sworn brother of the Kingsguard. Marguerite, their daughter, a widow of fifteen years, betrothed to King Joffrey I Baratheon. Marguerite's companions and ladies-in-waiting. Her cousins, Mega, Alla, and Eleanor Tyrell. Eleanor's betrothed, Alan Ambrose, squire. Lady Alisanne Bulwer, a girl of eight. Meredith Crane, called Mary. Tana of Mere, wife to Lord Orton Merriweather, Lady Alice Graceford, Septa Nisterica, a sister of the faith. His widowed mother, Lady Olena of House Redwine, called the Queen of Thorns, Lady Olena's guardsmen, Arik and Eric, called left and right. His sisters, Lady Mina, wed to Paxter Redwine, Lord of the Arbor, their children, Sir Horace Redwine, twin to Harbor, mocked as horror, Sir Hobber Redwine, twin to Horace, mocked as Slobber. Desmera Redwine, a maid of sixteen. Lady Janna, wed to Sir John Fossaway. His uncles and cousins. His father's brother Garth, called the Gross, Lord Seneschal of Highgarden. Garth's bastard sons, Garth and Garrett Flowers. His father's brother, Sir Morin, Lord Commander of the City Watch of Old Town. Morin's son, Sir Luthor, married Lady Ellen Norridge. Luthor's son, Sir Theodore, married Lady Leah Seri. Theodore's daughter, Eleanor. Theodore's son, Luthor, a squire. Luthor's son, Maester Medwick. Luthor's daughter, Oline, married Sir Leo Blackbar. Morin's son, Leo, called Leo the Lazy. His father's brother, Maester Gorman, a scholar of the Citadel. His cousin, Sir Quentin, died at Ashford. Quentin's son, Sir Olimer, married Lady Lisa Meadows. Olimer's sons, Raymond and Rickard, Olimer's daughter, Mega. His cousin, Maester Normand, in service at Black Crown. His cousin, Sir Victor, slain by the smiling knight of the Kingswood Brotherhood. Victor's daughter, Victaria, married Lord John Bulwer, died of a summer fever. Their daughter, Lady Alisanne Bulwer, eight. Victor's son, Sir Leo, married Lady Alice Beesbury. Leo's daughters, Alla and Leona. Leo's sons, Lionel, Lucas, and Laurent. His household at High Garden, Maester Lomis, counselor, healer, and tutor, Igon Verwell, captain of the guard, Sir Vortimer Crane, master at arms, Butterbumps, fool and jester, hugely fat, his lord's bannerman, Randall Tarley, lord of Hornhill, Paxter Redwine, lord of the arbor, Arwen Oakhart, lady of Old Oak, Mathis Rowan, lord of Golden Grove, Alistair Florent, lord of Brightwater Keep, a rebel in support of Stannis Baratheon. Leighton Hightower, voice of Old Town, Lord of the Fort. Orton Merriweather, Lord of Longtable. Lord Arthur Ambrose. 
His knights and sworn swords, Sir Mark Mullendore, crippled during the Battle of the Blackwater, Sir John Fossaway of the Green Apple Fossaways, Sir Tanton Fossaway of the Red Apple Fossaways. Rebels, Rogues, and Sworn Brothers The Sworn Brothers of the Night's Watch Ranging beyond the wall, J.R. Mormont, called the Old Bear, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. John Snow, the Bastard of Winterfell, his steward and squire, lost while scouting the Skirling Pass. Ghost, his direwolf, white and silent. Edison Tollett, called Dolorous Ed, his squire. Thorin Smallwood, commanding the rangers. Dywin, Dirk, Softfoot, Gren, Bedwick, called Giant. Allo Lophand, Grubbs, Bernard, called Brown Bernard. Another Bernard, called Black Bernard. Tim Stone, Ulmer of Kingswood, Garth called Greyfeather, Garth of Greenaway, Garth of Oldtown, Alan of Rosby, Ronald Harkley, Ethan, Riles, Mawney, Rangers. Jarman Buckwell, commanding the Scouts, Bannon, Kedge Whiteye, Tumberjohn, Forneo, Godey, Rangers and Scouts. Sir Otten Withers, commanding the rearguard, Sir Malador Locke, commanding the baggage. Donald Hill called Sweet Donald his squire and steward, Hake, a steward and cook, Chet, an ugly steward, keeper of hounds, Samuel Tarley, a fat steward, keeper of ravens, mocked as Sir Piggy, Lark called the Sister Man, his cousin Raleigh of Sisterton, Clubfoot Carl, Maslin, Small Paul, Sawwood, Left Hand Lou, Orphan Oss, Muttering Bill, stewards. Corin Halfhand commanding the rangers from the Shadow Tower, slain in the Skirling Pass. Squire Dalbridge, Egan, rangers, slain in the Skirling Pass. Stone Snake, a ranger and mountaineer, lost a foot in Skirling Pass. Blaine, Corin Halfhand's second, commanding the Shadow Tower men on the fist of the first men. Sir Byam Flint. At Castle Black, Bowen Marsh, Lord Steward and Castellan. Maester Amon Targaryen, healer and counselor, a blind man, one hundred years old. His steward, Clytus. Benjamin Stark, first ranger, missing, feared dead. Sir Winton Stout, eighty years a ranger. Sir Allardale Winch, Pipar, Deaf Dick Follard, Harry Howe, Black Jack Bulwer, Elron, Mathar, rangers. Othol Yarwick, first builder. Spareboot, Young Henley, Halder, Albet, Kegs, Spotted Pate of Maidenpool, Builders. Donald Noy, Armorer, Smith, and Steward, One-Armed. Three-Finger Hob, Steward and Chief Cook. Tim Tangletongue, Easy, Molly, Old Henley, Coogan, Red Allen of the Rosewood, Jerin, Stewards. Septon Celador, A Drunken Devout. Sir Andrew Tarth, Master at Arms. Rast, Aaron, Emric, Satin, Hop Robin, Recruits in Training. Conway, Guerin, Recruiters and Collectors. At East Watch by the Sea. Cotter Pike, Commander East Watch. Maester Harmune, Healer and Counselor. Sir Alistair Thorne, Master at Arms. Janos Slint, former Commander of the City Watch of King's Landing, briefly Lord of Harrenhal. Sir Glendon Hewitt. Darion, Steward and Singer. Iron Emmet, a Ranger famed for his strength. At Shadow Tower, Sir Dennis Malister, Commander Shadow Tower, his steward and squire, Wallace Massey, Maester Mullen, healer and counselor. The Brotherhood Without Banners, an Outlaw Fellowship. Beric Dondarion, Lord of Blackhaven, called the Lightning Lord, oft reported dead. His right hand, Thoros of Mere, a red priest. His squire, Edric Dane, Lord of Starfall, twelve. His followers, Lem, called Lem Lemoncloak, a one-time soldier, Harwin, son of Holland, formerly in service to Lord Eddard Stark at Winterfell, Greenbeard, a Taroshi sellsword, Tom of Seven Streams, a singer of dubious report, called Tom Seven Strings and Tom of Sevens, Angie the Archer, a bowman from the Dornish Marches, Jack be Lucky, a wanted man, short an eye, the Mad Huntsman of Stony Sept, Kyle, Notch, Dennett, Longbowman, Merritt of Moontown, Watty the Miller, Likely Luke, Mudge, Beardless Dick, outlaws in his band. At the end of the kneeling man, Sharna the innkeep, a cook and midwife, her husband called Husband, Boy, an orphan of the war. At the Peach, 
a brothel in Stony Sept. Tansy, the red-haired proprietor. Alice, Cass, Lana, Jizine, Helly, Bella. Some of her peaches. At Acorn Hall, the seat of House Smallwood. Lady Ravella, formerly of House Swan, wife to Lord Theomar Smallwood. Here and there and elsewhere, Lord Lymond Leicester, an old man of wandering wit, who once held Sir Maynard at the bridge. His young caretaker, Maester Rune. The Ghost of High Heart. The Lady of the Leaves. The Septon at Sally Dance. The Wildlings, or the Free Folk. Mance Raider. King Beyond the Wall, Dalla, his pregnant wife, Val, her younger sister, his chiefs and captains, Harma, called Dog's Head, commanding his van, the Lord of Bones, mocked as Rattleshirt, leader of a war band, Egrit, a young spearwife, a member of his band, Reich, called Longspear, a member of his band, Ragwile, Lennel, members of his band. His captive, John Snow, the crow come over. Ghost, John's direwolf, white and silent. Steer, Magnar of Thin. Charl, a young raider, Val's lover. Grig the goat, Erok, Quart, Bodger, Dell, Big Boyle. Hempen Dan, Hank the Helm, Len, Toefinger, Stone Thumbs, Raiders. Tormund, Mead King of Ruddy Hall, called Giant Spain, Tall Talker, Hornblower, and Breaker of Ice. Also Thunderfist, Husband to Bears, Speaker to Gods, and Father of Hosts, Leader of a Warband. His Sons, Toreg the Tall, Torward the Tame, Dormund, and Drin, his daughter Munda. Oral, called Oral the Eagle, a skin-changer slain by Jon Snow in the Skirling Pass. Magmar Tundoweg, called Mag the Mighty, of the Giants. Varamir, called Six Skins, a skin-changer, Master of three wolves, a shadow cat, and a snow bear. The Weeper, a raider and leader of a war band. Alfin Crowkiller, a raider slain by Corin Halfhand of the Night's Watch. Craster of Craster's Keep, who kneels to none. Jilly, his daughter and wife, great with child. Daya, Fernie, Nella. Three of his nineteen wives. Acknowledgements. If the bricks aren't well made, the wall falls down. This is an awfully big wall I'm building here, so I need a lot of bricks. Fortunately, I know a lot of brickmakers, and all sorts of other useful folks as well. Thanks and appreciation once more to those good friends who so kindly lent me their expertise, and in some cases even their books, so my bricks would be nice and solid. To my archmaster, Sage Walker, to first builder, Carl Keim, to Melinda Snodgrass, my master of horse, and, as ever, to Paris. End of a Storm of Swords, A Song of Ice and Fire, Book Three, by George R. R. Martin, G. E. O. R. G. E. R. R. M. A. R. T. I. N. Read by Roy Avers in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky, for the Library of Congress, June 2001. A Bantam Spectra Book. Published by Bantam Books, a division of Random House Incorporated, 1540 Broadway, New York, New York, 10036, www.bantamdell.com. 
Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.